is touching the truth. The North Tower of Hogwarts Castle Above a small staircase in the divination classroom. This is the office of the Professor of Divination at Hogwarts, Skylar can be sure that this is definitely the shabby office in Hogwarts. There is nothing but a desk and a bed in it. Professor Trelawney opened her eyes wide, and said in her signature, soft, vague voice, Welcome to my office, you are. Hello Professor, I am Skylar of the Malfoy family. I am here to greet you. Oh, Malfoy's second son. I've heard your name, uh. It seems you are not my student. Professor Trelawney said with some confusion. Professor, it's like this. I'm encountering some mundane difficulties now, so I came to seek your help. I hope that through your celestial eyes and your vision, you can help me find the answer. Skylar politely said his request. Interesting. Professor Trelawney said calmly, why do you think of asking me for help? She went on to say, do you know that in my teaching career in the past ten years, you are the first student to come to me for guidance? I once heard of your grandmother, Cassandra Trelawney. Miss Cassandra Trelawney is undoubtedly a true master of prophecy. Schuyler said. However, after her, there has never been a prophet in my family, Professor Trelawney said softly, I know that many people in the school think I am a liar. Do you still think I will prophesy? Teacher, why do you care too much about the opinions of those fools in the world? Most wizards don't believe in so-called prophecies, especially about bad news, so no one will want to believe in prophecies before the real disaster strikes. This is humanity. Skylar continued, as for me, I believe that professor you know how to predict, but you can't master your own prediction ability, and you can't use it as you like. Skylar's tone was full of confidence. Oh, interesting, why do you think that? Professor Trelawney's eyes flashed shrewdly. She had seen countless people with half-hearted divination without being dismantled, and her gaze had almost become her. She felt the depth and wisdom of Dumbledore in Skylar's instinct. To deal with this kind of person, any deception and blindness are useless, so it's better to go straight to the point. Professor Dumbledore is old, but he is not senile or idiot. He decided to hire you as a professor of divination at Hogwarts. Obviously he thinks you have such qualifications. Yeah. Professor Trelawney said to herself, I admit that Dumbledore did not have a good interest in divination at first. At that time, he told me that Hogwarts was going to give a divination class and wanted to invite me to be a professor, but before that, Dumbledore wanted me to make a prediction for him. Although I don't remember the content of the prophecy anymore, shortly after that, probably after the fall of the mysterious man, I came to Hogwarts as a professor of divination. At that time, there was no so-called divination class in the school. It seems that the prophecy has come true, Skylar said softly. Close to the subject, since you know that I don't have my ability to predict, then the purpose of your coming to me is. Skylar took out a bottle of potion from his arms, this is a potion that I specially refined. It can permanently increase a person's psyche, or in layman's terms, sentience. The main material is very rare. Even I have only one bottle of the rare adult Thunderbird's Tears. For your diviners, it is even more precious. It can enhance your vision. Note, the rarity of Thunderbird's is about the same as that of Phoenix's. They are protected species in North America. The ones Newt saved were only smuggled to Egypt. Trelawney's eyes flashed with various changes. She was not a fool. Skylar was able to bring such a precious potion to the door. Obviously he was very conspiring. Although she is very emotional, she is used to living an easy life. Although she is often looked down upon at school, she has no worries about food and clothing, and there is no risk in her life. That is also the case if she really has any emotional problems because of this. One bottle of Sydney wine can solve the problem, if it still doesn't work, then two bottles are needed. She decided to go straight ahead, what do you need me to do for you? Skylar smiled and said, professors are clever people, and I will not ask too much. Two things, first, I hope that the professor can do favor for me ten times without violating personal principles, Skylar looked into his eyes. Suddenly, he became sharp, his gaze locked tightly to Trelawney's. Second, I hope that the professor can form an alliance with the Malfoy family. You can continue to be your professor at Hogwarts, 
but if you can, you must help the forces I represent. Of course, you will not suffer, Professor. Every time you make a shot, I can offer you a bottle of potion in exchange, how about it? Trelawney only hesitated for a while, and then agreed. Schuyler offered very rich conditions and was able to make friends with the Trelawney family in full swing. At this moment it was profitable and harmless. Although she was a professor, multiple paths meant more choices. Dumbledore is not immortal. If one day she doesn't know which headmaster who doesn't have long eyes fired, at least she still has a place to go. Professor, Sybil Trelawney has become an ally. Schuyler used the first chance of divination. He chose to use it on Wilda Griffith. This was a good temptation, allowing him to see the true strength of Trelawney. Trelawney poured the entire bottle of potion into her mouth. She closed her eyes and was drunk in the skyrocketing spiritual sense. A strange pattern shining with blue light appeared on her forehead. It was in the shape of an eye, but there were many tentacles similar to plant roots around the eyes, which densely covered her forehead. This is the legendary third eye. Schuyler thought to himself, it seemed that he was right, and the power of Trelawney's blood really didn't let him down. The natural ability of divination is also divided into grades, and the third eye is undoubtedly the top one. The crystal ball on Trelawney's desk suddenly burst out with dazzling light, like a muggle projector, casting a very real illusion. The phantom shows a small room that looks like a cargo warehouse. There are no windows except for a door. Skylar can see Griffith sitting on a chair with a black cloth handle on her head. Her eyes were blindfolded, her hands were tied to the back of the chair by a weird rope, and her feet were also fixed to the legs of the chair. There are also two men in the room. One sits in a chair and smokes a famous wizard cigar. The other walks back and forth in the room with a very nervous expression. The only thing in common is that they both hold their hands tightly with a magic wand. Griffith in the picture tilted his head, as if he was in a coma. As long as there is a slight sign of waking up, he will be re-released with a stupefy. It's amazing, Schuyler said, Professor, can you please move your third eye farther, let me see what the outside of this room looks like. Some ripples appeared in the picture, as if the illusion was a little unstable. Just after the picture began to slowly become blurred, Trelawney's celestial-like traces lit up again, and the whole picture slowly rose up. In the picture, the people and things slowly become insignificant, and Schuyler sees the appearance of the building where the room is. The exterior of the building looked like the most common small warehouse in the Muggle world, but this couldn't fool Schuyler. It was definitely the handwriting of a wizard, the entire warehouse exuded invisible magical fluctuations, likely due to the Muggle expulsion curse. Inferred from the perspective of sunlight and shadows, this building was located in the north of England. Coupled with clues inferred from other nearby buildings and scenery, the area had been narrowed down to more than a dozen places. This was sufficient. Providing these clues to Scrimgeer, the rest would be the Auror's business. Doing this not only earned the favor of Deverell and Slughorn but also allowed them to receive a favor from Scrimgeer. Simultaneously, it measured Trelawney's strength, a move that could be described as four birds with one stone. Schuyler was very satisfied with Trelawney's divination ability. Then he made a second request for divination, not Meredith, but Mrs. Shabini. Divination is not omnipotent. If Meredith's position at the moment is protected by the bravery charm, then even knowing the position will be useless. It would only be inaccessible, much like the last time in Shafiq's ancestral house. The reason for choosing the object of divination as Mrs. Shabini was precisely because Schuyler suspected that she was the female member who appeared in the Shadow Dragon that day. Professor Trelawney took a rest for a while. She hadn't fully adapted to her complete bloodline talent, so the divination now consumed much of her mind. She entered the meditation state again. With the experience of the last time, the third eye was activated more quickly, and the marks on her forehead were much clearer than before. In the illusion, Two long wooden boxes resembling coffins appeared. The boxes were intricately carved with numerous mysterious Guruni charms, designed to cut off external influences and better preserve the contents within. The scene then shifted to an altar, where the two coffins were placed. This time, the coffins emitted magical fluctuations familiar to Skylar, soul magic. A sense of foreboding crept over him as he wondered what they intended to do. Soon, two figures walked onto the altar, one was Mrs. Shabini, 
and the other, whom Schuyler had never met but recognized as Mrs. Selwyn. They whispered to each other, but the picture was a bit fuzzy, and Trelawney's phantom magic couldn't convey the sound. Schuyler couldn't decipher their conversation. Wait a minute, this figure seems a bit off. The Selwyn family is undoubtedly a pure-blood faction, and Mr. Selwyn is even a Death Eater. Though there are conflicts between the Selwyn and Malfoy families, it's primarily a matter of interest distribution, not ideological conflict. Why would Madame Selwyn be associating with the Shadow Dragon? Is this the Selwyn family's most significant secret, or is it Mrs. Selwyn's personal matter hidden from the family? As Trelawney let out a soft cry, the entire picture shook, and a spiderweb-like crack appeared, breaking into pieces that turned into little stars and dissipated. Professor Trelawney seemed exhausted, having overstrained herself, and had fallen asleep. After a moment of contemplation, Schuyler left a note, turned, and exited the room. On Sunday morning, Schuyler received two owl-delivered letters. The first, from Slughorn, expressed gratitude for Gwenog's acquittal and included two VIP seats for the Lehade hobby team, a gesture of appreciation for Schuyler's assistance. The second letter, from Scrimgeer, was hastily written, detailing the Aurus expedition based on Schuyler's provided clues. Having followed the leads, Scrimgeer discovered Griffith's supposed location, but the kidnappers had preemptively vacated the premises. Recognizing the complexity of the situation, Scrimgeer suspected an internal leak within the Aura department, prompting him to be cautious even with his own subordinates. Planning to meet Schuyler to discuss the matter, he had sought Dumbledore's approval for the rendezvous. Schuyler found Scrimgeer's unexpected visit intriguing, realizing that a seemingly minor missing person case could unravel numerous complexities within the British wizarding world. Understanding the need for discretion, Schuyler considered how to respond without revealing Professor Trelawney's invaluable divination abilities, a card he was not willing to expose lightly. The meeting between Schuyler and Scrimgeer unfolded in a discreet Hogwarts classroom, secured by Gawain Robards to prevent eavesdropping. As the two engaged in a private discussion, the weight of the matter hung in the air. Mr. Scrimgeer, I suspect there's a mole within your aura department, leaking information that led to the failure of our last operation, Schuyler pointed out, addressing the root cause of the setback. Scrimgeer snorted, acknowledging his own oversight, this time, it's my carelessness. I've long been aware that some of my staff have questionable affiliations outside, deals that don't make it to the table. As long as it doesn't interfere with daily aura work, I've turned a blind eye. Unfortunately, their audacity has increased. He continued more seriously, the issue is, I underestimated the complexity of this task initially. I assumed it was merely disgruntled fans causing a ruckus, possibly seeking a ransom. I wasn't vigilant enough regarding intelligence confidentiality. That, indeed, is my mistake. Now, Skyler, I need your help. Due to the public and media scrutiny, the pressure from above is immense. I must resolve this case. Schuyler, curious about the potential outcomes, asked, what if you don't find any leads for me? Though the question was posed, Schuyler already knew the probable bureaucratic response. Scrimgeer's eyes gleamed with understanding, he grasped the implication. Yet, he held a personal standard, finding a scapegoat was one thing, but not trying to solve the issue would be a betrayal of the ambitious young Auror he once was. Slowly, Scrimgeer responded, Are you suggesting? Don't misunderstand, Mr. Scrimgeer, Schuyler clarified. I'm willing to assist, but reorganizing your Auror team is crucial. My involvement poses risks to my sources, and without adequate benefits, it's a delicate situation. Scrimgeer, with determination, responded, Don't worry, Schuyler. I'll overhaul the team this time. Your help won't go unnoticed. I won't forget your support. Schuyler awaited this assurance. All right then, I'll take your word for it. Let's leave Hogwarts first. Operating isn't possible here. You'll need to bring me along. The three of us, with Robards, should suffice for this mission. They left through the Hogwarts gate, Operat to Diagon Alley, and stood at the three-way intersection in front of Gringotts. Disguised as inconspicuous men in black, they entered Nocturne Alley. Schuyler had chosen this location, suspecting that Aurus might approach. The kidnappers, in panic, would discuss their next move, inevitably mentioning Griffith's name. Schuyler cast the imperious curse on Wilda Griffiths to guide their path. 
They passed storefronts, traversed alleys, and arrived at an inconspicuous dead end. Skylar whispered, this is it, you too. Scrimgeier and Robards exchanged glances, their expressions turning serious. Skylar, this matter might be more troublesome than we thought, Scrimgeier remarked. After knowing the existence of Ghost Society, Knight of Alpurgis, and the Shadow Dragon. There is nothing more that could affect Skylar in terms of fear. He simply looked at the two of them and inquired, what is it? Robards explained, behind this alley is the notorious Black Crime Square. You can enter by hitting certain bricks, similar to the Leaky Cauldron's wall. The current problem isn't how to get in, but... Scrimgeier interjected, I'm afraid there's much more behind Black Crime Square, closely tied to some high-ranking ministry officials. For years, our aura applications to sweep this place haven't been approved. Skylar's eyes gleamed sharply. Uncle, just say it straight, the so-called high-level people are Yaxley, Selwyn, and Delphini. Scrimgeer, slightly embarrassed, coughed and admitted, you're right. The Lestrange family was also involved before, but after the recent incident, Lestrange is almost synonymous with annihilation. Skylar smiled, so Mr. Scrimgeer, tell me what's your plan now? Scrimgeer faced a dilemma. If he halts the investigation, he appears negligent, inviting criticism from media and the masses. Yet, if he continues, he risks becoming a target for countless enemies, making his future life challenging. Rufus, I think, Robards, with an unpleasant expression, leaned in and whispered to Scrimgeer, let's stick to the usual routine. Find a small-time thief with no connections, frame him, make him take the fall, and declare Griffith missing. While we'll still face blame for incompetence, at least we catch a criminal, and they won't have much to say. We can't force our way in, right? Robards questioned, the last Auror supervisor attempting this was inexplicably dismissed within a week. Their family was robbed, and all members met unfortunate ends. The dark wizard who emerged was killed, and the supervisor, driven mad, ended up in St. Mungo's Hospital. The two fell into a contemplative silence for almost ten minutes. Finally, Scrimgeer spoke with difficulty, let's go. At this moment, Skylar interjected. His eyes gleamed with both mockery and unwavering resolve. Mr. Scrimgeer, since you've made a decision, I won't stop you. You go ahead. I've chosen to stay here, even without you saying anything, I've guessed Griffith's fate. I can't stand by and watch her suffer, especially when I know there's still a chance to save her. Skylar's tone carried solemnity and determination that couldn't be swayed by anything. I don't want to hear her crying every night in my dreams, facing the burden of guilt. Skylar, you, Scrimgeer didn't anticipate Skylar's response. He had high hopes for this young man, and if anything happened to Skylar while working under Dumbledore, it wouldn't be a matter resolved by catching a scapegoat for the crime. I've already made up my mind, there is nothing more you can do to talk me into going with you unfortunately, Skylar's voice turned cold. I won't be a burden for you. I'm going to set things right and inform my family, severing any ties between them and this matter. This way, my family won't trouble you. However, I have to say, Skylar's voice softened, almost a murmur to himself, I'm thoroughly disappointed. I believe that an Auror is a guardian of the wizarding world, a stalwart defender. Shouldn't Aurors be heroes, living up to their own conscience and the people's expectations? Without waiting for their response, Skylar produced a small piece of paper, lighting it with his wand. The paper transformed into a sparrow, fluttering its wings as it flew away. With a casual wave, Skylar walked to the dead-end wall, closely inspecting the brick's irregularities. As he reached out to touch a brick, a magic wand suddenly extended from his side, tapping a few bricks, causing the wall to part to the left and right. Scrimgeer's face turned green, a clear sign of anger, yet his eyes sparked with a renewed, lion-like determination. I may be scorned by you, Skylar, Scrimgeer spoke softly, but now you'll witness how I climb my way up to this point. With those words, he led the somewhat reluctant Robards, striding forward. Behind them, Skylar curled his lips into a slight smile, akin to a cunning fox. Everything is running according to his plans, not even the shadow dragons had their traces covered before Skylar's eyes. Each and every plan they've made is already anticipated by Skylar, he already has a lot of counters on what to do and how to proceed to another one if his plans were to go awry. Nightshade Mystic Market isn't your typical shop or commercial street, 
rather, it's an open-air auction platform. However, the items auctioned here are far from ordinary, these are the kind of dark artifacts and illicit goods that can't be openly traded, not even in the notorious Borgen and Burks. The interests involved in Nightshade Mystic Market are colossal, reaching even into the ranks of Ministry of Magic officials. Despite the aspirations of Aurors with a sense of justice to crack down on this illicit market, gaining entry has proven to be an insurmountable challenge. The square boasts a lengthy history, its establishment lost in the annals of time, possibly predating even the venerable Hogwarts school. The elusive figure orchestrating these auctions remains a mystery, with over 50 rumored individuals being whispered about. The only certainty is the square's close ties to many pure-blood families. To secure a spot in the auction, one must invariably have the recommendation of a pure-blood family. Participation is not open to everyone. The auctions take place in utmost secrecy, with attendees required to wear special masks to conceal their identities. These clandestine events occur irregularly, their dates and times communicated through covert channels known only to the qualified participants. Even the Ministry of Magic struggles to gather evidence, as the exact details of the auction are only available to those who meet the stringent criteria. At other times, the square remains an unguarded and inconspicuous platform. The criteria for participation remain shrouded in secrecy, known only to a select few. However, obtaining referrals from several pure-blood family heads is an essential prerequisite. This alone serves as a formidable barrier, and additional steps ensure that only the most eligible individuals make it through. Not having been to Nightshade Mystic Market, Skylar underscores his lack of knowledge about navigating through its secrets, including the mysterious wall that conceals its entrance. However, Skylar was well aware of the existence of this place. He was certain that Lucius Malfoy, too, was acquainted with Nightshade Mystic Market. While Lucius never explicitly acknowledged it within the family, Skylar had stumbled upon products from the Nightshade Mystic Market in the family's secret room. These items bore the unmistakable Nightshade Mystic Market logo, a vivid red crystal stone, even brighter than the famed Philosopher's Stone. When one stood in proximity to it, a disconcerting whisper could still be discerned. Skylar had learned about the origin of this eerie crystal from the Dark Magic Book, it was crafted from the blood of 777 seven-year-old children. Not a collection akin to Muggle Red Cross blood drives, but rather a result of cruel magical rituals that sacrificed young children. The revelation had left Skylar profoundly disturbed for a prolonged period. While Lucius may not have purchased the red spar in the family's secret room, it could have been an heirloom handed down by an ancestor. The crystal harbored potent magical energy, although its powerful resentment made it unsuitable for human absorption. Nonetheless, it served as a robust energy source for magical circles. Skylar suspected that Malfoy Manor's protective and shielding arrays relied on it as their energy source. This crystal stone's cruel and malevolent nature hinted at the nefarious nature of the goods auctioned at Nightshade Mystic Market. Despite its gruesome production method, these products fulfilled certain needs, affording Nightshade Mystic Market protection and a lofty standing in various circles. At this moment, no auction was taking place in Nightshade Mystic Market. However, Skylar noticed an unusual sight, two guards stationed at the door of the storage warehouse behind the auction table. Skylar swiftly recognized them as the two kidnappers shown on the crystal ball. It's unusual, Scrimgeer muttered in a hushed tone, a furrow forming on his brow. There's no regular guard here, and the storage room stays empty most of the time. It's only on auction days that it's used for temporarily housing those auction items. Skylar exchanged a glance with Amaterasu, confirming that no other individuals were present, only these two stationed men. The magical prowess of these guards was at the level of a junior aura, sufficient to handle ordinary intruders. However, Scrimgeer and Robards were elite members of the Aura Corps, capable of holding their own against the four heads of Hogwarts. Skylar felt a surge of confidence knowing that they are on his side. It seemed that whoever was in charge didn't believe anyone would dare break in, hence the minimal manpower deployed. Alternatively, they might have sources of intelligence within the Ministry of Magic, ensuring they could receive advance notice and relocate before the Aurus arrived. In the magical world with operating, flow network, and space bags, transferring sizable items was not a challenging feat. The other two seemed to recognize Scrimgeer, his distinctive appearance making him easily identifiable, thick hair, sharp eyes reminiscent of a lion, his signature look. 
Observing the situation, Skylar sensed a hint of nervousness from the other party, though it wasn't marked by overt fear. This wasn't the first time Oros had investigated the place. While Scrimgeer might be a challenging character, it didn't seem like he had come to stir up trouble, given the measured approach of bringing only one Auror and a young boy. Upon reaching the storage room door, Scrimgeer and Robards asserted their identities, We are of the Aurors, we are here to conduct research on one of your storage considering few reports that are not up to criteria and standards requested cooperation with the investigation, and sought permission to enter the storage room for a search. The other party, citing the absence of a search warrant, refused to cooperate. Do you have a warrant in the first place, you Auror bastards? The man asked with a sarcastic smile. No wonder their confidence seemed unwavering, they appeared well versed in Aura law enforcement procedures. Moreover, their assurance that Scrimgeer lacked a search warrant suggested a level of intelligence capability that shouldn't be underestimated. Scrimgeer indeed didn't possess a search warrant this time. It was a covert operation on his part, aiming to avoid the leaks that occurred in the past and allowed kidnappers to transfer in advance. He can only stare at the man standing at the door sinisterly while the man shoots him a teasing smile. Although Scrimgeer found the other party's confidence peculiar, he couldn't impulsively charge in. Confronted with their unwavering assurance, Scrimgeer had to grit his teeth and endure. Skylar, on the other hand, didn't share the same constraints as the two Aurors. Unaffiliated with the Ministry of Magic, he faced no scruples or restrictions from it. Witnessing the Crystal Ball's illusion firsthand, which unequivocally revealed the identities of the two kidnappers, gave him a different perspective. Unlike Scrimgeer, who only had Skylar's one-sided account, he felt confident in confronting the guards. What if the intelligence was incorrect? Offending the forces associated with the Nightshade Mystic Market wasn't a matter to be taken lightly. Having verified the kidnappers' identity, Skylar knew he wasn't making a mistake. Most importantly, he had his own motivations for this operation. His original goal was to rescue Griffith, extending personal favors to Devril, Slughorn, and Scrimgeer. Now that he knew of the Nightshade Mystic Market's involvement, the situation turned intriguing. The mysterious connections between the Nightshade Mystic Market and the Pure Blood families hinted at a potential opportunity. Skylar contemplated leveraging the situation to his advantage, profiting from the chaos, or at the very least, undermining the power of the Pure Blood families. Amidst the heated argument, Skylar wasted no time and took decisive action. Seizing the moment when attention was diverted, he swiftly casted Stupefy twice to incapacitate the guards, leaving only Scrimgeer and Robards in a state of bewilderment. Skylar, what in Merlin's name? Scrimgeer, utterly perplexed, struggled to find words to articulate the sudden recklessness displayed by the young man, who was unmistakably a quintessential Slytherin. The usual poised look behind these two auras were gone as soon as Skylar blasted both of the guards from entrance. Although they were cruel and would do anything to get rid of anyone standing in their way so they could serve justice, they never resorted to an unnecessary violence like what Skylar did because of their morals and their code of ethics. Ignoring the astonishment etched on Scrimgeer and Robards' faces, Skylar advanced towards the storage room's door, only to find it locked. Open Sesame Anticipating an anti alohamra spell, Skylar opted for the door-breaking spell to forcefully blast the door open. The door toppled backward with a resounding crash. Before alohamra became commonplace in Great Britain in a bygone era, wizards used the spell Open Sesame to unlock doors. Later, an inventive wizard refined its effect, giving rise to the doorway hole spell, capable of shattering door locks, occasionally leaving a smoldering hole in the keyhole. However, by the 17th century, Eldon Elsricle, a rogue who had learned Alohamra, in Africa, introduced the spell to Great Britain. This sophisticated unlocking charm soon became the new standard, supplanting the traditional chants. The sight before Skylar was beyond belief. In the storage area, at least a dozen iron cages imprisoned women, each one stripped bare. Yellow mucus clung to the joints of their eyelids, a clear sign of the release of an eye disease curse. Their lips were unnaturally sealed shut, a manifestation of the obligus mutoris spell. Hands bound behind their backs and feet secured together with tight ropes, they lay on the ground like helpless insects. Standing beside Skylar, Robards was equally taken aback by the horrifying scene. Utilizing his magical vision, 
he discerned that most of the captives were non-magical individuals or squibs, displaying minimal magical fluctuations. However, amidst them was an unmistakable witch, and Robards was certain she was the abducted Griffith. Scrimgeer and Robards entered the room, their expressions mirroring the disgust evident on Skylar's face. While they were mentally prepared for the brutality of the nightshade mystic market, witnessing it firsthand left them struggling to contain the waves of shock. These heartless individuals. Robards couldn't suppress his anger. Do they not possess even the most basic moral decency? Mr. Scrimgeer, Skylar spoke with an eerie calmness, are these the atrocities that the Ministry of Magic has turned a blind eye to for so many years? Scrimgeer, already simmering with rage, widened his eyes like bells in response to Skylar's accusation. I concede, Skylar, he declared firmly, the Ministry may have been too lenient in the past. I promise you, I will rectify this mistake even if it costs me my entire life. I will not hesitate to do so. This time, even Robards refrained from uttering a word to dissuade him. The heinous and malevolent atmosphere of the nightshade mystic market had left him profoundly shaken. As expected, Skylar didn't let Scrimgeer escape his notice. A man of depth, ambition, and slithering and cunning, Scrimgeer was well versed in the art of self preservation. Despite his unscrupulous actions, including falsely accusing a conductor of a Death Eater and compromising ethics to uphold the Ministry of Magic's reputation, he ultimately showed a willingness to sacrifice his life for Harry's safety in the original book. However, the gruesome scene before him undeniably crossed Scrimgeer's moral threshold. Even the typically outspoken Robards chose silence this time. The two guards were promptly apprehended on the spot. Scrimgeer utilized a specialized communicator to summon other Aurors and orchestrated the rescue of the captive women. They would be rehabilitated and then handed over to the Muggle government. Afterward, Skylar opted not to partake in the proceedings. Rejecting Robards's offer of an escort, he returned to Diagon Alley and then made his way back to school through FLU network transportation. Confident that Scrimgeer would impose strict measures on the mastermind behind the scenes, Skylar also considered the difficulty of suppressing the matter entirely. Notably, one of his Auror subordinates, Kingsley Shacklebolt, hailed from a sacred pure-blood family, making complete suppression even more challenging. Two days later, on a Tuesday morning, Skylar received two letters delivered by Owl Post. The first letter came from Philbert Devril, his Puddlemere United partner. Devril, anxious since Griffith's disappearance, sought recourse by appealing to Gwynog Jones, despite recognizing the slim chance of success. His aim was to secure any compensation, no matter how small, to mitigate the substantial losses he incurred, exceeding a mere 1,000 galleon transfer fee. His meticulous efforts in the current season's digging operations have yielded promising initial results. Puddlemere United has successfully bid farewell to the stagnation of previous years, showcasing a dazzling performance that propelled them to the second-highest position in the league, trailing closely behind the Ballycast Bats. This achievement, impressive as it is, is merely the team's performance during the running-in period. Confident in the team's potential, he envisions an opportunity to challenge for the championship in the upcoming season. With the team's success, there's been a remarkable surge in the number of fans, leading to the brisk sale of tickets and peripheral products. Consequently, the team's market value, along with the net worth of its shareholders, has experienced a substantial boost. Regrettably, the disappearance of Griffith threatens to unravel all of these accomplishments. The challenges compound, rapid fan and follower loss, a sharp decline in ticket demand and prices, a contraction in the team's market value, and growing investor dissatisfaction with backstage challenges. Upon receiving Skylar's letter urging him to postpone the attack on Gwynog, he initially resisted. Skylar's apparent lack of immediate concern, as the contract specified the transfer of such risks, left him frustrated, creating a sense that Skylar was detached from the situation. In less than three days, Skylar managed to rescue Griffith, surpassing his expectations. This surprise went beyond mere financial gains. His shrewd business acumen allowed him to perceive the immense power Skylar wielded. The swift communication with the head of the Auror office and the utilization of Auror resources for the rescue highlighted the considerable influence at Skylar's disposal. Recognizing Skylar's intelligence and astuteness, he comprehends the value that Skylar represents, a vast network of contacts and concealed intelligence capabilities. Such a character is undoubtedly worth the effort to cultivate as a valuable friend. 
In this letter, alongside the customary expressions of gratitude, Schuyler found a substantial gift, a transfer of shares from Puddlemere United. Deverell, fully cognizant of the significance of securing Schuyler's allegiance, decided to strengthen their ties by generously transferring a portion of shares to Schuyler's name. In an instant, Schuyler's stake in Puddlemere United soared to a remarkable one-third. Puddlemere United team shares acquired. The second letter, dispatched by Scrimgeer, contained revelations extracted from the two guards under the influence of Veritasrum. Astonishingly, the mastermind behind the atrocity was none other than Thorfinn Raoul of the Raoul family. The upper echelons of pure blood society were no strangers to the rumors surrounding Thorfinn Raoul's lascivious behavior. It was widely known that, apart from his official marriage, he maintained numerous extramarital relationships. His pursuit of muggle beauties took a sinister turn, involving the dark arts to ensnare and transform them into magical slaves. Apart from financial gains through their sale, he indulged in his nefarious desires by being an early participant in their enslavement. Equipped with this damning testimony, Scrimgeer swiftly comprehended the motive behind the rapid deployment of soldiers. He marshaled aurors, strikers, and investigative teams into numerous squads. Simultaneously, they conducted raids on Raoul family enterprises scattered across Great Britain. Unearthing the secret strongholds divulged by the apprehended guards, they discovered multiple locations where Thorfinn had covertly incarcerated his victims. These unfortunate individuals had been subjected to the potent Eros love potion, the most effective love potion, rendering them utterly dependent and obsessed with Thorfinn. With an abundance of personal and physical evidence, Thorfinn found himself unable to evade the charges this time. The inevitability of his imprisonment in Azkaban was now undeniable. On the very day Thorfinn realized his heinous deeds had been laid bare and understood the impending consequences of Azkaban, his foremost instinct was to flee. Yet, lacking the abilities of an animagus and unfamiliar with body transformation, he attempted to escape using short distance. Apparition several times, only to be relentlessly pursued by determined horrors. Schuyler's intrusion into the nightshade mystic market led to Thorfinn's arrest within a mere two days, underscoring the efficacy of horrors when unhindered by internal constraints. Prompted by widespread public outrage over Thorfinn's actions, the Ministry of Magic swiftly and efficiently handled the matter. On the same day of Thorfinn's capture, he underwent a unanimous trial, and Weisengamot swiftly condemned him to Azkaban with immediate execution. The severity of Thorfinn's deeds captured society's attention, leaving people incredulous that such malevolence persisted in the wizarding world. Public sentiment demanded a robust effort from the Ministry of Magic to rectify Nocturne Alley, becoming the new mainstream discourse. As popular outrage proved challenging to quell, officials in proximity to Nocturne Alley wisely chose silence, refraining from any commentary on the matter. Simultaneously, on that eventful day, the ancestral home of the Raoul family faced an attack. The descendants of the Raoul family in the ancestral house disappeared without a trace, and the once filled shelves of books, antiques, and valuable furnishings were systematically emptied. Unbeknownst to many, the Raoul family's industry in Great Britain underwent a surreptitious change in ownership. Remarkably, this incident attracted minimal attention. The Ministry of Magic seemed to turn a blind eye, and major media outlets refrained from reporting a single word on the matter. The properties of the Raoul family were divided and claimed by other pure-blooded families who had caught wind of the news. Strangely, news of the Raoul family's downfall did not spread swiftly, and by the time most pure-blood families were informed, only meager remnants were left for them to claim. While unaware of the reasons behind their actions, many were cautious and somewhat fearful of the few families that seized the lion's share of the Raoul family's properties. The most surprising aspect was that the foremost beneficiary was not the Malfoy family, but the typically understated Greengrass family, with the Malfoys following closely in second place. Adding to the intrigue was the revelation that the family securing the third largest portion was not Malfoy's traditional ally, the Parkinson's, or the Burke's family, but rather the Knott family. In the eyes of the pure blood community, Greengrass, Malfoy, and Knott represented three distinct interest factions. This indicated that, at the very least, there were now three significant sources of influence and intelligence. Positions solidified by the enhanced intelligence capabilities of these three families, surpassing that of others. Schuyler orchestrated all of this. Ever since discerning Draco's abnormal behavior, Schuyler has developed complex sentiments towards the Malfoy family. 
He was acutely aware of the corrupting influence of power across two generations of humanity, making it impossible for him to naively trust the family without reservation. Strictly speaking, the alliance formed between the Greengrass family and the Knott family had Schuyler as its primary target, not the Malfoy family. Given the uncertain family dynamics, distinguishing themselves from the Malfoy family's resources was deemed crucial. Providing benefits to Greengrass and Knott not only fostered stronger alliances but, per the agreement reached, ensured that a portion of the businesses they acquired would ultimately return to Schuyler. This arrangement was shrouded in secrecy, making Schuyler the undisclosed chief beneficiary of the entire incident. Gareth transferred the property ownership of three shops in South Diagon Alley to Schuyler. These establishments, currently under lease agreements spanning centuries, allowed Schuyler to assume the role of a landlord and enjoy a steady income stream from collecting rent. The generosity extended by Mr. Knott was equally substantial, considering the ease with which things transpired. Schuyler gained ownership of an underground gambling house in Nocturne Alley from him. This establishment specialized in accepting bets on the British-Irish League, Pegasus Race, and Broom Race, i.e., ball games, horse racing, and broom racing. Additionally, Schuyler acquired property rights to shops in Jiaoxiang. One particular vacant shop caught Schuyler's attention, and a quick glance at the house number, no, Diagon Alley, prompted his eyebrows to jump. Wasn't this precisely where the Wesley twins planned to open a store in the original book? At that moment, for words resonated in Schuyler's mind, this shop will rake in lots of galleons in the future. Obtain the property rights of four stores in the South Diagon Alley district. Obtain the right of the underground gambling house in Nocturne Alley. In the second week of school, not much excitement unfolded. On Thursday, Professor Moody declared an unconventional demonstration during the defense against the dark arts class. He announced his intention to cast the imperious curse on each of his classmates in rotation to showcase the spell's magic and evaluate their ability to resist its influence. As he spoke, a loud bang reverberated through the classroom, and discussions erupted like a torrent, flooding the room with a myriad of voices. The students were taken aback, not anticipating that Moody would dare to perform such an act, considering that casting an unforgivable curse on another wizard carried a penalty of life imprisonment. Undeterred by the reactions, Moody urged the students to take turns and experience the imperious curse. Under the influence of the spell, the students exhibited peculiar behaviors. Blaze hopped around the classroom, Pansy mimicked a squirrel, and Neville executed astonishing gymnastic movements, feats he could never achieve under normal circumstances. None of them appeared capable of resisting the spell, returning to normal only after Moody lifted the enchantment. Draco Malfoy, Moody declared in a deep, rumbling voice, it's your turn. Draco nonchalantly shrugged and walked to the center of the classroom. Moody raised his wand, pointed it at Draco, and intoned, Imperial. Skylar observed that a split second before Moody's incantation, Draco's eyes flickered with a green light, and black energy began emanating from his body. Draco's entire demeanor changed drastically, taking on a darker and more ominous tone. Draco, what happened to you? Skylar asked inside his heart after noticing the obvious sign of his malicious energy. Contrary to expectations, the imperious curse had no effect on Draco. He stood unaffected, smiling at Moody. Skylar discerned that the black gas resembled a nimble dragon, circling Draco's mind. At the precise moment the Imperius was cast, the black gas substituted for Draco and was dissipated by the curse. Draco smirked contemptuously, remarking, Professor Moody, it seems that the Imperius curse is not as challenging to resist as you claimed. The room fell into a hushed silence. Professor Moody wore a deep frown, clearly taken aback by the unexpected turn of events. The idea that Draco might resist the Imperius curse had crossed his mind, perhaps engaging in a mental struggle for control. However, he hadn't anticipated the direct invalidation of the curse. Without a word, Moody gestured for Draco to return to his seat and proceeded to call out the next name on the list. The next student in line was Skylar. Skylar, come forward. Let's see whether you could do the same like what your brother has just done. Professor Moody called out. Skylar confidently strode to the center of the classroom, a smirk playing on his lips. Secretly, he relished the opportunity to showcase his formidable willpower. While Skylar hadn't actually cast the Imperius curse himself, his knowledge of the spell far surpassed the staged theatrics being presented. 
The true essence of the imperious curse lies in magically paralyzing the cerebral cortex and prefrontal lobe of the human brain. This results in the subject losing reason, logic, and decision-making capabilities, succumbing to external influences that manipulate emotions. In simpler terms, those under the curse find joy in obeying orders and feel compelled to continue indulging in the submissive emotions they elicit. Schuyler understood that the most effective counter to the imperious curse wasn't a clemency, as many believed. A clemency primarily focuses on concealing emotions, specifically, the limbic system, rather than cognitive and rational abilities. However, this isn't to say that a clemency is entirely ineffective against imperius, practicing it can grant individuals better control over their emotions, making them less susceptible to external influences. To combat the imperius curse successfully, one needs a combination of stronger emotions and an unwavering will. As Moody intoned the words, Imperio, Schuyler initially felt a fleeting sense of tranquility, a light and fluttering pleasure enveloping his thoughts. However, in the blink of an eye, Meredith's face flashed across Schuyler's mind, igniting a fiery anger. Schuyler swiftly regained his icy composure, and the nascent flame of pleasure was extinguished before it could fully ignite. With a confident smile, Schuyler remarked, Professor Moody, if this is the extent of the magic, it doesn't seem as formidable as you described. Is it truly necessary for us to learn to resist this curse in the fourth grade? Professor Moody's expression darkened. Two consecutive failures left him unable to uphold his chosen teaching method. He had previously emphasized the importance of learning to resist the imperious curse, portraying its power in exaggerated terms. Even seasoned adult wizards had struggled against it, but now, after being thwarted twice in a row, it seemed that the imperious curse might lose its intimidation factor in the eyes of the young wizards. Struggling to convey his message, Moody conceded, in that case, let's proceed with the lesson here. He continued, both Mr. Malfoy's successfully resisted the imperious curse and overcame it completely. Seek their advice and learn from their experiences, ensuring that others cannot easily manipulate you. The rest of the class unfolded in an unusual atmosphere, marked by a tense silence. No one dared to break the stillness as they focused on taking notes about resisting the imperious curse. Moody remained seated by the podium, his face indecisive, seemingly pondering some internal dilemma. The other young wizards kept their heads down, diligently recording the intricacies of resisting the imperious curse. It wasn't until the bell signaling the end of the class rang, and Moody exited the room, that conversations resumed among the students. The Slytherin youngsters eagerly surrounded Skylar and Draco, requesting insights into their successful resistance against the imperious curse. While the Gryffindor students felt a twinge of envy, they refrained from impulsive inquiries. Casting a discerning look at the expectant Slytherin crowd and the huddled Gryffindor students, Schuyler nonchalantly declared, Since Professor Moody wants us to acquire this skill, I see no reason to keep it a private matter. Gryffindor's lot, if you're interested, feel free to join in. Participation is entirely voluntary, no one should feel compelled. Curiosity about combat-related magic drew the Gryffindor lions closer, positioning themselves conscientiously behind their Slytherin peers. Schuyler, raising his voice, proclaimed, listen up, everyone. There's actually no secret to resisting the imperious curse, it primarily hinges on willpower. Now, can anyone articulate what willpower is? A thoughtful silence enveloped the group. While everyone grasped the concept of willpower, succinctly defining its essence proved more challenging. Ever the insightful one, Hermione spoke up, does willpower involve using reason to combat subconscious desires? Skylar's gaze briefly intersected with Hermione's, exchanging understanding in those fleeting seconds. Initially unnerved, Hermione steeled herself, maintaining a steady gaze. The slight challenge in her eyes did not escape Skylar's notice, and a small smile played on his lips. It seemed that Hermione had matured during the summer break. Turning his gaze to Ron, Skylar noted with a wry smile that some things remained unchanged, Ron still exuded the essence of a carefree kid. Our friend, Ms. Granger is spot on, Skylar commended. Here's my take, will is consciousness, the willingness to forego personal desires in pursuit of one's goals. For instance, they sacrifice sleep and leisure to secure good grades in exams. However, Skylar's eyes gleamed, his voice lowering, it may also entail relinquishing a friendship to protect those close to you. Skylar purposefully avoided looking in Hermione's direction, 
yet the image of illuminating insight vividly mirrored Hermione's red eyes and tightly pressed lips in his mind. Clearing his throat, he began, learning to combat the illusion curse requires introspection, what is your purpose in learning this? How much are you willing to sacrifice for it? As you cultivate your consciousness, you lay the foundation to resist the imperious curse. The imperious curse aims to paralyze our reasoning and use our emotions to control us. The most effective strategy against it is to employ stronger emotions, breaking free from the opponent's dominance. When someone casts the imperious curse, you'll experience a light, fluttering sensation, an illusion of freedom. All you need to do is release your reason, relinquish control of your body, and embrace a certain spiritual freedom, a sense of pleasure. At that moment, contemplate the potential consequences for the person or thing you care about most. If you genuinely awaken, Skylar paused, Meredith's face surfacing in his thoughts, causing a twinge of pain. However, his expression remained impassive as he continued, you'll feel anger, unwillingness, and an intense, fanatical desire to break free from control. Personally, this is how I overcame the imperious curse, through sheer willpower. Returning to awareness, Skylar noticed the awe-filled gazes of the surrounding young wizards. Magic is profoundly spiritual, he remarked casually. A wizard's true power emanates from the heart. Glancing at Draco and Hermione, he added, once you've truly awakened and are willing to risk everything for it, I believe you've become a qualified wizard. With that, he gracefully donned his night star cloak and departed along the path the young wizards had willingly cleared for him. The repercussions of the Raoul family incident continued to reverberate, particularly affecting the lives of werewolves who relied on the family's resources for survival. In the wizarding world, werewolves face discrimination from wizards due to perceived dangers associated with their condition. Consequently, many werewolves struggle to secure decent employment, leading to impoverished living conditions. Seeking refuge in pure-blood families, such as the Raoul family, a group of werewolves led by Fenrir Greyback, exchanged their services for essential resources. This clandestine arrangement allowed pure-blood families to benefit without direct involvement. When news of the Raoul family's downfall reached these werewolves, who were kept in the dark about the events, the abrupt halt in supplies raised suspicions. Only this month did they realize that something had gone awry. Fenrir advocated seeking refuge with another pure-blood family, but not all werewolves under his leadership agreed. Some werewolves, discontented with their stagnant existence, opted to break away. Under the harsh conditions of hunger and cold, these disenchanted werewolves resorted to criminal activities, including burglary, arson, and looting. This posed a significant threat to both the wizarding and muggle communities. Simultaneously, the Ministry of Magic found itself overwhelmed. Each day, the Ministry received a minimum of 30 reports related to werewolf crimes. Despite deploying aurors, strong wizards, and reconnaissance teams regularly, their efforts were strained. The suppression of one werewolf incident often led to the emergence of new cases elsewhere. On a particular day, five werewolves launched an attack in a secluded village in Yorkshire. The village echoed with the sounds of people screaming, weeping, and houses burning. Three aurors patrolling a nearby area, arrived in the nick of time to engage in a fierce battle with the werewolves. Werewolves posed a significant threat to ordinary wizards, but they were manageable for well-trained aurors like Kingsley Shacklebolt. With superior training, these aurors could easily apprehend werewolves if not for the numerical advantage the creatures had. One particular werewolf demonstrated cunning intelligence. Recognizing the dire situation, the werewolf betrayed its companion, swiftly evading capture and disappearing into the dense and foreboding woods. Kingsley Shacklebolt, already frustrated that his day off had turned into an overtime assignment, felt a sense of irritation. His boss, Scrimgeer, didn't share a good rapport with him and his pure-blood family background had attracted unwarranted hostility. This mission, handed down by Skolinger without discussion, only added to his displeasure. Patrolling impoverished countryside areas proved tiresome, often yielding little success and contributing nothing to his record of accomplishments, a significant waste of time. Determined to bring these werewolves to justice and alleviate his own frustration, Kingsley set off in pursuit. Chuckling at the werewolf's apparent dilemma, he didn't anticipate that a werewolf from the opposite direction would slip away unnoticed. This wasn't acceptable to Kingsley. He wouldn't allow any werewolf to escape his grasp. His first thought echoed the sentiment of not letting the werewolf slip away, akin to holding a mountain with his five fingers. 
he is confident that the escaping werewolf will be apprehended on his own. Chasing into the woods alone, Kingsley exuded confidence in his abilities. He ranked among the top five in the Auror team of over 30 members, with Skolinger slightly surpassing him, a fact he begrudgingly accepted. However, he considered himself superior to others like Robards and Dawlish, even if he were to deploy his family's secret techniques. He believed he had the upper hand against a lone werewolf, even under the right circumstances. Yet, he was mistaken. Kingsley spotted the werewolf in the woods and observed an absence of fear in its eyes, only indifference and cruelty. The werewolf transformed into a swift black shadow, hurtling towards Kingsley with an unexpected ferocity. Kingsley was aware that the werewolf's fur possessed exceptional resistance to magic, necessitating physical attacks. Swiftly brandishing his wand, a combination of a whirlwind and flames erupted from its tip, striking the werewolf accurately and propelling it three feet into the air. While visibly scorched, the werewolf showed no signs of intimidation. Instead, it roared in greater fury, its body arching, for bristling, readying for the next assault. Kingsley orchestrated a dance with his wand, undeterred, manipulating dead branches and boulders to disrupt the werewolf's movements, causing it to dodge from side to side. Confident that victory was imminent, Kingsley suddenly sensed danger. His body swiftly evaded a dangerously close blue light, and he turned around just in time. A sinister laughter echoed from the trees, where an ugly old witch sat on a thick branch, Annis. Annis, it's you. Kingsley's mind raced, attempting to process the unexpected turn of events. He shouted coldly, continuously casting spells to fend off the opportunistic werewolves, even the hags have joined these attacks on civilians. Are you the one responsible for all this? After narrowly escaping another attack from Annis and launching the werewolf into the air once more, Kingsley declared with determination, this time, none of you will escape. However, Kingsley found himself immobilized before he could comprehend the unfolding situation. Confused and unable to discern the truth, he was denied any chance of understanding. At that very moment, a colossal werewolf figure hurtled towards him. Experiencing a sharp pain in his neck, Kingsley couldn't even act before finally closing his eyes as he saw Annis laughing like a maniac. Beside Kingsley's lifeless corpse, his shadow stirred slowly, seemingly infused with a semblance of life. After a brief moment, the shadow emerged from the ground, gradually solidifying into a tangible form. The werewolf lowered its hands and knelt respectfully. T.S.K. Tisk. Annis expressed dissatisfaction, Bathory, I've told you, your shadow restraint technique seems useless. It takes too long to prepare. If it weren't for me and this little wolf's cooperation, this guy would remain unrestrained by your hand. Bathory's eyes gleamed with cunning. Have you ever considered why Lord Malfoy chose only our two races among the myriad outcast races as allies? Cut it out. Annis retorted, does this need saying? Obviously, it's because of our two races' weird, unpredictable, insidious, and distinct methods. It aligns with his penchant for secretive actions and benefits his plan. Bathory slowly shook his head. You're only mentioning one aspect. Don't forget that the ogres, the fairy royal family, and the banshees all possess formidable abilities tucked away in their arsenals, no less potent than ours. Then what do you mean? Annis raised her eyebrows while staring at Bathory discontentedly. I believe, Bathory pondered for a moment, then slowly continued, it's because the abilities of our two races can harmonize and complement each other. Lord Malfoy must have recognized this, he's a discerning individual. Think about how many tactical combinations can arise from the shadow magic and hypnotic abilities of our blood-sucking royal family paired with the mind control and poison magic of your mother. I say, do you idolize him too much? How old is he? How can you be so certain about the compatibilities of our abilities that have been thought that far by that kid? Are you sure it's not that he just prefers the way of our works? Anna scoffed, although she recalled the magical vision Shelling cast during her recruitment, a moment that sent shivers down her spine and made her question her skepticism. Bathory's lips curled slightly. See, you still can't accept it. You simply refuse to acknowledge the truth. Cut. The old woman is no stranger to age and naturally resents taking orders from a kid. Annis observed Bathory's expression and amended, but there's no other way. Calling him young master is not just a matter of his influential family background and formidable strength. 
Honestly, it's also the fortune of an old woman to be able to follow him, at this point, Annas consciously lowered her voice and muttered, I don't want to become his enemy. Bathory remained silent after hearing Annas' explanation, she herself knew and could relate really well to what Annas just said. No one in their sane mind would dare to make an enemy out of Skylar Malfoy. She turned her attention to the young werewolf. Where were you? Her tone became serious, with a touch of coldness. Did you harm any innocent villagers? No, truly not, the werewolf lowered his head in fear. We followed the orders of the young lord and the two families. We merely frightened the villagers. We set off some lights. There was absolutely no harm done to anyone. Everything we did was to cooperate with the master's plan. That's for the best. If the lord finds out that innocent people were harmed, none of us can protect you. Bathory replied. Yes, yes, the werewolf nodded and bowed hastily. The little wolf understands. Thank you for your guidance. What about your four werewolf companions? A subtle smile appeared in Bathory's eyes. They don't listen to me, they just want to return to Fenrir's pack. Even though Fenrir has aligned with the Selwyn family, how can the Selwyn family compare to the young lord? The werewolf gritted his teeth and spoke ruthlessly, since they're so stubborn, I can't be blamed. This time, they deserve to be sacrificed. Let the Ministry of Magic apprehend them. Very well, let's go. The young lord is waiting for our report, and he won't be pleased if he's kept waiting. Bathory called with a smile on her face. Skylar stared at the letter in his hand, absorbing the news of Kingsley Shacklebolt's demise. Even though he had achieved his goal, successfully eliminating the character that stood as the biggest obstacle to the pure blood cause in the original book, Skylar found little joy in the accomplishment. He was acutely aware that Kingsley had committed no wrongdoing, he simply acted according to his convictions. Blame was a matter of perspective, and Skylar and Kingsley held opposing viewpoints. In the original storyline, after Voldemort's defeat, Kingsley ascended to the position of Minister of Magic. This decision led to the appointment of Harry, Ron, and Hermione, pro-muggle wizards, as the political backbone. Subsequently, a series of measures, such as the Pure Blood Family Bill, weakened the influence of Pure Blood families, with Kingsley playing a pivotal role in these changes. Skylar acknowledged that great ambitions often required sacrifices. While he didn't regret his choices, the emotional toll weighed on him. He couldn't help but reflect on the sacrifices made by members of the Order of the Phoenix, realizing the emotional burden Dumbledore likely carried as each member made their sacrifice. Occasionally, Skylar mused about an alternative scenario where he traversed the Weasley, Longbottom, Shacklebolt, and Pruitt families. He chuckled at his own fanciful thoughts, acknowledging that such pondering might be going too far. Bringing himself back to the present, Skylar unfolded a parchment with an extensive list of pure blood families. He methodically crossed out the name, Lestrange, with the two brothers incarcerated, there was little left to fear. Next, he marked off the name, Raoul, once again, the Raoul family now only had Thorfinn Raoul, the lone seedling, left in prison. In the aftermath of Voldemort's return, the available soldiers at his disposal dwindled significantly, creating a momentum far less formidable than in the original book. This shift in power dynamics raised the possibility of the Dumbledore faction gaining the upper hand, a scenario that Skylar did not desire. Skylar's ideal scenario involved both Dumbledore and Voldemort maintaining a delicate balance, showcasing his value to both factions. He aimed to exploit the chaos and profit from the ongoing struggle, not wanting either side to dominate completely. He was well aware that he lacked the inherent protagonist's aura in this world. Despite his rapid growth, catching up to Dumbledore and Voldemort in the near future seemed implausible. Skylar's immediate goal was clear, he sought the power to defend himself. Achieving this was feasible by strategically weakening both factions and ensuring a delicate balance, granting him time to mature without attracting unnecessary enemies. However, Skylar kept his long-term goals close to his chest. The complexity of his plans and aspirations remained undisclosed. With this in mind, Kingsley, a member of the Shacklebolt family in the Order of the Phoenix had another reason for his demise. Skylar lowered his gaze, purposefully crossing out the name, Shacklebolt, in the, Order of the Phoenix Faction, column. Collecting the parchment, Skylar sighed softly, noting the recent increase in such size. Kingsley's death, 
while a part of a well-executed plan, weighed on Schuyler's conscience. He orchestrated the scheme during the summer vacation, providing the Ministry of Magic with anonymous information about nearby villages and using his influence to direct Scrimgeer to dispatch Kingsley to the designated location. Little Wolf had fallen prey to Bathory and Annis in Knockdown Alley earlier. Little Wolf underwent extensive brainwashing through their combined magical efforts, turning him into an unwaveringly loyal servant. Deep-seated fear was implanted in his heart, extinguishing any remnants of courage to resist orders. Initially, Little Wolf had participated in the Battle of Lestrange at the Quidditch World Cup camp alongside other werewolves. However, after the confrontation, he was dispatched to Nocturne Alley and integrated into Fenrir Greyback's werewolf community. Originally intended as a means to infiltrate the werewolf ranks, Little Wolf's role evolved unexpectedly. As time passed, the Raoul family met its demise, altering the dynamics of the werewolf community. When Fenrir proposed joining another pure blood family, Little Wolf played a significant role in the division among the werewolves. Faced with helplessness after the split, the werewolves naturally gravitated towards a path of criminal activities. It was at this juncture that Skyler's plan to eliminate Kingsley took shape. Utilizing Little Wolf as bait, Skyler orchestrated a scheme that involved luring back a few werewolves desiring a return to Fenrir's fold. Simultaneously, Kingsley was assigned a task in the vicinity, and the rest unfolded according to the intended script. In exchange for the lives of four disloyal werewolves, Skyler successfully eliminated an elite or Kingsley, a trade-off deemed worthwhile. With a snap of his fingers, Shining and Dobby materialized, accompanied by a middle-aged man sitting on the ground with a sullen expression. Dobby reported, following the master's instructions, we lay in ambush in the men's toilet of the Ministry of Magic, capturing him precisely at the appointed time. Skyler narrowed his eyes slightly, observing the astonishing strength displayed by the brainwashed little elf. Once liberated from the ingrained awe of wizards, the elf's capabilities were truly remarkable. The captive in question was the elderly Barty Crouch, an employee at the Ministry of Magic. As the head of a pure-blood family, old man Barty possessed considerable strength, making a successful sneak attack challenging. Nevertheless, the combined efforts of the two elves managed to apprehend him. House elves operated under a distinct magical system compared to wizards. They had an innate affinity for magic, wielded formidable magical power, and enjoyed a longer lifespan than wizards. However, their preference for playful, peaceful, and obedient behavior made them less adept at physical combat. Their innate reverence for wizardry's majesty further hindered their combat prowess. The original work showcased Dobby, who, having liberated himself from the master-slave contract, effortlessly defeated the Death Eater Lucius, an adept in dark magic. This served as a testament to the potential combat prowess of freed house elves. Currently, Dobby, Shining, and the absent Dino had all been stripped of their will by Skyler, instilling in them unwavering loyalty to their master alone. Skyler's intention in having them capture Barty Sr. was twofold, to gauge the extent of the original plot's deviation and to determine whether Barty Sr. remained under the influence of the Imperious Curse. Using his magical insight, Skyler confirmed that Barty Sr. was indeed still under the sway of the Imperious. Skyler had no intention of lifting the Imperious Curse from Barty Sr. With Voldemort's formidable power, attempting to dispel the magic might alert the Dark Lord to the interference, potentially causing more harm than good. To avoid stirring the proverbial hornet's nest, Skyler opted for a different approach, unwilling to risk alarming Voldemort prematurely. Recognizing that Voldemort's constant companionship posed a risk of detection for Barty Sr., Skyler chose a hypnotic charm instead of attempting to tackle the Imperious curse directly. Voldemort's astuteness made it crucial to proceed cautiously. In a hypnotic state induced by Skyler's spell, Barty Sr. began to divulge information. Skyler questioned him about recent events, prompting Barty Sr. to recount an unsettling encounter with the mysterious man. The old wizard revealed glimpses of an ominous plot and emphasized that Harry Potter was in danger, cautioning Skyler to inform Dumbledore and the Dark Lord. With a wave of Skyler's hand, Barty Sr. fell into a deep sleep, his revelations temporarily silenced. Assessing the situation, Skyler noted that the overall plot seemed intact, Voldemort's focus remained on Harry, while Moody's interest likely revolved around Barty Jr. masquerading as Moody. However, the lingering question of Barty's distinctive dragon shadow aura persisted. This peculiarity, 
unnoticed by the original characters, raised doubts about potential alterations in the plot. Skylar pondered whether Voldemort was aware of Barty's anomaly and to whom Barty's true allegiance lay with. Lost in contemplation, Skylar decided to set aside these questions temporarily. Enough, we've gotten everything we wanted from him. Both of you return him to the place where you've caught him and made sure to do this away from the eyes of others. He instructed Dabin Shining to discreetly return Barty Sr. to the men's room, emphasizing the need for absolute concealment to avoid any prying eyes. Yes. Yes. Dobby and Shining chorused in unison, ready to execute their master's command. After replying to Skylar's command eagerly, both the house elves Dobby and Shining operate away once again to return Barty Sr. to the place where they found him, the men's room. The third week of the school year they have brought with it a noticeable surge in homework for the fourth-year students at Hogwarts. A chorus of complaints echoed through the halls as the students lamented the increased workload, especially in Professor McGonagall's transfiguration class. In response to the grumblings, Professor McGonagall, with her eyes gleaming behind her square-shaped spectacles, addressed the class with a sense of authority. You are entering a crucial phase in your magical education, she declared, her gaze piercing through the lenses. Your OWL exams are looming. But we won't be taking the OWL exam until the fifth year. Blaze raised his hand in protest. Perhaps, Mr. Shabini, but trust me, thorough preparation is essential. In this class, only Mr. Malfoy has managed to turn a hedgehog into a satisfactory pincushion. And let me remind you, your pincushion will still quiver in fear when someone approaches it with a needle. Meanwhile, Professor Binns concluded his lecture on the Goblin Rebellion, transitioning the fourth-year students to the preparation for the upcoming fifth-year OWL exams. The focus shifted to the extensive history of the wizarding world, tracing its roots back to the civilizations of ancient Egypt and ancient Greece. The wizarding world's historical records were first documented during this period, marking the beginning of the magical civilization. While many of these records were either lost or incompletely preserved, the wizarding world started to take shape during the time spanning from 500 BC to the 4th century AD. Historians collectively labeled this era as the Ancient Age, aligning with the Muggle world's Classical Age in their respective histories. The prehistoric era, predating the civilizations of ancient Egypt and Greece, was not within the scope of the OWL exam and, thus, remained untouched in the classroom discussions. During the times when the ancient civilizations of Egypt and Greece were flourishing, the Ollivander family officially emerged in the Mediterranean countries, establishing a lineage dedicated to magical wandcraft. In ancient Greece, notable figures such as the infamous Helbo, the enchanting Circe, the invincible Andrus, and the prophet Pussos captured the admiration and awe of thousands. Following the conclusion of the ancient era, the world entered what is commonly referred to as the Middle Age, spanning from the 5th to the 15th century. The 10th century, in particular, shone brightly, marked by the presence of influential figures such as the four founders of Hogwarts, the founder of Durmstrang, Merlin, Morgan Leff, Cleona, Morrigan, and the goblin king Ragnac I. Note, Cleona, an Irish female druid and seabird animagus, discovered the use of moonflower, proficient in bird language and healing magic, as depicted in the chocolate frog picture. Note, Morrigan, an Irish witch and crow animagus, served as the ancestor of the Sayer family in the founder of Ilvermoney, Isolt Sayer, according to Pottermore. In the subsequent generations, noteworthy individuals emerged, including Hengist of Woodcroft, the founder of Hogsmeade, Armand Malfoy, founder of the Malfoy family, and the three Peveril brothers, creators of the Deathly Hallows. Additionally, peculiar figures like Uric, who sported a jellyfish as a hat, added a touch of eccentricity to this era. Note, the Peveril's third granddaughter married into the Porter family in the 13th century, with two generations reversed. The three brothers lived in the 11th century, arriving in Great Britain alongside the Malfoy family around the same time. The period following the Middle Ages, spanning from the 16th to the 18th century, is termed the Early Modern Age by historians. Notable figures of this era include Nicholas Flamel, Paracelsus, the founder of Ilvermoney, Isolt Sayer and Azkaban, Echristus, and the Silver Spears each contributing to the magical landscape in the recent centuries. After that, the historical period from the 19th century onward is collectively referred to as the modern age in the wizarding world. 
Despite Professor Binz's lectures maintaining their characteristic monotony and inducing drowsiness among the young wizards in the audience, the realization that this content would be part of their exams prompted many to rouse themselves to take notes reluctantly. In stark contrast, Schuyler listened with great enthusiasm. For him, an understanding of magic was not just a necessity but a genuine interest. The soul of an adventurer hidden within him craved ancient stories and legends, making the history of magic a captivating subject. One notable exception to the tired crowd was Morag. Seated on the left side of Schuyler, she diligently transcribed the lecture, displaying a keen interest. On the other hand, Daphne, occupying the right side of Schuyler, succumbed to slumber within the initial ten minutes of the class. Upon the ringing of the dismissal bell, the restless freshman promptly exited the classroom. Unaffected by the commotion, Professor Binns remained stationary on the podium, observing their departure. Seizing the opportunity, Schuyler approached Professor Binns with a question, Professor, may I delve into the origins of magic? Oh, you truly are a young scholar, responded Professor Binns, his ghostly visage displaying a twitch of surprise. While his memory of names remained elusive, he vaguely recalled this young man, who had previously articulated insightful views on the Goblin Rebellion. And who might you be? I am Malfoy, Schuyler Malfoy, Professor. Mr. Malfoy, answering your question is no easy task. Ancient history has bequeathed us scant written records, and the wizards of that era seldom chose the path of becoming ghosts to enlighten future generations. The prevailing belief is that magic originated in ancient times, Professor Binns began. During this era, the world was vastly different from its current state. The landscapes were barren, and the climate unforgiving. Only the most formidable species could endure. Rather than the human wizards we know today, the dominant entities were the immensely powerful ancient dragons and giants. The precise appearance of these ancient dragons and giants eludes us, but we can draw inspiration from their descendants, the remnants being giant dragons and giants. These forebears differed significantly from their offspring. Possessing robust bodies adapted to exceedingly harsh environments. They wielded the potential to bring about cataclysmic destruction. This power, in essence, served as the prototype of magic. In that bygone era, various other species coexisted, including the ancient elves, precursors to our contemporary elves. Yet, their power paled in comparison to the destructive might of the races mentioned above. Furthermore, numerous archaeological findings suggest a penchant for peace and order among these species, with an aversion to chaos and war. Consequently, they opted not to withdraw from the world. This led the ancient dragons and giants to engage in a protracted war as they vied for the scarce resources available. Subsequently, beings of considerably lesser stature and strength, namely humans, made their appearance. Despite their seemingly unassuming nature in such an environment, humans possessed robust reproductive capabilities and an unwavering will to survive. The emergence of ancient humans and the subsequent mutations they underwent could be viewed as the initial magical upheaval in human history. This particular power, termed the power of chaos by subsequent generations, stands as the inaugural source of mankind's magical abilities. Passed down through the bloodlines, it continues to be transmitted from generation to generation, giving rise to the diverse wizarding families we recognize today. Partial insights into these origins can be gleaned from the literature of ancient pure-blood wizarding families. This likely contributes to the persistence of the idea of pure-blood supremacy among certain wizards. So, this is the origin of what we call bloodline power. With numerous uncertainties cleared up, Schuyler, eager for more knowledge, continued his inquiry, Professor, you mentioned that this is the initial source of human magic power. Does that mean we have other sources of magical power? Absolutely, young one. You're quite perceptive, Professor Binns commended, pleased with the attentive students. He elaborated, despite the dominance of chaos as power, humans, while seemingly feeble, swelled in astounding numbers. The ancient dragons and giants, diminished by prolonged warfare, found their populations dwindling. To bolster their ranks in war, they began recruiting humans, offering a share of their intrinsic bloodline power to those willing to align with them. This marks the genesis of the second generation of human magic, the power bestowed by the two major races, the dragons, and the titans. These three magical powers have historically been acknowledged as the roots of all magical abilities among human wizards. Schuyler nodded in understanding. 
Far from fatigued after his lengthy discourse, Professor Binns seemed to relish the discussion. Undoubtedly, his disposition was influenced by his ghostly nature. Does this explanation make sense to you? Professor Binns asked kindly. Yes, it does. Thank you for clarifying, Professor Binns, Schuyler expressed his gratitude. If you ever have more questions about the history of magic, feel free to approach me. Students as diligent as you are is a rare find nowadays, Professor Binns remarked contentedly, stowing away the ethereal textbook before gliding out of the classroom. Until next time, Mr. Malfoy. It was a rare occurrence for Professor Binns to recall a student's name, a testament to the impact of Schuyler's recent inquiry. Exiting the history of magic classroom, Schuyler suddenly felt the flying eagle mark on the back of his neck grow warm, a sign that Aquila was calling to him. Spotting Daphne and Morag in the corridor, he gestured for them to proceed ahead as he had some matters to attend to. Finding an empty corner, he summoned Aquila. Well, it's splendid to see an interest in ancient history, Aquila's phantom gracefully circled around Skylar. Recall when I mentioned that once you can fully inherit Ravenclaw's knowledge, I'd reward you with a secret. Now is the time for me to fulfill that promise. You must be aware that Hogwarts Castle was constructed by the four great founders in the late 10th century. Having weathered over a millennium, it has witnessed countless events, endured various changes, and accommodated numerous notable headmasters, professors, and students. Consequently, the castle is an extensive heritage repository, rivaling even the most ancient pure-blood families. Despite numerous excavations and transformations over the centuries, many of the castle's secrets remain hidden, Aquila explained. Though Schuyler attempted to maintain a facade of composure, his heart raced uncontrollably. Could Aquila's purported secret be related to the castle? The prospect was undeniably astonishing. Yes, your intuition serves you well. The secret I am about to reveal pertains to Hogwarts itself, Aquila affirmed. Let's begin with the seven secret rooms. I'm sure you're aware of two that you've already accessed, Ravenclaw's and Slytherin's secret chambers. Skylar's heart pounded wildly, he had never fathomed the existence of seven secret rooms. Beyond those associated with the four founders, there were evidently three more concealed chambers. Aquila reveled in Skylar's eager anticipation and shared, the remaining four secret rooms are Hufflepuff's secret chamber, Gryffindor's treasure, Merlin's secret chamber, Pear Portrait, and the Room of Requirement. To Skylar's surprise, it dawned on him that he had already uncovered three of these secret rooms, including the Room of Requirement. Observing the change in Skylar's eyes, Aquila exclaimed, No way! Have you discovered the secret of the Room of Requirement? Upon Skylar's affirmative response, Aquila expressed, It's amazing, truly remarkable. Now, all that remains is for you to explore the three remaining secret rooms. Due to the constraints of ancient magic, I can't directly reveal the secret rooms or treasures. Instead, I can provide you with clues. Pay close attention, Hufflepuff's clue is the kitchen, Gryffindor's clue is the horseman, Merlin's clue is Peppy, and Pear's clue is half-length likeness. This unexpected revelation left Skylar immensely satisfied with his newfound knowledge. However, Aquila wasn't done surprising him. Do you believe the castle harbors only this many secrets? A grave misconception. Aquila, delighted by Schuyler's astonished expression, continued, Have you ever pondered the principal's office, where successive headmasters left instructions for their successors? What lies beneath? Have you contemplated the origins of the nearly headless Nick ghost? And the mysterious giant squid in the Black Lake, ever wondered about its genesis? What secrets does the small island in the middle of the Black Lake hold? Lastly, consider the enigma of Professor Binns. As the longest-serving Hogwarts professor, his office has remained untouched by students. Rumor has it he doesn't even work there, given his inability to interact with the physical world. What mysteries lie within his office? Schuyler, now intrigued, had never considered what might be in Professor Binns's office. Reflecting on it, he found himself genuinely curious about the contents of the elusive professor's workspace. In any case, Schuyler had the entire day free from classes, so he decided to seize the opportunity and explore the mysterious office today. Considering that Morag shared a rare interest in the history of magic and had no classes for the day, Schuyler approached her with a secretive air. He inquired, Morag, do you happen to know where Professor Binz's office is? Morag scrunched up her cute nose, responding, Well. 
I've never heard that Professor Binns has an office. I think no student has ever thought to seek his advice after class. Schuyler grinned sneakily, every professor has an office, without a doubt. It's just that Professor Binns, unable to interact with the physical world, doesn't need to use the office for work. Have you ever wondered what might be in his office? Why the sudden interest? Morag gave a peculiar expression, then chuckled. Are you plotting to explore the professor's office? Curious if there's anything valuable. Is that it, young Master Malfoy? Skylar shrugged, I don't see why not. I don't think Professor Binns would mind at all. Although the items in his office belong to him, he can't touch, use, or employ them. If others can make use of them, it might be the best way to honor his memory. Perhaps it would even bring him some joy. Morag tilted her head, contemplating for a moment, as if finding merit in Skylar's reasoning. She then asked, so, why did you come to me? Exploring the entirety of Hogwarts Castle has always been part of my plan. Would you like to join me? Skylar asked with anticipation. Morag looked blankly at him, as if finding Skylar's proposition rather trivial. What do you mean, she questioned. I'm willing to assist you, whether it's exploring the castle or forming a group for more significant endeavors. Exploring castles is just child's play in comparison. The duo dedicated an entire afternoon to their quest. Their first step involved scouring the library for information in Hogwarts, a school history. Despite having previously perused this book, the ongoing authorship of Bat Hilda Bagshot ensured no regular updates or patches for the content. In the magical world, a book can withstand the variable curse as long as its author remains alive. Any modifications to the manuscript prompt instantaneous reflections in all copies. Thus, the two embarked on their search for the most recent information within this book. Armed with the latest clues, Skylar seized the opportunity to gather information from the ghosts they encountered. Through several inquiries, they successfully narrowed down the possible location of Professor Binz's office to three spots within the castle. Surprising for her usual well-behaved and quiet demeanor, Morag embraced the adventure wholeheartedly, accompanying Skylar with flushed cheeks, radiating an endearing cuteness. Their journey eventually led them to a concealed wooden door in the corridor of Gregory the Flatterer on the sixth floor. Though the door was protected by an anti alohomer curse, it proved no match for Skylar's skills. In the astonished eyes of Morag, Skylar used a muggle's universal unlocker to pry open the wooden door. With no one in sight, the two stealthily entered. Rumors had suggested that Professor Binns did not use this office. The room was in disarray, filled with open books and scattered parchment, shrouded in a thick layer of dust, indicative of prolonged abandonment. Morag patted her chest, finding the clandestine entry into the professor's office a bit too exhilarating. Observing Skylar's calm demeanor, she deduced that he must have engaged in similar exploits before. Observing Morag's flushed face, Skylar couldn't help but chuckle. The castle corridor's sprint had left a thin layer of sweat on her forehead, and her chest rose and fell rapidly. Amused, Skylar reassured her, don't be nervous. If the professor catches us, just say you were held hostage by me. Ha! Huh. Rolling her eyes at Skylar, Morag took a few deep breaths to regain composure, calming her nerves. Having vented their grievances to each other, she had mentally prepared for this endeavor. Yet, her well-behaved nature, molded by thirteen years of growth, couldn't be instantly reversed by a change of mindset. As the realization sunk in that she was about to violate school rules and compromise her long-standing principles, Morag expected to feel nervous or even repulsed. Strangely, these sensations eluded her. Instead, participating in these activities with Skylar brought an unexpected sense of exhilaration. Now holding the stature of a masterful wizard, Skylar noticed the subtle shift in Morag's expression. He remained silent, quietly observing her. Uncomfortable under Skylar's scrutinizing gaze, Morag blushed and asked, Why are you staring at me like that? Thank you, Morag, Skylar replied softly. Humph, I told you not to say thank you anymore, Morag grumbled, then her eyes filled with determination. You don't need to say anything. I believe you, Skylar. Even if you were to tell me that I need to raise an army for you, I would gladly do it in the blink of an eye, just for you. Skylar smiled and waved his magic wand at Morag, who, with a flick, saw her long hair and sweat vanish, leaving her clean and tidy. 
magic certainly had its conveniences. Skylar perused the rows of books neatly lined on the shelves. Most of the content pertained to fairy rebellions and giant wars, topics covered in class. These seemed to be reference materials for lesson planning rather than valuable reads, and Skylar decided they weren't worth taking. Meanwhile, Morag explored the office with genuine interest, thrilled at her first visit to a professor's quarters. Using the eyes of magic, Skylar discerned that most bookshelves contained ordinary history books. However, a subtle magical fluctuation emanated from an inconspicuous corner. Brandishing his wand, he tapped the spine of the book, causing the entire bookcase to rumble and shift to the left, revealing a small wooden door. To their surprise, even Professor Binns had a secret room, and the door wasn't locked. Gleefully, they entered to discover a round table at the center, upon which two sets of books rested, an unexpected treasure trove of language research notes on ancient dragons and giants. There were ten hefty volumes on ancient dragon language and six on ancient giant language. Skylar wasted no time, unceremoniously claiming them for his portable library. The Book of Ancient Dragons has been obtained. Book of Ancient Giants has been obtained. Observing Morag's gaze, Skylar felt a twinge of embarrassment. The saying goes, a seer shares a fortune. Or, how about we split these books evenly? Morag huffed in mild dissatisfaction. Do you think everyone is as studious as you? Fourth grade coursework is demanding enough. I don't have time for these time consuming extra studies. With an awkward smile, Skylar asked, So, how can I repay this lovely lady for her company throughout the afternoon and making my day so enjoyable? Morag found Skylar's proposition amusing and burst into laughter. I want you to teach me that spell, the one for a quick haircut and a clean, tidy restoration. Don't be fooled by those common spells. What I want is your unique technique. Don't think I don't know, your spellcasting technique is different, and that's why your casting speed and effects are outstanding. I've read about Finkley's spellcasting technique but can't replicate it like you. It's so delicate, she said with anticipation. How about it? Can you teach me? Since the day the two had confided in each other, Skylar had considered Morag his girlfriend. He wasn't secretive about sharing his techniques, Daphne, Meredith, and Astoria had already mastered his spellcasting method. Fool, given our relationship, even if you hadn't asked, I plan to take the time to teach you recently, Skylar said with a smile. What kind of request is this? Or would you like to change it? Well, let me think. Morag tilted her head. It seems I have nothing to learn for now. Why not? There must be something, Skylar's eyes lit up. I can teach you how to kiss. Skylar reached out, pulling Morag into his arms. Caught off guard, Morag exclaimed and tried to stand still but found herself being led into a kiss. As she looked up, she noticed Skylar's dark eyes flashing with an inexplicable light. Her whole body stiffened, heat rushed to her face, and her heart raced uncontrollably. Before she could speak, Skylar had already kissed her lips. Their four red lips pressed together, and Morag's initially stiff body gradually relaxed. She closed her eyes, meeting Skylar's deep kiss awkwardly. Skylar invested a considerable amount of time in teaching Morag his spellcasting techniques. His spellcasting method had long surpassed the framework of Voldemort's technique. Over the past three years, Skylar had read Professor Filch's dual notes, the dual records of the Silver Spear organization sent by Sister Juliana, and Rowena Ravenclaw's spellcasting method. Combined with his experiences in successive real battles, he had improved his spellcasting method at least twenty times. Confident that his spellcasting technique was on par with anyone, Skylar believed that, had Voldemort not attempted to enhance his own technique over the past ten years, he could confidently surpass him. Skylar returned to the bedroom, where Daphne and Astoria were waiting. I, Daphne, in the name of Greengrass, I've reached out to some junior classmates who have familial ties with us. They're all Slytherin, and the foundation for the Serpentis Vigil has been laid, Daphne reported. Astoria chimed in, I've got no issues here. Hestia and Flora from the Carlo family have also agreed to join. Skylar held the twin sisters, Hestia and Flora, in high regard. With the bloodline of the Carlo family, one of the 28 sacred pure-blood families, and wielding wands crafted from the same magical animal materials, the twins' combined spellcasting created a remarkable bonus effect, 
greater than the sum of their individual powers. Recalling historical instances, Schuyler couldn't help but humorously envision the prospect of Harry Potter and Voldemort teaming up against a common enemy. Good work. Schuyler commended. How many members do we have in the organization now? Following your instructions, I've refrained from contacting senior students for the time being. Even our class is unaware of our activities, so the primary force consists of third and second grade students, Daphne informed. Schuyler planned to entrust senior students of the Wakanda family to Nariel, but Nariel's loyalty and abilities were still under evaluation. Schuyler aimed to keep the plan discreet and avoid drawing attention from the Ghost Society. The students in the same class were kept in the dark due to Draco's peculiar behavior. Schuyler didn't want to unveil his plans until things were clearer, and considering Blaze's mother was still his adversary. As for the first-year students, they've just entered the school and may not be acquainted with the school's daily life, lacking a sense of confidentiality. Schuyler, therefore, decided not to consider them at this time. In the fourth grade, we have only three students, you, me, and Morag. In the third grade, there are six students, and in the second grade, including Astoria, there are ten students, Daphne informed. The total count of 19 students exceeded Schuyler's expectations, a positive outcome. Schuyler meticulously examined the list Daphne provided, expressing satisfaction with her organizational skills. After praising her, he inquired, anything else? When should we convene our first full staff meeting? Daphne frowned, organizing her thoughts before stating, Schuyler, have you ever heard of the Ghost Society, a student organization? Schuyler nodded, acknowledging that even Daphne was aware of the Ghost Society. Daphne continued, This organization is quite mysterious, and I don't possess much information about it. I stumbled upon its existence while recruiting members. I heard that your brother was invited. As for his acceptance, I'm unsure. It's beneficial for you both to be aware of the Ghost Society. I'll discuss it with Morag. For now, don't concern yourselves with their affairs. They operate in a more concealed manner than we do, so I'm confident they won't casually interfere with us. We just need to remain cautious. For the time being, Schuyler preferred to avoid conflict with the Ghost Society. While dealing with groups like Lestrange and Selwyn was acceptable, engaging with the enigmatic Ghost Society at the organization's inception seemed unwise. Additionally, based on Schuyler's inclination to read between the lines from his previous life, provoking smaller entities could attract attention from larger, more formidable adversaries. Behind the Ghost Society loomed the Knights of Alpurgis, capable of leveraging the legacy of two Dark Lords, making them formidable adversaries. In the subsequent period, Schuyler immersed himself in four pursuits, the Book of Ancient Dragons, Beauty Potion Crafting, Dwarf Pup Breeding, and Advanced Usage of the Iron Armor Curse. As time swiftly passed, October 1st arrived. The Serpent Vigil Club organized its inaugural meeting within the confines of Newt's suitcase space. New members, filled with curiosity about this mysterious space, developed an even deeper admiration for Schuyler's magical prowess. The meeting commenced with a self-introduction ceremony to acquaint members with one another. Daphne then proceeded to articulate the pre-designed articles and regulations, emphasizing the paramount rule that the organization's existence must remain undisclosed to outsiders. Violators faced severe punishment, solidifying the Serpent Vigil Club's status as a completely secret underground student organization. Daphne went on to present the three primary objectives of the Serpent Vigil Club such as, strengthening organizational cohesion, members from higher grades being obliged to mentor lower grade members, and fostering mutual assistance and communication among peers. Maintaining positive interactions was deemed essential. Regular dual training the organization would conduct regular dueling training sessions to enhance members' practical combat skills. Schuyler would personally supervise this activity, prompting cheers from many members. Resource sharing, the organization aimed to pool efforts in constructing a shared library within the suitcase space. Each member, predominantly from Slytherin and hailing from wizarding families, could contribute by copying family collections. Future members from Muggle backgrounds would be encouraged to conduct research or fulfill organizational tasks. A fair charter would calculate their contribution value, allowing them to exchange it for equivalent resources in the library. There is no need to worry about the initial resources of the library, as Schuyler himself, along with the Greengrass family collection, subtracting some private collections that should remain confidential, 
accounts for more than 500 books. Drawing inspiration from Hermione's creation of Dumbledore's army in the original work, Schuyler presented each member with a golden galleon bearing a changeable charm as their membership card. These coins would alter during member calls, be it for full-fledged meetings or actual combat training, displaying the time and location of the gathering. With these preparations complete, the Serpentis Vigil's inaugural session officially concluded. I believe everything is in order. If you have any questions, then please ask them before we finally conclude our first meeting and celebrate the formation of Serpentis Vigil. Schuyler said while looking toward other students. The other students looked at each other in silence for a few minutes before Schuyler finally raised his hand, to a better future where we stand as the pioneer to pave a new path in this wizarding world. Following his speech, the members erupted in cheers while shouting Schuyler's name. The Club Serpentis Vigil has been established. The following day, before dawn, Schuyler arose and ventured into the castle dungeon with a specific destination in mind, the kitchen. Emerging from the Slytherin Lounge, Schuyler navigated a broad stone corridor adorned with images of various foods. Swiftly locating a large portrait featuring a silver bowl overflowing with fruits. Schuyler lightly touched a vibrant green pear within the image. To his surprise, the pear squirmed and chuckled, transforming into a sizable green doorknob. Grasping the doorknob and pulling, Schuyler found himself in the legendary Hogwarts house elves' kitchen. The kitchen mirrored the size of the auditorium above, with cabinets filled with tableware and four long wooden tables positioned identically to the four college tables in the auditorium. Breakfast for the students was already laid out on the tables, and house elves would magically deliver the food to the waiting tables above during mealtime. Spotting Schuyler, a little elf approached and inquired, Sir, what's the matter? The restaurant isn't opened yet, so I thought I'd take a look in the kitchen, Schuyler replied with a polite smile. The implication of the restaurant made the house elf widen his eyes as he realized Schuyler's background. Please come with me, sir. The house elf grasped Schuyler's hand and led him to a table, where six other house elves hurriedly approached, carrying a large silver tray adorned with a jug of milk, ham, omelette, toast, salad, and pumpkin porridge. Thank you, little guys, Schuyler said gratefully as he poured himself half a glass of milk. After savoring the delicious meal, he inquired, since it's my first time here, may I explore the surroundings? Of course, sir, the house elf nodded eagerly. Schuyler's primary interest lay in the cold storage of food. After all, wizards didn't utilize muggle refrigerators, and as far as he knew, there was no specific curse for cooling items in the wizarding world. The so-called freezing spell essentially fixed the casting target and halted movement. As Schuyler strolled around, he observed the hundreds of little elves in the kitchen, deftly wielding their long fingers to command kitchen tools and utensils. They executed various cooking procedures in a remarkably orderly manner. Approaching the end of the kitchen, Schuyler finally reached a small room dedicated to storing ingredients. A rune was engraved on the door, and he recognized it as ISA, signifying ice and still. The magic talisman emanated immensely powerful waves of magical energy. By this point, Schuyler had become well acquainted with Guruni's spells, understanding the intricacies of their difficulty. Despite his extensive knowledge of ancient magical texts, mastering a Guruni's talisman like Guardian took significant time and effort, from his first encounter in the Silver Spear test level to assisting Astoria in expelling a curse, he could only achieve a semi-finished Guruni's magic. Until the moment Lockhart blows himself up, Schuyler succeeds in materializing the magic in desperation, completing the entire process of Guruni's spellcasting. While this achievement might seem remarkable today, he had only mastered the Guardian Talisman, just a drop in the vast sea of Guruni magic talismans. It was said that wizards in the Middle Ages were well versed in using Gurunis to cast spells, a fact that filled him with admiration and yearning for that era in the wizarding world. Whether it was the four founders of Hogwarts or the three Peveril brothers who crafted the Deathly Hallows, their proficiency in using Guruni's magic talismans was unparalleled. Schuyler couldn't help but marvel at their achievements. Whether it was the invisibility cloak of the Deathly Hallows or the door of the kitchen cold storage, after nearly a thousand years, they could still emit such powerful magical fluctuations. This was undeniably amazing and a goal Schuyler aspired to achieve in the future. Schuyler opened the door and stepped inside. As he entered the freezer room, the ISA magic talisman emitted a dazzling white light, transforming into a pure white beam shooting toward Schuyler. 
Knowing the potency of Guruni's as spells, Skylar refrained from employing the shield charm to absorb the attack. Instead, he raised his right hand and swiftly traced the I was rune with his index finger. A small palace phantom immediately enveloped Skylar, and the collision of the two Guruni's charms produced a sizzling sound, cancelling each other out. This action attracted attention. All the house elves rushed over to witness the commotion. They cleared a path to the left and right, revealing an aisle. An elderly house elf, leaning on a cane, approached Skylar slowly and uttered in an aged voice, the one foretold in the prophecy, you have finally revealed yourself. This venerable elf identified himself as Guber, the eldest elder among the more than 100 house elves residing in the Hogwarts kitchen. Having lived in Hogwarts since birth, he was elected as the elder and inherited a prophecy from his predecessor, Bran. According to the prophecy, a Hogwarts student would eventually arrive in the kitchen, activate the magic on the freezer, and successfully resist it on the spot. Throughout the years, countless students had entered the kitchen for food, yet none had shown any interest in triggering the mysterious magic. Goober gestured with his crutches towards an inconspicuous corner of the freezer and invoked a peculiar elfin magic. Instantaneously, a silver accented stew pot with a primitive design materialized. Person of the prophecy, you are the heir chosen by Hufflepuff. Take this saucepan. It is Hufflepuff's most treasured collection. When used to cook, it enhances the flavor of food. Skylar, as the young master of the Malfoy family, was perplexed. Why would he, with three house elves at his disposal, need to cook himself? Sensing Skylar's disappointment, Goober explained further, do not underestimate this saucepan. Hufflepuff was one of the most powerful wizards of her time. Do you seriously believe the keepsake that she left behind would be as simple as that? Do you seriously believe that Hufflepuff herself would leave something without any meaning? Goober touched a pattern on the front of the stew pot with his fingers, transforming it into a crucible. As long as you inject a little magic power here, it can become a crucible. If used to refine potions, it can increase the success rate and shorten the refining time. Upon hearing this, Skylar expressed pleasant surprise. Advanced potions such as compound decoctions, veritaserum, and blessing potions often posed risks, even in the hands of a potions master. Moreover, the extended refining periods added to the challenges. If the crucible could enhance success rates and expedite the process, its value would be immeasurable. Hufflepuff's crucible is obtained. With the obtainment of Hufflepuff's treasured possession that's meant for her successor, Skylar has started concocting a plan of his own inside his head on what kind of potions he will make once the preparation is all done. With this newfound bounty, Skylar was in high spirits and decided to linger a while longer. Engaging in a friendly conversation with Elder Goober, he ventured to ask about the selection process for elves to become elders. Elder Goober, if I may ask, how do the elves at Hogwarts go about choosing their elders? Skylar inquired politely. Elder Goober, unaffected by Skylar's politeness, responded in a calm and normal tone, not to worry, sir. Your question is not presumptuous at all. Among the elves, there is no official hierarchy. The position of elder doesn't involve managing other elves. Our tribe's ancestors established this tradition. Skylar's curiosity led him to contemplate the history of Hogwarts. When the school was founded, each founder had specific responsibilities. Rowena Ravenclaw handled the interior design, Salazar Slytherin recruited professors, Godric Gryffindor managed the intelligent creatures around the castle, and Helga Hufflepuff took charge of daily maintenance, including cleaning, purchasing, and kitchen operations. Note, Hogwarts had a different history during a more prosperous era. The number of employees and students was not as limited as described in the original book. McGonagall served as an assistant teacher before becoming a professor. In the original book, the student count dropped to 41 to 80 due to Voldemort's war. The increased mortality and reduced fertility led to a shrinking wizarding population in Britain. This book posits a setting where the number of students in the 1990s was 600, and the pre-Voldemort era had 1,000 students. Hufflepuff serendipitously gained the allegiance of a house elf, and with the assistance of that elf, discovered more of their kind. Touched by the brutal and inhumane treatment house elves endured during the Middle Ages, Hufflepuff brought them to Hogwarts, providing a secure haven. While she didn't attempt to liberate the house elves like Hermione did later in the original book, 
Hufflepuff offered them the best working and living conditions possible for the time, earning profound respect from the house elves. Skylar speculated that the first house elf to join Hufflepuff might be the supposed ancestor of Elder Goober. Goober himself promptly validated this assumption. You are listening to this audiobook on web novel audiobooks Tkthigud. Yes, our ancestor was the initial elf to follow Master Hufflepuff, the great Wooby. He established the tradition of appointing elders. Before each elder's demise, they must designate the next heir. The elf inheriting the elder's position also inherits the secrets of our house elves, and Hufflepuff's saucepan is one of them. Goober explained with a serious look on his face. Elder Goober, I didn't mean to pry into the secrets of your race. I was merely curious about Hokshi's whereabouts. Hogwarts, a school history documents his achievements, like helping he Chipak sever the demon tree soul eater and establishing a greenhouse for herb cultivation. However, the school history remains silent about his ultimate fate. Skylar replied with his palms facing toward Goober, explaining that he meant no harm. Elder Goober fell silent, his expression inscrutable even to Skylar's keen observations. Elder Goober, have I asked something I shouldn't have? If you'd rather not answer, it's okay. I was just curious, and I don't need to know, Skylar hastily added, feeling a bit embarrassed. Fate, Goober sighed. Skylar refrained from interrupting Goober's contemplation, patiently awaiting his words. As he took a deep breath, he observed the other house elves start whispering against each other. In all these years, you are the first person to inquire about the great Wooby's whereabouts, and you're not even a Hufflepuff. Elder Goober's gaze subtly shifted, and he continued, Since you've successfully navigated Master Hufflepuff's test and sought to know where Master Wooby went, I will share with you. Our house elves are, in fact, one branch of the elves. Skylar remained unsurprised by this revelation. Following the magical history class that day, he learned that elves originated from the ancient elves, a lineage lost in the annals of history alongside ancient dragons and giants. Descendants of the ancient elves manifested in various forms, and house elves scattered across Europe were just one manifestation. Other examples included the malevolent elves inhabiting Germany's Black Forest, Irish dwarfs, the Yumbo in African folklore, Tanuki from the East, and more. Strictly speaking, they all fell under the umbrella term of elvish creatures. In ancient times, to evade conflict, our eldest ancestors, the ancient elves, created a hidden realm as a refuge for their descendants. However, many descendants, unwilling to spend their lives in seclusion, harbored a deep desire to explore the outside world. Some clandestinely left the secret realm, giving rise to entities like evil spirits, dwarfs, yumbo, civet cat people, and us. With the assistance of Master Hufflepuff, we house elves have discovered a path back to the secret realm. Hence, every house elf at Hogwarts will autonomously return to the elven realm upon reaching the twilight of their years. There, they will embrace death. As for me, after appointing my successor as elder in a few years, I will journey back to the ancestral elven land. So, is this the most significant secret passed down through generations among house elves? The existence of the ancient elves' secret realm has endured to the present day. If avaricious wizards were to discover this, the implications would be dire. They would undoubtedly seek to exploit and enslave more elves and make them do their bidding. It makes sense why house elves guard this secret so closely. Skylar promptly discerned that something was amiss. Ravenclaw's intricate air selection trial, involving finding, repairing, and activating a crown, followed by perusing an extensive collection of books, suggested that Hufflepuff's test, as a co-founder of the Big Four, couldn't be as straightforward as deciphering a Guruni's magic talisman. While Hufflepuff's writings in the Rune Guide might seem dispassionate, cracking a single symbol would likely be within the capability of numerous professors and gifted students over the past millennium. Skylar couldn't help but ponder, could Hufflepuff's genuine trial be situated in the elves' ancestral land? Perhaps this crucible served as a decoy, constituting a fraction of the actual test. Satisfied with this apparent challenge, students might overlook the true trial. The pressing question now was, tell me, Elder Goober. How can I go to the ancestral land of yours without doing any harm to your kin? I believe the test that came from Mrs. Hufflepuff herself doesn't end with me knowing the tip of your historical where from. The elves, possessing this knowledge, would assuredly guard the secret from wizards. Methods such as separation, mental manipulation, and soul control could potentially extract the secrets, 
but Skylar vehemently rejected such dark practices. His past entanglement with black magic had left an indelible mark, and he was determined to avoid succumbing to its influence again. Goober finally showed an expression similar to a laugh, he chuckled for a bit before finally staring at Skylar. Behind those stairs, Skylar could see Goober's eyes lit up with an infused light of magic similar to when a wand is casting. Young master, that's on you to figure out. Prove yourself before the house elves and the Hufflepuff before you dare to dream of stepping inside our ancestral realm. Goober answered while his expression returned to normal. Returning to his bedroom, he summoned Dobby before him. Dobby has been by my side for the longest time, witnessing my growth since childhood. It's impossible for him not to harbor feelings. However, everything changed after I acquired the soul chapter of Abatel and delved into the realm of soul magic. During one summer vacation, before my first encounter with Voldemort, I conducted an experiment on Dobby. In my exploration of still unfamiliar soul magic, I implanted an irresistible suggestion in Dobby's mind, compelling his loyalty to me. It was around that time that my mindset began to evolve. The ability to manipulate the emotions, desires, and thoughts of others at will, how can I put it? It's undeniably thrilling to feel above everything else. I faced moments of hesitation, self-doubt, and anxiety as my proficiency in soul magic rapidly grew. However, an unexpected event involving Meredith, coupled with the frustration and guilt it triggered, strengthened my resolve to pursue power. This led me to cast aside caution and plunge deeper into the dark arts. Skylar's monologue inside his heart led him to look at Dobby with a caring look. He couldn't even dare to look at him for more than a second. I feared that he might cry upon realizing what kind of stuff he made Dobby went through. Confronted by Dobby's fanatical and unwaveringly loyal gaze, recalling the shared past of our childhood, and reflecting on what I had subjected him to, I sighed and spoke softly, Dobby, I am sorry for what I've put you through. Dobby seemed a bit bewildered, standing there dumbfounded, awaiting Skylar's command. Unbeknownst to him, what he was about to receive was Skylar raising his wand and uttering, Liberatio Anima. The spell that Skylar learned from one of the books he had read. A counter spell for the imperious curse that he had perfected to return one's self into what it was before the mind control spell taken effect. Dobby's heavy head shook, his entire being swaying, and with an unstable gait, he eventually settled onto the ground. How are you feeling, Dobby? Skylar inquired gently. Dobby is okay, Dobby mumbled, still grappling with the drowsiness in his head. He pointed to his temple and added, It's just a little dizzy up here. I owe you an apology, Dobby, Skylar contemplated for a moment and decided to be forthright. I used some magic on you previously, and it may have had an impact on your mind. But now, I've rectified it for you. Master doesn't need to apologize to Dobby, Dobby widened his eyes. Dobby actually knows that he could be free in the first place. Even though it was Harry Potter who did it, you, the young master, secretly contributed as well. You provided Dobby with employment, and for that, Dobby is deeply grateful. In Dobby's heart, he has always regarded the young master as the true master. House elves are an exceptionally unique species, and their loyalty doesn't solely adhere to ancient family contracts. For instance, creatures like Creature can only pledge allegiance to certain individuals within the family, opting for deception and conspiracy against others who are part of the same household. When a house elf hasn't truly surrendered, they'll go to great lengths to find linguistic loopholes in the orders given by their nominal master. They can even clandestinely engage in activities that may harm the owner, all within the bounds of the owner's directives, though they must endure severe self-punishment afterward. There's only one path to earning the true loyalty of house elves, and that's by treating them with kindness. In the original book, Sirius met an indirect demise after making this crucial mistake. The sentiments Dobby expressed now undoubtedly laid bare his genuine feelings for Skylar. Skylar, however, shook his head. Dobby, you've taken care of me since my childhood, and I'll never forget the times you endured punishment from Karkaroff to shield me. Bringing you back to freedom is the least I can do for you. As for having you work for me, well, I suppose I am using you to carry out tasks for me. No. Dobby interjected loudly, in Dobby's heart, the young master is a good friend. Assisting the young master is Dobby's happiest and proudest achievement. Skylar's gaze suddenly sharpened. Dobby, do you genuinely believe that? 
aren't you angry at all for when I cast a spell on you? Dobby doesn't know, replied Dobby, shaking his head stubbornly. But Dobby knows, little master, you will definitely not harm Dobby. Innocent. Skylar sneered, his tone turning cold. Then, what would you do if I cast a spell on you again? Dobby believes the young master won't do this. Dobby declared confidently, puffing out his chest without fear. Dobby. You are a bit silly, but so adorable. Skylar lamented inside his heart. Skylar sighed, closed his eyes, and spoke quietly after a moment. Thank you, Dobby. Thank you so much. Dobby, I need your help, note that this is a request, not an order. You can choose to refuse, and I will never blame you. Young master, please say, Dobby responded firmly. Dobby will do his best to help you. Skylar then shared with Dobby about the inheritance of Hufflepuff, requesting Dobby's assistance in guiding him to the ancestral land of the elves. Skylar solemnly assured Dobby that this time, his intentions were solely for Hufflepuff's inheritance, with no ulterior motives towards the other elven races residing in the ancestral land. Without hesitation, Dobby patted his chest and agreed. Anytime, young master. Skylar called upon Dobby and Shining, instructing Dobby to apparate them to the ancestral land of the elves. According to Dobby, this sacred place was a hidden realm, akin to the enchanted mirror world's existence. Only elves possessed the ability to locate it, with every elf soul being imprinted upon the ancestral land from birth, granting them an innate knowledge of its whereabouts. Upon arriving at the fabled ancestral land, Skylar was awestruck by the extraordinary sight that unfolded before him. A colossal tree, soaring into the heavens with its crown vanishing into the clouds, stood at the center. Nestled around its roots were several small elven villages. The elves in these villages buzzed with excitement upon spotting the outsiders, communicating in a language unknown to Skylar. It dawned on him that elves had their own unique language, dispelling the common wizard misconception that elves communicated in human tongues. Why is it that I don't understand any single thing that these guys are saying? Skylar inquired. Little master, little master, leave this to me in shining. Dobby exclaimed. Dobby in shining, on the other hand, Dobby and shining comprehended the language naturally, as if it were a knowledge ingrained in their souls. While these wild elves shared physical similarities with house elves, their spirits, temperaments, and even their eyes revealed a distinct divergence. Skylar, respecting the autonomy of other intelligent species, harbored no inclination to enslave these wild elves. His sole purpose in coming to this mystical realm was to unearth Hufflepuff's inheritance. Seeing how the other elves got acquainted with Dobby and Shining it almost instantly made Skylar lower his guard, okay, Dobby and Shining. Both of you need to go and collect as much information as you can while you're talking with them. I'll go and take a short rest by that rock over there, got it? Skylar said while pointing toward a rock with a flat surface. Dobby and Shining nodded in unison before they continued to talk with the other elves. Tasking Dobby and Shining with gathering information, Skylar patiently awaited their return. Before long, they reappeared with news. Dobby, displaying a newfound sense of seriousness, conveyed, Little Master, I believe I've found what you seek. Excellent. Thank you, Dobby, Skylar acknowledged. Can we proceed to that location now? Certainly, come come with me Little Master. Dobby replied. Guided by Dobby and Shining, Skylar cautiously trailed behind them as they navigated through numerous elf villages, making their way toward the colossal tree at the heart of the ancestral land. After approximately an hour of walking, the trio reached the base of the enormous tree. Adjacent to the roots of a particular tree, a deep hole presented itself. Confident in the master-servant contract he shared with Dobby and Shining, Skylar harbored no fear of any harm from them. Without hesitation, he entered the tree hole. The interior resembled a labyrinth, with dim passageways branching out in various directions. However, Dobby and Shining navigated with an apparent sense of guidance in the darkness. They traversed without hesitation, effortlessly advancing through the maze-like passages. Eventually, the group arrived at an altar. Before the altar stood three lifelike stone sculptures. The tallest statue wore a garment crafted from flower petals, adorned with a pair of slender dragonfly-like wings on its back both large and small. Its slightly puffed hair was embellished with a charming garland, 
bearing a striking resemblance to the current mountain forest nymphs. The second statue, bearing the closest resemblance to a human, exhibited pointed ears on either side of its head, distinctly different from humans. Clad in a form-fitting costume with a pointed hat perched atop its head, the figure held a willow flute near its mouth, poised as if serenading the surroundings with a refreshing forest melody. In many aspects, it closely resembled the present leprechaun clan. The bottom statue portrayed a creature with long drooping ears and large eyes, sharing some resemblance to little elves in three key features. However, unlike the smaller counterparts, this statue sported immaculate attire, well-proportioned limbs, and a handsome countenance. It held a wine glass in one hand, while the other gripped a broom, suggesting it was singing with a mischievous grin, exuding a smart and joyful aura. Dobby guided Skylar towards the statue, revealing a stone slab adorned with ancient elven inscriptions. Although some parts of the ancient elven script overlapped with Skylar's knowledge of wizarding scripts, they were not identical. Even with the assistance of Dobby and Shining, deciphering the profound knowledge embedded in the ancient magical texts proved to be a challenging task for Skylar. The initial paragraph unveiled the ancient secret, created by the ancient elves to evade the conflict between ancient dragons and giants. This space served as a sanctuary where they relocated. The three statues symbolized the mountain forest nymph, the progenitors of dwarfs and elves. The subsequent section on the stone slab chronicled a pivotal moment when certain elves, dwarfs, and nymphs decided to venture beyond and explore the outside world. The whimsical dwarfs, enchanted by Irish clover, beer, and music, opted to settle in Ireland. The nymphs, fond of singing and surrounded by vibrant flowers and plants, chose to establish themselves in France and Greece. The elves, captivated by human craftsmanship, stealthily infiltrated human homes, offering assistance in sewing, craftsmanship, and various endeavors without detection. Thus, Muggles' fairy tales, such as, The Elf and the Old Shoemaker, became widespread. These elves assist humans in various tasks, driven by their genuine love for handicrafts rather than the expectation of rewards. Thus, if someone gifts them clothing or anything to wear, akin to the old shoemaker in a fairy tale, they depart indignantly, resembling a solitary artist repulsed by the scent of copper. A wizard stumbled upon this unique characteristic of the elves one day. Seizing upon this knowledge, he used an abundance of handicrafts to entice the elves, then ensnared them in pre-designed traps. Once captured, the elves were subjected to soul contract magic, gradually succumbing to brainwashing that transformed them into human slaves, ultimately, the house elves known to wizards today. However, not all elves suffered this fate. Some managed to escape and fought back, a faction concealed themselves in the Black Forest in Germany, evolving into malevolent spirits with a penchant for consuming human children as a form of vengeance. Others sought refuge in Senegal, Africa, evolving into Yunbwa, with a bias for pilfering human food as an act of retribution. Another segment migrated to far eastern countries, transforming into civet cat people, specialists in playing pranks on humans. While most of these antics are harmless, there have been chilling tales in Japan of civet cats deceiving and murdering elderly women, followed by serving their husbands a broth concocted from the deceased. The text in this section presents several distinct handwritings, evidently scribed by different elves. One of them is unmistakably the work of the great Wugby. Fortunate to be adopted by the benevolent Hufflepuff, Wugby was regarded as a friend and granted the freedom of thought. In gratitude to Hufflepuff, Wugby, as it affectionately called itself, left a bloodline descendant at Hogwarts to aid in the school's daily operations. Only in its advanced years did Wugby return to the ancestral land of the elves. The third paragraph, inscribed on the stone slab, delves into the legacy bequeathed by Hufflepuff. Hufflepuff excelled in healing and life magic, and prior to her demise, she sealed her own life force within a magic circle hidden somewhere in the Forbidden Forest. To inherit this power meant gaining access to her unique skill, creation and regeneration, endowing the possessor with a constitution capable of swift self-healing, regardless of the severity of injuries sustained, as long as immediate death did not occur. Somewhere in the Forbidden Forest Skylar, astute and quick-witted, benefited from the enhanced intelligence bestowed by the crown of wisdom. His analytical skills and memory retention were exemplary. Following a round of contemplation, he discerned that the term life force alluded to gestation and reproduction. The remarkable and unnatural reproductive pace in the Forbidden Forest pointed directly to the Acromantulas, particularly Aragog, 
the giant spider that Hagrid introduced to the Forbidden Forest. Skylar promptly instructed Dobby and Shining to apparate themselves to the Forbidden Forest without further delay. Dobby, Shining, can you go to the Forbidden Forest for me? I believe one of the answers I was looking for exists there, Skylar asked while a smile slowly formed on his face. After extensive exploration during the previous semester, Skylar had become intimately acquainted with the topography of the Forbidden Forest. Anticipating a significant upcoming battle, he discreetly signaled Dobby and Shining to depart. Cloaking himself in the Night Star Cloak, enhanced through his alchemical skills and engraved with the Guardian rune, subtle light blue ripples emanated into the surrounding air. Donning the dual gloves, crafted with unicorn and thestral tail hair, interwoven with black and white yarn, the gloves emitted a cheery resonance when he grasped his wand. Adorned with a crystalline sheen, the vinewood wand revealed the successful neutralization of the wand's power of death by the power of holiness from the glove, a transformation Skylar recognized from his extensive reading. Contemplating the mysteries beyond death, Skylar's anticipation grew as he gazed at his magic wand. With the raven claw diadem adorning his head, a familiar mental power surged into his mind, causing Skylar's pupils to shift through four colors orange, turquoise, azure blue, and milky white, unable to conceal his heightened perception. Wearing the Slytherin locket, whose secret remained elusive, Skylar suspected that only people who have learned the parcel tongue could unlock its mysteries. Alone, he ventured towards Aragog's lair, ready for the challenges that awaited. He didn't make an effort to conceal himself so it wasn't long before the eight-eyed spider tribe discovered him. Giant spiders emerged from all directions, their countless legs creating layers upon layers as they encircled Skylar on the ground. Aragog. Aragog. Several smaller spiders kept shouting in English, though their speech was challenging to comprehend due to the clicking and clacking of their large claws with each word. Aragog emerged slowly from a concealed hole in the ground. The size of a baby elephant, its body and legs were a mix of black and gray, and each eye on its unsightly head, adorned with large claws, was clouded over, Aragog was blind. What's going on, it inquired, with its massive chelators clicking rapidly. People, spoke a little spider. There's only one this time, and it's different from the last two. In an old and weary voice, Aragog asked, is it Hagrid? Skylar responded calmly, I am not Hagrid. I am his friend, and he asked me to come and find you. Aragog hesitated briefly before saying slowly, Hagrid never sends anyone to me. You should explain yourself. What brings you here on his behalf? Hagrid asked me to retrieve something deep in the spider's den, Skylar explained with a sly smile on his face. Aragog appeared agitated, the large pincers clicking and clicking incessantly. How dare you lie to me? Children, kill him. The eager eight-eyed spiders who had been observing emitted excited clicking sounds. Countless legs rustled as they slowly approached Skylar, poised like patient predators preparing to swarm. For this outcome, Skylar had been prepared. In the moment of being surrounded, he utilized illuminating insight to observe the precise locations of each spider in the vicinity. In an instant, he unleashed four consecutive sonic boom spells, each finding its mark with precision. Simultaneously, a deafening noise reverberated, momentarily stunning all spiders within the observation range. The distinctive piercing screams of spiders echoed in the aftermath. Skylar took a deep breath, clutching his wand tightly in his palm, preparing to employ a magic he had never before used in actual combat. Pestis Incendium Skylar shouted with his wand pointed toward the children of Aragogs. A stream of blue flames erupted from the tip of the wand, crashing onto the ground with a resounding roar. The flames seemed to possess a life of their own, rising and falling in a spiritual dance, expanding and spreading with a crackling sound. Eventually, they merged into a towering tornado of flame, its momentum awe-inspiring. The modification of fiend fire that Skylar has learned and came up with from the hours of reading to get his reference from, the hours of tedious practice he has been putting, and the amount of failures that repels his body into the wall as a malfunction happened while he tried to cast the spell, all of it finally paid off. As the flame tornado dissipated, it transformed into a myriad of ferocious beasts, fire snakes, chimera, and fire dragons, all accompanied by menacing roars. They attacked in every direction, emanating from Skylar as the epicenter, scorching and scattering the eight-eyed spiders in a chaotic frenzy. The violent, cursing-infused fire, 
also known as the Devil's Flame, proved unquenchable by conventional means. Infected by this fierce fire, spiders faced an inevitable demise regardless of their attempts to flee. The rapidly spreading flames engulfed the spiders, one after another, creating a gruesome spectacle. Soon, within the visible range of the field of vision, a hellish scene unfolded, with burning and shrieking spiders, resembling a purgatory on earth. After this intense battle, only a fraction of the eight-eyed spiders remained in the forbidden forest, relinquishing their reign as overlords of the territory. Upon the release of Fiendfire, Aragog, sensing imminent danger, she hastily retreated to the crypt. Despite its advanced age and massive size, Aragog displayed remarkable agility and speed. Recognizing the inherent danger of Fiendfire's indiscriminate fire, Skylar swiftly pursued Aragog to ensure his own safety. Sprinting forward, he cast Ventus backward using his wand, propelling him forward like a propeller. The wind not only hastened his progress but also intensified the fiend fire trailing behind him. Although blind, Aragog relied on his heightened sense of hearing, honed over many years. Guided by the sound of the wind generated by Skylar's movements, Aragog swiftly extended a massive claw, attempting to seize Skylar. In response, Skylar's left hand dropped slightly, deftly retrieving a sterling silver dagger from his cuff pocket. Infusing it with magical power, the invincible curse activated, emanating a subtle aura of sharpness from the blade. Skylar narrowed his eyes without breaking his stride, wielding the dagger in a skillful Z-shaped motion. As if cutting through tofu, the dagger cleanly severed a pair of Aragog's colossal claws with effortless precision. Aragog's anguished cry reverberated as dark green liquid spewed from his mouthparts. Skylar's movements flowed like water, anticipating Aragog's venomous eruption. He gracefully ascended, rolling beneath Aragog's massive body. Swiftly rising, he forcefully thrust the dagger into Aragog's chest with a stab, seamlessly transitioning to a relentless advance. The dagger pierced through Aragog's chest, carving an unobstructed path across its lower abdomen and tail, accompanied by a long, hissing sound reminiscent of tearing cloth. Unfazed by the monumental impact behind him, Skylar pressed forward without a backward glance. The resounding crash of a colossal object hitting the ground marked Aragog's fall. Reaching the crypt's end revealed a vast underground expanse devoid of any other creatures. Skylar strategically revealed his position from the start to draw out the eight-eyed spiders and engage them on his terms rather than navigating an unknown crypt fraught with potential ambushes. Skylar's magical eyes scanned in all directions, detecting a subtle wave of magical power permeating the air. Following this magical trail, he discovered an underground spring within the crypt. At its source, a turquoise-hued magic circle emitted a radiant glow. Hovering above the formation center, a group of seven-colored liquid energy radiated in the air. The group of seven-colored energy, resembling a dynamic cloud, continually morphed its shape in mid-air. Delicate magical threads, as fine as hair, overflowed from it, permeating the magical circle's barrier and merging into the spring water. Skylar speculated that this phenomenon held the key to the enigma of the eight-eyed spider's reproduction. Aragog's longevity and the prolific reproduction of the eight-eyed spiders were likely attributed to the consumption of this vitality-infused spring water over an extended period. The intricately layered magic array, adorned with ancient runes, resembled a series of barriers entrapping the seven-colored power at the array's core. The eyes of the magic circle bore a Guruni's charm, specifically the, the freezing rune seen on the freezer's door. These enchanted eyes acted as a portal, with the freezing magic talisman serving as the lock. Now confident that he had uncovered Hufflepuff's true treasure, Skylar stowed away his wand and dagger. Closing his eyes, he envisioned every stroke and detail of the freezing magic talisman, employing Gurunis to release the rune repeatedly within his mind. With Skylar's augmented mental prowess, amplified by the Ravenclaw's diadem, mere minutes elapsed before success was achieved. Learning Gurunis for the first time was an arduous task, akin to a baby taking its first steps into the realm of speech, a journey from absolute naught to proficiency. Recalling his progression from the initial encounter with Gurunis, casting spells, commencing with witnessing the fairy sacred fire count as the previous semester, to ultimately mastering his inaugural Gurunis magic talisman, Guardian, Skylar contemplated the considerable duration of this transformative process. While freezing and barrier varied significantly in graphical composition and symbolic significance, Skylar drew inspiration from his prior experience. Raising his right hand, 
he sketched the freezing rune symbol in mid-air with his index finger, and a magic talisman materialized. Emitting an intense chill, it transformed into white light, piercing into the magic circle. Success Though visualizing the freezing magic talisman might elude Skylar for now, his ability to project it like a spell, coupled with the palpable sensation of its chill, signified his initial mastery. Alongside, Guardian, Freezing marked the second magic talisman Skylar had conquered, an admirable feat. Contemplating the proficiency of predecessors who effortlessly wielded Garunis as a mere pastime in his previous life, Skylar couldn't help but feel a twinge of envy. With the successful crack of the magic circle, the aquamarine radiance gradually waned. Raising his right hand, Skylar effortlessly guided the seven-color energy suspended in the air into his grasp. Upon contact with the energy, Skylar experienced an invigorating and enchanting force cascading from the crown of his head to the soles of his feet. Profound sensory transformations occurred, enhancing functions from skin to muscle and bone. His visual and auditory senses became acuter, surpassing their previous understanding. The magic power expended in casting the fiery fire curse instantaneously recovered and surged beyond, increasing by approximately 30% compared to its previous state. Skylar discerned that this energy was the source of life, as detailed on the elven slab, representing the pinnacle of magical power akin to Ravenclaw's crystal of wisdom. Having absorbed the life essence cultivated by Hufflepuff throughout her existence, Skylar's body resembled a masterpiece of alchemy, adorned with various magical patterns that manifested on his skin. Rather than black, these patterns emitted a radiant seven-colored luster akin to a rainbow. A surge of potent vitality pervaded Skylar's being, continuously transforming his body. Not only did he acquire heightened self-healing capabilities, but his body also exhibited an increased capacity to harbor more magical power. It was as if Skylar's body had become an expanded vessel, accommodating a larger space that consequently amplified his magical prowess. As Skylar meticulously observed the metamorphosis within, he grasped the profound implications of the accompanying unique abilities. The profound significance bequeathed by Hufflepuff could harness the immense vitality within, allowing instantaneous healing of any severe physical injury as long as he avoided death. Hufflepuff's secret technique has been learned, the mastery of creation and regeneration. Skylar sensed the surge in magical power and eagerly activated the magic site, intending to assess the extent of his magical growth. Unexpectedly, as soon as the magic site took effect, Skylar experienced a sudden tightness in his chest and his entire body felt ablaze, as though engulfed by a fiery inferno. His blood raced through his veins like boiling liquid, signaling a profound and potent transformation, akin to a second magical upheaval in his life. In response to the intense sensation, Skylar couldn't suppress a scream, unleashing a formidable burst of magical power from within. This magical energy formed invisible shockwaves in the air, causing the cavern ceiling and surrounding walls to quiver, resulting in the dislodging of boulders. Witnessing the imminent danger of falling debris, Skylar hastily evacuated the crypt, fearing for his safety. In a strategic move, he utilized a summoning curse to gather hundreds of eight-eyed spider eggs strewn across the location, stowing them away in his suitcase. Given their grade a contraband status, these eggs held significant value in the clandestine market, each fetching a handsome sum of at least 100 gold gallons. Hundred eggs of Aragog's spawn have been obtained. After successfully escaping the underground lair of the eight-eyed spiders, Skylar summoned Dobby and Operat back to his dormitory. Exhausted and contemplative, he collapsed onto his bed, pondering the rationale behind triggering this second magical upheaval. Perhaps, Skylar speculated, this phenomenon was an ancestral manifestation of ancient bloodline power. In the modern era, the potency of bloodline abilities has significantly waned compared to the formidable ancestral strengths of thousands of years ago. Skylar considered the absorption of advanced energies like the source of life and the crystal of wisdom as potential keys to unlocking the dormant potential within his bloodline. Skylar couldn't help but anticipate what treasures Gryffindor might have left behind, Ravenclaw boasted the essence of wisdom and Hufflepuff possessed the source of life. This led him to wonder about the potential legacy Gryffindor had bequeathed. It took half an hour for the weakness induced by the magical upheaval to gradually subside. Skylar keenly sensed the various transformations the second magical upheaval had wrought upon his body. Firstly, his physical strength had notably increased. As Skylar clenched his fist, 
he could distinctly feel the enhanced power generated by the muscles in his arm, a strength at least twice that of his previous state. This augmented power played a pivotal role in wizard duels, not only providing greater resistance to disarming and repelling curses but also amplifying explosive power during activities such as running and jumping. Furthermore, his magical prowess had taken a significant leap, propelling him into the realm of an adult wizard and beyond. It was conceivable that, within a year, as Skylar entered his fifth year, he could potentially reach the status of a junior or. In comparison, his peers like Harry and Ron, who started their magical education alongside him, would merely be scratching the surface of the upper grades by that time. Reflecting on the original book, Skylar mused about the achievements of Harry's squad, who ventured into the Department of Mysteries and confronted Death Eaters in their fourth and fifth years. Despite facing formidable challenges, they managed to survive. Skylar recalled the heated discussions in his previous life's fan club, where members debated the plausibility of these events. Lucius Malfoy's command to kill if necessary had sparked debates on the protagonist's luck and the potential leniency of Death Eaters, casting a shadow over the authenticity of their victories. Aligning with his understanding of his father in this life, Skylar interpreted the command differently. To him, the phrase, kill if necessary, implied avoiding senseless killings and resorting to lethal force only when absolutely essential, especially when the targets were underage children. Despite the malevolence of Death Eaters, Skylar recognized that they, too, had families, children, and love. Unlike Voldemort, he believed that harming children was their last moral boundary. Reflecting on past events, Skylar recalled instances during the Department of Mysteries battle where restraint was displayed. Ron was affected by a smirk effect spell, a stunning spell struck Ginny, and to his astonishment, Antonin Dolohov, instead of causing harm, opted to play a prank spell known as Tarantella on Neville. This was a surprising deviation from the expected malevolence of Death Eaters, revealing a unique aspect of their character. Returning to Skylar's present situation, his magical capabilities had been significantly bolstered. He had mastered various uncommon and peculiar attack methods, coupled with intricate tactical strategies and acute combat responsiveness. Even when his magical power was at the level of senior students, he could challenge adult wizards of higher caliber. Now, armed with increased magical prowess, he felt confident enough to take on wizards at the junior aura level. Moreover, Skylar sensed an overflow of magical power within him. His magic pool resembled a brimming reservoir, with small streams branching out in all directions, creating a complex network of magical flow. It seemed as if his body had developed a new network of blood vessels dedicated to facilitating the seamless circulation of magical power, nurturing every organ, tissue, and even every cell in his body. While Skylar continued to explore and contemplate the transformations in his body, a sudden warmth enveloped the back of his neck. TSK Tisk. Aquila's phantom materialized, wearing a complex and human-like expression. It appears that I've acquired an extraordinary master. I must have slept for too long, missing out on some fascinating developments. When did your magic power awaken? Aquila inquired with genuine interest. Awaken? Aquila, are you suggesting that magic started flowing autonomously? It's been a while, Skylar responded, recalling the events after administering occupational cerebral surgery on Morag. The changes ensued when he removed the black energy, but deciphering the exact nature of these changes had proven challenging due to the personal emotions involved. Ah. Uh, it's hard to explain, it happened for some reason. I decided to unlock a clemency, and that's when I noticed a sudden shift in my magic. I still haven't grasped the underlying principle, Skylar explained. Interesting. Aquila's eyes sparkled with an inexplicable radiance. The fact that you stumbled upon it without intentional effort speaks volumes about your remarkable luck. You've reached a realm pursued by Master Ravenclaw throughout his life, a realm even the wise Lord Ravenclaw never successfully entered. Of course, Lord Ravenclaw faced her own challenges, she dedicated much time to unraveling her bloodline curse. Aquila asserted gravely. As per Lord Ravenclaw's deductions, the benefits of magic activation are myriad, countless. First and foremost, you must have noticed that your magic power has transformed into a conduit, connecting your spirit and soul. This state is referred to as the unity of spirit and soul. The soul and spirit can now blend and nourish each other. It is precisely this union that laid the groundwork for your current undertaking. 
Without having entered the realm of magic activation and unity of spirit and soul, Master Hufflepuff's inheritance would merely alter your body, at best. It might enable you to master a new secret or enhance your overall magical prowess. This might already be considered a significant adventure by others, but, compared to what you've attained, it pales in comparison. Do you grasp how fortunate you are? Akila still found it challenging to comprehend how Skylar had accomplished all of this. The entire process seemed riddled with too many coincidences. From Akila's perspective, it was simply unbelievable. Incredibly fortunate. Since you had already established the magic bridge within your body prior to absorbing the source of life left by Master Hufflepuff, the influx of a substantial amount of magic power squeezed into your body, meaning, you've surpassed the limits of the human body. Akila inquired promptly, do you recall the third question posed by the Eagle Door Knocker? Skylar nodded. He vividly remembered the intricate query that had to be put in words, what is the true meaning of life, which he answered with, material, spirit, and soul. This response ultimately led to his acceptance as Ravenclaw's successor and candidate for the treasure. Akila lapsed into a moment of recollection, then wore an expression of admiration. Honestly, your response back then truly astounded me, material, spirit, and soul. There's no better encapsulation than that. Essentially, the triad of body, mind, and emotion constitutes life. Continuing with his explanation, Akila added, given your current state, having achieved unity of spirit, soul, and body, your magic power has progressed further, intertwining these elements into a cohesive whole. This aligns with the concept of three in one. Strictly speaking, you've touched upon the true essence of life. It could even be argued that you can no longer be classified as a wizard but as an entirely new species. What? Is that even possible? Skylar was taken aback, completely unaware of how extraordinary he had become. You find it hard to believe. Akila observed Skylar's expression and scoffed. Let me tell you, that's the untamed magic within you, although your magic has been activated, it's akin to that of a newborn, still in the early stages of exploration. If you learn to guide it as a vessel of magic power, it will become your most formidable weapon. Skylar contemplated for a moment, then inquired slowly, so, how do I guide it? Skylar believed that Akila had the knowledge, and it was merely awaiting Skylar to seek guidance. Otherwise, why share this information now? Akila replied, if you think you can get the answer from me without giving anything in return, that won't fly. You must offer something in exchange. Skylar pursed his lips, acknowledging that he had initially sought a shortcut without putting in the effort. Now that he grasps the importance of guiding magic, drawing from his understanding of spirit and soul magic, it's essential to delve into the subject himself, a matter of time and dedication. Skylar organized his mind's characteristics of spirit, soul, and magic. The soul, inherently fluctuating, can experience significant shifts under intense emotions, potentially leading to its division. The Abatel soul chapter even suggests a controversial shortcut to fortify the soul, killing the love residing in the heart. Magic power itself is lifeless. It only becomes perceptible to the wizard during spellcasting, following a fixed one-way flow, from the hand into the wand, transforming the magic power into a spell through specific wand movements before being released. Now, Skylar's magic takes on a new dimension. In essence, magic power can circulate to any part of his body. This prompts a realization, can Skylar cast spells using any part of his body? The mental image of waving a wand between his toes made Skylar shudder, the idea was almost unbearable. However, he soon realized he had fallen into a thinking trap. Who said a magic wand was a necessity for spellcasting? Wandless casting, while less potent than using a wand, was an option, as Dumbledore and Voldemort, even at their peaks, would not engage in a duel without their wands. Yet, certain spells did not require a wand. Transfiguration, for instance. Skylar's eyes gleamed with a sagacious light as he turned to Akila, sporting a triumphant smile. Akila, I've got it. Oh, really? Show me then, Akila responded, a hint of disbelief coloring its words. This youngster had already proven to be remarkably fortunate, if he possessed such insight, it would be nothing short of extraordinary. Akila, created by magic in the 10th century, had witnessed the emergence of numerous exceptional talents during an era of heroes. 
From Ravenclaw and Hufflepuff to Slytherin, and figures like Gryffindor, Narita, Merlin, and Morgana Le Fay, each one a prodigy in their own right. Note, Narita Volchanova was a Bulgarian witch, the founder of Durmstrang, who mysteriously perished during her tenure. She was replaced by Harfong Munter, known for his admiration of combat magic and black magic, as the school's principal. Yet, Akila couldn't help but feel certain that none of these luminaries had exhibited the same level of exceptional prowess at the age of 14. Skyler's accelerated growth was undeniably abnormal. Closing his eyes, Skyler mentally engaged the transformation technique on his body, comprehending the composition and alteration of matter, understanding the flow and fusion of magic, and embracing unyielding confidence and determination. Magic power coursed from the magic pool through his heart, traversing the brain, and ultimately permeating every corner of his body. Absolutely, that's it. Skyler exclaimed as he felt the newfound power inside his body surge from his core. Magic power slowly surged through Skyler's body, yet lacking proper guidance, it remained confined. He sensed every part and cell of his body brimming with potent magical fluctuations, accompanied by a subtle swelling sensation and a touch of a paper-cutting-like discomfort. Drawing in a deep breath, Skylar decided to release the pent-up magic power from his body. As he did so, he felt every part and cell undergo distortion and transformation. Suddenly, Skylar's stature increased, his hair turned a deep black, his pupils darkened, and his facial features underwent a complete overhaul revealing the visage of Carter Young from his previous life. Indeed, Skyler's speculation was spot on, he had mastered a new ability, Disguise Magus. The secret technique of the Black family has been learned, Disguise Magus. Akila's beak fell agape, rendering it speechless. Skyler not only comprehended the art of guiding magic power but also grasped its application in actual combat. Nocturne Alley bore a worn and desolate facade, its interior cloaked in a thick layer of dust, suggesting long years of abandonment. Underneath the seemingly vacant shop lay an obscure secret room, unbeknownst to any casual observer. The confines of the basement secret room were quite cramped, a mere ten people would render it as congested as a can of sardines. In the absence of any light, darkness pervaded the underground chamber. Amid the obscurity, an elderly figure sat at the room's center, his appearance unmistakably aged. His skin resembled weathered deadwood, etched with profound wrinkles and lines. The old man appeared in a state of repose, his eyes shut, and his breath so shallow it verged on imperceptibility. Suddenly, his eyes snapped open, and the secret room illuminated, as if his gaze alone could dispel the darkness. His scarlet-red eyes glowed ominously, lending a somewhat eerie quality. The vertical pupils mirrored those of a cold-blooded reptile, exuding an air of otherworldly intensity. As the old man contemplated movement, a force swiftly intervened. At this very moment, anyone present would observe eight snake-shaped chains of diverse hues binding the old man's body. Emitting an unseen power, these chains came to life upon the slightest movement, hissing and writhing like living serpents, trapping the old man more tightly. One of the snake heads spoke, its voice carrying a sinister tone, Ancient One, after all these years, you should abandon any futile attempts to break free from my seal. You know it's an impossible endeavor. The old man retorted with a cold snort, his voice resonating with vigor that contradicted his aged appearance, you treacherous, rebellious scion. Were it not for the injury inflicted by Andrus' patron Saint Curse, I would not have endured your insolence. You dared imprison even your own ancestors, you will meet your end for this betrayal. With a bitter edge, he added, your talents and bloodline are mine. You've betrayed your ancestry and kin, death is an inevitability for you. The snake emitted a grotesque, anthropomorphic, ha-ha-ha, that echoed in a prolonged fashion. Devouring the snake-shaped letter, its eyes gleamed with a striking aquamarine light. I'm already beyond the grasp of death. Not everyone fears it as you do. The sole reason I tethered my soul to this realm is to activate the Eight Snake Seal Array, a ritual demanding life and soul at its cost. Otherwise, what do you take me for? The serpent's voice abruptly turned icy, do you believe I enjoy lingering here with you? Swaying its snake head from side to side, a tinge of melancholy appeared in its eyes. My friends, my companions, they've already departed, embarking on new adventures in the realm of the dead, leaving me stranded in this sorrowful world. And it has nothing to do with you. The old man scoffed disdainfully, your worthless associates, hardly worth mentioning. 
noble and pure-blooded, yet willingly entangled with muggles. Associating with them is an insult to your lineage. Pity for your blood. Softening his tone, the old man continued, Listen, Salazar, they are undeserving of you. Leaving them behind is their loss. Godric is obsessed with muggle swordsmanship despite being a wizard, Helga is gifted with financial and pyrokinetic prowess, squandering it on cooking with fire. Rowena, she showed promise. I held high hopes for her, only to find her entangled with the Albanian raven family. A failure in inheriting the eagles, and aligning a goshawk with her is inconceivable. Birds of prey don't mix like that, it's absurd. Salazar, trust me, you've done nothing wrong. Once you unlock this cursed seal, we can fulfill the dream of pure blood supremacy together. I retain some influence beyond these confines, you know. I can still find my way to sway the Volpurgis. The colossal snake erupted into hearty laughter, causing its snake head to sway even more vigorously. If snakes possess tear ducts, they might have shed tears at that moment. Come now, old man, relying on your inferior pure blood families, Orochi sneered disdainfully. I'm aware that your headquarters, the Nightshade Mystic Market, was recently pilfered. The serpent's voice abruptly turned frigid, a glint of icy resolve in its eyes. I'm not dead, you don't need to attempt to deceive me. I erred once, lost my family, my friends, and all ties. This time, I won't repeat those mistakes. Just endure the apocalypse with me here. Ignorant fool. The market itself, let alone the pure-blooded families in Great Britain, is a mere fraction of the Valpurgis iceberg. The old man's mouth curled into a sneer. I've buried power in other countries. How could you possibly know everything? Also, do you wonder why I stirred just now? Oroki's pupils contracted slightly. The old man continued, that's because an entirely new power has suddenly manifested between heaven and earth. I fear another remarkable wizard is emerging in this world. The intensity of that induction today is extraordinary. It's not ordinary. Has someone truly succeeded in reviving the ancestral bloodline? Who the hell is it? I'm quite curious. A complex expression flickered in the eyes of the colossal snake. Although transformed into a snake-like soul, disconnected from the sense of heaven and earth, it recognized that the old man should not be lying about this matter. After all, the old man hadn't stirred for nearly fifty years. Without an external reason, the sudden exchange today would be peculiar. Orochi sighed anthropomorphically, as if musing to himself, I can't believe there are people in this world who can trace their ancestry back. The last time was fifty years ago, and that person only possessed less than ten percent of the bloodline power, yet it wreaked havoc on the world. This time, I don't know if it's for better or worse. That's it. I can't do anything anyway. The future of wizards, let the living wizards handle it. Salazar replied with a bittersweet tone as he realized this was not his age anymore. Hogwarts, Slytherin dormitory, housed a lavishly furnished bedroom. A strikingly handsome teenager stood with an air of unwavering poise, his gray pupils devoid of focus. He resembled a doll, bereft of soul and frozen in place. An odd occurrence unfolded in this enclosed room with its four walls, the gentlest of breezes wafted through, lifting the boy's lightly golden, neatly combed short hair. Suddenly, the young boy's eyes regained their focus, yet the expression was far from what one would expect from a boy his age. Perseverance, indifference, mercilessness, and unyielding tenacity filled his gaze. Has someone taken that step again, he murmured. Fascinating, truly fascinating. The world is forever rife with surprises. He scrutinized his hands, turning his palms up and down, and then examined his reflection in the mirror. He looks like a mere human, yet a touch too frail and delicate. His gaze shifted to the ceiling, eyes filled with depth, as if not fixed on the roof but on the boundless void beyond. Aquila flickers. Sirius dims. Draco shines, this is intriguing. Have you killed those dear to you? Truly. I am not lonely. He 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 he. Your soul, it intrigues me greatly. With these words, he eerily licked his lips, and then his eyes gradually emptied. Slowly emptied. Finally, the entire figure collapsed onto the bed. West London, Humbledon Village, Shafiq House. In this moment, Shafiq's aged residence no longer resembles the dilapidated villa of yesteryear. 
Instead, it has transformed into a glorious, pure white jade palace. Though only two stories tall, each wooden pillar and every wall boasts intricate detailing and sculptures, exuding an extraordinary style. A black carriage glided to a halt, and two women entered the villa, proceeding directly to the back garden. A black-haired girl with shoulder-length locks reclined on a mink leather chair in the white marble pavilion nestled within this garden. At first glance, she appeared to be around fourteen years old, with red lips, a graceful demeanor, and a dignified presence. However, her mismatched eyes conveyed an ageless wisdom, as if capable of piercing through the veil of reality. The pupils of her eyes held distinct colors, turquoise in the left eye and sea blue in the right. On all four sides of the pavilion, masked wizards in snug black attire stood guard. The robe collars and cuffs were adorned with embroidered red dragons. Wands held firmly in hand as they secured the pavilion. The two arriving guests wasted no time. One, possessing a slender figure veiled lightly, sported a wizard's robe embroidered with the Selwyn family emblem, a powerhouse within today's wizarding world. Even the senior deputy minister of the United States Ministry of Magic, Umbridge, sought alignment with this influential family. This guest was none other than the low-key Mrs. Selwyn. The other displayed a curvy figure with an alluring gait and a captivating fragrance trailing her. Every movement she made exuded charm. If Skylar were present, he would easily recognize her as the universally acknowledged beauty of the wizarding world, Mrs. Shabini. These two individuals stand as both formidable and affluent figures. Upon entering the pavilion, they adopt surprisingly modest and solemn postures, uttering, Let us see your lord. The girl, lounging on the bed chair, gazes lazily at the midnight sky, a smile playing on her lips. She remarks, Look at my hair, it's transformed from brown to black, and my pupils have turned heterochromatic. How does it suit me? Mrs. Selwyn and Mrs. Shabini, cautious in their responses, hesitate in the momentary silence. Observing them, the girl's lips lift slightly. You don't have to be so reserved with me. I owe my return to your assistance. Mrs. Shabini, breaking the silence, inquires, My lord, have you truly returned? The girl replies faintly, not entirely. The physical transformation has been relatively smooth, but the soul's merging progresses sluggishly. The willpower of my descendant proves stronger than anticipated. She resists vehemently, though with her fragile soul, resistance is futile. It's merely a matter of time. Both Mrs. Shabini and Mrs. Selwyn express joy. Congratulations, sir. We wish for your swift return. The girl dismisses their congratulations with a wave. Regrettably, time is not on our side. Mrs. Selwyn inquires cautiously, What do you mean, my lord? After a brief contemplation, the girl responds, I've been feeling restless lately, and an ominous sense of threat has emerged. I believe someone has taken that step again. Mrs. Selwyn couldn't contain her surprise. She understood the gravity associated with the, that step, mentioned by the girl. Forgive my impertinence, my lord, Mrs. Selwyn asks with respect after regaining her composure. Can you discern the identity of this individual? The girl shakes her head, remarking, I'm not omniscient, but the identity of this person is inconsequential. What matters is that time is running out. I must expedite the merging of my soul to truly return. Mrs. Shabini offers, What can we do for you, my lord? Please enlighten us. The girl smiles, expressing satisfaction. My descendant's tenacity surpasses my expectations. A fourteen-year-old girl doesn't naturally possess such fortitude. I suspect there's an obsession in her heart. The consciousness born from this obsession has given her the resilience to confront me. I presume she has someone she cares for, doesn't she? Mrs. Shabini confirms, yes, according to my son's information, she shares a close bond with the young master of the Malfoy family at school, and their relationship is emotionally charged. I want my descendant to succumb to her confrontational mindset, and the quickest way, the girl's eyes reveal a cruelty uncharacteristic of her age. It's nothing more than to eliminate her obsession. Devise a plan to bring the Malfoy boy to me. In the heart of Borneo's jungle in Southeast Asia lies a concealed cave, teeming with fantastical creatures, entities unseen in the wizarding world before. Among them are the gorgon serpents entwined in its hair, the colossal centipede, hundred eyes, adorned with a hundred vigilant eyes, and the naga, 
a female humanoid with six arms, a serpentine lower body, and a snake tail. Within this eerie cavern, a wizard immerses himself in a blood-red pool, surrounded by the lifeless bodies of the peculiar creatures he has conjured. Ha ha ha, he cackles maniacally, his eyes ablaze with madness. Excellent. Godlot, you traitor, for stealing my wand, you merit death at the hands of your son. Gryffindor, that sword feud remains etched in my memory. Malfoy, you vile schemer, resorting to underhanded tactics. And Cleona, Morrigan. Each one of you. I remember. I won't forget. The disgrace you've heaped upon me. Centuries of seclusion. Rising from the blood pool, his robust frame bears the marks of numerous harrowing ordeals, evident in the shocking scars that mar his body. A monstrous arrogance emanates from him, and the grotesque creatures surrounding him sense the impending pressure, their shrieks and cries reverberating through the cave. You, Great Britain, Hogwarts, Greengrass, wait for me. I, Egbert Egbert, have returned. Skylar jolted awake, his breath catching as he emerged from the grip of a haunting nightmare. What was that? Is it only a dream? Skylar asked to himself with his hand grasping his chest tightly. His eyes opened to a dystopian landscape. What was once a serene blue sky now bore the gruesome hue of blood, marred by ominous grey clouds. The air reeked of death, and even the breeze carried a saline tinge. The ground lay barren, consumed by large black flames that devoured everything in their path. Above, a colossal black dragon wreaked havoc, its roars echoing with malevolence as it spewed black flames into the apocalyptic sky. Before Skylar stood a formidable figure, a wizard with a coat of thick, black fur that gleamed with a metallic sheen. Towering like a half-blood giant, he bellowed commands, leading a grotesque horde of monsters. Behind Skylar, a noseless man emitted a sinister, echoing laughter. In his wake, a legion of masked individuals, accompanied by dementors, werewolves, giants, and lifeless corpses, formed a nightmarish army. Skylar, alone and bewildered, looked down, only to find the lifeless bodies of Daphne, Astoria, Morag, Lucius, and Narcissa sprawled at his feet. The bloodstains on their motionless forms conveyed the stark reality of their demise. A visceral scream tore from Skylar's throat, his eyes ablaze with disbelief and despair. No, he cried out to the heavens. This can't be real. The nightmarish tableau shattered, dissolving into fragments. The black dragon, the half-giant wizard, and the noseless figure vanished. A nebulous black shadow lingered before him, its true form elusive. Abruptly, Dumbledore materialized, his face stained with blood, a look of anguish etched across his features. Skylar, why is it like this that what have you done that what have you changed that IT shouldn't be like this? he uttered, his words laden with pain and confusion. Before Skylar could respond, Dumbledore's visage transformed once again, this time into Meredith's face. Two glistening trails of tears adorned her eyes. Skylar, have you forgotten me? Have you always been lying to me? No, no. Skylar protested, but Meredith's countenance shifted once more, assuming Draco's face. Fear etched Draco's features as he implored, Skylar, run. Run. Leave me alone. It's all my fault. I asked for everything. You don't care about me anymore. Run, run. What are you talking about? Skylar was still trying to comprehend when Draco's eyes suddenly blazed with fierceness. He shouted wildly, Die. Astoria should have belonged to me. Skylar glanced down at his abdomen, where Draco had thrust the dagger. Blood oozed from the wound, causing pain but the emotional anguish cut even deeper. Tears streamed down Skylar's face as he pleaded, No, it's not like that. Brother, listen to me. A wave of weakness overcame him. Skylar, clutching his wound, sank to the ground. You. Why? Unwillingness and anger surged within him. He felt the magic swirling around him, urging him to unleash it all. Release everything. Skylar gazed at his hands, witnessing them enveloped in a dark aura once again. You forced me. Avada Kedavra. Skylar roared with all his might, pointing his wand at the shadow. With a resounding blast, the shadow transformed into Hermione's face. Her eyes widened, brimming with bitterness and despair. Skylar. So it's true. Can't we be friends after all? 
she collapsed into Skylar's arms, an inexplicable light in her eyes. With great effort, she raised her hand, touching Skylar's face. She spoke with anger, Skylar, I don't blame you. I know your heart. To die by your hand, it's everything I ever wished for. Her eyes closed, and her arm dropped weakly. Uneasy, desperation, fear, helplessness, powerlessness, a myriad of negative emotions crushed Skylar. A familiar voice echoed in his ears, TSK TSK, have you killed your beloved and gained unparalleled power? How does it taste? My child. Skylar abruptly looked up, attempting to discern the speaker. Then, he woke up. It was just a dream. What kind of dream was that? Skylar felt the urge to throw the pillow across the room vigorously. Touching his sweat-drenched body, he decided to take a shower in the bathroom. Although a cleaning spell would be faster and more convenient, a warm bath could relax him, help him clear his mind, and allow him to organize his thoughts. Skylar hummed a tune as he lathered soap on himself, but a sense of indescribable unease lingered in his heart. He knew it must be connected to that dream. Can't let it go, huh? No wonder everything in the dream felt so real, and those negative emotions were akin to personal experiences. After putting on his nightgown, he glanced at the inviting bed, hesitating for a few seconds. Sighing, he recognized his own nature. Without unraveling the enigma of this inexplicable dream, he wouldn't be able to sleep peacefully. Sitting on the edge of the bed, he retrieved an elixir from his suitcase space, brought it to his lips, and took a sip. Fortunately, Skylar had the support of Sister Juliana and the Medieval European Wizards Association, otherwise, he wouldn't dare to squander such an expensive and rare potion. Reflecting on this, he felt grateful for accepting the invitation of the Medieval European Wizards Association. There wasn't much of the blessing potion left, and Skylar estimated that he would need more soon. Considering writing to Sister Juliana again to inquire about obtaining another bottle seemed like a wise decision. Given that Professor Slughorn owed him a favor, asking him might be a good option. As for attempting to self-refine the potion? That idea seemed absurd. The materials were hard to come by, and the refining process was excessively time-consuming. After drinking the blessing potion, he closed his eyes, contemplating the dream. What crucial details had he missed? Abruptly, he opened his eyes, leaped up, and rushed to his private book bag. Indeed, there was an anomaly in one of the books. It seemed to come alive, with a faint brilliance flowing on the book cover, emanating powerful magical fluctuations. The Secret of Cutting-Edge Black Magic Skylar vividly recalled that this book originated from the secret room of the Black family. It contained the secrets of Horcruxes, and Sirius' brother Regulus had used it to unveil Voldemort's greatest secrets. Skylar had read this book a long time ago, learning the unforgivable curses from it. Could there be a detail in the book that he had missed? Turning the first page, he encountered the preface in a wicked manner. The entire side had a blank page, featuring a triangular fold in the lower right corner. Skylar opened the fold, revealing the author's name, Egbert, written in a fly-sized font. A thoughtful expression crossed Skylar's face. Was this what his dream wanted to tell him all along? The revival of the old dark wizard that brought chaos into the wizarding world. The blessing agent doesn't enhance luck, rather, it heightens sensitivity to environmental changes, making it easier to spot overlooked details. Trusting his instincts, Skylar believed the agent had purposefully guided him to this revelation. Reflecting on his current circumstances, Skylar, like many Harry Potter enthusiasts, initially viewed Voldemort as the ultimate villain in the magical world. However, being physically present in this realm revealed the profound complexities hidden within magical society. Entities such as the Shadow Dragon, the Ghost Society, the Knights of Valpurgis, the Nightshade Mystic Market, and even the seemingly prestigious Malfoy family all possessed remarkable legacies. Skylar recognized that his thought process had been influenced by the so-called knowledge from his previous life, leading him into a conceptual misunderstanding. Who asserted that only Voldemort held the knowledge of creating Horcruxes? The method had become a lost mystery, but Voldemort's ability to study it demonstrated that others could as well. The author of the book, Egbert, was a testament to this fact. The great evil Egbert, a wizard known for combat prowess, had not only invented the method but was still alive, 
an insight that Schuyler needed to internalize, free from the biases of his past and present perspectives. One of the most renowned battles in history was the decisive encounter known as the Marek the Villain Battle. This pivotal event unfolded towards the close of the 11th century when the leader of the three Peveril brothers had just crafted the Elder Wand. Eager to test its might, he engaged in a duel, emerged victorious, and later revealed the Wand's formidable powers in a drunken state at a bar. Tragically, that very night, he fell victim to an assassination, merely by touching a door. In the ensuing month, the Elder Wand became the focal point of a fierce struggle, sparking a chaotic storm that eventually placed it in the hands of the infamous Dark Wizard of the time, Emmerich the Evil. Emmerich, the villain, proved to be a formidable adversary, wielding the Elder Wand's power with the ferocity of a tiger. Several Dark Wizards seeking to claim the Wand fell before him. Many believed that with his strength, Emmerich would become the new master of the Elder Wand. Unexpectedly, the great evil Egbert entered the scene, boldly challenging Emmerich. With astonishing strength, Egbert launched a one-sided slaughter against Emmerich. This feat garnered global acclaim and established Egbert as the first to defeat the Elder Wand's possessor through sheer prowess. This record held for years until Dumbledore, in the aftermath of defeating Grindelwald, replicated the astounding achievement. However, Schuyler was aware of Egbert's tragic fate. Egbert's violent actions, refusing to show allegiance to either side, led him to ruthlessly eliminate anyone who opposed him. Eventually, Gryffindor, driven by an overwhelming sense of justice, could no longer stand idly by, abandoning his duties at Hogwarts to challenge Egbert from a distance. The two engaged in a honorable duel, resulting in Gryffindor's defeat. Yet, Gryffindor not only managed to retreat under the Elder Wand's might but also delivered a sword strike to the great evil Egbert's shoulder. However, the tragedy for the great evil Egbert was about to unfold. On his way back, he fell prey to an ambush orchestrated by several formidable wizards. These sorcerers concealed their identities behind a cunning disguise. Despite their attempts at secrecy, their diverse magical practices, ranging from black and white magic to elemental, transformation, and even druid magic, betrayed the fact that both dark and light wizards were involved. Already wounded and significantly drained, Egbert valiantly persisted through his severe injuries, forging a dangerous path. Seeking refuge, he made his way to his apprentice, Godlot, hoping to find solace and plan his revenge. Much to his dismay, his most trusted disciple turned out to be the ultimate betrayer. Hogwarts had just been established at that time, and the master-apprentice system still prevailed in the magical world. The bond between a master and apprentice was akin to that of a parent and child. Hence, the great evil Egbert never fathomed that his beloved apprentice would betray him for the Elder Wand. Godlot killed the great evil Egbert in a shocking turn of events. Not only did he seize possession of the Elder Wand, but he also shamelessly claimed the inheritance secrets as his own. Under a new guise, Godlot transformed the stolen knowledge into a work passed down under his name, known as the Most Poisonous Magic. Certainly, now that Schuyler is aware of the author of Cutting Edge Black Magic Revealed, he speculates further on the great evil Egbert's hidden agenda at that time. It's likely that Egbert, being the mastermind behind the creation of the Horcrux, kept at least one card up his sleeve. He deliberately withheld the knowledge of the Horcrux from his apprentice, Godlot, and maintained secrecy about his own invincibility. Despite losing his old wand, Egbert remains alive. Notably, Godlot, although aware of the existence of Horcruxes, omitted any mention of them in Poisonous Magic. This suggests an incomplete inheritance, as the level of black magic in Poisonous Magic is significantly inferior to that found in The Secret of Cutting Edge Black Magic. This raises a critical question, if the great evil Egbert is still alive, where might he be hiding? The possibility of dealing with not only Voldemort's seven Horcruxes but an additional one becomes a daunting prospect. Schuyler is also reminded of another intriguing aspect regarding Horcruxes. In a past interview, J.K. Rowling mentioned an ancient Greek wizard named Herpo the Fowl, notorious for being the first person in history to create a Horcrux successfully. Curiously, there's no record of the destruction of his Horcruxes. Schuyler contemplates whether Herpo might still be alive and questions his whereabouts and silence with such formidable magical strength. This uncertainty leaves Schuyler somewhat irritated, sensing that these ancient wizards might resurface sooner or later. What concerns him the most is their connection to the Shadow Dragon, the Ghost Society, the Knights of Valpurgis, and the Nightshade Mystic Market. 
these contemplations give Schuyler a headache, anticipating the potential challenges ahead. The days unfolded in a routine manner for Schuyler, revolving around attending classes, delving into academic pursuits, and actively participating in the Dragon Club's activities. While he gained a basic understanding of the Book of Ancient Dragon language, the absence of ancient dragon power in his bloodline made him realistic about the feasibility of casting spells in the ancient dragon language. Recognizing the wisdom of avoiding biting off more than he could chew, Skylar abandoned the study of black magic, redirecting his focus toward transfiguration. Leveraging his disguise Magus bloodline power and the black family's secrets, including the taboo transfiguration and hundred changed thousands of magic secret art, he secured a unique advantage in the realm of transformation art. Not to be forgotten was his commitment to assisting Chang Chiu with the Chang family's secret transfiguration technique. Additionally, Skylar remained dedicated to the study of space magic and Guruni spells, although scarce learning resources hindered notable progress in these areas. Amidst these academic pursuits, Serpentis Vigil, the clandestine organization he led, flourished with four successful exchange activities. Under Schuyler's guidance, members showed substantial improvement in academic performance and practical skills. Astoria and Carlo emerged as formidable second-grade students, contributing significantly to Slytherin College's points tally. As the calendar flipped to October 23, a notable event loomed on the horizon a lesson in the protection of magical animals at Hagrid's hut. Standing tall with his characteristic hound-tooth collar, Hagrid awaited his students, wooden boxes emitting curious sounds and faint explosions beside him. This semester, Hagrid has undertaken the fascinating task of instructing students about a magical creature he fondly refers to as fried snails. This unique species is a result of Hagrid's artificial cultivation, achieved through the intricate crossbreeding of manticores and fire crabs. These creatures resemble deformed, shelled, large lobsters, presenting a rather grotesque appearance. Colored in a dull gray, they exude a slimy texture and possess a disorganized arrangement of limbs, making it challenging to discern their heads. The air around them is tainted with a potent odor reminiscent of stinky fish and shrimp. Periodically, sparks emanate from their tails, followed by a faint pop, propelling them forward a few inches. Despite nearly two months having passed since the commencement of the school year, the students remain puzzled about the dietary preferences of these peculiar beings. Hagrid, however, is pleased about his involvement in this project. He encourages students to visit his cabin every other day to observe the snails and document their unconventional behaviors meticulously. Draco, expressing clear reluctance, declines Hagrid's suggestion, stating, I've seen enough of these unpleasant things in class, thank you. Hagrid's initial smile fades as he insists, follow my instructions. This is part of your homework, and everyone must participate. What makes you think you have the privilege to exempt yourselves? Blaze responds with a disdainful sneer, recalling the trouble he caused Headmaster Dumbledore last semester. Hagrid, feeling the surge of anger, glares at Blaze and demands an explanation, what do you mean? Draco supports Blaze's skepticism, questioning the purpose of raising these creatures. Blaze adds, you had no choice but to answer as a professor. It's already a dereliction of duty. At the time, you claimed it was the content of the next class. We've been in school for almost two months, and despite these creatures having grown considerably, you still haven't figured out the answer. How did you even become a professor? Are you embarrassed? Blaze remarked. Just because they don't look appealing doesn't mean they're useless, Hermione couldn't hold back and retorted, standing up. Fire dragon blood has magical effects, but would you keep a fire dragon as a pet? Draco responded coldly, Granger, I let you go last time because of my brother. Are you still picking fights? You can call Potter and Wesley whatever you want. Let's find a time, I'll take on the three of you one by one. Once again, the familiar scene unfolded, causing Skylar a headache. He couldn't discern Draco's motives in deliberately bringing up events from the last semester. The passage of time had made those incidents seem distant, and Skylar doubted Draco's sincerity, suspecting an attempt to tarnish his reputation. Before Skylar could respond, Harry and the others grew restless. Ron, particularly sensitive about his perceived inferiority, felt insulted. His face flushed with anger as he drew out his wand, declaring, If you want to fight, I'm not afraid of anyone. No need to delay it, draw your wands now. Only you. Draco sneered coldly, slowly drawing out his wand. Let Potter join you, 
I wouldn't want to be accused of bullying the weak. In the midst of the tension, Hermione felt a pang of panic, torn between her loyalty to Ron and Harry and the memory of the previous semester's events. Draco and Blaze were clearly provoking a confrontation, but her recollection of past incidents restrained her from making a hasty decision. She bit her lower lip, casting a glance at Harry and Ron who awaited her response, a bitter feeling welling up within her. The word Skylar uttered in defense against the dark arts class resonated in her heart. His familiar and resonant voice echoed, as if speaking directly to her soul, in order to protect those around her, she had to give up a friendship. I wonder if I truly have become enemies with Slytherin, she mused, a sense of irretrievability settling in her heart. It's nothing. This whole mess started because of me. My excessive talking caused all of this, and I'll bear the consequences, she thought, a pang of remorse coursing through her. Fueled by this realization, Hermione positioned herself in front of Harry and Ron, drawing her wand. Malfoy. This has nothing to do with Harry and Ron. If you want to fight, I'll face you alone. Her words projected dominance, but her trembling wand betrayed the uncertainty of a duelist. Draco wore a contemptuous expression, his gaze fixed on Hermione's wand. Slowly, almost in slow motion, he raised his own wand. Skylar frowned, sensing Draco's scrutiny. Though Draco seemed to be looking at the trio in front, he was, in fact, peering at Skylar himself. The once arrogant Draco now appeared hesitant, refraining from initiating the attack as he had in the past. He seemed to be waiting for the opponent to make the first move. Examining Hermione's stance, it became evident that Draco was compelling her to take the lead, likely intending to overpower her effortlessly. Hagrid's loud roar echoed, What's the matter with you? Don't you recognize me as your professor? He attempted to stride forward and intervene, but an imposing figure obstructed his path. Blaze toyed with the magic wand in his hand, speaking in a soft tone, Professor Hagrid, while we address you as a professor, it seems our confidence in your knowledge and teaching prowess is under scrutiny. How about? A mysterious glint shone in Blaze's eyes, and a wry smile played on the corners of his mouth. I want to challenge you, Professor, to ascertain if you're truly formidable enough to hold this title. It's Professor Hagrid for you, you jerk. Hagrid blurted out in frustration. Being questioned about his professorial qualifications was the last thing he wanted to deal with, especially given the potential consequences for Harry and the others. The Malfoy brothers were formidable adversaries, and in his anger and impatience, Hagrid struggled to find a solution. Let's not quarrel. Regardless of what Professor Hagrid may have said, they are all professors, legitimately hired professors, Schuyler interjected. Brother, Blaze, I believe we should maintain a more respectful tone. When a professor speaks, it compromises the nobility of our family. Schuyler paused to take a bite and then continued, regarding the matter at hand, Miss Granger's words do carry some weight. I've learned some insider information from Professor Dumbledore. The Ministry of Magic bred the snails for magical animal purposes, and the license issued by the control department indicates their use in the Triwizard Tournament. So, they're not entirely useless. I suggest we heed Professor Hagrid's instructions and raise them diligently. Indeed, as soon as the mention of the Triwizard Tournament's inside story surfaced, the attention of the young wizards immediately shifted. Several individuals began expressing interest in the snails, engaging in hushed conversations. Their curiosity was piqued, eager to uncover the role of the snails in the Triwizard Tournament and speculate on the events in which these magical creatures might be involved. Draco's eyes betrayed a mix of emotions, briefly displaying a complex look. He feigned a touch of dissatisfaction with a cold snort before turning away. Wearing a mischievous smile, Blaze said, Certainly, Skylar, we're all ears. The other Slytherin students cast glances between Draco and Skylar, perplexed by the unspoken tension, rendering them momentarily silent. Skylar shook his head, directing the Slytherin wizards to employ the floating spell to separate half of the snails into individual boxes. This method aimed to minimize the risk of injury by allowing them to focus on feeding one snail at a time. Recalling the original book, Skylar noted that they had grown up to a substantial length of ten feet despite not discovering the preferred diet of fried snails. Observing Slytherin's approach, Gryffindor's students attempted to replicate the method. However, their floating spells proved less proficient. 
Dean Thomas suffered a few stings, and Seamus Finnegan nearly triggered an explosive reaction from a fried snail. Quickly reacting, Hagrid intervened swiftly, grabbing the creature and tossing it away. After much hesitation, Hermione summoned the courage to approach Skylar, expressing gratitude, Mr. Malfoy, thank you. Skylar sighed, meeting Hermione's gaze, and responded, no need to thank me. I don't hold you responsible for this. I need to apologize for my brother. Let's not dwell on it. Skylar recognized the situation well, Draco initiated the provocation, ostensibly targeting Hagrid but likely aiming for the Potter trio or even himself. If there's nothing else, Skylar heard Daphne's call and promptly excused himself, saying, my companions are calling me, I'll head over. Observing Skylar's departing figure, Hermione pursed her lips. Not one to overlook her own actions, she couldn't shake the feeling that she had once again caused trouble for Skylar, even if the specifics eluded her. Why do I always end up causing problems? Hermione's mood shifted to irritability in an instant. Recalling the last falling out with Skylar, she acknowledged her inability to control her emotions. Despite Skylar's seeming lack of sympathy at the time, she realized he had no obligation to protect her. Biting her lower lip tightly, Hermione internally vowed, there will be no next time. Absolutely. I've relied on you so much. Every time I'm in danger or hurt, you're there to help and comfort me, Hermione resolved silently. I've had enough. Next time, I'll handle it on my own. You owe me that. After the magical animal protection class concluded, the young wizards made their way back to the castle, where the hall buzzed with activity. A prominent notice caught their attention at the base of the marble staircase. What are they looking at? Daphne inquired curiously. Seeing the announcement, Skylar could clearly discern its contents and explained, it's about the Triwizard Tournament. Let me read it for you. The representatives of Bose Batons and Durmstrang will arrive at 6 o'clock in the evening on Friday, October 30th. Afternoon classes will conclude half an hour earlier. Students are expected to return their school bags and textbooks to the dormitory, assemble in front of the castle, greet our guests, and then attend the welcome banquet. Only a week. Daphne's eyes sparkled. Skylar, do you plan to participate in the competition? Skylar couldn't deny it. Let's see first. I need to understand how Dumbledore plans to select adult wizards. Honestly, I'm not confident about breaking the barrier set by the strongest wizards of our time. Will this going to be the right step for Skylar to take to prevent the nightmarish vision he just dreamt of? Or will this contribute to another step toward the destruction that he has been fighting hard to avoid of? The notice displayed in the entrance hall had a profound impact on the castle's inhabitants. Over the following week, it seemed that no matter where Skylar went, the only topic of conversation was the Triwizard Tournament. Rumors circulated rapidly among the students like an infectious contagion, discussions about who would compete as a champion for Hogwarts, the nature of the events in the competition, and the distinctions among the students from Bose Batons and Durmstrang. Skylar also observed a thorough cleaning underway throughout the castle. Numerous grimy portraits were vigorously scrubbed, much to the discontent of the subjects. They huddled in their frames, grumbling with irritation, wincing every time the scrubbing revealed pink, tender flesh on their faces. Even the suits of armor underwent a transformation, now gleaming and no longer emitting a cacophony of sounds as they moved. Filch erupted in a fury at the sight of a student who had forgotten to clean their shoes, terrifying two first-year girls into hysterics. The other faculty members appeared equally on edge. Goyle, Crab, give it your all. Don't embarrass yourselves in front of the Durmstrang guests. Show them that you can at least master a simple transfiguration spell. Professor McGonagall's sharp rebuke rang out as the class was drawing to a close, leaving the young wizards and witches with ears aching from her stern words. Finally, October 30th arrived. As they descended for breakfast that morning, the students discovered that the Great Hall had undergone a remarkable overnight transformation. Gigantic silk banners adorned the walls, each representing a Hogwarts house, Gryffindor with a red background and a majestic golden lion, Ravenclaw with a blue background and a regal bronze eagle, Hufflepuff featuring a yellow background and a determined black badger, and Slytherin showcasing a green background with a sleek silver serpent. Above the faculty desk hung the largest banner, displaying the Hogwarts school badge, a unified emblem featuring the lion, eagle, badger, and snake, 
encircled by a prominent letter H. Throughout the entire day, no academic lessons took place, the anticipation of the impending Triwizard Tournament overshadowing all other activities. As the afternoon waned, students hastily donned their robes and assembled in the hall. While chaos reigned among the other three houses, Slytherin's young wizards had already formed orderly queues. Descending the steps, the students lined up before the castle as the chilly evening set in. The night loomed, and a pristine moon cast its glow over the forbidden forest. Following the predetermined schedule, the students from Bose Batons and Durmstrang were expected to arrive promptly at six o'clock. A minute before the appointed time, Dumbledore's voice resonated from behind the crowd, if I'm not mistaken, the representatives from Bose Batons have arrived. A colossal object, much larger than a flying broomstick, indeed, larger than a hundred flying broomsticks, soared through the deep blue sky towards the castle, gradually growing in size. As the black behemoth passed over the treetops of the forbidden forest and came into view beneath the castle's illuminated windows, onlookers beheld a massive pink and blue carriage approaching. This colossal vehicle, resembling a house in size, was drawn by twelve winged horses. All these horses boasted silver manes and were each the size of an elephant. These horses were known as Abraxans, the other version of Pegasus as we know it. The difference between an Abraxan and a Pegasus would be their massive size. The carriage descended rapidly, hurtling toward the ground with astonishing speed. The students positioned in the initial three rows hastily retreated as a resounding crash reverberated. The horses' hooves thundered upon impact, sending vegetables flying from the massive plates they carried. In an instant, the carriage settled on the ground, its colossal wheels quivering, while the golden horses vigorously shook their colossal heads, their large red eyes whirling. Adorning the carriage door was the emblem of Bosbaton's school of witchcraft and wizardry, two golden crossed wands, each adorned with three stars. Stepping out of the carriage was a woman, roughly the same height as Hagrid, Ms. Olymp Maxime is the headmistress of Bosbaton's school of witchcraft and wizardry. Following her, twelve young male and female students disembarked, arranging themselves behind Ms. Maxim. By their appearance, they seemed to be around eighteen or nineteen years old, and a subtle tremor ran through them. This was hardly surprising, given the delicate silk robes they wore without any cloaks. Some students had wrapped their heads in scarves or turbans, all gazing up at Hogwarts with quivering expressions. Skylar couldn't help but sigh. Checking the local climate and temperature before embarking on a journey is common sense, isn't it? The intelligence of this group of wizards is indeed concerning. Even if you purposely opt for silk robes to showcase your French fashion taste, you could include a thermostat function. Constant temperature clothing isn't a high-end and expensive item. As a representative of a school, every action and mannerism reflects the image and prestige of the institution. Shivering in the cold for the sake of a stylish dress won't leave a positive impression. Is there an issue with the delegation's representative? Dumbledore and Maxim exchanged quiet words for a while, and then directed the Hogwarts students to create a pathway, allowing Bosbaden's delegation to enter the castle first. After another half hour, even the Hogwarts students began to shiver from the cold. Skylar, Daphne, and Nestoria observed the trembling crowd nonchalantly. The two sisters had already donned the thermostatic robes that Skylar purchased for them. These robes boasted numerous functions. Though not on the level of Supreme Wizard's robes, they were still unique high-end items. Of course, Morag, part of the Ravenclaw team, also possessed a set, making her the envied individual among Ravenclaw. Draco withdrew his wand and swiftly cast the flame-freezing charm on those around him, offering them some relief. Skylar narrowed his eyes slightly. The flame-freezing charm wasn't challenging to learn, but it was an uncommon spell. In the original book, even with Hermione's erudition, she didn't master it, opting for the incendio spell with few modifications to stay warm. The principle involved transforming a small blue flame into a bottle, providing warmth. Draco's actions left Skylar increasingly perplexed. At times, Skylar felt as if Draco was an entirely different person. Whether it was his cunning or strength, he harbored this impression. Yet, Draco would occasionally revert to the naive, impulsive, trouble-seeking, and seemingly normal strength persona. At that moment, an eerie and resonant noise emanated from the darkness, a muffled rumbling and suction, akin to a colossal submarine gliding along the shore. The students stood on the grassy knoll, their gaze fixed on the expansive field, 
and a surreal scene unfolded before them. The Black Lake's once placid and shadowy surface began to ripple, evolving into a sudden upheaval that sent massive waves crashing along the damp lakeshore. A colossal whirlpool materialized at the lake center, as if a gigantic plug had been abruptly removed from the lake's depths. A black mast emerged slowly from the whirlpool, followed by the sail rigging. Gradually, a magnificent ship ascended from the water, illuminated by the moonlight. Its appearance was otherworldly, resembling a skeletal structure, as if it were the remnants of a sunken ship freshly salvaged. The portholes emitted a dim, misty light, resembling ghostly eyes. Finally, with the sound of splashing water, the grand vessel fully emerged, gently riding the undulating water surface as it set course for the lake's shore. This was the fabled ghost ship. The ghost ship, a legendary alchemical creation with a storied reputation, stood alongside the Deathly Hallows, the Philosopher's Stone, and Eris's magic mirror in magical lore. Skylar scrutinized the ship intently. To his knowledge, the ghost ship was a highly sophisticated alchemical product. Only two such vessels existed in the wizarding world, besides Durmstrang, the other sailed the Caribbean Sea under the moniker, Flying Dutchman. This isn't merely a conventional mode of transportation, it boasts formidable and all-encompassing combat capabilities, essentially functioning as a mobile fortress. Schuyler had once come across a tale from the early 19th century where the Flying Dutchman had earned favor from a senior member of the Magical Congress of the United States. Leading a group of exceptional aurors in a sea ambush, they were unable to lay eyes on the adversary, as a single shot from the opponent's magical cannon instilled enough fear to force a hasty retreat. Fueling Schuyler's suspicion was the ship's nomenclature, Flying Dutchman. He speculated that the ghost ship might possess the ability to soar through the skies. Even if his conjecture was incorrect, the ghost ship's inability to take flight didn't diminish its brilliance. Take the Durmstrang ghost ship as an example, it could alter its form while traversing vast distances by utilizing the water surface as a medium. Drawing on Schuyler's understanding of space magic, he deduced a principle akin to the FLU network, except the medium transitioned from fire to water. This feat alone was no small accomplishment. Given that a significant portion of the earth is covered by water, the ship could navigate any water surface, expanding the breadth of its destinations. It could also transport large objects across expansive water bodies, such as a freshwater lake, an undertaking that the flu network might not even be capable of accomplishing with someone as large as Hagrid. Indeed, this seemed like an intriguing avenue for research. Schuyler pondered, recalling that in the original narrative, Hagrid had only made mention of flying motorcycles and night buses. Could it be that Hagrid was entirely inept when it came to utilizing the flu network? Disregarding the convenience factor, the Flying Dutchman enjoyed the liberty of unrestricted movement at sea for an extended period, employing a method beyond the Ministry of Magic scrutiny. In this context, the ghost ship's shape-shifting capabilities were evidently superior to the flu network. Hence, apart from convenience, the ghost ship also held the advantage of concealment. This explained why, even in the present day, the magical authorities of various nations remained powerless against the Flying Dutchman, and the identity of its owner remained an enigma. On the flip side, Karkaroff's approach appeared rather obtuse, he possessed a veritable treasure but failed to leverage its potential. If he could cultivate loyal followers among the students and rely on the ghost ship solely for escape, evading Voldemort's pursuit, who could trace the dark mark, would be a more formidable challenge. Karkaroff seldom displayed strategic prowess, and rare were the occasions when he took the top-tier students abroad to engage with other magical schools. The opportunity to forge stronger teacher-student relationships presented itself, yet he chose to indulge in the cabin, relegating the students to serve as mere laborers aboard the ship. It was no wonder that no student felt a twinge of sympathy for him following his demise. Indeed, it could be asserted that the primary challenge with the ghost ship lay in its operational complexity. Evidently, this was not an alchemical item designed for solo operation. Judging from the Durmstrang scenario, a minimum of 12 individuals was required to manipulate it effectively. As the ghost ship dropped anchor and came to a halt, 13 Durmstrang representatives, clad in thick fur cloaks, strolled out of the cabin. At the forefront was an elderly man with white hair and a goatee, warmly exchanging handshakes with Dumbledore, evidently, the headmaster Igor Karkaroff. The arrival of the Durmstrang students triggered a mild sensation within the Hogwarts crowd. 
It was apparent that some individuals recognized the Durmstrang student position behind Karkarov as none other than the renowned chaser Viktor Krum of the Bulgarian national team. After the exchange of pleasantries between Dumbledore and Karkarov concluded, the weary young wizards, who had endured the chilly wait, could finally retreat to the welcoming warmth of the hall. Durmstrang's delegation proceeded into the castle alongside the Hogwarts students, and upon entering the auditorium, the Hogwarts students took their seats at their designated long tables. Observing the scene, it became apparent that the Bozbaton students opted to sit at Ravenclaw's long table. Once settled, they surveyed the auditorium with somber expressions. Notably, three female students, discernible by their physical shapes, still tightly wrapped their heads in scarves and turbans. Durmstrang's delegation lingered near the entrance, seemingly unsure of where to seat themselves. After settling down, Goyle expressed his disbelief, I can't believe it. It's Crumb, Draco. Victor Crumb. Several young wizards surreptitiously cast glances at the Durmstrang representatives, with the Bulgarian national team seeker, Victor Crumb, drawing the most attention. As they observed Crumb up close, his striking hook nose, thick black eyebrows, and overall gloomy demeanor became apparent. With a hint of pretentiousness, Draco remarked, For God's sake, Goyle, he's just a Quidditch player. However, Draco's own attention belied his nonchalant words. In an exaggerated tone, Pansy said, That's crumb. Do you think he might use lipstick to sign my hat? Audrey Runcorn and Tracy Davis engaged in a lively debate about lipstick, completely absorbed in their conversation. Meanwhile, Skyler was also observing the Durmstrang group, but his focus was not on crumb, rather, it was on the sole woman in the Durmstrang delegation. Contrary to expectations, Skylar's interest was not in the woman's physical appearance, as thick fur cloaks obscured their figures. It was her magical prowess that truly captured Skylar's attention. Skylar took a deep inhale, his eyes gleaming sharply. Thanks to the body transformation brought about by the source of life, Skylar possessed a keener sense of smell than even a swallowtail dog. The scent was undeniably familiar to him the distinct aroma of alchemists, a fragrance that only those deeply entrenched in the world of alchemy might carry. This unique scent intertwined with women's perfumes, adding an extra layer of distinctiveness. Despite being several feet away, the scent cut through the amalgamation of other odors, standing out like a beacon in the darkness and easily discernible to Skylar. Simultaneously, his illuminating insight allowed him to discern the peculiarity of her magical power. While her magical potency was not weak, it roughly matched that of her Durmstrang peers, slightly inferior to Crumb. However, Skylar's magical eye perceived her aura as a gray area, an indistinct and cold sensation. He had a hunch that her magical power might be sealed by some alchemical method. If fully unleashed, her magical strength would likely surpass his own. The Durmstrang students ultimately settled on the Slytherin long table. Perhaps it was due to the alignment of aesthetics, be it in attire, demeanor, or general demeanor, with the students at the Slytherin table. The Durmstrang students cast fascinated glances at the dark, starry ceiling as they shed their heavy fur cloaks. Two of them even picked up the golden plates and goblets, inspecting them closely, clearly intrigued. Upon removing their fur cloaks, the Durmstrang students revealed average heights, akin to seventh graders at Hogwarts. However, the majority of the boys exhibited Eastern European features, characterized by rugged facial lines and uniformly trimmed military-style flat-top haircuts. This instantly conveyed the essence of Durmstrang's stringent military discipline. Crumb occupied a seat adjacent to Draco, and Skylar observed Draco, Crab, and Goyle reveling in their triumph. Leaning forward with a smug smile, Draco engaged Crumb in a hushed conversation, names Draco, the only man in Hogwarts that could show a man of your caliber a great time in Hogwarts, the two exchanged quick laughter. This camaraderie wasn't unexpected. Durmstrang, being a magic school exclusively admitting pure-blood students, embraced a management style akin to Muggle military academies. Under Karkaroff's leadership, the institution upheld high-pressure management and strict discipline, fostering an ambience saturated with pure-blood supremacy and valor. Thus, it wasn't surprising that Durmstrang students easily conversed with Slytherin counterparts. Seated across from Skylar was the female student who had captured his attention. She had shed her cloak, revealing the crimson Durmstrang uniform beneath. The attire, snugly tailored, accentuated her graceful figure with captivating curves. 
possessing mature and dignified facial features, her light blue eyes exuded wisdom and intelligence. Fair skin and rosy lips, coupled with an indifferent expression, exuded a poignant charm, making her seat the focal point of attention for all the young Slytherin wizards along the entire length of the table. However, she refrained from displaying any semblance of concern due to the onlookers surrounding her. Instead, she regarded Skylar with an intriguing gaze, her luminous azure blue pupils reflecting amusement in both her eyes and smile. Despite the notable attention Skylar received in the past, his image gracing the covers of major European media, this direct and unmasked scrutiny from the girl across the table made him feel distinctly uncomfortable. Though accustomed to recognition, he couldn't shake the sense that her placement opposite him was not a mere coincidence. Amidst the cryptic actions of the Durmstrang students purposefully avoiding a particular seat, Skylar, with the illuminating once again, couldn't help but perceive the deliberate nature of their actions. Nevertheless, upholding the courtesy befitting a noble gentleman, Skylar took the initiative to greet her, Good evening, my lady. I am Malfoy, Skylar Malfoy, representing Slytherin. Welcome to Hogwarts. I trust you'll find the environment here to your satisfaction. In response, she chuckled softly, Skylar Malfoy. Her eyes, resembling dazzling stars, held a distinct northern accent in her English, yet she spoke fluently. I've heard of you, the young master of the Malfoy family, the youngest Sir Merlin, youth representative of the Medieval European Wizarding Association, inventor of the anti-stun bracelet, and author of Me and the Basilisk at Hogwarts. I've admired your masterpiece for quite some time. It's truly a pleasure to meet you today. Oh, I almost forgot to introduce myself, my name is Eleanor von Hohenheim. Skylar's countenance shifted to a more serious expression. He is no ignorant pauper, he is well versed in the significance of the surname he now faces. The weight it carries in the international wizarding world is not lost on him. Over the past thousand years, the wizarding world has witnessed countless geniuses and peerless heroes, yet only a handful have achieved the revered status of being remembered across generations as legends of the generation. As far as Skylar's knowledge extends, five such legendary figures exist. The Venerable Mage Merlin is an undisputed member, as is the current Hogwarts headmaster, Albus Dumbledore. Nicholas Flamel, the creator of the Stone of the Sage, earns his place among them. Though not as widely recognized as the first three, the remaining two are names familiar to all wizards. Chang Gua, the Chinese master of transformation known for riding a donkey upside down, claims one spot. The other is held by an alchemist born in Switzerland and later settling in Germany, known as Paracelsus, his self-changed name from Philippus Aurelius Theophrastus Bombastus von Hohenheim. An intriguing aspect is that while Paracelsus's name is widely known, details of his accomplishments remain shrouded in mystery. Even as one of the 102 chocolate frog cards, the description merely acknowledges his proficiency in medical magic and mentions his study on the hereditary aspect of the snake whisperer's talent through blood. In contrast to the vivid depictions of Dumbledore, Merlin, and Flamel in the wizarding portraits, Paracelsus's contributions seem modest. Nevertheless, Paracelsus's legend is undeniable. In the wizarding world, two of the most common interjections among wizards are, Merlin's beard, and, thanks, Paracelsus. It becomes evident from this perspective how highly esteemed Paracelsus is in the wizarding world. Skylar also recalls a specific item on his to-do list, exploring Paracelsus's secret chamber, a task he prioritized alongside the investigation of the other six secret rooms. This revelation sheds light on many aspects. Note, Thanks Paracelsus, is not a fabrication by the author, it is from the Fantastic Beasts movie, spoken by Newt's commander, meaning, thanking God. Skylar's gaze involuntarily fixates on the family crest in the upper left corner of the girl's chest, confirming it as the badge of the Hohenheim family. Eleanor observes Skylar's reaction with satisfaction, displaying an elegant smile as she delicately plays with the golden goblet. Her jade-green fingers glide along the glass's edge, creating a subtle vibration that magically causes red wine to overflow from the seemingly empty glass. Skylar's pupils contract slightly. Transfiguration cannot conjure food out of thin air. While sorcerers can use refilling curses, expanding curses, and copying curses to multiply food and drink, creating sustenance out of nothing is beyond their abilities. However, the thing that Eleanor just showed before Skylar is something he is very familiar with, an advanced form of alchemy. 
As Skylar redirects his gaze to Eleanor's breathtakingly beautiful face, his eyes express nothing but seriousness. I must say, Eleanor, why the need for such ostentation? He's just a minor student, after all. The speaker is a robust boy seated not far from Eleanor's right. His physique resembles that of Goyle and Crab when they grow up, with rough features typical of Eastern European men. As he speaks, he slurps wine from his hip flask, a few drops staining his robe. Skylar was aware that the boy's name was Poliaco, as he had introduced himself to Daphne during their initial conversation, and Skylar overheard it. Wearing a playful smile, Skylar spoke softly, I don't see this as showing off. Miss Hohenheim, when you cast that spell just now, I uncovered a secret. Skylar smiled faintly. Oh, what's the secret? Eleanor leaned forward, bringing her face a little closer to Skylar. Soulful allure emanated from her deep blue eyes as she teased, Tell me, you're making my sister curious. Like a clever fox that had successfully raided a chicken coop, Skylar wore a sly expression as he whispered in a voice only the two of them could hear, You have the scent of necromancy. A shrewd glint flashed in Eleanor's eyes, but she maintained her smile. Impressive. You can perceive it. This is our little secret, she turned her head, glancing at Daphne and Astoria, not even your little girlfriends are allowed to know. Eleanor's candid acknowledgement didn't exceed Skylar's expectations. While the exploits of the Hornheim family were seldom discussed, the branches of alchemy, though intricate, ultimately converged toward the same objective. With Skylar's extensive knowledge of alchemy, it wasn't overly challenging to deduce the specific school of alchemy Eleanor had studied. Alchemy, in essence, aimed for the same final goals. First, immortality, then, resurrection, and the ultimate levels were beyond eternity, and, eternity, representing transcending the constraints of time and space, essentially achieving deification, another term in alchemy. Items like the Philosopher's Stone, Time Turner, and Resurrection Stone differed only in methodology, all striving toward the common goal. Certain aspects of alchemical research delve into the treatment of corpses to explore the intricate relationship between alchemy and the human body. However, despite the array of cleaning spells and potions wielded by wizards, eliminating the distinct odor from a body becomes a challenging task. You are listening to this audiobook on web novel audiobooks Tkthigud. Eleanor's faint scent of decay left only one plausible explanation, necromantic magic. Necromancy, often referred to as undead magic, stands as a magical branch intertwining black magic and alchemy. In the wizarding world, the most renowned necromantic magic involves the technique of refining and animating corpses. The Resurrection Stone, a notable example, forcibly restrains the souls of the departed and even manages to momentarily deter Voldemort in Harry's possession, an indication of its connection to this magical domain. Skylar nodded in silent acknowledgement, agreeing to uphold Eleanor's secret. The two swiftly transitioned into discussing the distinctions between their respective schools, as if the preceding exchange had never occurred. Unbeknownst to others, Skylar sensed that the narrative trajectory of the semester was growing increasingly intriguing. Soon, every student took their seats in anticipation of the upcoming event. The faculty and staff followed suit, making their way to the main guest table where Professor Dumbledore, Professor Karkaroff, and Madame Maxime took their places at the end. A moment of amusement filled the air as Bosbaden's students promptly stood up upon the arrival of their principal. Some Hogwarts students couldn't help but chuckle at the display. However, the Bosbaden students appeared unperturbed, only retaking their seats once Madame Maxime had settled on Dumbledore's left. As the noise in the auditorium gradually subsided, Dumbledore stepped forward, casting a warm smile toward the foreign students. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen ghosts, and, especially, distinguished guests, he greeted. I extend a warm welcome to you at Hogwarts. It is my sincere hope that you will find comfort and happiness during your time here. A girl from Bosbatten, still concealing her head with a tightly wrapped scarf, couldn't conceal a mocking sneer. Skylar observed her with a furrowed brow. Eleanor, who had been attentively watching Skylar, couldn't resist commenting with a playful smile, Mr. Malfoy, are you intrigued by her? She seems rather extraordinary. Skylar's discerning eyes detected unusual magical fluctuations emanating from the girl, the kind that felt non-human. These fluctuations were frequent, giving off an air of restlessness and unpredictability. It was likely the magical signature of Fleur Delacour, the renowned beauty from the original book. 
yet, what truly perplexed Skylar was another female student seated beside Fleur. When Skylar's gaze fell upon her, he was momentarily convinced that he had caught sight of a sword. The magical aura surrounding her seemed to embody a gleaming, cold, and razor-sharp blade. Even with just a passing glance, Skylar felt a subtle tingling in his eyeballs. She appeared more akin to a warrior than a wizard. Recollections of a similar description surfaced in Skylar's memory from the Silver Spear duel record provided by Sister Juliana. The document chronicled a duel marked by an individual exuding an aura of sharpness throughout their body, wielding spells with exceptional penetrating power. One instance recounted the use of a seemingly ordinary cutting spell that effortlessly pierced through a shield charm, a steel shield positioned behind the curse, and finally, the steel armor of the shield's bearer. The victim, holding the steel shield, faced near instantaneous demise, as if slashed by a keen blade, revealing even the beating heart. What manner of cutting spell is this? Skylar pondered. It was unmistakably a manifestation of swordsmanship. The record author designated the distinctive ability of this unidentified duelist as the natural-born duelist. Schuyler speculated that this was an exceedingly rare bloodline talent, one uniquely and inherently tailored for combat. It was the essence of a born duelist. Schuyler couldn't help but let a smile play on his lips, though the warmth did not quite reach his eyes. From Mad Eye Moody to Draco, and now Eleanor, coupled with this enigmatic duelist, he found it difficult to perceive their appearances as mere coincidences. A glint of determination flickered in his eyes, signaling his intent to scrutinize these unexpected arrivals, be they monsters, ghosts, or serpents. The championship will officially commence at the conclusion of the banquet, Dumbledore announced with a warm smile. I now invite everyone to indulge in the feast before us. As he took his seat, Karkaroff leaned in for a conversation. Skyler, experiencing his first Hogwarts dinner, marveled at the array of dishes before him, some undoubtedly foreign. What's that? Goyle inquired, pointing to an expansive seafood platter adjacent to the steak and kidney pudding. French fish soup, Draco proudly asserted. My house elf prepares it. Exquisite in taste, wouldn't you agree? Poliaco, in an uncharacteristic display, seized a sizable chicken leg and, without any care for the people beside him, began to feast, inadvertently splattering soup on his robes. Unperturbed, he exclaimed, it's delicious. Hogwarts fare surpasses ours, Durmstrang can't compete. Amidst the lively dining scene, a voice interjected, excuse me, would anyone be interested in this plate of mixed fish soup? Skylar's head snapped up, a puzzled expression crossing his face. This narrative seemed out of place, wasn't this storyline reserved for Fleur and Ron? Upon spotting the unexpected visitor, Skylar's bewilderment deepened. It wasn't Fleur, that much was certain. While Skylar had never encountered a genuine villa in this life, he distinctly recalled Fleur possessing beautiful, silvery hair. The girl before him, much like Lotus, removed the scarf concealing her head, revealing striking burgundy hair. A clarification is warranted here, English first coined the term redhead in the 12th century. The use of redhead to describe the Weasley family's hair color actually denotes a shade akin to orange, not true red. During that era, the term orange was primarily associated with fruit and didn't commonly describe a color until the late 15th century. Genuine red hair, scientifically speaking, doesn't exist in the natural world. It's been considered extinct since at least 1991, as red hair is a recessive gene gradually diluted through generations. While magical means of hair dyeing exist in the wizarding world, it's not a widespread practice. Wizards often prefer maintaining their natural hair color, considering it a symbol of status. The girl before Skylar sported a burgundy hair color reminiscent of the Philosopher's Stone, cradled in Skylar's arms. In the wizarding realm, only one family boasts this unique hair hue, the Moreau family, one of the twelve sacred blood families in France. Like the Malfoy family in Great Britain, the Moreau family holds significant aristocratic standing in France. Coincidentally, both families have experienced a thinning of direct descendants over the centuries, maintaining a singular bloodline. Schuyler, knowledgeable about French pure blood families, was taken aback by the evident strength emanating from the girl before him. He had never heard of the Moreau family having a precedent for awakening blood powers, especially a rare talent like the natural-born duelist that he had witnessed before. Observing Schuyler's reaction, 
Daphne and Nestoria misconstrued his fascination as admiration for the girl's beauty, expressing their discontent with subtle snorts. Eleanor interjected with laughter, Mr. Malfoy, when a lady addresses you, it's not quite a gentleman of you to stare at her in a daze. Skylar snapped back to reality, feeling a bit embarrassed. I'm truly sorry for my momentary lapse, I've already finished the mixed fish soup. Let me take the plate for you. Sure, thank you, replied the girl, her voice carrying a low and magnetic tone, sounding remarkably pleasant. Carefully, Skylar followed her to the Ravenclaw long table and handed her the plate. Once she was seated, she offered a sweet smile. Thank you again for your warm hospitality. I'm Catalina of the Moreau family. Just call me Catalina. By the way, I haven't asked for your name. Skylar gracefully inclined his head. I am Malfoy, Skylar Malfoy. Oh, you're Skylar. Catalina seemed a tad surprised. Did you know you also have quite a few fans at our Bosbatons? I didn't expect you to be so young. One of the reasons for my visit to Hogwarts this time is to meet you. Rather than responding with excessive modesty or arrogance, Skylar chose a more indifferent tone. I appreciate your kind words. I've been fortunate, and I have much more to learn. Well, I'll leave you to enjoy your meal. Have a pleasant evening. Returning to his seat, Draco smirked at Skylar. You seem quite intriguing to others, don't you think? He paused before continuing, that girl is truly exceptional. I suspect she's the heir of the Monroe family. She'd make a fitting match for the Malfoy family. Skylar couldn't help but roll his eyes. Brother, do you take me for a stud? Skylar said inside his heart. With a smile, Skylar replied to Draco, you're overthinking, Draco. I find the girls at Hogwarts quite charming. As he spoke, he deliberately glanced in the direction of Daphne and Astoria, both of whom returned his smile. Eleanor interjected with a playful smile, it seems, Mr. Malfoy, you are quite the favorite among the girls. Lowering her voice, she added pointedly, with so many plates of French mixed fish soup on each long table, why do you think she chose the one in front of you? Skylar had already considered this possibility, but he opted to observe from the sidelines without jumping to conclusions. As everyone continued to dine and converse, the plates on the tables were emptied before anyone noticed. Dumbledore rose to his feet and introduced the two distinguished guests, Barty Crouch, the director of the International Cooperation Department, and Ludovic Bagman, the director of the Sports Department. The applause in the auditorium was sporadic. In the past months, Mr. Bagman and Mr. Crouch have devoted tremendous effort to organizing the Triwizard Tournament, Dumbledore explained. They, along with myself, Professor Karkaroff, and Madame Maxime, will form a referee team to assess the endeavors of the champions. Dumbledore instructed Filch to bring the Goblet of Fire to the podium and outlined the rules of the Triwizard Tournament, three champions, each representing a school, chosen by the Goblet of Fire, three challenging tasks, each task scored based on completion, the champion with the highest accumulated score will be awarded the Goblet of Fire. Every student aspiring to be a champion must write their name and school on a piece of parchment and toss it into this goblet. The registration window is a mere 24 hours. Tomorrow night, on Halloween night, the goblet will select the names of three students it deems the best representatives of the three schools. The goblet will be placed in the hall tonight, and any willing student can touch it to signify their intent to participate in the selection. In order to deter underage participation, once the goblet is positioned in the hall, I will enchant an age line around it. Crossing this age line is prohibited for anyone under the age of 17. Every student aspiring to become a champion must inscribe their name and school on a parchment, depositing it into the goblet of fire within the 24-hour registration window. The deadline is Halloween night, where the goblet will then select the names of three students it deems the best representatives of the three schools. Dumbledore placed the goblet in the entrance hall to prevent underage students from attempting to participate and established an age line around it, restricting access for those under 17. Lastly, I'd like to remind all potential participants that this competition is no trivial matter, and one should not enter it impulsively. Once selected by the Goblet of Fire, a magical contract is formed that must be honored. Warriors are bound to see the competition through to the end, changing one's mind is not an option. Therefore, Carefully consider your decision and ensure your commitment before placing your name in the cup again. Now, I believe it's time for everyone to retire for the night. 
Good night, everyone. Age line. Draco exclaimed, his eyes gleaming as he turned to Skylar. Skylar, you're signing up, right? Skylar shrugged and spread his hands, responding, who knows? Breaking the principal's age line is probably not as simple as it seems. The two brothers exchanged glances, revealing a shared understanding. The following day was a Saturday, typically a time when students would enjoy a leisurely breakfast at a later hour. However, Skylar found himself rising much earlier than usual for the weekend. Accompanied by Daphne and Astoria, he left the Slytherin common room, and as they approached the hall, they noticed a gathering of more than twenty people. Some were still munching on bread while everyone focused their attention on the goblet of fire. Harry's trio was also present, and a nod of acknowledgement passed between Skylar and Hermione. In the center of the hall, the goblet of fire occupied the stool where the sorting hat usually sat, enclosed by a thin gold line with a radius of ten feet. Anyone put their name in yet? Ron eagerly inquired about a third-year girl. The Durmstrain group did, she replied, but I haven't seen anyone from Hogwarts sign up. Laughter suddenly erupted, and without turning around, Skylar knew the responsible person's identity. Fred, George, and Lee Jordan descended the stairs in high spirits. The trio of pranksters appeared extremely excited. In a low voice, Fred shared with Harry that they had taken the aging potion. Extracting a parchment note from his pocket, Fred approached the age line confidently. He stood at its edge, poised like a diver preparing for a plunge from a significant height. Taking a deep breath, he boldly crossed the line, followed by George. A hissing sound filled the air, and the twins were expelled from the golden coil as if an invisible shot putter had forcefully thrown them. They landed painfully on the cold stone floor, and their embarrassment surpassed the physical discomfort. With a resounding pop, identical long white beards appeared on the jaws of the two brothers. Laughter echoed through the hall as even Fred and George, upon seeing each other's white beards, couldn't contain their amusement after being thrown into the air. In that moment, a sharp gleam flickered in Skylar's eyes. Just before the twins were propelled into flight, he discerned the magical fluctuations on the golden coil. It was undoubtedly an enchantment. Understanding that enchantments are definitive and can only screen out qualified individuals, the question remained, what criterion determined this screening? Since the aging agent had proven ineffective, it suggested that physiological age was not the sole basis. Could it be a judgment based on magical prowess? A low, amused voice broke through the laughter, and all heads turned to see Professor Dumbledore emerging from the auditorium. His eyes gleamed as he looked at Fred and George. I suggest both of you pay a visit to Miss Pomfrey. She's already tending to Miss Fawcett in Ravenclaw and Mr. Moss in Hufflepuff. They, too, decided to experiment with their age a bit. However, I must say, your beards are much more splendid than theirs. With those words, Dumbledore left, and the twins followed suit, heading to the school hospital wing. Draco, Pansy, Goyle, and Crab arrived at this juncture. Having heard about the incident, Draco wore a contemptuous expression, sneering, trash is trash. They probably can only come up with this way. Ron, feeling the need to defend his elder brother, retorted, as if you're any better. If you've got the guts, why don't you sign up and give it a try? Draco's expression soured further. After scanning everyone present, he lingered on Skylar for a few seconds before shifting his gaze back to the Goblet of Fire. Weasley, spare our pure blood family from your disgrace, Draco retorted coldly. It's just an enchantment, not difficult to crack. Oh, really? Ron challenged with a skeptical expression. Well then, Malfoy, demonstrate it for all of us. Let's witness the famed Malfoy family magical power that they are so proud of, shall we? Draco closed his eyes, and Skylar's brow furrowed. Once again, Skylar observed the surge of black magic enveloping Draco, more intense than ever before. As Draco opened his eyes, an emotionless gaze met the onlookers. Stepping confidently toward the golden coil, Draco crossed it in a single stride. A subtle buzzing vibration resonated through the air, catching the attention of nearly everyone present. What Skylar's magical eyes witnessed left him stunned, space itself distorted. He recognized the magical trajectory reminiscent of the time-turner he used, a form of time magic. It dawned on Skylar that Dumbledore possessed knowledge of time magic, 
indicating that the old wizard's true capabilities might surpass what was initially thought. Skylar had presumed that the magical strength of the individual determined the age restriction. His confidence stemmed from his magic, surpassing even that of adult wizards. In terms of magical quantity, no student from any of the three schools could compare to him. Yet, it seemed the barrier judged intruders based on the visible signs of aging. Skylar's occasional use of the time turner, not exceeding four hours at a time and sporadically employed, might not accumulate enough time in years to leave a significant trace. The spotlight returned to Draco. Just as everyone anticipated Draco's imminent expulsion, the golden coil emitted a faint golden glow before dimming once again. Draco shot Ron a taunting look, and Skylar had a peculiar feeling that Draco's gaze wasn't directed at Ron, but at him. Ron flushed, unable to respond. Draco advanced a few more steps towards the Goblet of Fire, acknowledging its considerable distance from the gold coil, making it impossible to toss the parchment from afar. Upon reaching the goblet, Draco extracted a parchment from his robes, placed it within the flame, and watched as the once blue and white flames transformed into a fiery red, sparks dancing around. A quick glance at Skylar and Ron conveyed Draco's triumph before he confidently strolled away, leaving behind a gathering of young wizards with expressions ranging from shock to awe. The attention of the remaining wizards naturally shifted to Skylar. If Draco, without notable achievements in the esteemed Malfoy family, could exhibit such power, then the reputation of Skylar, an illustrious figure, was bound to be even more formidable. Skylar, however, maintained a serene smile. Though unsure of Draco's method for resisting the enchantment and forcefully entering, he had his own solution. Producing a piece of parchment, Skylar ignited it with a wave of his wand. The parchment swiftly transformed into a paper sparrow, wings fluttering rapidly. The paper sparrow soared effortlessly over the age line, darting into the goblet of fire. With a resounding bang, the flames within the goblet surged, but they refrained from adopting the anticipated red hue. It seemed Dumbledore had considered a countermeasure to prevent aspiring participants from launching their registration papers over the age line from a distance. Skylar's eyes subtly revealed the ancient Guruni rune of Kaunas. If the flames don't convert willingly, then I'll make them. Skylar fixed his gaze on the goblet of fire. The flames, reaching towards the sky, seemed to be restrained by an unseen force, gradually receding back into the cup. Suddenly, as if the goblet of fire was under a spiritual assault, the flames erupted again with a loud blast, scattering sparks. However, not long after the commotion, the flames weakened and fell once more, finally turning red and emitting a subtle spark. Not only were the students left speechless by Skylar's way of admitting his name to the Goblet of Fire, but the professors themselves, along with the judges, had their mouths agape as they witnessed how Skylar neutralized Professor Dumbledore's way of negating entrance from long distance. Draco tried his best not to pay attention to Skylar's expression right now, but he found his heart felt burdened. Wearing a bright smile, knowing he had just pulled everyone's attention, Skylar turned away and walked to Daphne in Astoria's side, whispering, Let's go. During breakfast, the most talked-about subject among the young wizards revolved around who would be chosen as Hogwarts champion. Many speculated that Cedric Diggory from Hufflepuff had the best odds, while others favored Slytherin's Cassius Warrington. Gryffindor rallied behind Angelina Johnson from their house. These three were all sixth-year students, with seventh-year students seemingly more focused on the upcoming nude exams and reluctant to be distracted by extracurricular activities. The Halloween dinner seemed to stretch longer than usual, perhaps due to the consecutive banquets. Many students appeared less enthusiastic about the meticulously prepared and hearty dishes, in contrast to their usual appetite. The occupants of the auditorium continued to gaze upwards, each face reflecting an anxious expression. Restlessness permeated the room, with individuals intermittently standing and turning their attention towards the podium. Finally, as the banquet concluded, a collective murmur rose within the auditorium. Dumbledore rose, and an immediate hush fell over the audience. On either side of Dumbledore, Karkaroff and Madame Maxime appeared as nervous and expectant as the rest of the gathering. Ludo grinned and winked at students from different schools, while Barty maintained a stoic and unresponsive demeanor. I am pleased to announce that the Goblet of Fire is on the verge of making its decision. Dumbledore declared with a smile. I estimate it will only take another minute. Once the names of the champions are revealed, I request them to proceed to the top of the auditorium, walk along the staff desk, and enter the adjoining room. 
he gestured towards the door behind the instructor's desk. There, they will receive preliminary guidance. With a wave of his hand, most of the lights in the auditorium dimmed, casting the room into a state of partial brightness and partial darkness. The goblet of fire, now positioned on the rostrum, erupted in a brilliant display, outshining everything in its vicinity. The blue and white flames, adorned with sparking embers, captivated the onlookers. Suddenly, the goblet flames turned red again, emitting crackling sparks. A flame leaped into the air, propelling a nearly charred piece of parchment. Dumbledore caught the parchment, and the flames reverted to blue and white. Champion of Durmstrang, Dumbledore's voice resonated throughout the auditorium, Eleanor von Hohenheim. A subtle expression of, I knew it, flickered across Skylar's face before he extended his congratulations to Eleanor. However, Eleanor's countenance remained impassive as she rose from the Slytherin table, exhibiting a calm demeanor as she made her way towards Dumbledore. Following Professor McGonagall's guidance, she turned right, traversed the rostrum, and entered the adjacent room. Silence once again enveloped the auditorium as the anticipation for the second parchment intensified. Dumbledore, usually composed, displayed an uncharacteristic falter as he studied the sign-up paper. His typically bright azure eyes, visible behind the half-moon glasses, seemed momentarily dimmed. The young wizards in the vicinity, oblivious to the cause of the principal's disquiet, sensed the heavy atmosphere permeating the hall. A palpable tension stifled any inclination to speak, leaving only the crackling of the goblet of fire audible. Dumbledore, grappling with the situation, spoke with a strained voice, his words carrying a horse edge, the champion from Bosbatons, it is Catalina Grindelwald Moreau. Catalina gracefully rose, elegantly flicked her vibrant red hair, and moved lightly between the Ravenclaw and Hufflepuff tables toward the podium. She offered a graceful bow to Dumbledore before entering the same room Eleanor had just entered. Hearing the name Grindelwald made Skylar's heart sink. Is this the same Grindelwald that took the wizarding world by terror years ago? He had a descendant. Observing Skylar's unusual expression, Daphne inquired softly, Skylar, what's bothering you? Skylar shook his head, expressing a sense of helplessness. Daphne, I can't quite put my finger on it, but it just feels like, this world is somehow different. Daphne chuckled, dismissing his concerns. You're overthinking it. Although Crum and the Vila girl may not be weak, competing with the magical legacies of Germany and France is a different league. I believe the selection of Hohenheim and Moreau is justified. Skylar sighed inwardly, thinking, you're not a traverser, of course, you can't comprehend my feelings. Astoria suddenly leaned over, tightly grabbing Skylar's arm. The goblet of fire is moving, and it's about to announce the name of the Hogwarts champion. My God, I'm so nervous, could it be Brother Skylar? The entire auditorium fell into silence, with almost all Hogwarts students holding their breath, anticipating the revelation of the Hogwarts champion. The third parchment arrived as scheduled. The Hogwarts champion, Dumbledore began, grabbing the parchment. However, he froze, staring strangely at the note in his hand. Clearing his throat, he announced, it's Skylar Malfoy. A series of, wow wow, exclamations erupted from the students in the other three houses, except for the Slytherins. How is that possible? He's only in the fourth grade. Could the Goblet of Fire have made a mistake? Despite many witnessing him putting his name in, it chose him over Diggory. Some rational students retorted, you're just envious and jealous, he is the youngest Sir Merlin, capable of facing hundreds of Dementors alone and defeating a thousand-year-old Basilisk. What's weird about the Goblet of Fire choosing him? A commotion also arose at the Slytherin table. Draco stood up abruptly, trembling all over, wearing an expression of disbelief. How is it possible, how is it possible? The Goblet of Fire actually chose him, not me. It's impossible. Impossible. Observing Draco's reaction, Skylar wore a thoughtful expression. It seemed Draco was genuinely confident, firmly believing that he was superior to Skylar. Skylar felt he understood something. Patting Astoria, he released her hand, stood up, and, guided by Professor McGonagall, walked into the previous room with his head held high. Pushing the door open, Skylar confidently stepped into the room adorned with portraits of wizards, many of whom were exceptionally old. Upon Skylar's entrance, the wizards within the frames gathered in the large central frame, engaging in peaceful discussions about his figure and appearance. 
Eleanor, catching wind of the commotion, looked over with a knowing expression. It truly is you, Skylar. It seems the day we'll compete on the same stage isn't too far off. Having accepted the reality of his selection, Skylar released the burden from his heart. Confidence emanated from his eyes as he replied, You won't be disappointed, Eleanor. Catalina joined them with a surprised expression, Well done, Mr. Malfoy. I didn't expect you to be a Hogwarts champion. It's been my dream to compete with you on the same stage. She continued in a serious tone, Please give it your best, and let me witness your real strength. Skylar raised the corner of his mouth, a mysterious light filling his eyes. The long-lost fighting spirit flared within his chest. My real strength? Do you know that when I get serious, I get scared of my own self considering how potent the power inside me rested? He had suppressed his true capabilities for too long, since the Ghost Society and Knight of Alpurgis joint attack during the bird incident. Due to numerous scruples, he had relied on foreign allies to act on his behalf. After inheriting Hufflepuff's legacy in crafting the magic of the three-in-one, the extent of his strength became elusive, even to himself. After a moment, the door creaked open, revealing a hesitant figure. The three champions turned their heads, and Harry Potter entered with uncertainty. Thinking he might have come to convey a message, Catalina eyed him with suspicion. What's the matter? she asked. Are they asking us to return to the auditorium? Following a flurry of footsteps, Ludovic Bagman entered the room, seizing Harry by the arm and ushering him forward. It's utterly bizarre. Bagman exclaimed. Completely unbelievable. Let me introduce, though it seems implausible, this is the fourth champion in the Triwizard Tournament. Eleanor straightened up, scrutinizing Harry before casting a contemplative gaze at Skylar. Catalina shook her long hair and grinned arrogantly. He can't compete, he's too young. Of course, Mr. Malfoy is an exception. You can't expect everyone to be as exceptional as Mr. Malfoy, right? It's a bit complicated, Bagman shook his head. The age restriction, implemented as an additional safety measure, was only put in place this year. Now that your names have been expelled from the Goblet of Fire. I mean, I believe you're not allowed to back out at this point. The rules are crystal clear, you must adhere to them. You must give your best effort to complete the tasks. The door swung open again, ushering in a flurry of figures. Professor Dumbledore led the way, trailed by Mr. Crouch, Professor Karkaroff, Madame Maxime, Professor Sprout, Professor McGonagall, and Professor Snape. Before Professor McGonagall closed the door, a cacophony of voices from hundreds of students could be heard in the adjacent auditorium. What on earth is the meaning of this, Dumbledore? Madame Maxime bellowed arrogantly, her ample bosom heaving beneath the black satin. I'm eager to know the same, Dumbledore, added Professor Karkaroff, a cold smile playing on his face, and his ice cube blue eyes exuding a chilling intensity. Two champions of Hogwarts. I don't recall anyone informing me that the host school can have two champions. Was I not diligent enough in reviewing the regulations? It's preposterous, Madame Maxime asserted, her large hand adorned with numerous opals resting on Catalina's shoulder. Hogwarts cannot have two champions. This is outrageously unfair. In our understanding, Dumbledore, your age line is supposed to exclude underage contestants, Karkaroff continued, his cold smile deepening in his eyes. Otherwise, we would have brought more candidates from our school. You can only hold Potter accountable for this, Karkaroff, Snape interjected softly, dark eyes flashing with hostility. Don't blame Dumbledore, it's all because of Potter's insistence on violating the regulations. He hasn't stopped breaking school rules since he first entered. Thank you, Severus, Dumbledore cut in decisively. Snape fell silent, though the malice in his eyes still flickered through his greasy black hair. Professor Dumbledore gazed down at Harry, and Harry returned his gaze. Did you put your name in the Goblet of Fire, Harry? he asked calmly. No, Harry replied. Snape emitted a disbelieving sound impatiently from the shadows. Did you ask an older classmate to help you put your name in the Goblet of Fire? Professor Dumbledore ignored Snape and pressed on with his inquiry. No, Harry replied with excitement. He must be lying. Madame Maxime exclaimed. Snape shook his head and pursed his lips. He can't cross that age line, Professor McGonagall asserted sharply. I believe we all agree on this point. 
Dumbledore's line must be faulty, Madame Maxime retorted, shrugging her shoulders. At least I know, both Mr. Malfoy put their names in publicly. Professor McGonagall was momentarily speechless. The fact that two fourth-grade students had bypassed Dumbledore's magic was incredible in Professor McGonagall's eyes. Mr. Crouch de Mar. Bagman, Karkaroff interjected, his tone becoming ingratiating again, you two are our, uh, impartial referees. You must also find this matter highly inappropriate. Isn't that right? Bagman wiped his round baby face with a handkerchief and exchanged a quick glance with Mr. Crouch. Mr. Crouch stood on the fringe of the firelight, his face partially concealed in shadows. He appeared somewhat peculiar, the darkened half casting him in a much older light, almost resembling a skeleton. However, when he spoke, his voice retained its customary firmness. We must adhere to the regulations. The rules explicitly state that anyone whose name emerges from the Goblet of Fire must partake in the tournament for supremacy. Hey, Barty knows the rules inside out, Bagman remarked, a smile playing on his face. Looking back at Karkaroff and Madame Maxime, it seemed the situation had been successfully resolved. Durmstrang will never take part in the upcoming competition. Karkaroff erupted in anger. After numerous meetings, negotiations, and consultations, I didn't anticipate such an occurrence. I just want to leave now. Bluffing threats, Karkaroff, a voice snarled from the doorway. You can't withdraw your champion now. She must participate in the tournament. They all must participate. As Dumbledore mentioned, they are bound by a magical contract. Suits you well, doesn't it? Moody had just entered the room, limping towards the fire. Each time his right foot hit the ground, a loud thud reverberated through the space, thud, thud. Beneficial? Karkaroff sneered. I'm afraid I don't quite catch the meaning behind your words, Moody. Karkaroff attempted to infuse his tone with contempt, as if he were dismissing Moody's words, but his hands betrayed his true feelings, involuntarily clenching into fists. Is that so? Moody said softly. It's quite simple, Karkaroff. Someone placed Potter's name in the goblet, knowing that if the name were expelled, Potter would be obligated to participate in the tournament. I have a feeling that the individual who submitted this boy's name into the goblet is undoubtedly a wizard with formidable skills. Oh, do you have any evidence for this? Madame Maxime interjected, raising her sizable hands. Because they deceived a magical object with potent magic. Moody retorted. To bewilder the goblet and make it forget that only three schools are partaking in the competition. This requires an exceptionally powerful confundus charm. I surmise they reported Potter's name as a student from the fourth school, ensuring he was the sole candidate for that school. Is that so? Are you sure you didn't pull all of that out of your arse simply because you work in Hogwarts? Karkaroff scoffed at this and nearly engaged in a heated argument with Moody. How has this situation come about? We don't know, Dumbledore addressed everyone in the room. But in my opinion, we have no choice but to accept it. Harry and Skylar have both been unexpectedly selected to participate in the competition. Therefore, they must adhere to the regulations set by the Goblet of Fire and give their all in the tournament. All right, shall we proceed? Bagman suggested, rubbing his hands and smiling at the assembled individuals. I'll be guiding our warriors, won't I? Barty, it's over to you. Right? Mr. Crouch seemed to snap out of his contemplation. The first task is designed to test your courage, and we won't be revealing what it entails. Confronting the unknown is an essential quality for wizards. The first task is scheduled for November 24th. It will be conducted in front of other students and the referee team. During the challenge, the warriors are not permitted to seek or accept assistance from their teachers. Armed only with their wands, they must face the initial set of challenges. Once the first task is concluded, they will be briefed on the second task. Due to the demanding nature and extended duration of the competition, the warriors will be exempt from the regular school year exams. Mr. Crouch turned to Dumbledore. I believe that covers everything, Albus. Yes, nothing has been omitted, Dumbledore affirmed. Wait, Professor, I have something to add, Skylar interjected suddenly. Dumbledore looked at Skylar with curiosity. Skylar spoke up, saying, Mr. Crouch emphasized the importance of wizards facing the unknown. 
However, upon researching past Triwizard tournaments, I discovered a plethora of cheating methods. It seems that school professors often disclose the details of the tasks to their students. I find this practice highly undesirable and believe it needs to be addressed to ensure a fair competition. A discerning gleam appeared in Dumbledore's eyes as he fixed his gaze on Skylar. Are you suggesting? It's quite simple, really. We could establish a magical contract. The magic would bind anyone privy to the task details not to disclose any information to the warriors. Violators of this agreement would be subject to the magical constraints of the contract, enforced until the conclusion of the Triwizard Tournament, Skylar explained, accompanied by a wry smile. No one understood the potential pitfalls of the competition better than Skylar. For instance, even before the first task involving the Fire Dragon had begun, every warrior was already aware of the nature of their respective challenges. Madame Maxime and Professor Karkaroff displayed visible discomfort. Madame Maxime remarked, this seems unnecessary. Professor Karkaroff added, the Triwizard Tournament has existed for numerous years, and there's never been a need for a confidentiality agreement. Dumbledore turned to Bagman and Crouch. Both nodded in agreement, aligning with Dumbledore's proposal. With three out of the five referees supporting the idea, Madame Maxime and Professor Karkaroff reluctantly conceded. Dumbledore gracefully waved his wand, conjuring a parchment that hovered in the air. The tip of his wand emitted a radiant glow, swiftly inscribing a comprehensive set of terms outlining the confidentiality agreement. As everyone in the room perused the document, it became evident that the contract addressed potential issues from various perspectives. A subsequent wave of Dumbledore's wand engraved the golden names, powered by magic, onto the parchment. The names included Maxime, Karkaroff, McGonagall, Bagman, Snape, Hagrid, Flittick, and Sprout, the last four being the competing champions. Once the process was complete, the parchment burst into a sudden blue flame, rapidly incinerating itself in midair. It seemed as if an invisible thread had woven through everyone's minds, serving as a constant reminder to uphold the terms of the agreement. With 24 days remaining until the inaugural event, Skylar remained unruffled about the impending competition. His confidence stemmed from meticulous preparation and an expectation that events would unfold according to the original plot. Even if there were deviations, such as the first project not being the Fire Dragon, Skylar was undaunted, ready to overcome any challenge with his formidable strength. This wasn't arrogance but a genuine belief in his capabilities. Skylar's strength far surpassed the typical prowess expected of a student, even in comparison to an ordinary adult wizard. He was selected to partake in the Triwizard Tournament and accomplished the initial goals set for his semester at Hogwarts. By securing an exemption from end-of-semester exams, he gained additional time to strategize and sought further guidance from professors under the pretext of tournament preparations. Contrastingly, Harry faced a different situation. Since the resumption of classes, he found it challenging to avoid the scrutiny of fellow students. Many students from other academies perceived Harry's solo enrollment in the championship as less honorable, unlike Skylar, who enjoyed universal respect for his unparalleled magical prowess. Whether one admired or disliked Skylar, akin to the Malfoy family's sentiments, no wizard could dispute his extraordinary strength. Moreover, Skylar and Draco's accomplishments, including the basilisk slaying and Dementor defeat, had become widely known. Skylar's act of dispelling the Dementors with sheer willpower and Draco's exploits were acknowledged by everyone. Despite being in the same fourth grade as Harry, Skylar carried the high expectations of everyone at Hogwarts. His selection for the Triwizard Tournament was seen as well-deserved, with no doubts about the legitimacy of his achievements. Contrastingly, Harry's situation took a different turn. Many young wizards believed that Harry resorted to dishonorable means to manipulate the Goblet of Fire and secure a spot in the Triwizard Tournament. They perceived his actions as driven by a selfish desire for fame and attention. The memory of Harry arriving at school in a speeding car further fueled this negative perception. In the eyes of his peers, Harry was seen as robbing Skylar of his rightful honor and tarnishing the reputation of Hogwarts. Even Ernie McMillan and Justin Finnery, who had previously been on good terms with Harry, distanced themselves. The camaraderie they once shared faded, and when a mischievous jumping bulb escaped Harry's train playfully hit him in the face, their laughter was noticeably absent, creating an uncomfortable atmosphere. Ron, feeling betrayed by Harry's decision to enter the Triwizard Tournament without informing him, ceased communication with his friend. 
Hermione, positioned between the two estranged friends, attempted to mediate and ease the tension within the trio. The growth of Harry's journey, along with the people alongside him who'll support him in times to come, have been changed totally from how it was in the original story. Skylar couldn't help but wonder at how everything was going to turn out moving forward. This semester, Hermione experienced significant personal growth compared to her portrayal in the original book. Notably, she developed a greater emotional maturity, demonstrating an ability to accept the diversity of values among her peers and learning the art of compromise. Hermione initiated a process of self-reflection, acknowledging that she had tended to exhibit a self-centered attitude and lacked emotional intelligence. Previously, she imposed her thoughts, values, and ideas on others without considering the reasons and original intentions behind their actions. This time around, she refrained from criticizing Ron's perceived naivety and instead sought to understand his feelings of rebellion and discomfort. Using a more empathetic approach, Hermione comprehended Ron's emotions and sincerely tried to address his concerns from his perspective. She conveyed the message that everyone is unique and possesses their own place in the world. There is no need to conform to others' expectations because she recognized the immense pressure Ron, as the youngest son and older brother, faced, much of which he imposed on himself. As Hermione actively worked on understanding Ron, their relationship gradually improved. Unbeknownst to Hermione, Ron observed her attentively when she was not aware, and he began experiencing complex and unfamiliar emotions toward her. In a similar vein, while Hermione harbored strong dissatisfaction with the treatment of house elves, she refrained from imposing her sense of justice on others. Demonstrating a more open-minded approach, she listened to Hagrid's perspective and opted to treat house elves with as much consideration as possible. This marked a departure from her original portrayal, where she had completely dismissed house elves' thoughts and attempted a forceful liberation. Notably, Hermione did not entertain the idea of initiating a house elf rights promotion association. Instead, she directed more of her energy towards academic pursuits, understanding that practical impact ultimately relies on strength and influence. During moments of contemplation, Hermione found herself wondering if this sense of responsibility mirrored that of a certain young man she held in high regard. Was this the driving force behind him to tirelessly pursue knowledge and fame? Was this the significant difference in their positions? Returning to Skylar's narrative, he was currently engrossed in the quest to discover Merlin's secret room, with Peeves providing an evident clue. Contrary to popular student perception, Peeves was not a ghost but a poltergeist, an entity that could move objects, create disturbances, and generate various sounds. The term, prankster, derived from German, literally translates to noisy ghost. Pranksters are intangible entities with enough physical form to perform actions such as chewing gum or even stuffing it into their nostrils. The prankster, belonging to the category of non-creature, or non-existence, similar to dementors and boggets, has never been a living person. Its defining characteristic is that it has never died and cannot die, as it has never experienced survival. Confident in his ability to navigate the Hogwarts grounds during the curfew, Skylar embarked on a night tour. He anticipated that Filch and his cat would be powerless to stop him. True to his expectations, Skylar encountered Peeves and, as anticipated, was on the receiving end of a prank. Just as Peeves was about to raise an alarm, Skylar swiftly wielded his wand. In an instant, Peeves found his mouth sealed, his tongue knotted, rendering him mute. The poltergeist, well versed in the ways of countless individuals, suddenly realized it had provoked a formidable character and promptly fled. Pointing his wand in the direction of Peeves' escape, Skylar murmured softly, Insequare anima. Peeves, struggling desperately, felt his body uncontrollably drawn toward Skylar as if subjected to a powerful suction. Despite its efforts, resistance proved futile in the face of the current predicament. Another spell that Skylar learned from one of the book's content that he managed to procure, based on reading some pages over and over again while thinking of how some cruel spells can be adjusted into another that would fit his purpose, Skylar modified another spell to catch one's soul. Although it might sound a bit brutal, but this spell is something that he managed to practice time over time to go against something that doesn't have physical body. This is a perfect counter to the spirits such as Peeves, a prankster of poltergeist. After Skylar cast the spell to capture Peeves forcefully, he deftly produced a specialized bottle container, using his wand to coerce Peeves into it. Let me go, let me go. Peeves yelled as he got sucked into the bottle. Meanwhile, the hurried footsteps of Filch and his cat approached. 
Unperturbed, Skylar casually applied the invisible phantom charm on himself, calmly walking past Filch and Mrs. Norris, effortlessly returning to his dormitory. Once back in the dormitory, Skylar had just released Peeves. The mischievous poltergeist swiftly darted toward the wall, attempting a quick escape while Skylar was caught off guard. To its surprise, it discovered that its ethereal form had been ensnared by a magic chain emitting a sinister red glow, rendering it immobile. The other end of the chain was linked to the tip of Skylar's wand. Peeves vented his frustration, exclaiming, Peeves is in trouble this time, and I admit it. Can you tell me the reason why you are going this far? Skylar responded leisurely, no need to be in such panic, Peeves. If you provide a satisfactory answer, not only will I release you, but I'll also give you some prank supplies. Skylar gestured toward the box of large dung eggs on the desk as he finished speaking. All right, deal. Let's talk. What does your question consist of? Peeves knows everything and can talk endlessly. Skylar grinned and inquired, tell me what you know about Merlin. What? Peeves exclaimed, you've uncovered Peeves' secret so quickly. No fun, no fun. How did you figure it out? Skylar smiled mysteriously, choosing to remain silent. He had no intention of exposing Aquila. Peeves sighed, fine, I confess. I'm actually a magical creation crafted by the old man Merlin. He's a mischievous old man who found the school during the era of the four founders too dull and serious. So, he created the magnificent Peeves to inject some laughter into this school. Skylar chuckled inwardly, thinking, you're probably the only one enjoying this. Past generations of principals, professors, and administrators would likely be infuriated with you. Though he pondered this, Skylar refrained from voicing it. Skylar inquired, nevertheless, I always perceived you as a prankster, an emotional amalgamation of mischievous and destructive desires, a being akin to a poltergeist, a Patronus. How did you suddenly transform into a magical creation? Ha ha, Peeves laughed, poltergeist. Patronus? Can they talk? Do they possess a mind? They, Peeves grew unusually serious, can they rival the great Peeves in wit? When I first emerged from the chaos, I was merely an emotional amalgamation. I was clueless, unaware of my origin or destination. Peeves wore a reflective expression. Later, the old man appeared, and using a certain method, he condensed my sanity, creating the clever, grand, and humorous Peeves the poltergeist you see now. Skylar's mind suddenly drew a connection to Dementors. As manifestations of despairing emotions, Dementors demonstrated intelligence. Although incapable of speech, they could follow the directives of the Ministry of Magic and Voldemort. Could it be that Dementors were essentially a kind of magical creation born from this particular magic? If that were the case, mastering this magic might empower one to bestow spiritual wisdom upon creatures like bogats, vampires, ghosts, and even the revered Patronus. This intriguing notion seemed worthy of inclusion within the realm of Skylar's ongoing research. Peeves continued his narrative, saying, after the old man departed Hogwarts, he frequently returned in the guise of a student, visiting Peeves and sharing jokes. But one day, when he came to see Peeves, his demeanor seemed rather peculiar. Upon leaving, he mentioned facing a destined foe, making it unlikely for him to return. It marked the first time Skylar observed a hint of sorrow on Peeves' countenance, even if it was only a trace. Peeves resumed, but let's return to our main topic. The old man transformed Peeves into a door key the last time he left. If someone meeting specific conditions touches me, they can be teleported to his secret room, where his inheritance lies. However, as he stated, only a prankster, whom I acknowledge, is eligible to inherit. Throughout these many years, no one has managed to catch my eye except for Gryffindor, not bad for the twins, but you, you, and, no, troublemaker. Observing the dangerous gleam in Skylar's eyes, Peeves, discerning that he found himself in a precarious situation of his own making, adopted a forced smile and remarked, certainly, esteemed Mr. Malfoy, having successfully passed the old man's test and been bestowed with his medal, you are undoubtedly qualified to access the secret room. Come now. Lay your hands on me. A mere touch and I shall activate the door key spell inscribed upon my form, transporting you directly to the secret room. Skylar sneered, retorting, do you comprehend the repercussions of attempting to deceive me? You know very well that I could see behind your tricks, right Peeves? 
Before Peeves could respond, Skylar's wand unleashed a dark gray, peculiar skull toward the corner, emitting spine-chilling whistles. Although this curse wasn't directed at Peeves, the ghost still experienced an intense sense of impending danger. It was evident that the spell harbored soul magic capable of harming spirits or ghosts. Swallowing hard, Peeves, who had roamed freely at Hogwarts for numerous years, was acutely aware of who could be provoked and who could not. Clearly, Skylar fell into the latter category. Peeves forced a smile and uttered, impossible. Peeves would never dare deceive the illustrious Malfoy. Please don Merlin's medal, not the Ministry of Magics but the distinctive medal conferred by Hogwarts, a special medal, adorn it, and it shall serve as the key to the authentic entrance of the secret room. Come forth. I assure you it will transport you to the that old man's secret chamber. It dawned on Skylar that Merlin's memory had mentioned it as a trial during Merlin's trial. Back then, participants dismissed it as a misunderstanding because the school's announcement clearly indicated it was merely an intramural competition. Now, he comprehended the special purpose of Merlin's distinctive medal, it served as the key to unlocking Merlin's secret room. As anticipated by Skylar, Peeves possessed the ability to manipulate events in this process. It could either transport individuals to the genuine secret room or to a deceptive one, potentially fraught with peril. Fortunately, Skylar had played his cards right, otherwise, he might have fallen prey to Peeves' deceit. Skylar donned the medal, made contact with Peeves, and with a poof, both he and the mischievous ghost were teleported into an unfamiliar secret room. The secret room was bathed in dim light. Skylar raised his wand, casting a Lumos spell, and simultaneously activated the magic eye. Very well, my task is fulfilled. Peeves gleefully performed an eccentric dance, expressing some mischievous intentions. Mr. Malfoy, I wish you the best of luck in your next endeavor, I suspect you'll need it. Before Skylar could pose any questions, Peeves vanished. Instead of passing through the wall, it dissipated directly into the void as though some external force had reversed the spell afflicting the door to be sealed. The secret room held nothing of interest, dust and insect carcasses were scattered throughout. A crystal ball rested upon the central round table, emitting subtle waves of magical energy, with four Guruni's magic charms swirling within its depths. Skylar approached, examining the scene closely. The four magic charms were strategically positioned at each corner, creating correspondences between them. In ancient magical texts, the presence of more than one magic talisman heightened the complexity of interpretation. Each talisman often represented multiple meanings, akin to the polyphonic and polysemous nature of characters in modern languages. When two charms appeared simultaneously, the interpreter had to not only isolate other potential meanings within each charm but also comprehend the combined significance of the two charms and their arrangement. The four magic symbols, particularly arranged in opposing corners, presented the most challenging scenario for interpretation, offering a myriad of possible combinations. The first magic talisman, hammer, signified shape. The second, hyogre, denoted thinking. The third, philgia, represented spirit. Lastly, the fourth, hamingja, conveyed sex. Schuyler plunged into deep contemplation. Shape pertained to form, appearance, and state, thinking, encompassed thought, contemplation, and inspiration, spirit, in this context, referred to intuition, spiritual perception, or destiny. Meanwhile, sex embraced a broad spectrum of meanings, delving into personality traits, including wisdom, strength, experience, technology, bloodline, and even aspects like willpower, mental fortitude, endurance, and luck. A spark ignited in Schuyler's mind. Could it be? Could it be the self? Recalling the trinity theory that lays as the foundation for achieving enlightenment, Schuyler pondered the essence of life, body, spirit, and soul. No matter how expansive the meanings of the four magic talismans were, they seemed inexorably tied to the overarching category of life essence. Understanding this, however, left Skylar grappling with the question of what to do next. Do these four magic charms signify a Guruni magic that needs to be unleashed to decipher this level? If so, it seemed an exceedingly challenging task. Skylar had a firm grasp on the guardian magic talisman, while the others, namely, sacred fire and freeze, were only in the preliminary stages of understanding. Crafting a spell with a single rune was already formidable, 
let alone attempting to cast a spell with four runes spanning multiple levels simultaneously. Skylar contemplated his options, eventually considering a last resort. He retrieved a bottle of golden liquid from his pocket, it was time to take a sip of the blessing potion. After imbibing the potion, Skylar realized his thinking was too narrow. He cleared his mind, allowing thoughts to diverge and embracing all manner of inspirations, analyzing each one systematically, no matter how seemingly absurd. First and foremost, cracking magical levels inherently requires the application of magic, there's no denying that. The purpose behind Merlin's inheritance and the kind of heir he seeks are pivotal considerations. The threads of clues regarding Merlin's criteria for selecting heirs began to weave together in Skylar's mind. Firstly, one must triumph in Merlin's test competition and be bestowed with Merlin's distinctive medal. This implies being an exceptional underage student excelling in potions, metamorphosis, and battle magic. Secondly, recognition by Peeves is imperative, or, in other words, a profound understanding of soul magic is necessary for capturing Peeves. However, the third point appeared somewhat amiss, it didn't quite fit the narrative. It must be acknowledged that deciphering the Guruni's text itself is not the most formidable challenge. With the aid of a Guruni dictionary, many individuals could accomplish this task. In this context, the real complexity lies in deducing the meaning encapsulated within the combination of Guruni's texts. This demands an understanding of the essence of life itself. Skylar grinned. He activated the magical marks on his skin, revealing strips and circles of curse marks. Taking his magic wand, he gently tapped hammer, causing the corresponding rune in the crystal ball to illuminate. Stirring his spiritual power within the spiritual realm, his eyes flickered with thunder and lightning as he lightly tapped Hyuga with his wand, igniting the corresponding rune. Exerting his soul magic to its fullest, a formidable black shadow materialized behind him. Lightly tapping Filgia with his wand, the corresponding rune gleamed. Concentrating deeply, he recalled the moment of breaking free from the imperious curse, awakening within the depths of his being. Tapping Haminja lightly with his wand, the final rune also sparked to life. At this juncture, all four Guruni's charms were illuminated and activated. The answer to what Merlin had left behind as his legacy is in front of Skylar. He is only one step away from becoming yet stronger than the other wizards. Breaking the seal and entering Merlin's secret chamber itself already notified Skylar's presence to the other forces and individuals that are slowly rising behind the curtain as the story unfolds. Many have become aware of Skylar's magical prowess, and each day, with Skylar becoming stronger, it only makes them feel more anxious than ever. Even the great Salazar Slytherin is cowering at Skylar Malfoy's current power. You've arrived, a voice whispered in Skylar's ear. It belonged to a handsome middle-aged man with a phantom-like appearance, an ethereal visage that seemed surreal. Tall and slender, he bore a fragility reminiscent of the Merlin memory from the trial, but he appeared slightly older than the memory from that time. Who are you? Skylar inquired, though he already had a hunch and sought confirmation. I am the one you seek, the spirit in the form of old man responded. You mean you're Merlin himself? Skylar furrowed his brow. Are you still alive? The spectral figure before him was evidently a product of some mysterious magic that eluded Skylar's understanding. This form of magic brought to mind enchanted paintings, yet it far surpassed them in technological advancement. While enchanted paintings could endure for millennia, they were susceptible to destruction, relocation, or concealment. The method of preserving memories within this secret room, activated only by specific means, presented no such issues. Furthermore, Skylar hadn't forgotten that during Merlin's trial, this self-proclaimed memory phantom demonstrated spellcasting prowess far beyond what enchanted paintings could achieve. If you're referring to Merlin as a wizard with a physical body, he is indeed deceased, Merlin gazed into Skylar's eyes and explained, strictly speaking, I am Merlin's memory, yet I am also Merlin. In the past, I utilized special magic to leave a memory within this secret room. How much time has passed since then? Approximately. Nearly a thousand years, Skylar replied. Merlin fell silent upon hearing the words. Known for his calm and wisdom, he remained quiet. After a considerable pause, he spoke with emotion, a thousand years. Merlin observed Skylar with satisfaction and nodded approvingly. Your aptitude is commendable. The latent chaotic power in your bloodline has been awakened, 
your spiritual power in the divine consciousness is remarkable, and your body exudes robust vitality. It seems you've had quite a few adventures. Skylar nodded humbly, choosing not to elaborate. Merlin dismissed the topic with a casual wave of his hand. Since fate has led you to me, you are now Merlin's descendant. This could be advantageous for you, but it could also bring challenges. Be mentally prepared. Before Skylar could inquire further, Merlin turned and headed toward a small wooden door. Follow me, I will entrust all my legacies to you. Following Merlin through the wooden door, Skylar found himself in a modest secret room. Adorning the stone wall were three items. A worn, brown magic book devoid of any inscriptions on its cover. A plain ring made of dark black wood. A forearm-length staff engraved with mysterious Guruni runes. At its tip, the staff sported a horizontal grip adorned with a deep purple bead. These three magical artifacts have been my companions for many years, and they were among the most potent magical items of their time. Now, they are all yours. Take them, Merlin's voice, though not loud, carried a particularly alluring tone to Skylar's ears. Suddenly, a barrage of thoughts flooded Skylar's mind, urgency to enhance his strength, a yearning for potent magic, and more. Amidst the mental chaos, his hand instinctively reached for the magic book, emanating an irresistible allure. Merlin observed his actions impassively, revealing no expression. As his hand approached the book's cover, Skylar felt an uncontrollable surge of magic power infiltrating his mind. A sharp pain shot through his eyebrows, his entire body seemingly struck by lightning. His hands recoiled involuntarily, causing him to lose balance and sit on the ground. When he looked up again, a profound guard filled his eyes, and his wand reappeared in his hand. Are you truly Merlin? Merlin's gaze fluctuated, offering no response to the question. Instead, he inquired, why do you ask? Skylar, still catching his breath, took two steps back. If not for the sudden pain, he would have already seized the magic book. At that moment, a singular thought dominated his mind, something must be amiss, and there was likely a catch. Despite considering himself strong-willed, he sensed the potential for his mind to be easily manipulated. I don't believe in free lunches. Skylar sneered, his tone now tinged with diminished respect. A slight smile curved Merlin's lips as he spoke slowly, I didn't deceive you, they are indeed immensely powerful magical artifacts. I merely heightened your emotions a bit. Pursing his lips, Skylar gained a deeper understanding of Merlin's prowess. This so-called memory's ability to cast spells mirrors the humanoid phantom encountered in the final stage of Merlin's test. The fact that even a millennium-old memory can proficiently perform silent and wandless spells suggests the formidable magical prowess Merlin possessed a thousand years ago. Merlin grinned, remember, I, too, was a Slytherin student. Just like you, I harbored ambitions and a thirst for formidable power. His expression turned serious, however, the significance embedded in these three artifacts is not something everyone can shoulder. I must forewarn you, inheriting my artifacts demands the corresponding awareness. Upon inheriting these magical weapons, you will inevitably become entwined and burdened with the fate of a thousand years ago. Now, make your decision. A thousand years ago. During the Dark Middle Ages when the four founders lived, a period marked by the dominance of potent dark wizards and malevolent creatures. Skylar, a true Slytherin, possessed desires and ambitions, yet he remained grounded and rational. He could discern the situation and prioritize self-preservation. Although he felt a twinge of greed for the clearly extraordinary magical instruments, he already had enough on his plate and preferred not to stir up additional troubles. I forfeit, declared Skylar, his eyes unwavering and resolute. Merlin nodded approvingly, the first hint of satisfaction gracing his face as he remarked, Regrettably, I deceived you this time. You had no real choice. Before Skylar could grasp the implications, his eyes widened as the three magical artifacts ascended into the air, making their way into his awaiting arms. Merlin smiled dwindled as he explained, Had you succumbed to my temptation moments ago, I wouldn't have given them to you, had you chosen to reject them outright, I wouldn't have given them to you either. You possess the initial qualifications to wield them, showcasing an ability to safeguard yourself and avoid falling into perilous situations. You have a promising future awaits based on your judgments of situations around so far. Merlin gazed into the distance, letting out a sigh, moreover, 
I don't have more time to wait. Existing for a millennium, I've finally awaited your arrival. The magic power dissipated over the ages is no longer sufficient for my sustenance. I understand you harbor many doubts, so allow me to unravel them for you. With these words, Merlin's phantom transformed into a vibrant light and entered Skylar's consciousness. Dizziness overcame Skylar, inundating him with memories that were not his own. A grand tableau unfolded, a spectacular war scene. Behind Merlin, countless human wizards and knights, each emanating formidable magical energies, stood ready for battle. On the opposing side stood a bewitching witch adorned in a jet-black, form-fitting robe that accentuated her graceful silhouette. Adorned with a pure black rose, she commanded legions of skeleton warriors, a three-headed six-armed half-snake man, and a lava monster engulfed in green flames. As the two factions collided, Skylar, a mere spectator within this memory, could sense the earth-shattering impact. Merlin, wielding a staff, lifted it high while reciting an ancient spell. A magic book levitated in the air, flipping to a specific page without any visible force. From its pages, clusters of white fireballs imbued with a holy aura surged forth, violently crashing into the opposing forces. Each volley incinerated ten or more skeletons into ashes. Devoid of any flying apparatus, the alluring witch ascended into the air, emitting a piercing roar. In an instant, she transformed into a colossal dark dragon exuding a tyrannical aura. Skylar swiftly identified her, Morgan Le Fay, Merlin's lifelong nemesis. Morgan Le Fay was the sole animagus known to morph into a magical creature, the Dark Dragon. Professor McGonagall had emphasized in class that animagi typically transformed into mundane creatures like cats, dogs, birds, or mice. Attempting a magical creature could lead to unforeseen calamities. Even Dumbledore, surpassing others in skill, had forsaken animagus magic because his patronus was the phoenix. Merlin's voice echoed, Morgan, by incarnating as a dragon, you defy a taboo, your soul will be damned, cursed, and eternally tormented. Even in her draconic form, Morgan comprehended Merlin's words. Emitting a long, deafening scream, she swiftly advanced towards Merlin, generating powerful winds that twisted and disrupted the formation of human warriors in her wake. As she neared Merlin, she unleashed a torrent of violent black flames, each flicker exuding a cursed breath, creating a terrifying cursed flame. Merlin caressed the ring adorning her hand, and Skylar, the onlooker, suddenly grasped the ring's name, the Ring of Guardian. A vibrant illusion of a palace materialized around Merlin, shielding her from the onslaught of the black flames. The flames crackled against the magical barrier but couldn't breach it. Merlin pointed at the magic book suspended in the air, shouting, Desperatio ad oblivionum. The magic book autonomously flipped to a specific page without any breeze, projecting an intricate magic circle. A profound black hole manifested above the battlefield as the magic circle materialized. Emitting an intense suction force, the black hole distorted the space visibly, compelling both sides to cease their combat and tactically withdraw from the affected area. The dragon form of Morgan roared defiantly, beating her wings in a desperate struggle against the magical circle's suction. Aware that the magic circle possessed formidable sealing capabilities, she understood its Achilles heel, exorbitant magical energy consumption. Even with Merlin's advanced magical prowess, sustaining the spell for an extended duration was an arduous task. Morgan needed only to endure until Merlin's magical reservoir was depleted, ensuring her triumph. As anticipated, a few minutes later, Merlin's countenance paled, and she involuntarily expelled a substantial spurt of blood, staining her pristine white robes a gruesome shade of blood red. Raising his staff, Merlin bellowed, Rod of Destiny, grant me strength. The dim bead affixed to the wand emitted a crimson radiance, propelling Merlin's magical power to an astonishing level. Skylar discerned that this wasn't genuine magical power growth, rather, Merlin employed herself as a vessel, tapping into the magical energy stored within the wand. This tactic carried an immense risk, as a single misstep could lead to the rupture of his physical form under the strain of external magic. Indeed, after a mere five seconds, Merlin's hands started to char to blacken scars. A pervasive decay emanated from the staff's grasp, spreading along the arm. As it progressed, muscles and skin succumbed to putrefaction. After harnessing the power of the staff, Merlin unleashed the might of the magic circle once more. Morgan, unable to resist the circle's suction, resorted to an unexpected tactic, 
one that defied all expectations. The dragon manifestation of Morgan emitted a poignant cry, enveloped in an eerie dark green flame. Beneath the relentless burning, scales and skin cracked, using the colossal dragon form to withstand the magic circle's force. Amidst this resistance, a diminutive black dragon burst forth from the larger dragon's body, morphing into a swift black streak that soared away. It was akin to a golden cicada shedding its exoskeleton. The memory abruptly concluded. While the outcome of the conflict remained unclear, the astute Skylar could deduce several key points. Firstly, the magic book functioned as a magical tool, not merely reading material. It documented ancient magic, accessible when paired with a specific incantation. Secondly, the ring's appellation was the Ring of Guardian. A mere stroke on its surface erected a protective barrier resembling a palace. Thirdly, the wand was dubbed the Rod of Destiny. Its bead possessed a function akin to an elder wand, temporarily augmenting the wielder's magical power. However, the stability of this enhancement was inferior to the elder wand, introducing considerable risk for the user. Fourth, Merlin's reference to the cause and effect from thousands of years ago pertains to the undead Morgana. In this brief recollection, Skylar distinctly heard Merlin's explanation of Morgana practicing animagus magic in the Forbidden Realm. By transforming into a dark, magical creature, Morgana knowingly incurred the consequences, a cursed soul incapable of true annihilation or death. This implies that Morgana may very well be alive in the present day. This revelation poses a considerable challenge. With Voldemort already wreaking havoc in the British magical world, Morgana, a witch from the Middle Ages, likely wields ancient magic of even greater potency. The extent of her capabilities could exacerbate the existing turmoil. What remains unclear is Morgana's connection to the Shadow Dragon. Skylar harbors suspicions of a correlation between the two entities. The alignment of the name, Shadow Dragon, with Morgana's abilities appears too coincidental. Moreover, given that the Shafiq family descends from the bloodline of Morgana's, Meredith's abduction by the Shadow Dragon might be intricately linked to the undead Morgana. In the recounted memory, although Morgana is not deceased, she likely suffered significant injuries. This may elucidate why Morgana's influence seems to vanish in subsequent historical accounts, leaving behind no further exploits. Perhaps, in order to recover from her severe injuries, Morgana had to enter a prolonged slumber. While her soul might be truly immortal, her physical body seemingly couldn't endure the passage of thousands of years. A chilling realization dawned on Skylar, Morgana needed a new physical vessel. Trelawney's divination flashed through his mind, and he connected the dots. The two coffins on the altar likely contained Morgana and Meredith. Recalling the inscription on the coffin, Soul Magic, sent shivers down Skylar's spine. The horrifying truth unfolded before him, Morgana sought to reconstruct her body, and the most straightforward method involved seizing a fitting vessel for her soul. The Shafiq family's descendants, sharing the same bloodline as Morgana, presented an ideal choice. Skylar realized his earlier misconception, the Shadow Dragon abducted Meredith not merely for her blood power but as a vessel for Morgana's resurrection. The Book of Merlin has been obtained. The Ring of Guardian has been obtained. The Rod of Destiny has been obtained. Fully equipped with the magical properties of Merlin's doesn't make Skylar's heart any lighter after realizing the true objective behind the Shadow Dragon organization. Skylar's head is a mess right now. Every second was spent thinking about how he should approach the problem toward the resurging forces of the Dark Middle Ages. The first week of November swiftly passed, giving way to the second week, which marked the commencement of the metamorphosis class. Professor McGonagall took the center stage, expounding on the intricacies of cross-species transfiguration. The complexity of transfiguration in the fourth year had escalated significantly, challenging even adept students like Daphne and Hermione. Now, what about Schuyler? In his nonchalant manner, he approached the subject with a unique perspective, considering it more of a supplemental endeavor rather than a rigorous academic pursuit. Skylar said the transfiguration courses in the first three years merely laid the groundwork for young wizards. Material transfiguration and reverse transfiguration dominated the initial years, involving transfigurations such as turning matches into needles, mice into snuff boxes, beetles into buttons, and rabbits into slippers. The spells were then used to revert these changes to their original states. With a solid grasp of theory, visualization techniques, 
and the right dose of confidence and determination, success in these foundational stages was practically assured. Despite the apparent simplicity, many young wizards, lacking patience and perseverance, stumbled at this level, including the likes of Neville and Ron. Only in the third grade did the Transfiguration class introduce superficial activation spells to material changes. For instance, the transfiguration of a teapot into a tortoise required the tortoise to exhibit signs of life, such as crawling, moving, and retracting into its shell. This addition brought an extra layer of complexity to the student's transfiguration endeavors. It is crucial to emphasize that Gamp's law of elemental transfiguration has a fundamental exception, magic cannot bring forth souls. Consequently, entities subjected to activation spells may exhibit lifelike movements, responding appropriately to their surroundings, creating a semblance of possessing a soul. However, these are mere illusions. The reality is far less mystical, these pseudo-beings are nothing more than a set of behavior patterns predetermined by a wizard through magic. The casting process allows for the integration of increasingly intricate behavioral patterns, with more advanced wizards or witches capable of executing complex transfigurations. Consider Professor McGonagall's giant chessboard, which mirrors the player's chess skills and strategic insight. Likewise, the armor, symbolic statues, and monstrous statues left by the four founders of Hogwarts showcase even greater sophistication, possessing a degree of autonomous thinking. They not only excel in various combat skills and weapon usage but also autonomously strategize to fortify the castle, engaging in group battles reminiscent of an indomitable, ironclad army. In stark contrast, Voldemort's proficiency in using the activation spell remains crude. His emphasis on the sheer power of magic results in the creation of aggressive corpses, refined from thousands of lifeless bodies. Despite their sheer numbers, immense strength, and formidable defense, these reanimated corpses lack any semblance of cognitive ability. Their attacks are purely instinctive, a deficiency that Dumbledore exploited, frightening them off with a mere display of fire. Certainly, Skylar did not underestimate the bad people in the original book. Voldemort's true strength lies in dark and combat magic, and it's impressive that he achieved such a level of proficiency in polymorphism. Moving into the fourth grade curriculum, the Transfiguration class has progressively become more challenging. It now involves the application of switching spell, wherein two items are simultaneously exchanged to alter the appearance of one another. Two months into the school year, Professor McGonagall is still stuck on the content of the first class. Students like Goyle, Crab, and Hufflepuff's Justin have not fared well, as their ears remain affixed to cacti, eliciting angry outbursts from Professor McGonagall. This struggle isn't unique to them, reportedly, students like Neville, Ron, and Michael are facing similar challenges in other classes. Daphne and Draco show better performance, managing to exchange the flowers of cacti and roses. However, their execution lacks the finesse and fluidity that the task demands. And then there's Skylar. In front of everyone, he casually nodded the wizard hat on his head and exchanged it with the witch hat on Professor McGonagall's head. Far from angering her, this feat earned Slytherin House 10 extra points, much to Professor McGonagall's delight. Professor McGonagall is genuinely concerned about the students' progress in this class. With numerous conversion mantras to learn this year, this segment remains foundational, and the slow progress is a cause for worry. Many challenging aspects are awaiting this group of young wizards, with the most formidable being cross-species transfiguration. Take, for instance, the transfiguration of a guinea fowl into a guinea pig. This particular spell involves two distinct physiological structures and life habits of the two species. The practitioner cannot succeed solely by visualizing the external appearance, they must also possess an understanding of the internal structure of both species. This requires a profound comprehension and memory. In the case of transforming a guinea fowl into a guinea pig, one must mentally map each bone of the guinea fowl to its corresponding bone in the guinea pig, ensuring a one-to-one -one correspondence for other body parts as well. Failure to execute this step accurately can result in incomplete changes to the skeleton, joints, and organs. Mistakes might include transforming the hind legs of the guinea pig into a form unsuitable for running, akin to a chicken's leg without joints, or altering the guinea pig's lower jaw in a way that hinders biting. A deformed creature with a skeletal structure resembling wings might be produced in extreme cases. The process doesn't conclude here. The wizard must also erase the bird-like instincts of the guinea fowl from the brain and replace them with the various behaviors typical of guinea pigs. 
Neglecting this step can lead to peculiar actions such as attempting to fly or pecking at insects, which are not behaviors typical of guinea pigs. However, for Schuyler, mastering OWL level transfiguration was a self study accomplishment, utilizing Professor McGonagall's notes on transfiguration acquired in the first grade. Even spells like Evanesco, typically introduced in the fifth grade and requiring only a touch, have become second nature for Schuyler. In simple terms, Schuyler is well prepared for the OWL exam. Schuyler's focus has shifted towards newt level transfiguration techniques, specifically the transfiguration spell and conjuring. Among these, conjuring is the magic that captures Schuyler's utmost fascination. Let's delve into the concept of conjuring first. As mentioned earlier, Conjuring involves creating something out of nothing through magical means. Spells like Avis and Draconifers are considered the two easiest and most stable spells within the Conjuring category. In truth, most wizards employ Conjuring spells to simplify their lives. For instance, in The Fate of the Hallows, the three Peveril brothers illusioned a bridge when faced with a river, thus saving themselves a journey. Professor Quirrell used a conjured rope to tie up Harry, and Professor Flittick conjured numerous golden bubbles while crafting Christmas decorations. While searching for Blake, even Dumbledore conjured several hundred purple sleeping bags in the hall. On the surface, conjuring may seem trivial, but its upper limit is remarkably high. Skilled practitioners of this art can be considered elite aurors, ranking at the top tier. They can hold their own even against formidable wizards and survive multiple encounters. As an interesting historical note, prior to 1984, supporters of the Appleby Arrows Quidditch team had a tradition of shooting arrows into the sky whenever a chaser scored a goal. Just envision the spectacle of a rain of arrows filling the sky. Note, this tradition was later deemed too dangerous and subsequently banned, as detailed in The Magical Quidditch Ball. In the opening chapter of the first book, Daedalus Diggle conjured a meteor shower in the skies over Kent. Just picture the scenario if he directed those meteors towards the Earth. Can any reader still claim that the Harry Potter universe is low in magical intensity? Of course, even if Daedalus possessed the potent ability to wreak havoc on the world, he certainly had sufficient magical prowess to control such extraordinary forces. Moreover, even if the Shooting Star spell has certain unknown limitations, there are also spells like Thundercloud and Tornado Magic at play. Take the Dartmoor Wilderness in 1379, during a European duel contest, for instance. In a decisive battle between the second and third runners-up, the second runner-up wizard conjured an immense thundercloud. This cloud not only unleashed a torrential downpour but also came with thunder and lightning attacks. Responding to this, the runner-up wizard employed a tornado magic spell, dispersing the thundercloud and sweeping away opponents, referees, spectators, and nearby trees in one fell swoop. Doesn't this sound like a world abundant with powerful magic? Why, then, did such spells not make an appearance in the original plot? Well, consider that there are very few group battles in the original work, and even when they do occur, chaos typically reigns among a limited number of participants. In such situations, using direct and impactful magic often takes precedence over employing range skills, it's simply more effective. Another combat spell that stands out is one demonstrated by Voldemort in the fifth book of the series during the intense battle between Dumbledore and Voldemort. Dumbledore unleashed a formidable spell at Voldemort, and instead of resorting to the barrier charm, Voldemort opted for a different approach. It's likely that he realized the Protego wouldn't suffice against this particular spell, underscoring the significance of choosing the right spell in actual combat. As for Skylar's interest was piqued by activating the talent of Metamorphmagus. He was eager to explore the potential effects of combining these two magical elements. In the usual routine, Professor McGonagall declared the class's end after covering the cross-species conversion assignments. Not waiting for the others to exit, Schuyler approached the podium and expressed his interest in learning the knowledge of Metamorphmagus. Professor McGonagall, taken aback, gazed at Schuyler for a few moments. Once the other students had left the classroom, she carefully articulated her response, Schuyler, I acknowledge that your learning progress surpasses that of your peers, but learning this kind of knowledge in the fourth grade is premature, that's content typically covered in the seventh grade curriculum. Professor McGonagall held a positive outlook on Schuyler's abilities and conveyed her advice genuinely. While Schuyler may have mastered the transfiguration spells and cross-species transfiguration, there are subsequent challenges, including the vanishing spell and, following that, the transfiguration spell. Metamorphing represents an even more advanced, 
intricate, and perilous magical skill compared to the Transfiguration spell. Skylar's eagerness for advancements in magical skills was bound to raise eyebrows, precisely what Professor McGonagall aimed to prevent. With a helpless smile, Skylar responded, Professor, I can't help it. My opponents on the Triwizard tournaments consist of seventh-year students, how can I face them with my limited knowledge of being something akin to a freshman? Professor McGonagall eyed him suspiciously, on the verge of declining once more. However, she was halted when she witnessed Skylar's wrist flick, casting a beam of light from his wand onto a nearby desk. The desk appeared to waver, quietly transforming into a replica of Skylar himself. Every detail, from the uniform to the wand, was an identical match. Although the expression seemed slightly sluggish, the eyes conveyed a sharpness that betrayed its artificial nature. In the final act, Skylar employed a flawless vanishing spell, causing it to vanish completely. The entire process involved four OWL level metamorphoses, material deformation, activation curse, conversion curse, and disappearance curse. Each step demonstrated impeccable perfection. Professor McGonagall's eyes narrowed as she recognized that the boy was showcasing his prowess in metamorphosis. While she could perform this level of transfiguration herself, achieving such mastery at the age of 14 was unparalleled. This was a true genius. Among her many students, even James Potter, the last transfiguration wizard who had appeared, couldn't match him, even with a head start. Come with me, Professor McGonagall said, her stern expression softening slightly as she led the way out of the classroom. Skylar's face lit up with joy as he hurriedly followed her. Once in her office, Professor McGonagall retrieved a precise book from the shelf and handed it to Skylar. Skylar glanced at the title, Transfiguration Notes. Opening the cover, he found every page filled with Professor McGonagall's meticulous notes. Delighted, he had come across this book in the library before, but it only contained the steps to practice metamorphology. Professor McGonagall's book, however, provided extremely detailed precautions and methods to enhance the success rate, precisely what he needed. Before we proceed, it's crucial to understand that metamorphosis is an exceedingly perilous transformation spell. I won't tolerate anyone practicing it in secret. Read this book thoroughly when you go back. Once you've gone through it, inform me beforehand when you plan to start practicing. I'll supervise the entire process to ensure your safety, Professor McGonagall cautioned, gradually losing the smile on her face and adopting a serious tone. Let me share a few examples to emphasize the severity and prove I'm not joking. She continued, the ancient Egyptian master of transformation, Sphinx, pushed the boundaries in her pursuit of transformation. Unfortunately, she ultimately blurred the line between structure and essence. She turned herself into a Sphinx monster during the transformation, losing emotion and reason. Similarly, the renowned ancient Greek witch Siren, in her quest for flight, sacrificed her own reason and completely shed her humanity, transforming into a harpy. Legend has it that her descendants, the harpies, still roam the Mediterranean today. Note, the harpy hobbit is a legendary creature in the Harry Potter world, and its existence has never been confirmed. However, every wizard is familiar with the term hobbit and the appearance and personality attributed to the legendary hobbit. In the original book, Ginny described the angry Vila as, like a hobbit. The holy head harpies, to which Gwynog Jones belongs, are named after the mythical harpies. Skylar was taken aback. He had suspected that there was a considerable risk of bodily deformation, but he hadn't anticipated the danger to be this severe. After a moment of contemplation, he asked, Professor, what is the distinction between structure and essence? If you alter the structure, doesn't the essence change accordingly? Professor McGonagall smiled and responded, an excellent question. The answer to this question may vary from person to person, but in my view, the essence pertains to your purpose and heart. Transfigurating the structure is merely a tool for the caster themselves, not the sought-after outcome. Only by maintaining the original purpose as a guiding light can the shapeshifter avoid losing their sanity. This principle holds true for any method of transformation. Skylar silently absorbed her words, refraining from further inquiries, and softly expressed, Thank you, Professor. Professor McGonagall's deep knowledge of transfiguration has been learned. As Skylar prepared to depart, Professor McGonagall remarked, You're welcome. I also hope that you can secure victory for the school. Skylar smiled and replied, Professor, thank you for your encouragement. While I can't guarantee a win, 
I can assure you that I will give it my all. You. A rare smile flickered in Professor McGonagall's eyes. Daring to say that. How audacious of you to defy the established rules and participate in the Triwizard Tournament without authorization. I really don't know what to make of you. However, Professor McGonagall softened her expression, the Goblet of Fire is discerning. If it has chosen you as a champion, it indicates that you are qualified for the competition. She couldn't help but recall another champion from Hogwarts. I don't know about Potter though. This tournament is challenging, and perilous elements are involved. I advise you to exercise caution and avoid unnecessary risks, understand? When McGonagall learned that Skylar had entered the Triwizard Tournament on his own, she was initially furious. She never expected Skylar, who consistently adhered to the rules, to act so recklessly. Yet, she found relief in the realization that, given Skylar's fourth-year status, he wouldn't have another opportunity to participate, considering the tournament's five-year cycle. Furthermore, his formidable skills were evident to all, in McGonagall's estimation, he could hold his own against seventh-year participants. Thank you for the concern, Professor. Skylar smiled before continuing, I understand, Professor. I'll be cautious, Skylar replied obediently. Professor McGonagall added, additionally, I believe it would be wise to seek Professor Dumbledore's advice. It's beneficial for a lower-grade student participating in an upper-grade competition. He is currently in his office, probably piled under all the work that he's been avoiding like the plague. Won't even be surprised if he is currently slumbering with cockroaches. Hearing this kind of reply that he would never get from watching the movie or reading the book made Skylar chuckle at Professor McGonagall's response. Professor Dumbledore. Might not be a bad idea to get an advice or two from him, Skylar thought, skeptic look was visible on his face. All right, Professor, I'll go see him, he replied. Skylar wasn't naive enough to believe that meeting Dumbledore was solely for the reasons Professor McGonagall mentioned. He could discern from her tone and expression that there was more to it. Professor McGonagall might be an exceptional witch and a master of transfiguration, but she was not a proficient liar. What could Dumbledore want with him? Various possibilities raced through Skylar's mind, with the most prominent being his participation in the Triwizard Tournament. Reflecting on recent events, he was confident that he hadn't left any discernible traces. Whether establishing the Serpentis Vigil or dealing with Kingsley's demise, there seemed to be minimal risk of exposure. Dumbledore's request likely had a purpose. Skylar considered that the inevitable might be catching up to him. Furthermore, with the revelations about Meredith and Morgan Le Fay, he had valid reasons to seek Dumbledore's counsel. Entering the principal's office, the portraits of the former headmasters feigned slumber on the wall, yet their half-open eyes attentively observed Skylar. Seated at the desk, Professor Dumbledore wore a friendly smile that barely concealed the depth of his scrutinizing gaze. It's been quite a while, Skylar. How was your summer vacation and your experience in fourth-grade campus life? Dumbledore inquired with genuine warmth. Skylar, no stranger to the seemingly amiable elder who was, in reality, a master chess player with brilliant strategic moves, was well aware of Dumbledore's astuteness. No matter how discreetly executed, every action at Hogwarts was challenging to conceal from the principal's discerning gaze. If Dumbledore's attention was allocated on a scale of ten points, five were on Harry, two on Ron and Hermione, and the majority of the remaining three focused on Skylar. Understanding Dumbledore's strategic priorities, Skylar had strategically positioned himself by having Daphne spearhead the establishment of the Serpentis Vigil. With Harry and himself attracting attention and additional support from characters like Mad-Eye Moody and Draco, Skylar doubted Dumbledore's omnipotence. After all, the principal wasn't a deity, no matter how powerful he was. Forgoing any pleasantries, Skylar addressed Dumbledore directly, Dear Professor, let's not beat around the bush. Did you call me here just to exchange greetings? For the first time, Dumbledore found himself momentarily taken aback. Despite his easygoing demeanor, his long-standing role as principal and the authority he wielded naturally instilled awe and, at times, trepidation in students. It was an unprecedented occurrence for a student to confront him so unabashedly. Responding with a smile, Dumbledore remarked, My dear child, there is truly no malice in my summoning you. As the headmaster, it is my duty to care for each student. Today, I simply wish to know if there's anything you'd like to discuss with me, perhaps about Meredith? Indeed, Skylar's insight proved accurate, 
Dumbledore had summoned him to the principal's office with the explicit intention of addressing matters related to Meredith. The moment Dumbledore broached the subject, Skylar's emotional vulnerability became evident. Skylar's pupils contracted slightly, and the mention of Meredith struck a chord deep within him. The pain associated with his perceived failures weighed heavily, as he grappled with an unwavering commitment to safeguard those close to him. As you brought up Meredith's situation, you must be aware that she has fallen into the clutches of the Shadow Dragon, Skylar's gaze bore a sharp intensity. I swear, I will rescue her, but... Skylar's tone resonated with unequivocal determination, before that, I need more strength. No one can impede me. His eyes locked onto Dumbledore, conveying a clear message, Professor, please understand, I no longer want anyone close to me to suffer harm. By the time he said that the fragments of nightmares that have been haunting him for the last few weeks were resurging inside his head. Skylar's declaration left no room for ambiguity, he sought strength, and anyone daring to obstruct his path was deemed an adversary. Dumbledore maintained a thoughtful silence, scrutinizing Skylar as if unraveling a complex puzzle. I am sorry child. I don't know how hard it has been for you lately, listen to what I am about to say closely. Admitting to a discomforting lack of control, Dumbledore sensed an otherworldly power emanating from Skylar. Though seemingly implausible, he entertained the notion that Skylar had transcended conventional boundaries. At this moment, Skylar wasn't the only source of disquiet challenging Dumbledore's sense of control. Recent events weighed heavily on his mind, creating a confluence of uncertainties. His intelligence network relayed disturbing information, in the small British town of Hangleton, a muggle named Bryce, tasked with guarding Riddle's house, had mysteriously vanished. Dumbledore had a strong intuition that this incident was undeniably connected to that individual. Compounding his concerns, news arrived from the Order of the Phoenix revealing the demise of Kingsley Shacklebolt, a trusted ally. Despite the official narrative of his death during a mission against five werewolves, Dumbledore found the account implausible. How could three skilled Aurors falter against a handful of werewolves? Something felt amiss. The unsettling reports didn't end there. The International Wizarding Federation delivered disconcerting intelligence, a dark wizard had forcefully breached the Indonesian Ministry of Magic, exploiting the international FLU network to escape to Europe. While the Indonesian Ministry might not be the most formidable, its breach by an ordinary dark wizard raised eyebrows. Closer to home, Hogwarts itself had become a hotbed of peculiar incidents. Hagrid's report disclosed extensive burns discovered in the Forbidden Forest. Dumbledore personally investigated the scene, confirming it to be the aftermath of a potent curse. The presence of suspected dark wizards in the Forbidden Forest raised alarming questions. Individuals proficient in casting powerful fire spells without facing significant backlash are typically formidable and not likely to pose a direct threat to the safety of Hogwarts students. Moreover, the caster of the intense fire curse in the Forbidden Forest seemed to possess extensive knowledge of such curses. The extensive destruction, particularly the decimation of eight-eyed spiders, showcased a mastery of fire curses rarely witnessed. Reflecting on recent events, Dumbledore recalled Minerva's report of a confrontation between the Malfoy twins and Alastair Moody on the first day of school. Investigating further, he discovered that Draco had successfully blocked Moody's attack. Subsequently, Draco and Skylar collaborated to unleash a formidable magical assault, compelling Moody to resort to an unfamiliar spell similar to Protego for defense. The entire incident raised numerous red flags for Dumbledore. Whether it was Draco's ability to block Moody's attack, the potent combination of Draco and Skylar posing a genuine threat to Moody, or Moody's utilization of an unfamiliar barrier spell, all aspects left Dumbledore deeply concerned. As if these challenges weren't enough, Dumbledore harbored suspicions about all four Triwizard Tournament contestants. The nature of the competition between Skylar and Harry seemed peculiar, and Dumbledore could only speculate about the underlying motives. Additionally, he had reservations about Skylar's participation, suspecting that Skylar had surpassed a realm that defied clear explanation. In Harry's case, Dumbledore speculated that he was coerced into the tournament and manipulated by an enigmatic figure, though the orchestrator's connection to Hogwarts remained unclear. The unexpected participation of the Moreau and Hohenheim families left Dumbledore perplexed, as he was aware that these families concealed deeper complexities beyond their reputation as prominent pure-blood families. The alchemy school associated with the Hohenheim family hinted at potential involvement in dark necromantic alchemy concerning the manipulation of the human body, 
a realm considered taboo within the field of alchemy. Moreover, the presence of Grindelwald in the Moreau family's lineage raised further concerns, the reasons for which were self-evident. Balancing these considerations became mentally taxing for Dumbledore, especially with Harry concurrently developing a plan that demanded his exhaustive attention. Consequently, Daphne successfully concealed her establishment of the Serpentis Vigil, as Dumbledore found himself incapable of diverting more attention to the other young wizards at Hogwarts. Breaking the silence, Dumbledore spoke in his most gentle tone, My child, remember that you are not alone. Meredith, too, is a student of Hogwarts. As the principal, I am responsible if there's anything troubling a student. Feel free to seek my help anytime. Skylar maintained an expressionless demeanor but inwardly, he questioned whether this old man intended to show him favoritism. Dumbledore decided not to dwell on the topic further and continued, the pursuit of power is not inherently wrong. I only caution you not to lose yourself and to remember your original intentions. I have seen many students as talented and ambitious as you, more. Dumbledore's words trailed off, and he lapsed into silence. His expression reflected a weariness that seemed to transcend his age, harking back to times long past. For Skylar, the weight of Dumbledore's burdens became palpable. Despite Dumbledore's outward display of power and wisdom, he couldn't escape the reality of being a 113-year-old man, burdened by the weight of his past. A life devoted to facing two generations of the Dark Lord now seemed to extend its worries to the potential emergence of a third Dark Lord. Aware of his own predicament, Skylar recognized that he had antagonized at least two formidable adversaries, the Shadow Dragon and the Ghost Society. After careful consideration, even though he was reluctant to owe Dumbledore any favors, he acknowledged the impracticality of building a comprehensive intelligence network from scratch quickly. Relying on Dumbledore's established network appeared to be the more sensible choice. Yet, an internal struggle persisted between adhering to his plan, commitment to his destiny, and the potential need for compromise. The image of Meredith's face flickered in Skylar's mind, bringing with it memories of a poignant kiss in the tea house and the lifelong commitment she had expressed. His heart ached, torn between conflicting emotions. The pain he felt was profound, as if his very being was being pulled apart. In this struggle, he realized that he couldn't be indifferent. While he had been willing to sacrifice his friendship with Hermione for the sake of family and ambition, Meredith held a distinct place in his heart, surpassing even Hermione. With a resolution formed in his mind, Skylar decided to address the unspoken concerns lingering between him and Dumbledore. Professor, let's not play coy with veiled hints, Skylar asserted. I'm aware that you've harbored suspicions and concerns about me. Ultimately, isn't it because I belong to the Malfoy family, and you fear I might align with the Death Eaters, following the path of those other pureblood families? He continued emphatically, I can assure you now that your concerns are unfounded. I have no intention of joining the Death Eaters. In fact, everything I've done so far has been aimed at distancing my family from the Death Eaters, sparing you from being entangled in the war between Death Eaters and your side. Dumbledore responded with a smile. To be honest. I never worried that you would become Voldemort's subordinate, he remarked, his eyes gleaming. It's simply because he is not worthy. I must admit that living for as long as I have provides a certain advantage in understanding people. I've encountered countless individuals, and I can confidently say, you cannot be swayed, even if that person is Voldemort, Dumbledore added with a positive tone. Certainly, this sentence can be interpreted in various ways, such as implying that Skylar might become a new Dark Lord. Skylar let out a sigh and spoke slowly, Professor, my pursuit is simple, to attain enough power to protect those close to me and lead a life with dignity. Continuing, Skylar said, Professor, you're likely aware that over the summer, I gained some knowledge of wizarding law from Mrs. Amelia. I've come to realize that, although the wizarding world appears to be governed by laws, there are evident loopholes in these laws and regulations. For instance, certain muggle products like radios and sports cars are deemed legal, while others like TV sets and blankets are not. And let's not even mention the Minister of Magic, who, as part of the administration, holds the authority to alter laws at will and even possesses the capability to exempt individuals from jurisdiction, the power of the Wisengamot members within the system. No matter how appealing the slogans may be, they can't mask the harsh reality that power reigns supreme in the wizarding world, Skylar spoke eloquently, Professor, you wield power and can choose to use it benevolently, but it's unrealistic to expect everyone to follow your example. 
Power has a corrupting influence, as evidenced by the officials at the Ministry of Magic. Despite their claims of authority, during the last Wizarding War, they crumbled like dry leaves in front of the Dark Lord, persecuting muggles and the innocent. Their actions spoke louder than words. Skylar maintained a firm tone as he concluded, in the wizarding world, those without power are deemed unworthy of wealth and status. This is the brutal reality. Coming out of a fourth-year student's mouth, the words that Skylar uttered bring forth more than just a weight of responsibility laid across the intention of his actions. Dumbledore leaned in, showing a more serious expression on his face as he listened attentively to what Skylar was about to say. Dumbledore observed Skylar in silence for a while. Eventually, he spoke slowly, you've made a valid point. The pursuit of power is indeed inherent in human nature. Power can bring benefits, glory, authority, and, in terms of benefits, it can safeguard one's dignity and protect those close to us. He continued with intensity in his gaze, the crucial question is whether you possess the ability to control power, rather than being consumed by it. The truly strong individual wields power responsibly, avoiding its abuse. Have you heard the tale of the Peveril brothers? The eldest brother, relying too heavily on power, ultimately faced destruction. Skylar responded assertively, Professor, you make it sound simple. Harry's father and Sirius were both unregistered animagi, right? Why didn't I see you report them, have them sent to Azkaban, and let Harry become the son of a criminal? Professor Moody attacked muggles, and it made headlines in the newspapers. Yet, under Mr. Weasley's interference, nothing happened. This doesn't seem like the so-called responsible use of power, does it? He concluded coldly, it's evident that everyone unconsciously leverages the power in their hands to shape events in their favor. Skylar locked eyes with Dumbledore and whispered, the difference lies in the fact that you have your sense of justice, and I have mine, my own sense of justice. Skylar felt a bit weary of the philosophical advice he was receiving. Without waiting for Dumbledore to respond, he continued, if you're here to discuss my registration for the Triwizard Tournament, I'll be up front, I broke the rules. I went against the age restrictions you set and participated in the tournament, but my motivation was solely to attain greater power, nothing more. I have no interest in world domination or the pursuit of immortality. Dumbledore's eyes seemed to brighten, and he smiled, saying, Child, you've misunderstood me. I never doubted that you would join the Death Eaters, and I won't determine your future solely based on your lineage. I can assure you of this. Hogwarts is an incredibly inclusive institution, and the school has had students from Death Eater families before. We enroll these students because we believe that every young soul is extraordinary and worthy of our protection. I am genuinely pleased, my boy. I am truly happy that you've chosen to confide in this old man today. With this, Dumbledore eased the first concern in his heart. One of the reasons he recruited Skylar was because he sensed Skylar's fervent desire for power, combined with the impact of Meredith's disappearance on him. He worried that Skylar might succumb to extreme thoughts and embrace the dark path. Thus, he wanted to have an open conversation to guide him away from that dangerous trajectory. Certainly, this is just one aspect. Another reason is the recent influx of unsettling events, creating a sense of unease that prompted Dumbledore to seek reassurance for his plans. He no longer intends to let Skylar develop independently but rather intends to involve him directly in the plans he made. Dumbledore regarded Skylar kindly and spoke gently, saying, I've come to talk to you today primarily about your thoughts and to determine how, as the principal, I can offer you assistance. Is this a green light? Skylar wondered inwardly. It appears the old man is unaware of Serpentus' vigil and Kingsley's demise. Despite Skylar's seemingly straightforward demeanor, facing one of the wisest wizards of the century, he couldn't help but entertain some degree of deception. Several thoughts crossed his mind at that moment. Maybe Dumbledore isn't as all-knowing and all-powerful as some believe, perhaps those fan fictions from his previous life set expectations too high. Dumbledore, of course, remained unaware of Skylar's internal musings as he continued, there are a few significant matters I wish to discuss with you. Let me begin with the first one. Skylar, I sense a familiar magic within you, though faint. I believe I cannot be mistaken. Have you, by any chance, already made contact with the books of Abatel? Skylar was momentarily taken aback. Dumbledore not only knew about Abatel but could also sense the familiar magic within him. Was it possible that? 
Dumbledore perceived the realization in Skylar's eyes and, with a smile, said, You don't need to divulge the origin of your abatel. I harbor no covetous intentions toward it. He then produced a book from his drawer, adding, Since you have established contact with Abatel may find use for it in the upcoming Triwizard Tournament, consider this book a gift from the principal in recognition of your contributions to the school's honor. True to expectations, Dumbledore presented Abatel Volume 4. Although a surge of excitement coursed through Skylar, he managed to maintain a composed demeanor. Despite his yearning for this magical tome, he was not one to easily accept kindness, especially from someone like Dumbledore. Dumbledore was widely acknowledged as the most brilliant chess player in the original books. Even in death, his plans continued to impact the events involving Voldemort. Given Dumbledore's reputation, Skylar found it hard to believe that there wasn't some underlying motive behind this gift. Professor, Skylar spoke cautiously, as the saying goes, there is no free lunch. Firstly, when I entered the Triwizard Tournament, I violated the rules, and there's no guarantee I could secure victory for Hogwarts in the competition, considering my opponents were all seasoned wizards. I believe it would be more fitting to receive this gift based on the contributions I make, don't you think? Is that so? Dumbledore's eyes gleamed with an enigmatic light. I don't share the same perspective. I hold great optimism for you, Skylar, Dumbledore spoke in a gentle tone. I don't perceive you as inferior to them in any way. In fact, I believe, you are the most formidable contender in this tournament. Skylar inclined his head slightly, entering a thoughtful silence. One could only wonder, was such praise truly warranted from Dumbledore? Throughout the semester, Skylar had intentionally kept a low profile. While the collaboration with Draco showcased an impressive combination of spells, it was crucial to note that it involved the use of a family secret incantation. The potential synergies from sharing the same bloodline caster in this particular spell remained uncertain. As for his success in resisting the Imperius curse during the defense against Dark Arts class and mastering the Transfiguration spells, were these not merely the achievements of an exemplary student? One could hardly label them as extraordinary. It appeared as though Dumbledore, much like Merlin, possessed a unique insight into Skylar. Despite lacking magical eyes, these venerable wizards seemed adept at employing mysterious methods of detection, creating an unsettling mystery. Dumbledore surveyed Skylar's reaction with a contented smile. Before you accept this gift, I would like to share a few words with you, he continued. Are you familiar with the tale of Abatel? Yes, Professor, Skylar responded, Abatel boasts a rich history, believed to have emerged before the establishment of Hogwarts. Its authorship remains a mystery, likely the work of multiple contributors. During a war, the compendium was fragmented into eight pieces, some of which even made their way into Muggle World publishing houses, revealing portions of the contents. Each volume corresponds to a distinct magical field, encompassing magic spells, magical mechanics, transfigurations, learning, charmology, enchantment, curse, spirit, and soul. You've truly astonished me, every detail you provided is accurate, Dumbledore acknowledged with a nod. This volume in my possession is dedicated to metamorphosis, specifically the magical domain of polymorphism. I've heard of your intention to learn about human body transformation from Minerva, and this book may prove instrumental for you. Lastly, I must inquire, have you encountered knowledge about the six legendary books? The six great books? Schuyler questioned in puzzlement. Why was this information surfacing now? It sounded reminiscent of cliched narratives from the world of online essays. Could this be another whimsical tale from the old man? Dumbledore spoke deliberately, the so-called six great books aren't merely legends, they are tangible realities, though very few are acquainted with them. I learned of them from an old acquaintance of mine. Allow me to elaborate. Old acquaintance again. Perhaps an old flame. Schuyler pondered cynically in his heart. The six great books represent a significant legacy, and it's believed that our magical theories have evolved based on the knowledge contained within them, Dumbledore continued. These books are categorized into white and black magic, with the first three being devoted to white magic and the last three to black magic. It's essential to note that my reference to black magic doesn't imply criticism, magic's nature depends on the intentions of its wielder. Learning about dark magic doesn't automatically make someone a dark wizard. Inquisitively, Schuyler asked, May I ask, Professor, do you know the origins of these six great books and their current whereabouts? The first book is the epitome of alchemy, 
and my old friend Nicholas once possessed half of it, Dumbledore smiled and revealed, I have reason to believe that he passed it on to you before his demise. What? Schuyler's thoughts immediately raced to the locked book he had received from Nicholas. This mysterious tome bore no title on its cover and was secured by a special alchemical lock that could only be opened through alchemy. Despite Schuyler's considerable prowess in alchemy, he remained unable to decipher the lock. Reflecting on this, he couldn't help but marvel at the true strength of Nicholas and long for the knowledge concealed within that enigmatic book. Simultaneously, another question surfaced in Schuyler's mind, Professor, are you suggesting that Mr. Flamel's extraordinary alchemical abilities were derived from only half of the book? Yes, Dumbledore nodded solemnly. That's precisely why Nicholas's alchemical legacy is incomplete. Despite being hailed as the most potent alchemist of his era, there's an underlying bitterness in his story. Due to the incomplete inheritance, his successful creation of the Philosopher's Stone was essentially a fortuitous event that couldn't be replicated. He was unable to produce another Philosopher's Stone, and regrettably, he couldn't pass on this knowledge to others. Schuyler was intrigued by this revelation. So, Nicholas Flamel's single creation of the Philosopher's Stone wasn't due to deliberate choice, but rather a limitation imposed by the incomplete inheritance. But how did this connect to taking on apprentices? Dumbledore anticipated Schuyler's queries and elucidated, Nicholas had a benevolent nature. He didn't wish to sever the inheritance, but he was more concerned that it would fall into the wrong hands, the incomplete knowledge might tempt someone into attempting to refine the Philosopher's Stone without his unique luck. Failing in the refining process would not only squander materials but also potentially unleash a series of unforeseen disasters. Understanding dawned on Schuyler. So, is there any information on the whereabouts of the other half of this book, he inquired. Dumbledore fell silent, his gaze fixed meaningfully on Schuyler, a glint of uncertainty in his eyes. After a prolonged pause, Dumbledore spoke, speaking of which, have you heard of the Hohenheim family? A spark of intrigue lit up Schuyler's eyes. Could this truly be connected to the Hohenheim family? Schuyler responded, I'm familiar with them. They are a renowned pure-blood family in Germany, known for their expertise in family healing magic and alchemy. The ancestors are said to be the enigmatic Paracelsus. Dumbledore maintained his gentle smile. You seem to be quite well informed. Indeed, the Hohenheim family is rumored to focus their alchemical pursuits on refining the human body. Schuyler, feigning contemplation, paused before responding, achieving immortality. Dumbledore's gaze deepened, and he spoke in a hushed tone, that would be my conjecture. As we know, alchemy seeks, in succession, immortality, followed by, resurrection from the dead, and ultimately, transcending eternity. I surmise that Nicholas hesitated to progress beyond the initial stage after knowing what lies beyond that boundary. Nicholas clung to this state, perhaps relying on chance, because his inherited knowledge only encompassed the aspect of immortality. Consequently, while he attempted to maintain the immortality of his soul and body, he inevitably succumbed to the ravages of aging. This aging manifested not only in his physical form but also in his soul, resulting in emotional detachment and a numbing of the spirit. I suspect that the secrets recorded in the lower half of the book pertain to overcoming the deficiencies of the Philosopher's Stone. Dumbledore's eyes gleamed suddenly. And the Hohenheim family, dedicated to the study of the human body and soul, has become the subject of this particular topic I am discussing with you. So, Professor, you suspect that they possess the lower half of the book? Schuyler inferred, grasping Dumbledore's implication. After all, what else in this world could offer better resistance to aging than refining both body and soul? Dumbledore maintained a stoic silence, fixing his gaze directly into Schuyler's eyes. After a pregnant pause, he posed a question, Schuyler, have you ever come across the Knights of Valpurgis? Schuyler's response was instantaneous, he froze for a moment before nodding in understanding. A testament to his discernment, he had quickly grasped Dumbledore's intended meaning. Professor, what do you imply? Schuyler inquired. Are you suggesting a connection between the Hohenheim family and the Knights of Valpurgis? Dumbledore's eyes gleamed with a certain intensity. You are acquainted with the Knights of Valpurgis, I see, he acknowledged. I have been monitoring this organization for an extended period. Initially, I suspected it to be a faction allied with Voldemort due to its intricate ties with the pure-blooded families of Great Britain. However, my intelligence network revealed a different narrative. 
The Knights of Valpurgis predates Voldemort's existence and has left its mark on significant global wizarding conflicts, including the tragic war that swept the wizarding world led by Grindelwald at the turn of this century, Dumbledore continued. I diligently pursued their trail and discovered that their influence extended beyond Britain. Many pivotal international events in the past century, and even earlier, bear their clandestine involvement, from the Goblin Rebellion in the 18th century to the Italian Civil War in the 17th century and the genocide of the blood-sucking royal family in the 15th century. They operate like a venomous serpent lurking in the shadows, poised to strike at opportune moments. While concrete evidence may be elusive, my conviction is rooted in numerous compelling reasons, Dumbledore declared in a grave tone. The pure-blood families of Great Britain merely scratched the surface, I believe that many ancient pure-blood families across Europe, North America, and even Africa may count themselves among its members. Among them, Dumbledore paused significantly before stating with solemnity, the Hohenheim family and the Moreau family are implicated. Enough of this. Schuyler felt like he didn't want to keep everything to himself anymore, so he decided to share what's been bothering him toward Dumbledore. The pursuit of power and the six intriguing books we've discussed are merely appetizers. The real focus of our conversation is the reason the old man with the white beard finds himself in this situation today. Schuyler responded with a disdainful snort, Professor, are you familiar with the Ghost Society at Hogwarts? They're the clandestine student organization carrying on the legacy of the Valpurgis Knights. And, just so you know, they have a bit of unfinished business with me. Consider it a small holiday gift. A shadow crossed Dumbledore's eyes at the mention of the Ghost Society, triggering memories of Voldemort. Originally known as the Knights of Valpurgis at Hogwarts, this organization served as a breeding ground for quasi-death eaters under Voldemort's influence. However, it underwent a transformation, renaming itself the Ghost Society after the suppression of Armando Dippet and his two lieutenants. Despite its disappearance over the years, it had clearly resurfaced without Dumbledore's notice. He sighed, a tangible sign of the weariness settling in. Perhaps he truly was growing old. The realization hit him like a wave. Harry's development fell short of expectations, was it wise to continue placing all his hopes on the prophecy? I haven't dealt with them yet. I didn't think they'd resurface. Skylar's tone turned icy. Since they've dared to come knocking, I might as well use this opportunity to remind them that the Malfoy family is not to be trifled with. In Skylar's mind, he was almost certain that these two formidable female warriors were after him. After all, the prominent adversaries in the original book were undeniably Victor Crumb and Fleur Delacour. And he happened to be the most significant variable in this world. Unless there are other unknown transversers in this realm, it is solely oneself capable of dismantling the original plot. The lingering question is, what is the purpose of the Knights of Valpurgis for themselves? The Ghost Society had targeted him, but he refrained from retaliating. Gemma initiated the attack in the initial encounter, yet her actions were marked by evident mercy. She deliberately disclosed a wealth of information before striking, despite the severed friendship, Skylar harbored no genuine desire for revenge. As for Hogwarts, the Knights of Alpurgis scattered across Europe had never laid a finger on the institution. The perplexing aspect was the sudden reappearance of these two dormant, discreet, and enigmatic families. What had they done to incur such vehement animosity? He considered a possibility. Unless. For Schuyler, understanding the motives of the other party was paramount at this juncture. An embryonic conjecture had already taken root in his mind. Schuyler, exercise caution, Dumbledore warned. The involvement of how many pure-blood families lurk behind Valpurgis and the extent of their power has always been shrouded in mystery. The global wizarding war of that year implicated, at the very least, pure-blood families from Great Britain, France, Germany, Austria. Had it not been for the affluent families contributing funds and manpower, the war wouldn't have escalated into a protracted conflict, spanning across all of Europe and even reaching North America. Just as the saints suffered defeat, I anticipated that Valpurgis would be severely weakened, yet they resurfaced in the conflict led by Voldemort mere decades later. Their power's background is likely more formidable than we initially assumed, Dumbledore remarked, his eyes flashing with insight. Even if, one day, its historical roots trace back to an era predating Hogwarts, I wouldn't consider it an accident. But, more crucially, you must comprehend the current situation, Dumbledore emphasized. Now that you're acquainted with the details of the other two warriors, I can rest easy. 
exercise caution and refrain from unnecessary bravado. If you find yourself in peril during the game, extricate yourself promptly to ensure your safety. Don't fret, Professor, Skylar assured with a smile. Leave it to Potter. I believe he needs to grasp this more than I do. Dumbledore didn't pursue the topic regarding Potter, maintaining a poker-faced expression that concealed his thoughts. He blinked. Returning to our earlier discussion, Dumbledore resumed. Most of the other six books are missing. The crucial volumes vanished with the passing of the revered, Dumbledore continued, with the revered mainly denoting the magic of the omitted school. I suspect that this particular tome is in the possession of the omitted, a clandestine organization surviving underground. They exclusively recruit wizards proficient in omitted magic, and a significant portion of their membership consists of omitted. Abatel is comprised of eight volumes. Apart from the one in my possession, the whereabouts of the other volumes elude me. However, rumors suggest that the Pruitt family, an elusive lineage concealed from the world for centuries, supposedly holds two volumes of Abatel. It appears they adhere to some ancestral precepts, aiming to complete the entire set of eight volumes. The Omitted is in the possession of the Omitted, constituting the core inheritance of Omitted. This inheritance is the linchpin that enables Omitted to Omitted. Omitted is a wizard renowned as the sole practitioner of Omitted in the magical world. This unique status is pivotal for various undisclosed reasons. As for the last book, Omitted, I've been unable to locate it, but a significant suspicion lingers in my mind. I suspect it is Omitted. Regarding how this individual acquired the book, I'm genuinely clueless. Fascinating. Are there new forces at play? Have new families emerged? Omitted, family. Pruitt family. Omitted. Perhaps accustomed to such revelations, Skylar found it challenging to be stirred. The well-informed Skylar understands that the realm of wizardry boasts families with extensive legacies beyond the holy 28 pure-blood families. He has long been aware that some discreet and mysterious wizarding families exist, evading widespread recognition. While these families may not be in the limelight, their heritage is nothing short of remarkable. Much like the obscured heritage of, omitted, the envy and jealousy surrounding it are palpable. Skylar, well versed in the plot, understands that Dumbledore may still harbor undisclosed information, omitted, s inheritance goes beyond what meets the eye. In the second part of the Fantastic Beasts movie, Dumbledore explicitly mentioned that, omitted, bloodline inheritance gives birth to individuals with the ability to, omitted, encompassing potent, omitted, as well as those with unique but seemingly weaker abilities. Note, omitted, is the author's private translation. Take, for instance, the Potter family, tracing their lineage back to Linfred in the 12th century. Ostensibly known for inventing the bone revitalizing elixir, the flu curing effervescent potion, and the hair smoothing lotion, the one Hermione used at the prom, these patents have accrued significant wealth for the family. Despite the impression that their success relies solely on these patents, either sold or already expired, the truth is different. Linfred's eldest son, Hardwin Potter, discreetly married the granddaughter of the third brother of Peverier, thereby acquiring the inheritance of the fabled invisible cloak of death. Hence, the existence of hidden families in the wizarding world is not surprising. All right, Dumbledore handed the book to Skylar. Accept it, my boy. You need it, and I need you to trust your headmaster, Dumbledore playfully blinked and added, consider this book the inception of our mutual trust building. Skylar accepted the book. Abatel had been an invaluable aid, and the first three volumes alone had significantly elevated his current strength. This was especially pertinent given his current focus on transfiguration and how to deal with metamorphosis, with Abatel change proving timely in his studies. Abatel Volume 4, Acquired I've delivered what I needed to share with you today, Dumbledore stated, concluding the meeting. Do you have any questions for me? After a moment of contemplation, Skylar spoke, Professor, I want to inquire if there's any way to crack it. Dumbledore paused briefly before responding, yes, unless you, omitted, you will never be able to crack it. Why this sudden interest? Skylar replied earnestly, I've uncovered the truth about Meredith's abduction. The Shadow Dragon is, in fact, an organization established by the Black Witch Morgan Le Fay in the 10th century. I've learned that Morgana practiced animagus magic, ensuring her soul's persistence. Meredith, strictly speaking, belongs to her descendant bloodline, 
serving as a potential vessel for her resurrection. Dumbledore's brow furrowed deeply. Resurrection magic. This. This sounds rather intricate. Dumbledore declared solemnly. There are numerous dark arts involving possession, but most can only attach to a container for a short duration due to the inherent repulsion between the container and the soul. As far as I know, there is only one method to truly merge the soul of the host, Dash, Skylar urgently inquired, so, Professor, what happens after the fusion? Will Meredith's soul still endure? Sorry, Skylar, Dumbledore's eyes betrayed a hint of distress, his voice softening as he replied, the stronger soul will engulf the weaker one. If your information is accurate, and the other party is indeed the Black Witch from a thousand years ago, there's no doubt that Meredith's soul will be consumed. Despite being mentally prepared, Dumbledore's response hit Skylar like a bomb. His heart felt as if it had plummeted into an ice-cold cellar. Observing Skylar's visibly distressed expression, Dumbledore couldn't help but exhibit a complex gaze. He saw through the facade and was confident in his assessment. Though Skylar maintained a stoic demeanor, a fleeting glimpse of genuine sorrow betrayed his eyes. This child wasn't Voldemort. Regardless of his remarkable abilities, he was just a child. Simultaneously, doubts lingered in Dumbledore's mind about how Skylar took that decisive step. Could it be that he completely misunderstood? That Skylar hadn't severed the soul's ties at all? An even more ludicrous notion surfaced involuntarily. Had this kid trodden a different magical path altogether? Was it possible? The silver lining, Dumbledore softly comforted Skylar, is that, magic is an inherently time-consuming process. It necessitates two distinct phases of, and dash, to, signifies a process of, during this stage, the body undergoes continuous transformations, gradually resembling the appearance of the resurrected person. However, it won't be an exact match but an intermediate stage between the resurrected and the host. The phase is crucial, requiring the resurrector to engage in dash, borrowing the power of, to dash, Skylar struggled to voice his query, Professor, please be direct. How much time do I have? Dumbledore shook his head, I'm afraid I cannot provide a definitive answer. It depends on how long Meredith's will can withstand her, as if unable to witness Skylar's anguish any longer, he diverted his gaze toward the small lamp on the ceiling. But I fear, you may not have much time left. Skylar didn't recall how he bid farewell to Dumbledore or how he retraced his steps to the dormitory room. Always composed and shrewd, he now appeared soulless, lost in a fog of confusion. He didn't change his clothes, lying on the bed with unblinking eyes fixed on the ceiling. He dared not close his eyes, apprehensive that shutting them would expose him to Meredith's heartbroken visage. Suddenly, his magical power surged, coursing through his mind, infusing it with a chilling clarity that jolted him awake. Skylar marveled at the self-awareness and protective nature of his magical power. It had the capacity to safeguard and alert the host, a trait he had experienced. Before when Merlin attempted to amplify his greed and entice him with magical artifacts. He tightened his fist, muttering to himself, what am I doing? There is still hope for Meredith, I can't give up here. Taking a moment to collect his thoughts, he deduced that Meredith's likely location was Shafiq's old house, a place seemingly impenetrable unless the secret was divulged, an assertion both Dumbledore and Voldemort corroborated. Unable to infiltrate, Skylar resolved to lead people out. Three known members of the Shadow Dragon exist, Moody, Mrs. Shabini, and Mrs. Selwyn. Moody, however, was off-limits due to his potential involvement in Voldemort's plans, complicating matters. In that case, Skylar's eyes gleamed, that leaves Mrs. Shabini in Mrs. Selwyn. A plan crystallized in his mind, but before executing it, he needed assurance that his strength could contend with unknown adversaries. After all, enhancement of strength was imperative. Fourth grade classes were not limited to the increasingly challenging transfiguration lessons at Hogwarts. In the magical creatures department, the once diminutive blast-ended scruts had grown into formidable creatures, each now reaching three feet in length with astonishing strength. No longer the fleshy, carapaceless beings of their infancy, they had developed a thick, shiny, grey-white armor-like exterior. Resembling a cross between a giant scorpion and an elongated crab, their anatomy remained puzzling, with the location of the head and eyes still unclear. These creatures had become exceptionally powerful and challenging to control. 
Undeterred by the difficulty, Hagrid assigned students the peculiar task of tethering a snail with a rope and taking it for a walk. Throughout the lesson, a disconcerting crackling sound punctuated the air, signifying the explosive discharge from the tail of a blast-ended screw, propelling the snail forward and occasionally toppling unsuspecting students to the ground. Since Schuyler vouched for Hagrid on a previous occasion, their relationship had slightly improved. Hagrid, known for his disdain for the Malfoy family in the original book, refrained from comment when he witnessed Schuyler and Daphne holding hands and chatting while guiding lobsters. It was a rare moment of warmth and camaraderie during class. Meanwhile, the unfortunate Slytherins were tasked with managing a blast-ended scrut each, leading to a chorus of complaints from both Slytherin and Gryffindor students after the class concluded. The charms class focused on Accio, a spell not inherently challenging in pronunciation or gestures. Its true difficulty lay in the capacity to vividly visualize the desired outcome in one's mind. For instance, if one sought to summon a cow, the necessity was to picture a vivid picture of a cow with greater detail, enhancing the spell's efficacy. Additionally, magical power posed a constraint, while fourth grade students could grasp the basics, mastering it was beyond their current capabilities. Most magical items possessed inherent magical resistance, making it challenging to summon items unless one was the original owner, akin to Harry. Breaking through this limitation necessitated at least aura level magical proficiency. Furthermore, magical creatures, encompassing animals and plants, also exhibited their magic resistance. At the fourth grade level, the pinnacle achievement would be summoning a flobber caterpillar. However, it was essential to acknowledge that Accio carried inherent dangers. In 1743, the infamous anti-Muggle activist Gideon Flatworthy attempted to summon a product from nearby Muggle farmers, presuming he could appropriate it for himself. Tragically, he miscalculated the force while casting the spell, leading to a fatal beating by the summoned haystacks and cattle. Note, Gideon Flatworthy is derived from The Book of Spells, serving as an anti-Muggle activist opposing wizards mimicking Muggle tasks. Certainly, Slytherin's young wizard had undergone extensive training under Schuyler's guidance over the past three semesters, exhibiting commendable performance even surpassing most counterparts in the same class. Rumors circulated about the misbehavior of Harry and Neville from another class, resulting in extra homework as a consequence of Professor Flittick's disciplinary action. Amidst the Charms Club activities, a new member made an entrance, an accomplished fifth-year Ravenclaw senior named Chang Cho. The spells explored in the Charms Club delved beyond the standard seven-year magical education curriculum. Participants focused on learning less mainstream spells, akin to extracurricular supplementary learning in the Muggle world. During a particular session, Professor Flittick guided them through the advanced application of the Patronus charm. Contrary to its fundamental purpose of summoning a guardian spirit to ward off dark creatures, the Patronus was revealed to be in collection of emotions such as happiness and protection, a manifestation of the caster's soul. Its utility extended beyond creature repulsion, the Patronus could convey messages, being a magical guardian, repenting certain creatures, and patron uses could even be the last beacon of hope to fight off desperation and sadness. Given their closely matched grades in the club, Skylar took on the responsibility of practicing with Chang Cho. Her reputation as the most sought-after beauty in Hogwarts earned Skylar a myriad of envious glances, including those from Cedric Diggory, second on the list of girls' dream lovers, and Roger Davis, ranking third. Chang displayed remarkable talent despite her excessive focus on Quidditch practice. Under Skylar's meticulous guidance, she successfully shed previously ingrained bad habits in spellcasting, abandoning overly exaggerated and forceful gestures, as well as the pursuit of strictly standardized pronunciation. Gradually, Chang honed the most optimal method for spellcasting. Though she didn't achieve the ability to make her Patronus speak, her Swan Patronus demonstrated a newfound understanding of how to move instead of blindly charging forward. This accomplishment was considered top tier within the club, earning Professor Flittick's full praise for the new member. In the remaining time, Schuyler embarked on an intensive study of metamorphosis and reading the newly acquired Abatel book from Dumbledore. He relentlessly pursued strength like never before by utilizing nutritional potions to replace meals, stimulating potions to forego sleep, and occasionally resorting to items like the Time Turner and Ravenclaw's diadem. Metamorphosis, as its name implies, revolves around the transformation of the human body. A master of this art can effortlessly assume the appearance of anyone, manipulating not only their figure and face but also their clothing. This technique stands as an advanced iteration of transfiguration and polyjuice potion. 
In the Fantastic Beasts movie, Grindelwald showcased this mastery by assuming the guise of Percival Graves for an extended period, infiltrating the Magical Congress of the United States of America, teeming with elite horrors, without arousing suspicion, an extraordinary feat certainly, Skylar, by discovering that he's one of the Metamorph Magi. He's been trying his best to push his limit on how far he could transform himself. However, after Skylar conducted in-depth research, he discerned a fundamental difference between metamorphosing and human transfiguration, despite their seemingly comparable effects. Human transfiguration, a form of blood magic, enables the alteration of appearance through magical power but is confined to human form. The caster can freely manipulate height, body shape, facial features, skin color, hair color, eye color, and even assume the guise of an old man or allow a man to appear as a woman. However, these changes remain within the realm of human forms. Metamorphosing surpasses these limitations. Beyond altering the appearance of the human form, the metamorphosing technique permits further, transfigurative, changes, with the added flexibility of applying these changes to entities other than the performer. In essence, mastering the metamorphosis technique represents an advanced version of polyjuice potion and human transfiguration. It lacks a time limit, allowing for sustained transformations, and breaks through the confines of the human form to cater to diverse situations. Possessing the ability to metamorphose, Skylar leveraged his prior experience in utilizing magic at the cellular level, facilitating a swift mastery of the human body transformation technique. Within a few days, he skillfully approached the threshold of this advanced magical art. As time swiftly progressed, Friday the 13th of November arrived. For fourth-year Slytherin students, Friday afternoons were a cherished time, but for Gryffindor, particularly the renowned Harry Potter, it marked the most dreaded period. This day entailed two consecutive potions lessons. The previous Friday had been a torment for Harry during potions class. Locked in the underground classroom for a relentless hour and a half, he endured relentless ridicule from Snape and Slytherins. Snape's exacting standards forced Harry to repeatedly redo his potion, subjecting him to considerable hardship. The prospect of the impending potions lesson sent shivers down Harry's spine. Following lunch, he and Hermione proceeded to Snape's underground classroom, discovering Slytherin students gathered outside, most adorned with large badges affixed to their robes. These badges bore the same inscription, vivid red letters blazing like fire in the dim underground corridors, support Skylar Malfoy, the true champion of Hogwarts. Like it, Potter. Draco declared loudly upon Harry's approach. They have other tricks, take a look. He pressed the badge firmly against his chest, causing the words to vanish. In their place, another line of text emerged, radiating a luminous green, Potter stinks. Even Skylar couldn't help but find it amusing. Skylar recognized that he shouldn't indulge in such behavior. He understood that Harry becoming a champion was not his fault. Harry was genuinely pitiable, but it was undeniably amusing despite that. Guided by Draco, Blaze, Goyle, Crab, and Pansy all chuckled oddly. Each one clicked their badge, culminating in the glaring words, Potter stink, flashing around Harry. Very amusing, Hermione sarcastically remarked to Pansy, Malfoy is entitled to be selected as a champion. Supporting him is your right, but there's no need to mock another warrior like this, is there? Your pure-blood family, lowering her voice but maintaining a calm tone, she continued, can your so-called glory in enlightenment only reach this level? If you don't have the courage to compete openly in a contest, must you resort to petty tricks outside the arena? That is a valid point. Skylar secretly applauded, noting that Hermione displayed a level of maturity far beyond her character in the original narrative. Being occupied with studies, research, and the Serpentis Vigil organization affairs in recent days, Skylar had reduced his surveillance of Harry's trio. Unexpectedly, Hermione had undergone substantial mental growth unnoticed. Simultaneously, he recalled something, didn't Hermione organize a House Elf Rights Promotion Association in the original book? However, neither she nor Harry seem to be wearing that badge now. It appears she has truly evolved from her character in the original work. Hermione's argument was logical, and her tone had shifted from sharpness to calm confidence. Draco was momentarily rendered speechless by her words. He could only snort coldly, avert his gaze, and resume ignoring them. Oh, if the plot unfolds like this, Draco won't use the big stick on the front teeth on Harry, accidentally striking Hermione, and then Hermione won't take the opportunity to shrink her front teeth during the treatment process. 
What should be done? Well, why should I be concerned about this? With this thought, Skylar couldn't help but lift the corners of his mouth slightly. He turned his head and noticed Daphne standing quietly beside him. She observed the unfolding scene with calm detachment, as if the present events were unfolding in a separate world from hers. Skylar suddenly experienced an inexplicable emotion, and a phrase from the Chinese muggle community floated through his mind. He almost expected to see that person in the dim light when he turned around abruptly. Throughout this semester, from the school's commencement, Daphne had remained silently by his side, as inconspicuous as an unseen presence, causing him to overlook her existence nearly. I recalled their initial meeting on the train as if that moment had unfolded just yesterday. After Meredith's disappearance, Daphne didn't overtly express anything. Instead, she willingly assumed Meredith's former supportive role around Skylar. Quietly, she delved into subjects like astronomy, herbal medicine, and a history of magic, subjects she usually disliked. She claimed she aimed to build her power, but she took on the entire responsibility without uttering a single complaint. She devoted herself to every detail, handling everything personally. Throughout this semester, immersed in exploring Hogwarts and delving into magical studies, Skylar hardly exchanged more than a few words with Daphne, except during class and on activities revolving around the Serpentis Vigil. Skylar genuinely neglected her, yet she uttered no complaints. Not a word of reproach, not a hint of coquettishness, nothing. Skylar pursed his lips. I've been so focused on what's too far ahead of me that I've neglected someone that truly cared for me. He thought to himself. As Snape swung open the door to the underground classroom, Skylar redirected his attention away from Harry and Draco. He openly held Daphne's hand in full view and without hesitation, walking into the classroom together, even amidst her surprised gaze. In the dimly lit potions underground classroom, Harry and Hermione occupied one table, while Ron shared another table with Dean and Seamus. Antidote. Snape's voice echoed through the room as his cold, black eyes surveyed the class with an unsettling glint. Prepare your own formula now. I expect precise and careful brewing. We will select someone to test it. The fourth-year potion course proved challenging, demanding students to delve into the intricacies of potion formulas on their own. From the first week of school, Snape had elucidated the vast realm of antidotes, extending beyond mere countercurses. The curriculum covered remedies for love potions, polyjuice potions, and antidotes for veritasrum. The depth of knowledge approached that of a distinct subject, although Hogwarts primarily focused on antidotes for more common potions. Snape had ominously hinted at testing their antidotes with a potential poisoning before Christmas. It seemed that today marked the day for that unsettling experiment. Skylar, however, remained indifferent. In accordance with the plot, both he and Harry were excused from attending class on this particular day. As for Daphne, Skylar had clandestinely practiced concocting the universal antidote with her several times. As long as Daphne adhered to the correct steps, even without syncing with the changes in astronomical time or maintaining perfect control over the flames, she could successfully neutralize most poisons. The inclusion of bezoar stones in the antidote offered reassurance, rendering it effective against a wide range of toxins, excluding those as potent as basilisk venom or lethal substances like acromantula venom. Furthermore, the likelihood of Snape selecting a Slytherin student as a poisoning target was extremely slim. Just as the tension in the underground classroom lingered, a knock echoed through the air, diverting attention from the potion-making tasks. As Skylar recalled, the visitor was a third-year Gryffindor named Colin Creevy, short with ash-brown hair and an ardent Harry Potter enthusiast. Colin entered the room with a smile directed at Harry before approaching Snape's podium. What? Snape inquired impatiently. Excuse me, sir, I need to take Harry Potter upstairs, Colin explained. Snape's gaze shifted from his aquiline nose to scrutinize Colin, causing the enthusiasm to evaporate from the Gryffindor's face. Potter has another hour of potions class, Snape replied coldly. He will go upstairs after class. Colin blushed, clearly uneasy. Sir, sir, not only Harry Potter, but also Skylar Malfoy. Mr. Bagman asked me to call them. All the champions are gathering. I believe they want to take pictures. Snape's expression betrayed his internal turmoil. He had harbored a desire to poison Harry on Halloween, but the welcome ceremony for outside guests thwarted the opportunity. 
Now, he found himself on the verge of punishing Harry, only to witness the prey slipping through his fingers. Despite his reluctance, Snape bit back any retort. After all, Skylar was leaving the classroom along with Harry. Potter, he sneered, why does our famed Potter need to attend such a rudimentary potions class? Approaching Skylar's table, Snape scrutinized him with a critical gaze. Maintaining his characteristic cold expression, Snape offered a somewhat ambiguous wish, Malfoy, I wish you good luck. After a brief pause, he added in a softer tone, after you finish, come to my office sometime. Skylar acknowledged Professor Snape with a nod, and both Harry and Skylar rose from their seats, making their way toward the classroom door. As soon as they exited, Colin eagerly expressed his amazement, it's amazing, isn't it, Harry? You've become a champion. Harry, feeling his face flush, wished for Colin to stop talking fervently. The remainder of his recent defeats against Skylar had dealt a blow to his confidence. Attempting to shift the topic, Harry asked, why are they taking pictures, Colin? Probably for the daily profit. Colin replied with excitement. Great, Harry muttered to himself, just what I need, more public embarrassment. After conveying his good wishes, Colin hastily departed, leaving Harry and Skylar to proceed to the designated classroom. The smaller classroom they entered had most of the desks pushed to the back, creating a spacious area in the middle. Three desks, covered with a long piece of velvet, stood in front of the blackboard. Behind the velvet, five chairs were arranged, and among them sat Ludo Bagman, engaged in conversation with a witch in a magenta robe. Upon spotting Skylar, Eleanor, and Catalina greeted him with surprise, completely overlooking Harry standing nearby, further souring Harry's expression. When he entered the room, Bagman's attention was abruptly drawn to Harry, prompting the judge to rise and approach swiftly. Ah, come in, Harry, come in. There's nothing to worry about, it's just a wand-testing ritual. The other judges will be here soon, Bagman reassured Harry. Wand-testing? Harry thought uneasily. We must check whether your wands are fully functional and in good condition because, in future competitions, your wands will be your most important equipment. The expert is upstairs with Dumbledore, Bagman explained before adding, then, take some photos. This is Rita Skeeter, he said, pointing to the witch in the magenta robe. She's writing a little article about the tournament for the Daily Prophet. With a fashionable dress and meticulously styled blonde curls, Rita exuded an air of deliberate glamour. Despite her efforts, the overall aesthetic impact was awkward, especially when coupled with her wide chin. Narrowing her eyes, Rita stared at Harry as though a hyena had found its prey. Before we start, can I have a few words with Harry, she asked Bagman, her gaze fixed firmly on Harry. The youngest champion, you know. To add a little color to the article. Bagman agreed, and Harry found himself trapped in an unfortunate interview in a broom closet. Observing the scene with a knowing look, Eleanor whispered to Skylar, you British reporters are really interesting left our overseas guests alone and even ignored you, Sir Merlin, selecting the boy who survived the catastrophe for an exclusive interview. Schuyler was well aware of the situation unfolding before him. Rita specialized in writing sensational and scandalous tidbits. Despite not fearing Dumbledore for the sake of her career, she did have vulnerabilities. What she dreaded most was jeopardizing the career she had painstakingly built. Schuyler knew she had influential connections in the media industry, making her hesitant to provoke him. Responding with a smile, Skylar remarked, after all, he is the boy who lived. It's always more attractive to readers. Today's readers are quite discerning. They demand novelty, eccentricity, logical consistency, and divine writing. Even so, some daily profit readers, who pay only a few nuts, resort to reading pirated copies from its competitors. Catalina burst into laughter and said, Mr. Malfoy, why do I feel that you are so resentful? Their conversation was interrupted by the approaching footsteps of Dumbledore and Mr. Ollivander. They descended together from upstairs after learning about Harry and Rita from Ludo. Dumbledore, upon hearing of the interview, immediately entered the broom closet to put an end to it, rescuing Harry in the process. Flushed with excitement, Rita hurriedly ran out with her parchment, while Harry wore an expression as if he had just eaten a fly. The next event on the agenda was the wand testing ceremony. Catalina was the first to have her wand tested. Ollivander twirled the wand between his slender fingers like a conductor's baton, and the wand emitted numerous pink and gold sparks. 
he then brought the wand closer to his eyes, studying it carefully. That's right, he said softly, eleven and a half inches. Very elastic. Made of aspen wood. And it contains. Oh, my God, it's. Contains a feather from a feathered serpent, Catalina said, it's a wand inherited from my family. Although Schuyler had never crafted a wand himself, he was well versed in the science of wand lore. There were classic texts on wand making, whether it was the Malfoy family, the Black family, the Greengrass family, or the Ravenclaw library. Drawing from the knowledge passed down by these families, Schuyler might not match Ollivander's expertise, but he was certainly more knowledgeable than most in the field of wand making. Aspen wands were known for being particularly martial, and suitable owners of aspen wands tended to be natural duelists. When the Silver Spear was founded, it was rumored that only wizards and witches with aspen wands were allowed to participate. The wing feathers of the Quetzalcoatl were of extraordinary origin. They combined the potent characteristics of dragon core wands, making the spells cast with them more powerful. Additionally, they possessed the diversity of Phoenix Core Wands, allowing for varied spell effects with a creative twist. Judging from the magic wand alone, Skylar concluded that it was indeed a formidable weapon. Ollivander frowned deeply. The abilities of this wand surpassed his own understanding. The feathered serpent had long been extinct, and he had never encountered a feathered serpent wand before. So, he could only feign passing the wand with his fingers, meticulously checking for any scratches or blemishes, and then return it to Catalina without daring to cast a spell with it. Very good, very good, the wand is in good condition, Mr. Ollivander commented while observing the wand. Mr. Malfoy, it's your turn. Catalina returned to her seat with brisk steps, and as she passed Skylar, she smiled sweetly at him. Mr. Ollivander checked meticulously, examining the wand repeatedly. It took him more than ten minutes before he looked at Skylar seriously and said, Mr. Malfoy, do you recall what I told you about the wand you purchased from me three years ago? I've noticed that your wand seems to have changed. Skylar frowned and asked, Excuse me, is there something wrong with my wand? He thought it was odd, as he believed he had always maintained his wand very well and was unaware of any issues. No, no, don't get me wrong, Mr. Malfoy, Ollivander said hurriedly. There is nothing wrong with the wand but I sense that it has undergone some changes that I can't quite describe. I assure you, these changes are only beneficial. Its compatibility with you has improved, and using it will make your spellcasting more convenient. Mr. Ollivander requested that Skylar's wand produce a string of silver-white smoke rings. The ethereal rings floated gracefully from one end of the room to the other. Expressing satisfaction, Ollivander remarked, Miss Hohenheim, it's your turn. Eleanor rose gracefully, presenting her wand to Mr. Ollivander. Well, began Ollivander, if I'm not mistaken, it's a creation of Gregorovich. He's an excellent wand maker, though his style isn't something I'm particularly. Yet. There was no change in Eleanor's expression, but Skylar detected a hint of sarcasm flickering in her eyes. Ollivander's face suddenly shifted. Oh, his complexion turned an unnatural shade of red, clearly shocked by his revelation. He whispered, I made a mistake, this is not Gregorovich, this is. This is. This is the wand of Cadmus Peveril. Eleanor's eyes betrayed a momentary surprise, perhaps not expecting the unassuming old man before her to discern the wand's origin. However, a smile graced her lips. Yes, our family ancestors were fortunate enough to acquire this artifact. A glint of intrigue flashed in Skylar's eyes. Is this family, deeply immersed in the practices of necromancy alchemy, truly entwined with the resurrection stone, the pinnacle of achievements in necromancy alchemy? In this manner, Schuyler almost underestimated this adversary. Beyond the legacy of Paracelsus, does Eleanor von Hohenheim also possess the inheritance of the Peveril family? Ollivander raised the wand before his eyes, scrutinizing it repeatedly. A faint cold sweat appeared on his forehead. He couldn't discern the material of the wand's body or the composition of its core. After a prolonged inspection, he spoke, a tremor in his voice, Very good, very good. It seems to be an excellent wand. At long last, it was Harry's turn. Aha! Ah, yes, Mr. Ollivander exclaimed, his light-colored eyes suddenly ablaze with excitement, Yes, yes, yes. I remember it vividly. No one could fathom his inner exhilaration. Finally confronted with a straightforward magic wand. 
isn't it just phoenix tail feathers and Hollywood? The most uncomplicated wand imaginable. After the judges have done their checks on the champion's wands, Skylar's routine returned to attending classes and delving into the intricacies of transfiguration. He had achieved a commendable understanding of the human body transformation technique and was confident in mastering it before December. A few days later, Rita Skeeter's article on the Triwizard Tournament hit the stands. More focused on Harry's personal life than the tournament itself, the piece relegated the Bosbatons and Durmstrang warriors to the last lines, misspelled and barely acknowledged. Strikingly, Skylar's name didn't merit a single mention. Rita not only transformed Harry's nuanced responses into a distasteful diatribe but also sought the opinions of others about him. Harry has supposedly found his first love at Hogwarts. According to his close friend Colin Creevy, Harry is inseparable from a girl named Hermione Granger. Born into a muggle family, Miss Granger shares Harry's top academic standing. This narrative made Harry and Hermione the primary targets of cynicism among Slytherin students. This situation drove Harry to the brink. He even inadvertently snapped at Chang Cho, the goddess in his mind. While Hermione did bear some of the unpleasant fallout, she refrained from lashing out at innocent bystanders. What concerned her more was the potential for misconceptions about her emotional life. Still, the memory of that day when Skylar held Daphne's hand and entered the classroom lingered, leaving a bitter taste in her heart. This marked the first time she genuinely felt a twinge of envy toward Daphne, born into a pure-blood family and seamlessly sorted into Slytherin House. Reflecting on the day she donned the sorting hat. She remembered its inquiry, Ravenclaw or Gryffindor. Admiring Dumbledore, the eminent wizard of the century, she made the bold choice of Gryffindor, the house she deemed the finest. In moments of contemplation, she couldn't help but wonder how different things might have been if she had opted for Ravenclaw that day. Eleanor and Catalina, although granted the freedom to attend any class by Dumbledore, didn't join the regular students at Hogwarts for lessons. Eleanor dedicated the majority of her time to the ghost ship, guided personally by Karkaroff himself. Similarly, Catalina spent most of her days in the carriage under the guidance of Madame Maxime. After the judges checked their wand and deemed proper, Skylar engaged in friendly exchanges with the two girls. He learned that both the ghost ship and the carriage were enchanted with an undetectable extension charm. Not only were the spaces expansive enough to accommodate hundreds of people, but they also featured numerous subspaces, such as boys' dormitories, girls' dormitories, washrooms, offices, and classrooms. Essentially, these enchanted vehicles served as mini portable schools designed for small class teaching. Skylar efficiently utilizes his time turner dedicating time not only to his academic pursuits but also fostering relationships with Daphne, Morag, and Astoria daily. While the quest for power to save Meredith is paramount, he values the efforts of these three girls, refusing to take their support for granted and steering away from selfishness. On a chilly night, the potions class convened in the underground classroom, illuminated by dim lights. Professor, Skylar respectfully inquired, what brings you here to see me? Snape's gaze, as gloomy as ever, conveyed a certain weight as he spoke in a low, smooth voice, is it your idea to participate in the Triwizard Tournament? Yes, Professor, Skylar responded, I believe my strength is on par with that of a seventh-year student, and I have a compelling reason for joining. A glimmer of light flickered in Snape's typically vacant eyes. Visibly affected, he spoke slowly, is it because of Meredith? That Shafiq girl? That's correct. Skylar met Snape's gaze directly. To me, she's a companion, a relative, and the one I love. Snape couldn't help but emit a cold snort. Foolish. Realizing he had deviated from his usual icy demeanor, he pursed his lips and continued coldly, given your family background, appearance, and strength, you could have any woman you desire. Why cling to the past? Skylar concealed a cynical smirk within as he pondered, Professor, you're projecting your own past, aren't you? Something that you could have done the same, but you didn't. With resolute eyes, Skylar addressed Snape, Professor, if I were to abandon my beloved in the face of adversity today, how could I ever deserve a genuine relationship in the future? Raising his voice, he continued, Moreover, Professor Dumbledore mentioned that there's still a chance to save Meredith. Even if she has transformed into someone else or remarried, I'll act as a true man and reclaim her. A rare shift flickered across Snape's eyes, causing the classroom's atmosphere to turn even colder. 
Intent to subtle nuances, Skylar sensed an obscure, almost ominous aura. Caught your thoughts, there is nothing you can hide from me. Skylar thought to himself after seeing the sudden change of expression on Snape's face. After a pause, Snape's eyes reverted to their usual emptiness. He calmly stated, you're unlike any Malfoy I've encountered. A fool. He proceeded, although you may be foolish, having made up your mind. Snape continued, as your head of house and a friend of your father, should support you publicly and privately. From a concealed compartment on his desk, Snape produced a book, handing it to Skylar. Take this book. It's a magical tome I've been researching, and it should assist in enhancing your strength. Humph, Skylar couldn't ignore the fact that Snape saw a reflection of his former self in him. Snape ostensibly aimed to aid Skylar while making amends for his past, yet he maintained a businesslike facade. Certainly, given that Skylar had manipulated him, he refrained from voicing these thoughts aloud. Thank you, Professor. Skylar gave his gratitude. One more thing, Snape's deep voice resonated softly, this time, don't share this book with anyone, even if that person is your brother. Understood, Professor. Skylar swiftly grasped the implication and couldn't help but chuckle. Last semester, Skylar had shared his junior potion notes with the Slytherin students without Snape's consent, and it appeared that Snape was already privy to this. Skylar had a strategic motive for doing so. He was testing Snape, probing his limits. Snape was a complex individual. A half-blood wizard, he aligned with the pure-blooded Death Eaters due to his advocacy for dark magic and power. While originally loyal to Voldemort, he defected because of a woman he loved. However, this didn't necessarily translate into loyalty to Dumbledore. His allegiance to Dumbledore stemmed from the desire to protect the individual he loathed the most. In essence, Snape was only loyal to himself, a target that Skylar could potentially win over. It was hardly surprising that Snape was aware of the events of the previous term since Skylar had no intention of keeping it a secret from him. Snape's reaction was intriguing. He refrained from accusing Skylar of divulging his potion knowledge, but similarly, he didn't commend Skylar for contributing significantly to the overall improvement of Slytherin's potion skills. Although he was evidently in the know, Snape chose to act as if he were oblivious, maintaining a stoic silence. Deep down, the growth of Slytherin students has been a massive help for Snape himself. However, this time, Snape broke his usual pattern and explicitly requested Skylar to keep the notes private, even barring Draco from sharing them. What did this signify? Simply put, it underscored that Snape's personal support for Skylar was based on Skylar himself and held no connection to Slytherin or the Malfoy family. Once again, the episode highlighted the significance of reputation. Whether it was the Greengrass family, the Knott family, Trelawney, or Snape himself, they all saw a distinct possibility in Skylar. Beyond Dumbledore and Voldemort, there existed a third possibility in this world. Snape emitted a soft snort and uttered coldly, I take back what I just said, you're not entirely foolish. Professor Snape's magical tome has been obtained. Severus Snape, the youngest headmaster in the history of Slytherin House and a renowned master of potions, possesses a multitude of talents that often go unnoticed amid his fame. Among his lesser-known strengths is his remarkable proficiency as a spell inventor, having crafted more than one spell in his illustrious career. Lavina Monk Stanley, known for inventing a light charm, is hailed and remembered for that singular achievement. She first developed the wand lighting charm, Lumos along with the wand extinguishing charm, Knox. She astonished her colleagues one day by lighting the tip of her wand to look for a dropped quill in a dusty corner. In Skylar's prior life, he was already aware of Snape's magical prowess, particularly in the realm of curses. The spells credited to Snape's inventiveness include the toenail growing hex, the langlock jinx, the dangling jinx, muffliato charm, and the notorious sectum semper. Notably, there are five kinds of spells that were known to have been created by Professor Snape. Upon delving into Snape's magical tome, Skylar was forced to reconsider the extent of Snape's capabilities, realizing that he had previously underestimated the depth of Snape's magical talent. It becomes clearer why Snape earned Voldemort's appreciation at a young age and secured a place within the innermost circle of Death Eaters. Despite being a half-blood wizard, he garnered the respect and allegiance of pure-blood Death Eaters. Voldemort's willingness to spare a muggle which for him underscored the significance of Snape's contributions. Skylar, who prided himself on an extensive knowledge of spells, 
even doubting if there were others in the world who knew more spells, found himself astonished upon perusing Snape's magical tome. The tome revealed many curses developed by Snape for novel applications. Additionally, he dismantled and enhanced these spells, restoring them to their original forms but imbuing them with greater potency. For example, the bombardment spell, Bombarda, was modified by Snape into the Continuous Explosion Curse, this is a spell that can produce a series of explosions. There is no upper limit on the number of explosions as long as the magic power in the caster's body can keep up. Based on this spell alone, Skyler could conclude that in the original work, he was beaten to the point of being defeated by Professor McGonagall and Professor Flittick in one round. It was definitely because he did not want to hurt his colleagues that he showed mercy. For example, the tickling charm was invented by Miranda Goshawk. It originally caused uncontrollable laughter on the recipient's face. Still, he improved it into the endless laughter curse, the laughter that becomes relentless will not only affect the opponent's face, but will even further intensify, spreading throughout the body and find ways to induce internal convulsions, such as abdominal spasms. Of course, what Schuyler was most envious of was the mind control, imperious, he learned from Voldemort. Mind control, as the name suggests, is a kind of magic that does not require chanting spells or auxiliary devices such as wands, and can also be used to manipulate others by itself. In the original work, only three wizards have demonstrated this ability, one is Dumbledore, one is Voldemort, and the last one is Snape. According to clues in the original work, it is inferred that Voldemort should have learned it from his dark arts mentor. Skyler's flying broomstick skills can only be said to be at an average level. He can fly well, but if he were to control the broomstick with one hand to fly and wave the wand to fight with the other, he would probably be unable to do it. Levitation suits him perfectly. First of all, Skylar possesses active magic power, so he can easily control magic power all over his body, as long as he silently casts a levitation magic on himself, he can independently coordinate the deployment of magic power through various parts of the body, and he can levitate effortlessly. Second, Skyler knows how to multitask and cast spells with both hands. Once he connects with levitation, Skyler's levitation ability will be greatly doubled. So, in addition to levitation, he has one more thing left to do on his first priority to-do list, which is to protect his loved ones. The week passed quickly. Soon came Saturday, November 21st. There are still four days left before the first event of the competition. This day marked the Hogsmeade visit, and Skyler decided to take all the third-year members of the Serpentis Vigil Club to the Three Broomsticks for a celebration. Despite having the ability to use the suitcase space to bring out the second-year members, he refrained from doing so to avoid potential sightings and subsequent complications for Professor Snape. Choosing the largest table available, they occupied it with a total of nine people, leaving a few empty seats. Ms. Rosmerda, the proprietress, greeted them with a warm smile, hey, look, our champion is here. Customers at other tables directed their attention toward Skylar, many offering smiles of acknowledgement. As the renowned proprietress gracefully approached their table, she said, do you want anything? I can deliver it directly. In a typical bar setting, patrons usually had to visit the bar themselves to place orders. However, Ms. Rosmerda clearly extended special treatment to Skylar due to his status as a Triwizard Tournament participant. Okay, ma'am, Skylar declared grandly, six deluxe seafood platters, all fried, six dozen fresh North Sea oysters, a glass of butterbeer, and a glass of fizzing pumpkin juice for each person. Today, I'm treating everyone. Witnessing the sizable order, the Lady Rosmerta beamed with even greater warmth, okay, I'll have it brought over shortly. Excitement filled the air as everyone anticipated the upcoming competition, fueled by Skylar's apparent confidence. Moreover, the entire expense was covered by Skylar. While not all Slytherin students hail from affluent pure-blood families, many come from modest mixed-blood backgrounds. Their pocket money typically stretched to buying candies and stationery, with an occasional indulgence in the cheapest butterbeer at the bar. Rarely had they ordered or savored anything beyond these basics. Imagine having a senior who was not only friendly, polite, helpful, academically proficient, physically strong, and good-looking but also exceptionally generous. Where else could one find such a rare gem? Slytherin students secretly congratulated themselves for joining the Serpentis Vigil Club, elevating Skylar's popularity among them. The Three Broomsticks Tavern bustled with Hogwarts students relishing the afternoon's freedom. 
Among them were various magical beings rarely spotted elsewhere, including dominatrixes and food enthusiasts. Hogsmeade, being the sole pure wizarding village in the UK, served as a secure haven for them, free from concerns about breaching the international law of secrecy if witnessed by muggles. Shortly thereafter, another group entered through the door. It was Chang Cho accompanied by her extensive Ravenclaw circle of friends. Spotting Skylar, her eyes sparkled with delight. She smiled and approached, leading her friends with her. Skylar, your group looks lively. Some friends and I can't find a seat. Can we join you? It was near lunchtime, and indeed, there were no tables available at the three broomsticks. However, as Skylar surveyed the crowded space, his table wasn't the only one with vacant seats. For instance, there were numerous empty seats at the table occupied by Ron, Fred, George, and Lee Jordan. Similarly, there were unoccupied spots at the table where Ernie McMillan and Hannah Abbott sat. Not to mention, Cedric Diggory was making an effort to navigate past Stebbins and Summers at another table, attempting to locate an available seat. Skylar inwardly sighed. He already grasped Cho's subtle hint, and indeed, Cho was exceptionally attractive. However, the timing of their encounter was inconvenient, and Skylar's heart was already committed to others. Whether it was Daphne, Meredith, Morag, or Astoria, they had all shown sincere devotion. These girls silently supported him, handled his trivial matters, and contributed to his happiness. They allowed him to immerse himself in the pursuit of knowledge and power without worries. Replicating such love and significance in this lifetime was a daunting task. Skylar couldn't afford to let them down. Nevertheless, he had promised Mr. Chong to look after Chang Cho, and turning her down abruptly would be unkind. As Skylar pondered how to convey his thoughts, Daphne stepped in on his behalf. Cho, we are currently discussing an interesting plan here, Daphne, sensing Cho's interest in Skylar, cleverly devised a plan. Her eyes sparkled with wisdom as she declared, if you want to sit here, you must undoubtedly join us in making the plan. Cho, displaying no signs of weakness, met Daphne's gaze and replied with a smile, oh, what is the plan? Skylar the Champion Fans Club. With that, Cho took a seat, accompanied by her friends Marietta Edgecombe, Marcus Belby, and Eddie Carmichael, all of whom agreed to join the so-called Skylar the Champion Fans Club. Surprisingly, Skylar had no prior knowledge of this club's existence. Daphne's intention, however, was clear to him, she was testing Ravenclaw's attitude toward him. She aimed to include young wizards from Ravenclaw and Hufflepuff in the Serpentis Vigils Club recruitment plan if feasible. In the original work, Marietta was an unpopular character due to her betrayal of Dumbledore's army. However, Skylar recognized that Marietta's decision to betray was motivated by threats to her family. Her mother, Madame Edgecombe, faced job loss due to Marietta's actions. In Skylar's case, such a problem didn't exist. With connections in the Ministry of Magic, including the Department of Legal Enforcement, the Auror Office, the Office for the Prohibition of Abuse of Magic, and the Pest Advisory Office, he had already infiltrated various departments. Unlike Marietta, Skylar had no reason to betray, and Madame Edgecombe's position in the Flu Network Management Bureau provided a unique opportunity for valuable information. Though not a high-ranking role, it held significant influence in monitoring the Flu Network. As for the other two boys, they were purely here to make soy sauce. Belby, well, he was an ordinary boy. The only noteworthy thing about him was that his uncle Damocles had recently invented the Wolfsbane potion. However, Belby and his uncle had a strained relationship, and they had no contact at all. On the other hand, Carmichael hails from an ordinary background, but he is more valuable to win over than Belby. A top student who could stand alongside Hermione, Carmichael earned praise for obtaining nine excellent exams in the ordinary wizarding levels, OWL, the same number as Hermione in the original book. Unfortunately, despite his talent, he didn't know how to make good use of it and channel it in the right direction. Using his good grades as a facade, he attempted to deceive his junior students, selling them fake, Baruffio's brain elixir, for a mere twelve galleons per pint. Sacrificing his reputation for such a trivial profit seemed unwise to Skylar. Morag himself hailed from Ravenclaw. Under the deliberate management of Morag and Cho, the young wizards in Ravenclaw initially maintained a certain formality, but gradually, they relaxed and engaged in lively conversations. Laughter and chatter resonated loudly from their table, 
drawing side glances from many young wizards at other tables. The dinner concluded with a cheerful atmosphere. The so-called Skylar the Champion Fans Club wasn't just a joke. Daphne had already made a solid plan with Cho. They needed to find time to create posters and distribute them across various notices, as well as craft sizable banners to display during the competition. Additionally, they had to recruit more young fans for the club and schedule time to rehearse slogans to cheer for Skylar. In the secret room beneath Miraculous Alchemy in Hogsmeade Village, Skylar furrowed his brows, eyeing Daphne, what on earth are you up to? Daphne reached out and caressed Skylar's handsome face, Skylar, are you trying to tell me that you're not the least bit attracted to Cho? No. Skylar asserted, I'm only helping her because I owe her uncle some advice. There's no other connection between her and me. Daphne sighed, wrapping her arms around him and whispering, but you need her, don't you? Cho informed me that her great uncle promised to teach you their family's secret transformation technique. With Cho's appearance and popularity, it could significantly benefit your position in Ravenclaw, correct? Daphne, what's going on in your mind? Skylar held her tightly, stop dwelling on these thoughts and let me handle them. Remember, I'll never, ever, whether it's for the Chang family's transfiguration skills or for their family's hegemony, I won't even allow you to be harmed. Daphne lifted her head, her eyes misty with gratitude. Thank you, Skylar. It's enough for you to have this concern, she said softly. You don't have to go to such lengths. Really. Her eyes now held an unprecedented firmness. Because, I believe you. Daphne continued while looking at Skylar with a compassionate look. At half past eleven at night, Skylar cast an invisible phantom spell on himself and silently departed from the Slytherin common room. Skylar's destination was Hagrid's hut. Had the original novel's plot not veered off course, this day would mark Charlie Weasley and his team's transport of the fire dragon from the Romanian dragon sanctuary to Hogwarts. As the gamekeeper, Hagrid would be tasked with designating an area as a temporary habitat for the fire dragons and welcoming the Romanian visitors. The venue lay shrouded in darkness. Skylar treaded the lawn toward the faint glow emanating from Hagrid's hut. Bosebaden's immense carriage was also illuminated, with the voices of Madame Maxime audible as one drew near. After about five minutes of anticipation, Hagrid emerged from the hut, strolling energetically while humming an off-key tune. He headed toward Bosebaden's carriage. Hagrid knocked three times on the door adorned with two crossed golden wands. Madame Maxime opened the door, a silk shawl draped over her exceptionally broad shoulders. She offered a slight smile upon seeing Hagrid. After exchanging a few trivial greetings, the two strolled side by side toward the periphery of the temporary enclosure. Their path led them far around the edge of the forbidden forest, the castle and the lake gradually disappearing from view. Suddenly, shouts and yells echoed from the front. Four enormous fire dragons came into sight. Well, it's a fire dragon, and the plot remains unchanged. Furthermore, the fire dragons originated from the Romanian Dragon Sanctuary, where Skylar holds the position of the second largest shareholder. Skylar is acquainted with most of the employees at the sanctuary, minimizing the likelihood of these fire dragons being replaced or tampered with. If any abnormalities had occurred at the sanctuary in the past few months, Skylar, as a major shareholder, would undoubtedly be privy to such information. It's worth noting that the head of the sanctuary is an acquaintance of Skylar, a member of the Malfoy family introduced by him, while Charlie Weasley serves as the deputy head. Despite the discord between the Weasleys and Skylar and their differing positions, Skylar acknowledges Charlie's proficiency in raising dragons. Skylar maintains a degree of tolerance, but advancing to a more pivotal role or securing a promotion might prove challenging for Charlie. Skylar observed Karkaroff trailing behind them, but he paid little attention. So what if these individuals are privy to the subject matter? The magical confidentiality contract established by Dumbledore himself is impervious to breach, considering their capabilities. Even Hagrid didn't dare invite Harry to witness this spectacle. Skylar is willing to wager that Hagrid has contemplated the idea, yet the power of the contract would constrain him, rendering him unable to act upon such thoughts. Skylar found himself delighted by the unfolding situation. His proposal wasn't merely aimed at securing a victory in the Triwizard Tournament, it was, in fact, his initial move against Barty Crouch Jr. He anticipated how Crouch would attempt to disrupt and hinder Harry, 
and the success of his strategy hinged on how effectively he could unravel and counteract Crouch's machinations in the first task. Simultaneously, he looked forward to witnessing the champion's performances when faced with the unknown challenges ahead. On the morning of November 22, Skyler, armed with the knowledge of the upcoming task, exuded confidence. He went back to the Slytherin Chamber of Secrets, dedicating his time to refining his transfiguration skills and strategizing his approach to overcome the Fire Dragon. While he possessed over five methods to handle the Fire Dragon, Skylar refused to settle for a mere victory in the game. He aimed to showcase his full potential and secure a resounding triumph. The goal was not merely to win but to do so in the most spectacular and impressive manner possible. He considered various approaches, eliminating some from consideration. The conjunctivitis curse was dismissed since Eleanor and Catalina, being direct descendants of the family, undoubtedly understood how it could be employed against the fire dragon. Transforming a puppy into a fire dragon was also deemed impractical, what if the dragon accidentally harmed the innocent creature? Similarly, using hypnotic magic to lull the fire dragon into a deep sleep was deemed futile due to the dragon's formidable magic resistance and the absence of Vila blood bonuses. Skylar grappled with various strategies to confront the fire dragon, exploring the potential of different spells and curses. The sonic boom spell coupled with the flashbang spell seemed like a viable option, creating a stunning effect to seize the golden egg. However, he dismissed the idea as it lacked the desired flair. Considering severe fire curses, continuous explosion curses, or soul attacks, Skylar contemplated the ethical implications. While possibly effective, the prospect of slaying a dragon raised moral concerns. Could such an act be considered a victory? Amid his contemplation, Skylar examined the books on his table, each chosen with the intention of aiding him in the task. As his eyes fell on a book in the far corner, a bold idea crystallized in his mind. This plan held promise, contingent on ensuring the fire dragon couldn't retaliate. Abandoning reliance on transfiguration, Skylar shifted his focus to the protective magic he had been diligently studying. Most of the protective spells or charms were already within his mastery. However, their effectiveness came at the cost of increased restrictions. He also possessed knowledge of using Guruni to cast spells, particularly invoking Iwas, his most potent protective magic. Yet, its drawback lay in its brief duration. While suitable for withstanding a wave of attacks from adversaries like Peter Pettigrew, it proved inadequate against the sustained assaults of a fire-breathing dragon. However, this obstacle did not deter him from seeking innovative solutions. His primary goal was to identify the optimal point among the three variations of the shield charm. The challenge lay in achieving a more potent effect than the shield charm itself without complicating the spell excessively. Moreover, the spell's duration should not exceed the time it takes for the fire dragon to invade. In Skylar's perspective, the key factor was the speed of spellcasting. Regardless of a spell's potency, its power would be rendered ineffectual if it couldn't be cast swiftly. An advantage he possessed was the ability to simultaneously cast spells with both hands. His strategy involved developing a new protective magic that surpassed the shield charm in effect. Simultaneously, by using Guruni to invoke Iwas, he planned to superimpose two layers of protective covers, ensuring comprehensive safety. The brief duration of the Guruni talisman was due to the magic power of the outline symbol being unable to linger in midair. However, if it could be affixed to other magic spells, utilizing them as carriers, the effectiveness could be prolonged, an intricate process but not impossible. Armed with a time hourglass, Skylar had ample time to experiment with this magic. He commenced the unraveling of the incantation against all evil, a complex process that even Professor Flittick took nearly five minutes to recite, emphasizing the incantation's considerable length. The initial modification Skylar implemented involved systematically eliminating the less crucial spell syllables. These pronunciations, primarily serving to aid the spellcaster in altering pronunciation for improved fluency, held no significance in the process of converting magic power into magical effects. Given Skylar's expertise, they became redundant. A second point of refinement sacrificed a portion of the protection range. Skylar identified spell syllables focused on expanding the protection range and eliminated most of them. He deemed it sufficient for the protective range to cover him alone, ensuring a 360-degree coverage without blind spots. Lastly, drawing inspiration from the shield charm and the imperturbable charm, Skylar meticulously selected spell syllables to enhance protective strength. 
these chosen pronunciations were then incorporated into the spell. After hours of concentrated effort, Schuyler gazed upon a parchment adorned with chaotic markings, a satisfied expression adorning his face. It's done, he exclaimed. He named this newly crafted magic combination, Divine Aegis. Coincidentally, a crackle resonated as he set down the parchment, and both Winky and Dobby appeared simultaneously. Dobby bowed respectfully and reported, Master, as per your instructions, we've diligently monitored Moody and Hogwarts with a spyglass, detecting no signs of suspicious individuals. However, a signal has emanated from the miraculous alchemy, indicating the presence of unfamiliar faces in Hogsmeade Village. Approximately five of them. Skylar's eyes gleamed with anticipation, are they finally approaching, these creatures and miscreants? He spoke solemnly, well done. Do you know where they've settled? It's an old vacant house on the edge of the village. Dobby contacted Mrs. Bones on behalf of the owner and obtained the Magic Land Deed Registration Branch records of Hogsmeade. Master, please take a look. With those words, Dobby respectfully presented a sheepskin scroll sealed with a secret spell. Skylar nodded, acknowledging Dobby's resourcefulness. The elf demonstrated an increasing ability to carry out tasks without explicit instructions, showcasing growing competence. Drawing his wand, Skylar lightly touched the scroll with its tip. As he read the name, a wicked smile crossed his face. Just as he finished perusing the parchment, it spontaneously combusted and swiftly disintegrated into nothingness, leaving no trace behind. Dobby, please contact Bathory. She can transform into bats and shadows, making her suitable for sneaking. Ask her to help me uncover the identities of these people. Yes. Dobby responded and departed. Twinkle, how is Harry Potter's situation? Skylar inquired with a deep voice. Master, due to various rumors targeting him recently, Potter appears to have lost confidence. He's hardly engaged in any competition-related practice and has even abandoned his daily studies. His charms class, in particular, suffered a setback when he failed the summoning curse and was subsequently detained by Flittick. Fortunately, Moody intervened, taking him away for private tutoring to help him master the summoning spell. Ah, that's it. Even if I can't inform the warriors about the game, can Barty Crouch Jr. still prepare all the spells and tools that can be used for Harry in advance? It seems you really can't underestimate these people, they are smarter than you think. Skylar thought to himself. Very good. Have you been discovered by Moody? His prosthetic eyes are quite troublesome. Shining responded respectfully, no problem. The master's invisible phantom spell is truly powerful and effective for us elves. I can stand right in front of Moody, and he wouldn't sense anything. Skylar nodded with satisfaction and then inquired, where are those families in France? How are you contacting them? You've already contacted the Delacour family. Mr. Delacour agreed to your proposal and conditions. He will lead several families who are related to him as cousins to form an alliance with the master. All the details are written in this secret letter. Saying this, Shining respectfully presented a red envelope, emanating conspicuous magic fluctuations. Skylar recited the French version of the spell, Finite Incantatum. After a while, the magical waves on the envelope slowly dissipated. According to the prearranged code, if the letter accidentally falls into the hands of others, and that person reads the curse in English or Latin, the letter will explode, delivering a big surprise. Skylar read the contents of the letter, and after perusing it, he stashed the letter into his secured folder, categorizing it under the French section. The letter primarily constitutes a magically binding alliance agreement, meticulously detailing every family closely associated with Mr. Delacour, and all these families will form an alliance with Schuyler in accordance with the agreed terms. Even though the Delacour family is of mixed race, Mr. Delacour's mother-in-law, being a pure-blood Vila, establishes an exceptionally close relationship between the Delacour family and the French Vila tribe through his wife, Apollon Delacour. Vila, born with the ability to charm, typically takes on the appearance of a beautiful woman, transforming into a harpy-like figure when angered. Though their numbers are scarce and they lack formidable magic beyond their charm, their marriages to many wizards have resulted in numerous mixed-race descendants. With the Vila tribe as the epicenter, a vast and intricately woven network of interpersonal relationships unfolds. Consequently, the Delacour family takes center stage, boasting an extensive web of connections in the French wizarding world. 
Of course, Mr. Delacour claims all these individuals are his cousins, the Everest family, the Bonacut family, the Amarino family, and more. These families, though of mixed blood heritage, each excel in diverse fields in France. Leveraging their connections through Vila marriages, they've covertly established a network rivaling that of pure blood families. The Everest family specializes in herbology. Mr. Everest holds a high level managerial position at the Magic Garden in the Pyrenees, owned by the Ministry of Magic across various European countries. Mr. Bonacud serves as the French representative of the International Federation of Wizards, while Amarino holds the position of editor in chief at The Stone Wings. The letter further notes that his daughter, Fleur Delacour, is aware of the two alliances. During her tenure at Hogwarts, she pledges unconditional cooperation with all of Schuyler's endeavors. Excellent. With this development, even the matter of planting a spy in Bosbaden's carriage has been resolved. Alliance with the Delacour family has been established. Alliance with the Everest family has been established. Alliance with the Bonacud family has been established. Alliance with the Amorinu family has been established. The cold morning class started with herbology. The lesson focused on the art of pruning Flutterby Bush. This peculiar plant, though unconscious, possesses a form of sentience akin to a jumping toadstool. When it senses the presence of a living creature, it vigorously shakes its branches, making it challenging for individuals to intercept its branches smoothly. The Flutterby Bush only blossoms when diligently cared for over an extended period. Its flowers, a rare spectacle, unfurl once every hundred years. Typically blue and shaped like butterflies, other variations are not entirely ruled out. A unique aspect of its flowers lies in their variable floral fragrance, capable of changing according to the intended target it seeks to attract. While the plant finds renowned usage in love potions, it is also frequently employed by witch hunters as bait or traps. Undoubtedly, the class was intriguing, yet an air of distraction permeated the room, with most young wizards surreptitiously stealing glances in Skylar's direction. The reason is that the impending Triwizard Tournament will commence in a few hours. Contrastingly, Skylar, being a seasoned warrior, approached the game with a calm demeanor, content to pass the time as he pleased. At noon, post-lunch, Professor McGonagall hastened toward him in the auditorium, accompanied by the visibly perturbed Harry. The latter wore a grim expression, understandably so. Even with prior knowledge of the task, Harry faced nerve-wracking situations as depicted in the original book, now, he confronted the unknown. Schuyler suddenly felt a surge of empathy for Dumbledore. Is this the successor the headmaster has painstakingly nurtured? Harry's nature is marked by kindness, simplicity, and unwavering loyalty. Yet, without the resilience inherited from his mother, he would never have become an exceptional talent, let alone assume the crucial role of a savior. As mentioned in the original book, his courage is attributed to the near misadventures he faced, with Dumbledore overseeing from the shadows. He confronted Voldemort in his first year, battled the Basilisk in the second, and encountered over a hundred Dementors in the third. Regrettably, apart from the first year escapade, all other accomplishments were overshadowed by Skylar. Skylar, it's time for the champions to go to the field to prepare themselves for the first part of the tournament. You must be prepared for the first task, Professor McGonagall announced. Sure, Professor, no problem. I'm ready. Skylar stood up, donning a sunny smile and meticulously adjusting his supreme wizard robe. In its sleek mode, the robe hugged his body, accentuating perfect and robust muscle lines. The dark patterns on the garment emitted a subtle allure, rendering him incredibly confident, heroically poised, and strikingly handsome. Daphne and Astoria rose simultaneously, each planting a kiss on his cheeks. Daphne whispered, I am praying for your good luck. Return safely. You are one fortunate fellow. Professor McGonagall sported a rare smile. And you seem to be in excellent spirits today. Are you feeling confident? It's all thanks to the professor's meticulous teaching that I've reached the strength I possess today, Skylar expressed with a grateful smile. I'll give it my all and won't let the professor down, surveying the entire auditorium, he raised his right hand high, forming a fist and cast the sonorous spell. His voice resonated loudly, I won't disappoint you. Hogwarts will triumph. Ravenclaw erupted in cheers under the spirited leadership of Morag and Cho. Waving Skylar's face on small flags, Luna even conjured a horn from nowhere, blowing an exhilarating tune. 
Hufflepuff joined in with vigorous applause under Cedric's guidance. Susan Bones, along with Hannah Abbott, Megan Jones, and other rehearsed girls, stood in a neat line, passionately chanting, Skylar. Skylar. We must win. Hogwarts. Skylar will be the true champion. Skylar, take the trophy to Hogwarts. Truly, the Skylar fans club is paying off as he feels their support echo inside his heart, warming and giving him all the reasons to give his all. Gryffindor's Hermione gazed intently at Skylar, silently waving clenched fists and forming a, come on, expression with her mouth. Among the still-seated young wizards, her movements were notably conspicuous. Ron, seated beside her, displayed a hint of disgust, but given the improvement in their relationship, he refrained from criticizing. Slytherin's young wizards rose collectively, admiration and awe evident on their faces as they gazed at Skylar. Draco approached, delivering a hearty slap on Skylar's shoulder, smiling, you got this, brother. Along with our parents' prayer, I too am wishing the best outcome for this tournament. I can't wait to see you crush them. Draco concluded his greeting by offering Skylar his fist. Skylar smiled before taking the invitation of Draco's fist bump. They hugged each other tightly after that. At that moment, the sinister aura enveloping Draco is nowhere to be felt. They are just brother bonded by their blood, wishing each other for the best. In the professor's chair, Professor Flittick, a diminutive man, stood on his seat and applauded vigorously, sending an encouraging glance Skylar's way. Professor Sprout beamed with joy, casually scattering a plethora of petals with seven colors and seven flavors. Professor Trelawney, head held high, clutched a goblet filled with sherry while Snape, momentarily setting aside his usual aloofness, joined in the applause with the other professors despite maintaining his typically cold countenance. Skylar smiled genuinely, lifting his head and closing his eyes, fully immersing himself in this moment. Regardless of the game's outcome, today would forever remain etched in his memory. Named Skylar Malfoy and identified as a Slytherin, at this moment, this minute, this second, he was nothing more than a student representing the whole Hogwarts. Dumbledore, observing from a distance in the professor's chair, experienced a flicker in his eyes, unable to suppress a sigh. Despite his mental preparedness and early attempts to win over Skylar, he found himself taken aback by the extent of Skylar's popularity among students. After all, Skylar was just a fourth-year student, and he couldn't recall Voldemort being held in such high regard during his own fourth year. Furthermore, Skylar hails from a family notorious for its hostility towards mixed blood and muggle wizards. To say it's notorious might be an exaggeration, but the current atmosphere tells a different story. Even Hermione, a muggle-born and a close friend of another champion, Harry, passionately cheers for Skylar. What's the meaning behind this unexpected unity? Dumbledore's eyes gleamed with wisdom. He sensed that all of this might just be the starting point for Skylar. Presently, Skylar could effortlessly transcend the divisions of houses and blood statuses, rallying everyone's will and hearts. If he emerges victorious in the competition. It appears that Dumbledore's earlier gesture of kindness in sending Abatel was indeed remarkably foresight. Guided by Professor McGonagall, Skylar, and Harry walked along the outskirts of the Forbidden Forest, heading towards the location where the fire dragon awaited. The outside weather proved quite chilly, with gusts of cold wind brushing against their faces. Harry's complexion grew even paler. Skylar utilized the constant temperature feature of the Supreme Wizard's robe, shielding himself from the cold. Instead of feeling the chill, he experienced a pleasant warmth. As they neared the area where the event was set to take place, a tent stood tall, strategically positioned to shield the fire dragons. The entrance of the tent faced them, becoming increasingly visible. You must enter with a few fellow champions, Professor McGonagall instructed, her gaze now fixed on Harry, her voice slightly trembling. Potter, wait for your turn. Mr. Bagman is also present inside. He will guide you through the steps. Good luck. Thank you, Harry responded in a subdued and distant tone. Inside the tent, Catalina reclined leisurely on an opulent chair made of unicorn leather. Adorned in a pristine white wizard robe, her jade-like skin seemed even more ethereal. Her eyes remained tightly shut, with fluttering eyelashes and a gentle rise and fall of her ample chest, exuding an enchanting and languid beauty. It was as if she had fallen into a profound slumber, akin to sleeping beauty in muggle fairy tales. However, through Skylar's magical sight, 
he could discern the frequent fluctuations of magical power within her body, ebb and flow, strong and weak. It seemed as if the magical power in her blood was undergoing successive micromagic upheavals. He understood that, with closed eyes, she was focused on cultivating the power of dualist heart within her bloodline, oblivious to the arrival of someone in the tent. Eleanor stood upright, delicately caressing the wand in her hand, her gaze fixed on it with soft and intense concentration as if she were fondly stroking a cherished companion. Skylar furrowed his brow. Through his magical eyes, he could clearly perceive the gradual dissolution of the sealing enchantment placed on the wand. These two individuals were about to embark on their initial task, facing a real challenge. Were they going to succeed? Would they attempt to confront and defeat the dragon? As for Harry, he stood motionless, resembling a stone statue. Skylar offered a faint smile in Harry's direction, but Harry responded with a smile that seemed more akin to a grimace. Well, his reaction was much more in line with expectations. A tremendous roar echoed from outside the tent. The deafening sound indicated the presence of a formidable creature. At that moment, Bagman entered the tent, wearing a smile. Catalina's eyelashes fluttered as if sensing something, and she opened her eyes. The entire tent suddenly illuminated, as if bathed in the radiance of sword light. Invisible waves of sharpness rippled through the air, grazing against the exposed skin of those present. A subtle chill could be felt by everyone. Bagman's complexion paled, and he promptly retracted his earlier statement. After waiting a few moments for his color to return, Bagman continued, All right, now that everyone is here, it's time to brief you on the situation. His expression changed again, now reflecting excitement. Did you hear the commotion outside? That's the adversary you'll be facing. The fire dragon. I'll be passing this bag to each of you in turn, he announced, raising a bag and shaking it towards them. You'll be selecting the fire dragon models you're going to face. They come in different types. Oh, and one more thing. By the way. Your primary objective is to retrieve the golden eggs. Ladies first, he added, extending the bag to Catalina with his hefty arm. Catalina reached into the bag and pulled out a small, lifelike dragon model, a green dragon body, brown pupils, and a number attached to its elegant slender neck, no. It was a Welsh green dragon. The Welsh green dragon was considered one of the more docile among the various dragon species. The corners of Catalina's mouth lifted slightly, and a smile glinted in her eyes. She seemed quite content with her luck. On the other hand, Eleanor revealed a bright red Chinese fireball dragon. The number tied around its neck was no. Shaped like a colossal lion, the Chinese fireball dragon was known for its courageous and fierce nature. While not the most robust dragon species, it posed a formidable challenge. Especially when injured, it would turn violent, disregarding life and death, significantly escalating the danger. At this moment, Eleanor displayed no expression on her face. She didn't even blink. It appeared that no matter the type of dragon she chose, her heart remained unswayed. Skylar reached into the bag and pulled out a silver-blue Swedish short snout, an attractive silvery-blue dragon whose skin is sought after for the manufacture of protective gloves and shields. On the other hand, Harry drew the short straw, unveiling a black Hungarian horntail with the number four. Known for its aggressiveness and danger, the Hungarian horntail carried the most sinister reputation among the four fire dragons. Even Harry, hailing from the muggle world and new to the wizarding realm, was aware of its infamous notoriety. At that moment, Harry's face turned ashen, devoid of any trace of color. All right, you've all got your dragons. Bagman announced. The number on your neck indicates the order in which you'll face the fire dragon. Understand? Now, I'll leave you for a moment as I explain to the audience. Mr. Malfoy, you're up first. Enter the field as soon as you hear the whistle. Clear. Perfectly clear, Mr. Bagman, don't worry. Skylar responded with a confident and calm smile. The Swedish short snout awaited, signaling the beginning of Skylar's journey in the Triwizard Tournament. Here I come, Swedish Brachiosaurus. Skylar shouted inside his heart. Skylar emerged as the vanguard among the champions, boldly stepping onto the field as the piercing whistle signaled the commencement of the challenge. As he ventured through the tent entrance and into the open, he meticulously adjusted his robe, elevated his gaze, and gracefully made his way into the arena. 
The stadium's architecture resembled the ancient Roman Colosseum, a circular expanse with a spacious field at its core. Varied terrains featuring trees, rocks, and ponds adorned the landscape, while newly constructed spectator stands surrounded the arena. The stands were teeming with spectators, their gazes fixed upon Schuyler as he took center stage. Bathed in the afternoon sunlight, the golden rays cast a radiant glow upon him, trailing a shadow behind his lithe figure, enhancing the illusion of his slender form. Under the brilliant sunlight, the vibrant and handsome countenance of the young man became a spectacle. The golden halo, accentuated by the supreme wizard's robe, bestowed an air of solemnity upon him. As the sacred golden light permeated his being, his entire demeanor transformed into something regal, akin to a mountainous presence, exuding majesty and distinction. In the audience, many young wizards found themselves mesmerized, almost deluding themselves into perceiving Skylar not as a mere fourth-grade wizard but as a majestic battle mage adorned in golden armor. On the opposing end of the arena, a striking silver-blue fire dragon assumed a commanding stance. Perched upon a lofty rock, its wings gently fluttered, as if warding off bothersome intruders. Adjacent to the fire dragon lay a conspicuous golden egg, adding an enigmatic touch to the unfolding spectacle. Skylar found himself in a stroke of luck as the initial contestant, with the Swedish short snout already present on the field, indulging in a tranquil nap with closed eyes. This particular competition event posed no significant challenge for Skylar. Dealing with a dormant fire dragon, granting him ample time to strategize, proved to be a far cry from the formidable battle he faced against Aragog and her spiderlings in the Forbidden Forest. With his right hand holding the wand, Skylar lowered it, engrossed in silent concentration as he tapped into the reservoir of magic power within him. Vinia Arctis. In an instant, the wand in his hand rose swiftly before his eyes. Executing deft movements, the wand danced across his fingertips with unparalleled speed, leaving ephemeral afterimages in its wake. More than a dozen thick black vines suddenly sprouted vigorously from the ground surrounding the Swedish short snout. The growth rate of these black vines was nothing short of astonishing. In the blink of an eye, they multiplied into hundreds, ensnaring the giant dragon and firmly anchoring it to the ground. It is one of the spells that he has learned from spending his time reading the ancient books dated from the Middle Age knowledge of wizardry. A resonant roar echoed through the sky as the dragon vehemently struggled, attempting to free itself by using claws and fangs to sever the relentless vines. However, the vine's rapid growth impeded its efforts. Just as the giant dragon managed to tear off a few vines coiled around its body, it endeavored to flap its wings, aiming to escape the impending peril. However, more vines wrapped around its bloated body again, ruthlessly lifting it from the low air. Pulling it down, it fell heavily to the ground with a violent crash. The Swedish short snout was now covered in wounds and went into a rage. Among the fire dragon species known in the world, in terms of size and strength, the Ukrainian iron belly is undoubtedly the largest, in terms of being the wildest, most aggressive, and with the longest attack distance, the Hungarian horntail deserves the title, but if you want to argue about the destructive power behind the flames these dragons spew, then the Swedish short snout would be the best contender. The flames of the Swedish short snout are unique. It is the only dragon species that can spit out blue fire. The temperature of the flames is enough to turn wood and bones into ashes in one second, and although it cannot resemble the Hungarian horntail, the fire that sprays out lacks the ability to spit out a torrent like the Chinese fireball dragon, but the flame it spits is incalculably potent. It would be scorching if you want to use an adjective for that kind of flame. It can be seen that the flames of the Swedish short snout are the strongest among many fire dragons, both in terms of the quantity of the flame and the quality of the flame. The Swedish short snout lost its mind in anger. It roared one after another, and the dense silver-blue scales on its body began to glow with a faint blue light, and then it opened its mouth, it breathed fire. The flashing, dazzling blue flame was like a high, wild, huge wave, overwhelmingly devouring everything in sight. A hot wind suddenly came out of the center of the arena, and even the spectators far away in the stands could feel the astonishingly hot wind blowing on their faces. Astoria covered her mouth with a worried look, while Daphne and Murray looked calm. They obviously had a better understanding of Skylar's strengths. Morag also joked, Merlin's beard, look at this temperature. I'm afraid even the goblin wrought silver by the goblins can be melted, right? Astoria's two little hands held each other tightly and said, isn't this dangerous? Can Skylar seriously handle it? 
Daphne patted her sister's little hand and said calmly, Don't worry, he will be fine. Is his strength something that a mere fire dragon can defeat? The once sane Swedish short snout sprayed blue flames desperately around itself, and even its huge body was covered by the flames. Under the influence of the raging fire, the crisscrossing vines turned into ashes in an instant upon contact. However, at the same time, the scales on the fire dragon's body were also melted by the raging fire, falling into pieces at a speed visible to the naked eye. Pieces peeled off the dragon's body. After enduring all the hardships and injuries, the Swedish short snout finally broke free from the shackles of the vines, spread its huge wings, and flew into the sky. It raised its head high and let out a long, deafening roar. The sharp sound broke through the sea of clouds and stung the eardrums of the audience, making everyone present eager to feel its anger. Most dragonologists and magical beast textbooks rank the Hungarian horntail as number one in the ranking of dragon dangers. That's because the Swedish short snout lived in uninhabited areas in the wild, and humans were not its main source of food. Therefore, this dragon rarely comes into contact with people, and the fatal accidents it causes are even rarer. It can almost be said to have the lowest mortality rate among all dragons. This creates the illusion that the Swedish short snout is not one of the dangerous dragons because of their exposure to humans. If you regard it as a safe dragon because of this, then wait to be severely punished by the cruel reality. Although the Swedish short snout rarely attacks humans, this does not mean that it is a good-tempered baby dragon. Only experienced fire dragon experts will know that when a Swedish short snout becomes really angry, it is definitely an existence that cannot be dealt with lightly because it will let everyone know what fear truly means. However, at this moment, Skylar's long-prepared magic has been completed. Skylar created his own protective magic, the Divine Aegis. With Skylar as the center, the sharp wind roared, and the magic power emitting strong white light quickly gathered and swirled around Skylar like a vortex surrounding Skylar in the protective barrier. Then, the vague energy field gradually materialized, and a force field appeared faintly on it. The force field was moving, in the eyes of outsiders, Skylar seemed to be being held hostage. However, the shield provided by Divine Aegis was wrapping Skylar's entire body, giving him even a sense of comfort behind his own creation of shield spell. The Swedish short snout erupted blazing blue and purple flames from its mouth and slammed its body against the barrier with its claws in front. Boom! Keek! The Swedish short snout let out a tragic scream that resounded through the sky. The whole dragon somersaulted backward and lay on the ground in a state of embarrassment. However, it still could not stop the subsequent impact force that rebounded. Its entire body was not affected by the impact. It rolled away in a controlled manner in the opposite direction, creating large swaths of smoke and dust. Around Skylar, the shiny protective shield still stood tall without any particular damage suffered. There were a uniform of cheers from the surrounding auditorium, Skylar. Must win. Hogwarts. Skylar. True champion. Hogwarts will win. Skylar slowly spoke. Even though there was noisy noise all around, his voice still clearly reached the ears of everyone present. Rather than speaking, it is better to say that he is singing, he loudly opens his mouth and chants the mysterious ancient language. His voice is deep and powerful, akin to singing, and each word and pronunciation reverberate like thunder at the edge of the sky, shaking the eardrums of everyone present. The audience fell into a momentary silence, with even Dumbledore standing up directly in the referee's seat, his usually calm old face showing a rare expression of shock and confusion. Although Professor McGonagall is the head of Gryffindor House, Skylar is still her favorite student. She cares about Skylar as much as anyone else. Unable to contain her concern, she asked, Albus, talk to me. What's currently going on with that child? Dumbledore initially frowned tightly but then relaxed his brows. He shook his head and said, I'm not entirely sure, but it sounds like dragon language, probably the lost ancient dragon language, the dragon tongue. Madame Maxime and several nearby professors looked on in disbelief. In today's era, let alone the ancient dragon language, there are almost no wizards who can speak the dragon tongue. Karkaroff snorted loudly and said with a look of contempt, Albus, feel free to brag about it. You don't even know the language yourself, but one of your students could speak of it. Be more proud about it rather than trying to beat around the bush. Rather than showing it off, you'd rather play clueless with us. Since when did Hogwarts become this arrogant? 
several professors and Madame Maxim, familiar with Dumbledore's personality, frowned upon hearing Karkaroff's words. Just as Professor McGonagall was about to refute, someone on the field exclaimed in surprise. Every Hogwarts student must have read the textbook Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, a mandatory reading for first-year students. In this book, the author, Newt Scamander, explains that fire dragons are the most dangerous magical creatures, and no species of fire dragon can be tamed. Wizards may attempt to subdue fire dragons through coercion or torture. For instance, it is rumored that Gringotts used such methods to train a fire dragon. When exposed to a specific noise, the dragon recalls the pain and becomes compliant. A knowledgeable goblin can then use this noise to pass by the dragon safely, making them an effective guardian for underground vaults. However, this doesn't constitute true taming. Once a fire dragon breaks free and takes to the sky, it ceases to be subdued and might seek revenge. Fire dragons cannot be tamed is considered an ironclad rule that wizards have learned from numerous lessons over the past thousand years. This notion has become deeply ingrained in the hearts of all wizards, and everyone firmly believes in it. However, this iron rule was shattered today, witnessed by hundreds of Hogwarts teachers and students. Skylar's delivery of the ancient dragon language is grand and majestic, resonating with thunderous echoes and creating a rumbling and explosive atmosphere. Each syllable carries the inherent majesty of the ancient dragon, imposing the superiority of the draconic lineage upon the unruly Swedish short snout. The creature, once defiant, now lay subdued on the ground, its head, limbs, and body rendered immobile, emitting only feeble and pitiful cries. It's the true submission of a dragon. Inherent in all fire dragons and sub-dragons, the submission of oneself toward another entity could only be achieved if the dragon itself respects the other party. If the dragon deemed the other party worthy of their loyalty, then the might of the dragon itself, which is sealed inside their blood and carried from their ancient bloodline, would be a hundred percent loyal to their contractor. Naturally, the dragon tongue is profound and has been lost for an extended period. Even Professor Binz's records do not constitute a complete inheritance. Thus, Schuyler hasn't fully mastered the language, having only scraped the surface of it. Nevertheless, Schuyler carefully selected a piece of ancient dragon language for this critical moment, specifically prepared to exert the necessary restraint and coercion. Deciphered by archaeologists, these words are believed to be the parting thoughts of the last ancient dragon, akin to a prophecy when translated into human language. The probable meaning of this paragraph might be, in the cycle of existence, life has withered, but don't despair, stick to hope, darkness will eventually pass, night will not last long. When dawn breaks again, courage, he will rise again. The Swedish short snout, now entirely incapable of resisting, witnessed Schuyler don a relaxed smile. Approaching the subdued fire dragon, he extended his hand, gently patting its head as if soothing a puppy. Then, with the golden egg in hand, he raised it triumphantly toward the referee's seat. Once again, the previously hushed audience erupted into a deafening roar that resonated through the sky. Having accomplished his task, Schuyler opted not to return to the tent. Instead, he strolled closer to the auditorium, intending to observe the performances of the next three champions. While competition rules prohibit those yet to participate from leaving the tent without authorization to prevent unfair advantages, there's no mandatory requirement for the champion who've completed their events to return to their tents. A contingent of Dragon Farm employees entered the arena, exerting considerable effort to assuage the terrified and stunned Swedish short snout before safely removing it. The team leader exchanged a subtle understanding glance with Skylar. Subsequently, Ministry of Magic personnel arrived to restore the scene to its original state. Once everything was in order, the field transformed once more, featuring a caged common Welsh green. Ludo, signaling the commencement with a whistle, introduced the second contender, Catalina. She emerged from the tent, stepping onto the field where sunlight played upon her figure. Yet, her presence seemed to reflect an icy, almost mirrored surface, emanating a cold radiance. Quite a sight as she readied herself in the arena, basking under the sunlight only to radiate an aura of coldness while she closed her eyes and took a deep breath. Across from her, the common Welsh green maintained a defensive crouch, protecting its clutch of eggs. Its fierce eyes fixed on the girl, occasionally emitting a low growl akin to a warning. Catalina's lips parted, and she enunciated with clarity, Sectum Sempra. Choosing a cutting curse, her incantation, 
unlike a typical cutting curse, generated a faint white light that not only disrupted the air around it but also produced a splitting sound. The curse she had just cast struck the fire dragon's body with precision, causing a burst of crimson blood to gush from beneath its neck. Simultaneously, the fire dragon suffered a severe blow from the impact of the curse. Catalina remained relentless. She swiftly advanced while murmuring an incantation under her breath. With a deft wave of her wand in an intricate pattern, a white light radiated from the wand's tip. The common Welsh green, still incapacitated from its fall, made no meaningful resistance. The white light precisely struck the wound on the fire dragon's body, resembling a large fountain as it sprayed a continuous column of crimson water, staining the ground with shocking bloodstains. Skylar furrowed his brow. The second spell was not a cutting spell or even a combat spell, it was a bloodletting spell in healing magic. For a wizard with a natural affinity for combat, the combination of curse that would struck fear into her opponent's heart paired along with the healing spell she is capable of would make he a formidable ally Skylar started to think of a few plans, trying to think whether bringing Catalina to his side would be worth the trouble or not. The common Welsh green, lying limp on the ground, emitted a mournful cry. Dragon Sanctuary employees promptly rushed to the scene, administering first aid to the wounded creature. At this moment, Catalina gracefully approached the golden egg and raised it aloft. Catalina's displayed prowess successfully captivated the hearts of the audience, prompting them to shower her with applause, much like they did for Skylar. The third participant poised to enter the battle was Eleanor. In contrast to the previous two champions, Eleanor's demeanor resembled less that of a champion and more of a priest presiding over magical rituals. She moved gracefully around the field, uttering incantations, while the Chinese fireball dragon fixated its fierce gaze on her. As Eleanor traversed the terrain, the dragon's head swiveled, intermittently releasing small fireballs accompanied by thick smoke from its nostrils. Upon discovering a specific spot, Eleanor abruptly halted, pointed her wand at the ground, and exclaimed, Dragon Seal. A deep and resonant muffled sound emanated from the depths of the earth, and the entire arena floor lit up with intertwining crimson magic marks. The Chinese fireball dragon emitted a terrifying, earth-shattering scream, writhing in agony as if ensnared by an invisible net. Known for its vehement nature, the dragon continued to roar and thrash about. Its sharp claws gouged a sizable hole in the ground in front of it, yet it remained entangled in the invisible restraints on its body. Despite attempting to spew flames, the dragon opened its mouth wide, revealing its pointed fangs, only to expel saliva onto the ground, no tongue of fire emerged. It was a scene of desperation. Closing its eyes, the Chinese fireball dragon lay limp on the ground, surrendering to the futility of its struggle. Skylar promptly grasped the situation, this was a sealing technique designed for fire dragons or individuals with dragon bloodlines. It had the capability to restrict the dragon's innate abilities, including strength and fire breathing. Undeterred by the hostile gaze of the Chinese fireball dragon, Eleanor approached and elevated the golden egg for everyone to see. While Eleanor's performance lacked the thrill of the preceding champions, the magic that subdued the formidable fire dragon left the young wizards astonished, eliciting applause from the audience. With three impressive displays already completed, Harry's own performance appeared rather ordinary. The prospect of facing a fire dragon topic had initially terrified him, and though he clung to a glimmer of hope due to being the last in line, the preceding champions swiftly completed their tasks in less than five minutes, each acquiring a golden egg. As the whistle sounded, Harry's mind went blank. What should he do? He hadn't formulated a plan yet. His steps were shaky, akin to a soulless zombie. He stared at the ground, exiting the tent as the slanting sun cast shadows on his face, creating an air of mystery and intrigue. The Hungarian horntail remained crouched at the far end of the paddock, fixating its vicious yellow eyes on Harry. Its spiked tail thrashed violently, gouging deep pits into the unyielding ground. In the arena, Harry stood motionless, deep in thought for a full ten minutes. The Slytherin students showered him with severe boos, but their disapproval went unnoticed. Amidst the chaos, a faint voice seemed to whisper in Harry's ears, Use your strengths. Strengths. Besides Quidditch, do I possess any other strengths? Wait, Quidditch. Could it be that? Harry's inner turmoil was visibly shown in his expression toward the crowd as his inner voice battled his paralyzed thought process. Just as inspiration struck Harry, the mysterious voice returned, urging, use a spell to get what you need. 
Harry lifted his head, determination blazing in his eyes. He dismissed all distractions and bellowed, Accio Firebolt. Employing the summoning charm, Harry called the Firebolt from the castle, mimicking the original work. He mounted the Firebolt, sustaining a minor shoulder injury but securing a golden egg. The subsequent scoring session unfolded. Skyler's performance undeniably stole the show, earning unanimous perfect scores from Dumbledore, Crouch, and Bagman. Despite some hesitation, Madame Maxime was also awarded 10 points. However, Karkaroff was less impressed, granting a mere 4 points. Harry faced a similar treatment in the original novel, but the timid Harry chose not to react to this unjust occurrence. Skyler, however, was not one to be easily intimidated. As Skyler's countenance darkened, he approached the referee's seat and employed a sonorous spell to address the assembly boldly, Dear Principal Karkaroff, I would like to inquire about the mistake I made in this match that led to the deduction of points. The entire audience was caught off guard, rendering the scene momentarily hushed. While Dumbledore and Snape maintained stoic expressions, Professor McGonagall observed Karkaroff with a hint of satisfaction. Karkaroff's expression shifted, and he asserted, Your performance is too artificial. There is no way no one didn't see how staged your performance was and on top of that you recited incomprehensible spells. I don't know what sort of shameful tactics you've pulled. He paused, seemingly hinting at something, casting a pointed glance at Dumbledore before continuing, you even managed to make the dragon lie down submissively, I've never heard of such things happening in the history of the wizarding world. Let alone a kid of your age taming a dragon. Skyla retorted with vigor, since our esteemed guest, Mr. Karkaroff, the headmaster from Durmstrang, questions my performance, and to prove myself while upholding Hogwarts' reputation as a fourth-year student, I formally challenge you to a fair, one-on-one -on -one duel. I dare you to accept, do you have the courage to descend and face me? The entire audience was left in a state of astonishment. In the annals of the wizarding world, such a challenge had never been witnessed before. It was common knowledge that a wizard's magical prowess typically increased with age. As the head of Durmstrang School, Karkaroff boasted a level of skill comparable to an elite or, standing not far behind McGonagall and Snape. For a fourth-year student to extend a challenge to such an accomplished figure amounted to a daring leap across four proficiency levels. Skyler, well acquainted with Karkaroff's disposition from the original narrative, knew that the latter would never accept the challenge. Karkaroff remained unaware of Skyler's true identity, and the risk of tarnishing his own reputation loomed large. Even if he did muster the courage to face the challenge, Skyler harbored no fear. With Dumbledore present, his safety was assured, and possessing the magical prowess of an adult wizard, along with carefully devised tactics and formidable spells at his disposal, Skyler could potentially outmaneuver and counterattack. As anticipated by Skyler, Karkaroff succumbed to fear, altering the score to a perfect 10 out of 10 with a livid expression. Skyler's overall score reached an impeccable 50 points. Catalina's spell, characterized by its forceful nature, resulted in varying degrees of damage to each fire dragon egg due to the powerful winds generated while knocking the fire dragon away. Consequently, she secured a score of 45 points. Eleanor's approach lacked the courage and combat spirit expected of a champion, and her preparation time was notably longer, leading to a deduction in points. She garnered a score of 45 points, sharing the second position with Catalina. Skyler refrained from offering commentary on the scoring methodology, as it aligned with the original book's approach. After all, the Triwizard Tournament showcases ancient beast fighting champions, and the entertainment value derived from the champion's innovative breakthroughs is a crucial factor in scoring. While the most effective, Fleur's strategy in the original book resulted in the fire dragon falling asleep, and the champion obtaining the golden egg without any peril or harm to other dragon eggs. Despite this, her ranking was the lowest. This problem prompted Skyler to contemplate intensely on devising the most captivating method to conquer the challenge two days prior. His aim was not just to secure victory in the game but also to capture the hearts of the audience. Harry's score was marginally lower than in the original book due to his prolonged contemplation on the field, culminating in a total of 38 points. The standings for the competition results are as follows, Skyler secures the first position, Catalina and Eleanor share the second spot, and Harry settles for third. Skyler reveled in satisfaction, achieving precisely what he aimed for. Quietly feeling the satisfaction, Skyler mused in his thoughts. This no longer resembled the simplistic house games of the original world, 
and the path for Barty to aid Harry in a comeback victory was no longer as straightforward. Following the announcement of the competition results, the inaugural event of the Goblet of Fire concluded officially. The second event, scheduled three months later on February 24, required the champions to unravel the secret of the Golden Egg. However, having already deciphered the method, Skylar found himself liberated once again. With lots of free time in his hands, Skylar decided to pursue other matters other than tending to the golden egg itself. The results of the competition resonated in real time across Europe, capturing the attention of various media outlets. On an eventful day, it wasn't just the Daily Prophet that graced the occasion, the stone-winged devil from France, Viking Daily representing the Nordic region, the gossip-centric, Confusion, the Women's Magazine, which is weekly, the curiosity-driven, the Quibbler, and numerous other reputable media from Europe were present. Behind this extensive media coverage lay Juliana's strategic intent. As Skylar's spokesperson, she seized the opportunity to propel Skylar into becoming a formidable and idolized figure in the wizarding world. Post-competition, Skylar found himself inundated with letters akin to a flurry of snowflakes. These messages arrived from nearly every European country, conveying words of praise and appreciation in a myriad of languages. Some enthusiasts went a step further, organizing events in their respective countries to celebrate Schuyler's accomplishments. Notably, a sender by the name of Admiral Jaina appended a reward to their letter, a Gringotts-sealed cash roll with a marked value of 115 galleons. In response, Schuyler enlisted Daphne to gather all the members of the Serpentis Vigil Club. Together, this dedicated group convened in the secret room behind the expansive mirror on the fifth floor. Hours ticked away as they meticulously opened, translated, and crafted responses to each letter. As dinner approached, fellow members departed, leaving only, Skylar, Morag, Astoria, and Daphne, to persist in the thoughtful task of engaging with their admirers. Certainly, Skylar would never subject himself and his three girlfriends to mistreatment. In his ever-diligent manner, Dobby presented a lavish dinner to commemorate Skylar's triumph in securing his inaugural project victory. As an additional gesture, a bottle of Ogden Old Fire Whiskey was uncorked, casting a celebratory ambience in recognition of Skylar's success. Upon entering the Slytherin common room that night, the atmosphere was once again engulfed in cheers and jubilation. Tables and chairs bore the weight of delectable mountains of cake, accompanied by sizzling pumpkin juice and butterbeer. Blaise Shabini orchestrated a display of meticulously crafted fireworks, transforming the air into a canvas of stars and sparks. The lounge adorned its walls with several new banners, most depicting Skylar commanding his wand at the fire dragon, compelling it to bow its head like an obedient puppy. However, two banners stood out, humorously portraying the fire dragon's rear engulfed in flames. Draco approached Skylar, delivering a hearty pat on the shoulder, and expressed his pride, I knew you had it in you. Skylar, I've already written to inform my parents, and they're immensely proud of you. Skylar gazed at Draco and finally voiced the sentiment that had lingered in his heart for quite some time, thank you, pig shit. Don't use that name. Draco retorted, feigning annoyance. The two brothers shared a history of using this nickname during their younger years, but it had been abandoned since they turned nine. In a moment of quiet acknowledgement, the two brothers exchanged glances and burst into uncontrollable laughter. Draco ceased his laughter and adopted a more serious tone, well, you've won the first task. Let's not discuss that useless potter. I must say those two girls are quite formidable. You might want to be careful with them. Skylar's eyes and the corners of his mouth retained their smiles, but a subtle glint gleamed deep within his eyes. He replied emphatically, got it, you pig shit. No need to worry. Ah, you're still talking. Draco appeared on the verge of losing his composure amidst the raucous laughter of the young wizards surrounding them. Just as Draco was about to throw a piece of cake at Skylar, Skylar uttered softly, Thank you, brother. Draco hesitated for a moment, snorted, and declared, I won't cause trouble for you. Now, I'm heading back to my room for some rest. With that, Draco turned proudly and made his way toward the boys' dormitory corridor behind the cyan tapestry, carrying the piece of cake with him. Without looking back, he softly added, as you said, we are brothers. As Draco vanished behind the tapestry, a slight upward curl graced Skylar's lips. Draco's departure didn't dampen the festive atmosphere, instead, it fueled the younger wizards, making the scene even more exuberant. 
Without even him knowing it, Skylar has diverted one of the biggest crises that he could possibly face in the future. The fallout between the relationship of the Malfoy brothers. It will tell story for years to come if Skylar didn't pay more attention to how Draco acts. Beer foam, food remnants, and colorful ribbons shot from vibrant cannons decorated the tables and the ground with celebratory chaos. Hansie approached, accompanied by her three loyal followers, Audrey, Tracy, and Millicent. She greeted Skylar with a smile, saying, Congratulations, Skylar. Thank you, Pansy, Skylar responded graciously. Pansy, with a pointed expression, mentioned, Draco organized this celebration for you. Rumor has it he spent all his pocket money this semester. I understand and appreciate it, Pansy, Skylar replied softly. Suddenly, Terence emerged, holding a sizable glass of butterbeer. He raised the glass and exclaimed, Here's to our Slytherin champion, Skylar. Simultaneously, all the young wizards raised their cups and cheered Skylar's name. After setting down his cup, Terence remarked, You're amazing, Skylar. Unbelievable. You've broken the iron rule that fire dragons cannot be tamed. To my knowledge, no one has achieved this feat in the past hundred years except you and Scamander, the master of fantastic beasts. Skylar had heard a bit about Scamander's exploits during the period of Muggles' First World War, 1914. You are listening to this audiobook on web novel audiobooks Tkthigud. Scamander participated in the Ministry of Magic's confidential plan to tame the Ukrainian Iron Belly. Ultimately, the plan was aborted, as the Fire Dragons only responded to Scamander and resisted other dragon tamers. Concerning this peculiar occurrence, Skylar entertained a speculation. He considered that Scamander's family might possess a bloodline talent akin to an affinity for magical animals, and Scamander, due to his slightly autistic nature, was compelled to nurture this talent. Not approached, delivering a package to Skylar. Dad asked me to give this to you. He said congratulating you on today's success is a gift. Skylar and Not exchanged a glance, nodding in tacit agreement. The Caro sisters delicately touched the gleaming golden egg, commenting, Oh my god, it's quite heavy. Is this the clue to the second level? Others began to take notice of the golden egg at this point. Blaze inquired, What could be inside this? I don't know, I haven't studied it yet, Skylar said with a sly smile. But feel free to open it and take a look. Blaze handed the golden egg to the robust Goyle, who, using his strength, dug his nails into a groove and pried it open. To their surprise, it was empty, devoid of any contents. However, the moment it was opened, an incredibly terrifying, high-pitched scream reverberated throughout the entire room. Close it! Pansy shouted, covering her ears with her hands. Goyle hastily shut the golden egg. What was that? Blaze queried, staring at the golden egg. It's like a banshee's cry. But also somewhat reminiscent of a mandrake's scream. Anyway, it's unsettling. What's there to fear? Terence asserted, Skylar has even tamed a fire dragon, how could he still be afraid of these things? The consensus among the group was swift. By the time Skylar returned to the dormitory, it was nearly one o'clock in the morning. Unwrapping the package bestowed upon him by Mr. Knott, he discovered a book titled, The Encyclopedia of Alchemical Locks, encompassing methods for crafting and deciphering alchemical locks throughout the ages. Perfect, precisely what Skylar needed. Skylar profoundly grasped the significance of consolidating power. In his previous life, many fans admired protagonists for their individual prowess. However, he now understood that everyone possessed unique strengths and weaknesses. Regardless of one's might, even an exceptionally gifted individual like Voldemort couldn't conquer the world alone. Only by uniting the strengths of many could greater achievements be realized. He retrieved several items from the space within his suitcase and arranged them methodically on the bed. These were gifts sent by his allies, requiring substantial effort to assemble. Skylar took this moment to study them in detail with no one around. Miss Juliana's gift arrived in the form of a dragon-shaped specimen enclosed within a transparent container. According to her, the specimen was an ancient dragon cub excavated by the organization's archaeologists from a specific ruin. Apart from the organization's clandestine sealing technique, it also contained a trace of the ancient dragon's magic, specifically the power inherent in the ancient dragon's bloodline. On the other hand, Professor Slughorn's offerings were magical potions, all of which were exceptionally rare. 
Alongside a vial of blessed elixir, there was a sizable container of dragon's blood. Extracting pure dragon blood from adult dragons is a costly affair, with its trade nearly monopolized by the Ministry of Magic, rendering it almost unattainable on the open market. However, Slughorn's contribution wasn't just any adult dragon's blood, it was a vial of activated dragon's blood. The creation process involves intricate ritual steps, precious magical ingredients, and considerable time, spanning several months. Dumbledore's knowledge unveiled that ordinary dragon blood possesses twelve known uses, research published by a young Dumbledore, even though many of them are deemed somewhat impractical, such as cleaning ovens, stain removal, treating plantar warts, and so forth. Skylar often pondered why dragon blood commanded such a high price in his previous life. The revelation now clarified that these commonplace applications were merely the mundane uses of regular dragon blood, unbeknownst to ordinary wizards and common folk. The genuine worth of dragon blood lies in its potential to be transformed into activated dragon blood. Active dragon blood possesses the unique ability to stimulate bodily functions and unlock hidden potentials, with the specific effects varying based on the dragon species utilized. However, the manufacturing process is exceedingly intricate, and even the most accomplished potion masters seldom encounter the opportunity to refine active dragon blood. This is why not many this people like dealing with the dragon blood, considering how much of a delicate touch is needed to process everything from the first step if you want the result of high-quality products. Taking the vial Skylar received as an example, it contains black dragon blood extracted from a living Hebridean black dragon. Slughorn then supplemented the dragon blood with abdominal skin and flesh from Ukrainian iron belly, fangs from the Peruvian viper tooth, black ridges from Norwegian ridgeback, the pointed tail sting of Hungarian horntail, golden fringed spikes from Chinese fireball dragon, resembling a lion's sideburns, and the golden longhorn of Romanian longhorns, along with Australian Antipodean opalized eyes. These materials are inherently expensive and rare, and the ritual itself imposes numerous prerequisites. For instance, the horns of the horned dragon must measure precisely three feet, the fangs of the Peruvian viper tooth must not have emitted venom for at least three months, and the Antipodean opalized eye must be larger than a watermelon, to name a few. Upon completion, it must be dispatched to the Star Gathering Platform, a facility controlled by the Ministry of Magic. This platform features a magical circle that harnesses the brilliance of moonlight and starlight, ensuring the dragon's blood is exposed to the most potent celestial illumination. This, in turn, induces a mutation in the inherent power within the blood. It comes as no surprise that Skylar received gifts from these three individuals. As his renown continues to escalate, the symbiotic relationship between him and Miss Juliana deepens, leading her to display her favor towards Skylar generously. Similarly, for Slughorn, renowned figures act as a magnet, attracting him with their allure as individuals he is eager to befriend. What took Skylar aback was the fourth gift. This particular offering hails from Alvin Caro, the patriarch of the Caro sisters and the current head of the Caro family. Alvin Caro possesses a dignified demeanor. In comparison to other heads of pure blood families, although not widely recognized, he proves to be a formidable individual. In the original narrative, the Caro family ardently upholds pure blood supremacy, yet Alvin does not follow in the footsteps of Lucius Malfoy. Instead, he refrained from directly involving himself and dispatched his less competent siblings, Amicus and Electo, to join the ranks of the Death Eaters. Amicus and Electo are evidently not formidable adversaries, even the recently matured Harry and the underage Luna can overcome them. Yet, they have been entrusted by the Death Eaters with the task of infiltrating Hogwarts and assuming the guise of professors. The underlying reason behind this assignment likely stems, to a certain extent, from Alvin Caro influence. Putting aside the nature of the gift, the act of bestowing it carries significant implications. The Caro family's apparent endorsement of pure blood supremacy may well be a facade. Considering Schuyler's conspicuous actions at Hogwarts, it is common knowledge that he is likely not a pure blood. Mr. Caro, a purported advocate of blood purity, has two daughters attending Hogwarts, making it implausible for him to be unaware of Schuyler's background. In this light, the motive behind Alvin Caro's gesture becomes clearer. This is a family prioritizing its own interests. Ultimately, Amicus and Electo's alliance with the Death Eaters serves the family's benefit. However, this doesn't prevent Alvin from hedging his bets elsewhere. If befriending Skylar and expanding the family's options can be achieved, he will not hesitate to pursue such avenues. In essence, this is a strategic move. 
Just like how the ancestor of Malfoy's moves, Alvin puts more than just an egg into his basket so he can plan carefully from the many choices available if the future come offering them a harsh life. The value of the gift is weighty, bestowed by the head of the revered sacred 28 pure blood family. Although it appears as a simple list, the names inscribed upon it carry profound significance. Thorfinn Raoul, Corban Yaxley, Trovan Selwyn, Archibald Avery, Antonin Dolohov, Augustus Rockwood. The names of Mr. Knott and Alvin Carroll were also present. Some of these individuals are acknowledged Death Eaters, while others are heads of pure blood families who contributed financially, although none escaped personal involvement. This list is undeniably intriguing. Skylar's eyes gleamed with a discerning light, and the corners of his mouth curled into a sly grin. If he wasn't mistaken, this list substantiated some of his suspicions. It appears Mr. Caro has truly done himself a significant favor. Alchemy Lock Encyclopedia has been obtained. Ancient Divine Dragon Specimen has been obtained. The Elixir of Blessing has been obtained. An active dragon blood has been acquired. An intriguing list has been acquired. December unleashes its wrath upon Hogwarts with relentless high winds and stinging sleet. The young wizards within the castle, accustomed to the perpetual chill of winter, find solace in the warmth of crackling fires and the protective embrace of thick stone walls. Their gratitude deepens as they gaze upon Durmstrang's ghost ship tethered on the icy lake, its colossal form buffeted and swayed by the fierce gusts. Like spectral dancers, the ship's black sails twirl and flutter against the backdrop of the ominous night sky. Bosebaden's enchanted carriage mirrors the struggle against the elements, jostled incessantly by the howling wind. Majestic rune horses, draped in snug blankets, seek refuge within the stable, where the aroma of Hagrid's generous servings of single malt whiskey mingles with the biting cold. The students attending care of magical creatures find themselves grappling not only with the intoxicating scent but also with the demanding care of the formidable blast-ended scruts. Now dwindling in number to a mere ten, these creatures still harbor a violent penchant for mutual destruction. At almost six feet in length, their robust gray carapaces, formidable limbs, explosive fire-breathing tails, and various appendages render the blast-ended scrut a grotesque spectacle of fearsome proportions. The students, faced with the repulsive sight, cast disinterested glances at the substantial box Hagrid unveils, laden with plush pillows and cozy blankets. In an attempt to induce hibernation, Hagrid places the blast-ended scripts into the box and seals it shut. However, his expectations are met with resounding failure, leaving him not just mistaken but significantly so. Evidently, snails neither hibernate nor appreciate the confines of tight spaces. The aftermath of their protest was marked by a series of explosions, scattering smoky box fragments across the ground, liberating the snails to wreak havoc in the pumpkin patch. Draco and Blaze, sporting disdainful expressions, averted their gazes, deeming the spectacle unworthy of attention. Goyle and Crab, embodying the epitome of qualified followers, departed in search of more engaging pursuits. In response to the chaos, Harry, Ron, and Hermione led a contingent of Gryffindor wizards, brandishing their wands to emit sparks in an attempt to corral the unruly blast-ended scruts. Having learned from past misadventures, the remaining Slytherin students instinctively rallied behind Skylar, entrusting him with the responsibility of navigating the unfolding predicament. Mocking disbelief permeated the air. Could Skylar, a wizard who treated dragons as mere pets, possibly grapple with creatures as peculiar as lobsters ablaze at the rear end? Skylar's discerning eyes traversed Pansy, Millicent, Tracy, and Audrey, pausing on not. A certain depth. In his gaze hinted at unspoken thoughts. He inquired, has everyone reached a decision? A unanimous affirmation resonated as Pansy and the three girls exchanged glances, taking the lead in responding, yes. Skylar's lips curled slightly at the corners, now, pay close attention to my instructions. I'll initiate the binding spell to restrain them. When I count to three, simultaneously cast the stun spell. Remember, avoid bombarding those tough shells. Aim for the male spines and mouths, and target the female suckers. Skylar refrained from deploying the barrier spell, concerned it might not breach the blast-tailed snail's formidable shells. With a swift wave of his wand, it transformed into thick vines, progressively entangling the five snails layer by layer. As the snails attempted to resist, emitting sparks from under their tails, Skylar's cold shout cut through the chaos, one, two, three, now. 
The young wizards executed Skylar's strategy flawlessly, pinpointing the vulnerabilities mentioned and incapacitating all five blast-ended scrubs. Simultaneously, the Gryffindor wizards, aided by Hagrid, were just completing their own tasks. Rita Skeeter, draped in a thick magenta robe with a purple suede collar and an ostentatious crocodile leather handbag, observed the unfolding drama from the fence of Hagrid's garden. Hagrid, busy securing a rope buckle on the blaster's spine, turned to Rita Skeeter and inquired, Who are you? My name is Rita Skeeter, a reporter for the Daily Prophet, Rita replied, her mouth adorned with a smile that showcased her gleaming gold teeth. What are these charming animals called? she inquired, her smile widening. Blast ended scruts, Hagrid grunted in response. Really? Rita expressed genuine interest. I've never heard of them before. Where did they come from? Hagrid's face reddened beneath his unruly black beard. Seizing the moment, the astute Hermione stood up and chimed in, They are fascinating, aren't they? Right, Harry, don't you think so? Uh, yeah. Ouch. Very fascinating, Harry stammered, momentarily distracted as he accidentally stepped on his own foot. Hermione shifted her gaze towards Dean Thomas, who sported an ugly gash on half his cheek, Lavender, whose robe bore scorch marks, and Seamus, nursing several burnt fingers. Catching on to something, she smiled and suggested, Excellent. How about an interview? Share your experiences in teaching magical creature protection with the readers of the Daily Prophet. They have a zoology column every Wednesday. We could feature these, um, blast ended scruts. Blast ended scruts, Hagrid eagerly corrected, air, yes, that sounds fine. The two settled on meeting at the Three Broomsticks on Friday for Rita to conduct an interview with Hagrid. What's the matter? Daphne inquired, her gaze fixed on Skylar. Slytherin had successfully handled the blast ended scruts, and the other young wizards had departed, leaving Skylar lingering, observing the interactions between Rita and the sea in the distance. Skylar offered a slight smile, it's nothing. I just have a feeling that the old man with the white beard is about to encounter some troubles. As thoughts of Hagrid's subsequent developments crossed his mind, he found amusement in the situation while also feeling sympathy for Dumbledore. Why did all his allies seem so adept at stirring up trouble? Approaching Skylar, Daphne, even though there was no one around, cautiously cast an ear-blocking spell before whispering in a low voice only audible to the two of them, what happened with Pansy's group. Skylar shrugged, what else could it be? Just a display of goodwill towards me. But, Daphne wore a puzzled expression, isn't she close to your brother? Skylar sneered, for all of them, Pansy, Millicent, Audrey, or Tracy, after I showcased my ability to tame the fire dragon, their personal loyalties took a back seat to their family interests. Today's statements are, I dare say, merely reflections of the intentions of those old folks pulling the strings behind them. Since the commencement of the semester, Skylar found himself engrossed in the affairs of the Serpentis Vigil Club, the intricacies of the Goblet of Fire, and the study of various magical subjects. Regrettably, this left him somewhat distant from his fellow young Slytherin wizards in the same class. It wasn't a matter of choice, his limited time made it impossible to immerse himself in every aspect. His somewhat enigmatic brother, however, did not fail to meet expectations. Leveraging the opportunity, he secured admiration and respect from a cohort of classmates through exemplary performance in class and frequent amicable interactions with others. Predictably, Pansy's proximity endured over time, while Goyle and Crabbe remained unwaveringly loyal followers. Among the other young wizards, Blaze seemingly developed a newfound camaraderie with Draco. Millicent, Audrey, and Tracy's ardor and admiration for Draco became increasingly evident. Initially fans of Skylar, the latter two abruptly shifted their allegiance to Draco. Skylar was acutely aware of the dynamics but chose to feign ignorance. He understood that life resembled a chess game, where the truth was straightforward. A misstep with one piece could jeopardize the entire game. Regardless of Draco's prior schemes or determined endeavors, the decisive moment arrived when Skylar vanquished Draco and earned the coveted title of Hogwarts champion. The fraternal rivalry for fame reached its conclusion, with the winner definitively established. Following Skylar's resounding triumph in the initial event, even Pansy grasped the undeniable momentum favoring Skylar. This realization extended to the other three girls, who, despite any personal affection towards Draco, couldn't ignore the weight of their noble family backgrounds. 
understanding that their actions reflected upon their families, they recognized the necessity to align with the established victor. Draco, or the puppeteer behind him, unless utterly oblivious, and as long as the preservation of the Malfoy family's prestige lingered in their thoughts, they would acknowledge the irrevocable nature of their defeat. The chance for a resurgence remained elusive. Brother, brother, in the true chess game, I made my move as early as the first year. Despite your meteoric rise over a single summer, unless you eliminate me, you'll forever remain a mere chess piece. The real chess player that's been playing behind your back, I believe, will emerge soon, don't you think? Skylar thought to himself while smirking a bit. To be honest, Skylar also has a lot of expectations. His mind is always racing with thoughts on who was the one behind Draco's sudden change. Would it be the Shadow Dragon led by Morgana herself, but if it's the Shadow Dragon, then why would she need the help of Draco when she already has Meredith confined? Is this actually another group besides the one that Skylar has encountered this far? An entirely new group that has yet to let their name be known to the public, or to Skylar at least. Speaking of which, Daphne asked solemnly, do you know what happened to Draco? Well, when it came to Draco, Skylar wore a pensive expression. His demeanor turned serious as he responded, I already have an immature guess in my heart. He then displayed a wise smile and continued, I think I will soon know whether my guess is right. Even though Daphne had almost blind confidence in Skylar, she couldn't help but show a hint of worry, is this really okay with you? Don't worry. Skylar raised his head slightly and cast his gaze into the distance, I won't fight. It's an uncertain battle, and, life is like a chess game, after all. You plan for your moves by the time the first pawn has been moved, Skylar continued. Long before December unfolded its wintry embrace, Skylar had already attained mastery over the intricate skill of human transfiguration. The complexity of transforming one's physical form into that of a human is undeniable. Even among advanced students, only a few managed to grasp this ability before graduation. In the original narrative, Crumb, a seventh-year wizard and an adult, demonstrated the pinnacle of human transformation as the strongest Durmstrang champion chosen by the Goblet of Fire. Despite his prowess, Crumb incurred no penalties for reverting to his original state, underscoring the formidable challenge inherent in human body transformation. In a past life, Skylar frequently discussed this intriguing question with fellow enthusiasts in the official Harry Potter fan club, why, after Voldemort assumed a repulsive, noseless appearance, did he not utilize body transfiguration to revert to his handsome self? Fans of the series offered various speculations. Some believe that his red-eyed snake-like countenance served to intimidate foes effectively in battle. Others posited that the fragmentation of his soul had stripped him of his humanity, distorting his sense of aesthetics. Certain theories suggested he sought to distance himself from his muggle father's inherited face, while others argued that his lack of hair and body hair prevented attempts to impersonate him with Polyjuice Potion. Presently, if one were to pose the same question to Skylar, his response might be that Voldemort never truly mastered the art of human transfiguration. Surveying the entirety of the original series and the Fantastic Beasts films, it becomes evident that, excluding the innate abilities of Metamorphmagi, Grindelwald stands as the sole individual capable of completely transfiguring into another person without relying on potions. Now, however, a new contender has emerged, Skylar. A Metamorphmagi by nature, Skylar possesses prior experience in employing magic at the cellular level. What he remained unaware of was that while his magical potency might not rank as the most potent, its flexibility and adaptability far surpassed that of any other wizard in the magical realm. In a millennium, he became the inaugural individual to craft the unprecedented triad, a single-bodied human wizard whose magical capabilities seamlessly adapt to any alterations without encountering stagnation or rejection due to bodily transformations. This exceptional trait explains his swift mastery of human body transformation. After numerous consultations with Professor McGonagall, Skylar honed the ability to alter his height, facial features, skin color, hair color, and eye color at will. Under Professor McGonagall's guidance, he ventured into more ambitious transformations, transcending the constraints of the human form. Behind his back, ribs morphed into colossal wings, the coccyx transformed into a tail crowned by a fearsome serpent's head, and the shoulders on each side metamorphosed into two additional arms. Professor McGonagall's eyes gleamed with brilliance. Despite her awareness of Skylar's exceptional talent in transfiguration, the rapidity of his progress never failed to astonish her. Skylar's ingenious applications of human transfiguration further left her in awe. 
At this juncture, having attained mastery in the art of transfiguration, Schuyler could be considered a true maestro. Standing on the same level as Professor McGonagall, although not reaching the same level as Chang Hao and Grindelwald themselves. Schuyler, Professor McGonagall's eyes conveyed both admiration and affection. To be honest, I have nothing more to teach you. I fear you will have to forge ahead on your own in the realm of transfiguration. You are the most gifted student I've encountered in this field. Her countenance then tightened, adopting a more serious tone as she whispered, I hope you won't squander this talent. Instead, utilize what you've learned on the righteous path. Do you understand? Schuyler held profound respect for the professor before him, fair, caring for students, and willingly imparting his unique skills selflessly. Responding sincerely from the depths of his heart, he conveyed, Professor, thank you sincerely for your guidance throughout these days. I will forever treasure the kindness you've shown in your personal time to instruct me. Although I belong to Slytherin, Professor, your regard is as honorable to me as that of my own head of house. Please rest assured, I will carry each of your words close to my heart. This moment marked what Professor McGonagall had been anticipating, and a delighted smile graced her face. Back in the dormitory, Schuyler contemplated the trajectory of his transfiguration skills moving forward. He was acutely aware that his mastery of transfiguration was far from reaching its zenith in the magical world. One particular avenue of transformation that eluded him was the animagus. This technique delved into the realm of the soul, requiring extensive and time-consuming preliminary preparations. It posed a formidable challenge to the caster's mental fortitude, and while its effects were intriguing, it had limitations. An animagi could only transform into non-magical creatures devoid of magical powers and spellcasting abilities, making it useful primarily for stealth and disguise. Schuyler's lack of interest in becoming an animagi did not signify a halt in his transfiguration pursuits. In fact, he harbored a sincere desire to ascend to the next echelon in human transfiguration. Having delved into the contents of Abatel Volume 4, Schuyler encountered mentions of a form of transfiguration rooted in ancient centuries. This particular transfiguration technique bore some semblance of a fusion of animagus and metamorphmagus. While being an animagi offered convenience, it came with significant limitations. Once an animagi assumed the form of an animal, the wizard's magical abilities became inaccessible, and upon reverting to human form, the advantages of the animal form ceased to manifest. Human body transfiguration can only change the shape of the human body, such as a shark head, a pair of wings, and a tail, but it cannot obtain the specific abilities of animals. For example, although Victor, who turned into a shark head, could breathe underwater, he couldn't swim swiftly, maneuver adeptly, or sense prey effectively. This ancient century transfiguration technique allows the caster to retain the basic human form while also taking on the advantages of the animagus animal. For example, Professor McGonagall's animagus is a cat. If she can have the agility, night vision, and heightened senses that only cats can have under normal circumstances, then her combat power will definitely be greatly improved. Another example is the animagus of raptors, such as eagles, owls, etc. If the caster can be allowed to change the ribs on the back into bird wings on the basis of this transformation, and at the same time acquire the keen eyesight, powerful talons, and swift flight of the bird, wouldn't it be possible to navigate aerial battles without resorting to broomsticks? It would be even more powerful if you could also get the ability to communicate with or control other creatures of the same species or access the innate magical talents of the chosen animagus. When Schuyler discovered this magic, he was so excited. However, at the end of the book's chapter, the harsh conditions for learning this transfiguration technique are mentioned, the caster must have a very strong magical core. The learner's mental capability is better than that of other wizards. To be specific, he must have exceptional magical prowess. Simply put, the best practitioner is a wizard with an extraordinarily powerful magical aptitude. And Schuyler fully meets the conditions for learning this magic because he's been forging his body with relentless studies and training to elevate him to the next level. In the following time, Schuyler decided to devote himself to the study of this magic, and he named it Etherform. Schuyler's remarkable performance in the initial project once again heightened his popularity. The Champion Schuyler Fans Club witnessed a rapid surge in membership as Schuyler fostered a positive reputation and image within both Hufflepuff and Ravenclaw. For many young wizards, joining the club represented an opportunity for glory. 
In their hearts, Skylar's accomplishments were synonymous with Hogwarts honor, and being his classmate was a badge of distinction. The club burgeoned into the largest and most populous in Hogwarts, outpacing the second largest club, the Gobstone Club, by a factor of three. As club leaders, Cho, Marietta, Luna, and Susan collaboratively crafted a Support the Champion Skylar badge, distributing it widely across Hufflepuff and Ravenclaw. The response exceeded expectations, marking a warm welcome. This development stirred an uneasy feeling in Harry for a while. Subsequently, Hermione and Ron designed a Support the Champion Harry badge, which gained widespread popularity among Gryffinders, restoring Harry's smile. However, responses from the other three colleges were notably scarce. Recognizing the opportune moment, Skylar decided it was time to advance to the next stage of his plan. On a designated day, Skylar arranged to meet Cho and Susan in front of the expansive mirror on the fifth floor. With different eyes observing, he encanted the Revelio spell before the mirror. Ripples emanated across its surface, unveiling a profound path. How cool! Cho's eyes gleamed with excitement. Is this a secret passage? When did you discover it? She gently touched the mirror, effortlessly passing through to the world on the other side. Skylar responded in a half-joking tone, if I told you I knew about its existence on the first day of school, would you believe it? Unexpectedly, Chan Cho nodded without hesitation, her expression serious. As long as you say it, I believe it. This admission left Skylar slightly embarrassed. Breaking the somewhat awkward silence, Susan remarked, Skylar, you are really shameless. You knew about such an interesting place but didn't share it with us. Remember, we are your hardcore fans. But enough of that, let's get going. I'm eager to see what secrets lie inside. Skylar gazed deeply at the two girls, his eyes bright. Not only Susan but also Cho couldn't help but sport a faint blush on her cheeks. The secret of this passage is just a trivial matter, he said with a slight curl of his lips, his voice soft. There are more interesting things. The passage was shrouded in darkness. Skylar gestured with his left hand, causing a slight tremor in the air. The sound transformed into three glowing orbs emitting a bright, gentle milky white halo. The light balls exhibited an autonomous consciousness, hovering around the three individuals, mirroring their every step. Is this a transfiguration spell? Cho inquired. Coming from a family skilled in transfiguration, she was no stranger to advanced transfiguration even as a fifth year student. Skylar affirmed, indeed, it's a transfiguration spell. Speaking of which, I owe thanks to your great uncle. His, A Thousand Changes technique, enabled me to understand how to seamlessly integrate the characteristics of the Lumos spell into transformed objects. Skylar's tone carried a mix of emotion. He sighed lightly, the mysterious and ancient eastern magic truly holds unique merits that captivate the imagination. I really wish Master Hao would be able to teach me about the secret technique he promised me, though, lately, it feels like I've hit a wall in my learning journey of transfiguration. Skylar continued while looking at Cho bitterly. Skylar, Cho blushed, though it wasn't discernible in the dim secret passage. What my uncle said before was just a joke. Don't take him too seriously. Really? Skylar's eyes were half-smiled. I was quite looking forward to the secret transfiguration technique he promised. Well, whatever. As the trio continued for fifteen minutes, peculiar patterns emerged on the stone walls of the secret passage. Resembling ancient runes yet possessing a distinct character, they seemed almost like the graffiti of an intoxicated artist. We've arrived. Skylar exclaimed while coming to a full stop. The two girls gazed at the images and texts with an entranced look as if some mysterious power within them held a deep allure. Skylar stood still, attentively observing their reactions. These magical marks are all Skylar's masterpieces, spell marks crafted after intensive study of spiritual and soul magic. They have the power to evoke temptation, greed, and fear deep within the human heart, and only a resolute will can resist their influence. Cho responded swiftly. Her vision had just cleared, and her eyes revealed profound fear, as if she had witnessed something truly terrifying. Abruptly, she dropped to her knees, covering her face as she wept bitterly. In the midst of Susan recovering from her enchantment, she let out a sudden scream, rolled her eyes, and fainted. Skylar swiftly retrieved his magic wand,
casting finite incantatum on both girls. Gradually, they awakened or regained their senses, yet were unable to recall the events that transpired. Rubbing her sore eyes, Susan questioned, what just happened? Skylar explained, the stone wall is inscribed with magic marks designed to temper the will and soul. If you successfully pass their test, it can strengthen your willpower and soul, immensely benefiting your magical strength, but... But what? Susan inquired eagerly. You both, Skylar said calmly, failed the test just now. Ah! Both girls exclaimed simultaneously, wearing expressions of extreme disappointment. Skylar reassured them in a deep voice, honestly, it's nothing. You're all my friends. You can let me know whenever you're ready, and I can bring you here to try again. Really? Have we really become an acquaintance of yours in that short amount of time? Cho displayed a look of surprise, and Susan, standing beside her, mirrored an expression of anticipation and excitement. Of course, it's true, Skylar smiled. After all, Master Chang Hao and Madame Amelia have provided me with a lot of help and guidance. Let's consider this as a reward for their kindness. However, you have to promise not to reveal the secret of this passage to anyone else. The two girls nodded in agreement. Okay, today's adventure ends here. Skylar declared. I'll take you back first, Daphne and the others are still waiting for me up front. The two girls seemed to have sensed something and exchanged knowing glances. Despite a brief gaze, neither showed any inclination to turn around. Finally, Cho summoned the courage to speak, is there something beyond the secret passage? Can we explore it as well? Although aware that the mentioned Daphne and the others likely referred to Skylar's fellow Slytherins, the feeling of exclusion was unsettling, especially after learning that the secrets within the passage could contribute to their strength. Knowing too much is not necessarily a good thing, Skylar's gaze moved back and forth between the two of them, and he spoke with significance, the secrets beyond the passage involve a larger aspect of my life. So far, those who have been part of it are my closest and most trusted confidants. Once you become privy to this secret, there's no turning back. Have you thought it through? Skylar's bright gray pupils seemed to illuminate the somewhat dim secret passage. Whether due to psychological effects or an actual change, both girls sensed a gust of wind within the darkness, and the air temperature seemed to drop. Even the milky white glow emitted by the three floating light balls lost its soft and warm quality. An unexplained chill enveloped the two girls. Skylar's usual gentleness gradually blurred in the shadows, creating an eerie and unfamiliar atmosphere. Cho hesitated and recoiled slightly, but she couldn't dismiss Skylar's consistent gentlemanly and amiable demeanor, his positive reputation for intercollegiate friendliness, and most importantly, the high praise he received from her great-uncle, Chang Hao. Recalling how Skylar had helped her master the Patronus charm during summer vacation, a faint blush graced her face, and she made a sudden decision in her heart. She gritted her teeth, suppressing the uneasiness within her. Staring into Skylar's eyes, Cho observed a hint of firmness, stating, whether it's the magic mark or your question just now, it's a test, isn't it? A trace of appreciation flickered in Skylar's eyes, though he remained silent. Interpreting Skylar's gaze, Cho affirmed her suspicions. The hesitation vanished, replaced by a determined sparkle in her eyes, and she spoke with conviction, I failed the test earlier. I admit it. It brought me fear Dash, but this time, I won't make the same mistake again Dash, I've decided, I want to participate in your so-called secret, Cho's tone grew resolute, I've thought it through. Even if there's no turning back, I won't regret it. With Cho taking the lead, Susan nodded, expressing her agreement. Don't worry. Skylar's face resumed its usual gentle smile, warming the atmosphere in the secret passage. Even the three light balls seemed brighter. You won't regret today's decision, Skylar led the way, waving for the two to follow. What you're about to encounter is an opportunity that will shape the world's future destiny. Ready yourself for the true test. Skylar greeted them with a cold smile. Hogsmeade Village, within the concealed chamber beneath miraculous alchemy. Before the arrival of Skylar and the two girls, every member of the Serpentis Vigil Club had gathered there, waiting in quiet anticipation. Observing Skylar successfully bringing in two non-Slytherin and quasi-new members, Morag, hailing from Ravenclaw, couldn't contain his excitement. He swiftly approached the two girls, offering warm smiles and hearty hugs as a gesture of welcome. 
Over the past few weeks, Daphne and Astoria had been diligently providing ideological guidance to the young Slytherin wizards, instilling the core principles that Skylar aimed to convey, the concept of a new world marked by equality in blood and houses. The entire process unfolded smoothly. Firstly, both Skylar and the influential families behind Daphne and Astoria were prominent first-tier pure-blood families. Secondly, the members of the Serpentis Vigil Club were all in their second and third years, still in the early stages of forming their beliefs. Being Slytherins, they naturally revered strength, implying that what the authority, Skylar in this case, stated was generally accepted as correct. Dissent is often attributed to a lack of understanding. Thirdly, even when encountering a few wizards sharing a noble background, such as Astoria's classmates, the Caro sisters, they still possess strong family lineages and significant magical prowess. Though they may exhibit more spirited and unruly personalities, these concerns cease to be significant after Skylar's unexpected triumph over the fire dragon. Skylar's displayed strength surpassed the understanding of an average wizard student. Notably, even Karkaroff, the formidable head of the first school, refrained from directly accepting Skylar's challenge. Moreover, Skylar consistently bestows various perks upon club members, including study notes, snack sharing, and personal guidance. Following Daphne's example, the members of the Serpentis Vigil Club have willingly fallen in line. Upon learning that Chang Cho and Susan would be joining this close-knit community, the existing members extended warm gazes and friendly smiles, providing reassurance to the newcomers. Hello, everyone, Skylar exclaimed loudly as he observed Cho and Susan taking their places beside Morag. Today marks another special day for our collective gathering. Since the inception of this organization, I've witnessed with great satisfaction that each one of you has wholeheartedly embraced the principles of love, assistance, and support for fellow members. Serpentis Vigil Club is an underground student organization, Skylar's eyes sparkled as he spoke, but, in my heart, this is a big family that transcends blood and class. We are all one family. Skylar timed his pause perfectly. The excitement in Daphne, Astoria, and Morag was palpable. They clapped in unison, and the atmosphere suddenly turned into a festive cheer. Several young wizards from less influential mixed-race families even had tears in their eyes, cheering loudly for Skylar. Raising his right hand, Skylar hushed the crowd. He continued, If the organization is a seedling, you are the roots buried deep in the ground. It is your participation and contribution that infuses nutrients and energy into the organization. Your support sustains its operation and development, allowing it to thrive underground safely. Each one of you has contributed significantly, and I must say, as a member of the organization, your accomplishments fill me with pride. You should be proud of yourselves. Applause erupted once again, subsiding only when Skylar chose to speak. But, Skylar's deliberate pause held everyone's attention. Every young wizard present knew that what he was about to say was the crux of today's gathering. They waited attentively for Skylar's next words. The organization needs to grow, Skylar declared. We cannot rest on our laurels and adhere to Slytherin's notions of pride and self-admiration. We must open our arms to young wizards from other houses for the organization to flourish. So, Skylar began, today, I successfully invited Chang Cho from Ravenclaw and Susan Bones from Hufflepuff. They will both join our big family. I need you to treat them like original members, welcome them, show them respect, and help them integrate into our big family as soon as possible. They are our precious members, Skylar emphasized, using the analogy from before if we consider the organization as seedlings, they are new branches extending the tentacles of the organization to new places, guiding us to explore new corners that we have not touched before. Therefore, Skylar's tone carried a hint of urgency, I hope everyone can treat them as you treat me and do your best to provide them with cooperation and assistance to the best of your ability. With that, the meeting was adjourned. The young Slytherin wizards departed first, leaving Skylar, Daphne, Astoria, Morag, Cho, and Susan behind. Skylar and Morag proceeded to explain the organization's purpose, charter, regulations, and future plans in detail to the two new members. Only then did Cho and Susan truly comprehend Skylar's dreams and ambitions, his genuine philosophy, and the future he aimed to create. The eyes of Cho and Susan gleamed with admiration and enthusiasm. Susan remarked, Skylar, I never knew you had such a lofty ideal. Although the road ahead may seem challenging, I believe in you. 
you can undoubtedly lead us to realize your vision. The world of Datong. Cho murmured thoughtfully, a world where pure blood wizards and muggle wizards coexist harmoniously, a world that treats intelligent species kindly, eliminates slavery and hatred. She gazed steadily at Skylar and continued, if you accomplish this feat, I'm afraid you will replace Merlin and become a legend for future generations. From that day forward, Cho and Susan discreetly began recruiting new members for the Serpentis Vigil Society from Ravenclaw and Hufflepuff, focusing on second and third year wizards. Time passed swiftly. With the assistance of various members of the Serpentis Vigil Club, Cho and Susan initiated the recruitment of new members for their respective clubs. During this period, an announcement from Professor McGonagall graced the notice board. The Yule Ball, a traditional part of the Triwizard Tournament and a fantastic opportunity for young wizards to socialize and build friendships was set to take place in the auditorium on Christmas Eve from 8 o'clock until midnight. Aspiring participants were advised to prepare their robes promptly and extend invitations to their chosen dance partners. The Yule Ball was exclusive to students in grades 4 and above. Those below grade 4 could participate by securing a senior student's dance partner invitation. The buzz about the Yule Ball echoed across the entire campus like a whirlwind, swiftly becoming the focal point in the minds of nearly every fourth grade and above wizard. Excitement permeated the air as students contemplated the prospect of inviting someone of the opposite sex they admired or harbored a crush on as their dance partner. Amidst the general enthusiasm, Skylar found himself facing an unexpected challenge. Unlike previous years, where only a handful chose to remain at Hogwarts during the Christmas holidays, this year saw a significant shift. Every student above the fourth grade seemed compelled to stay, all utterly engrossed in the impending prom. This sentiment, however, was particularly prominent among the girls. For those with a penchant for romantic fantasies, the grandeur of the prom, a dashing prince, and elegant dancing embodied the fairy tale dream they yearned for. Skylar, unwittingly positioned as the epitome of many girls' dream lovers, suddenly realized the sheer multitude of female students at Hogwarts. Their collective presence, previously overlooked, now manifested in giggles and whispers echoing through the hallways. Every boy's passage drew shrill laughter, and excited discussions about attire for the Christmas night filled the air among the girls. Ever since a daring fifth-year Ravenclaw girl, encouraged by her peers, took the courageous step of asking Skylar to be her dance partner on the way to the Great Hall for dinner, chaos ensued. Deprived of the opportunity for a peaceful meal, Skylar found himself facing a relentless stream of girls vying for his attention. Like ants drawn to honey, they appeared along various paths Skylar traversed daily. Pansy even informed him that his daily schedule had become a sought-after commodity, fetching exorbitant prices in galleons. Skylar adopted a solitary approach to escape the relentless attention, moving both in and out of class alone. He employed the invisible phantom spell and activated the hidden function of the supreme wizard's robe, attempting to maintain a low profile. Despite his efforts, Skylar couldn't entirely elude the fervent female fans, especially those adept at discerning the weaknesses in Skylar's gentlemanly character. These girls skillfully presented their invitations, feigning chance encounters with Skylar. Their innocent eyes and expressions, tinged with a hint of shyness, were carefully orchestrated to match the occasion. Above all, they made sure to showcase their individual charms. For Skylar, skillfully navigating the delicate art of tactfully refusing dance invitations while maintaining an air of helplessness is itself a test of finesse. He endeavors to convey a sense of regret on his face, employing a gentle and gentlemanly tone as he utters, I am honored, Miss XX, but I already have a partner in mind. Recognizing the courage it takes for a girl to risk rejection, Skylar, as a gentleman and an educated individual, cannot outright refuse without empathy. That, he asserts, is something only excessively rigid individuals would do. This predicament has become the focal point for classmates teasing Skylar. Pansy, ever smiling, remarked, Skylar, it appears you're quite the heartthrob. Blaze retorted, assuming an air of arrogance, rejecting them is the right move. In my opinion, you're still too soft-hearted. Thank me later. A straightforward and firm rejection can make other girls relinquish their hopes. Of course, a Slytherin warrior must have a noble Slytherin lady as his dance partner. Not, not affording much respect to Blaze, consistently refused, tactfully exposing Blaze's less than honorable intentions, oh, come on. Do you really want the girls to abandon their fantasy of inviting Skylar only to redirect their attention to other boys? 
These words left Blaze momentarily speechless. Goyal and Crab could only cast pitiful glances aside, lamenting, how envious. These two astute individuals had the shrewdness to seek out prospects among the third-year girls who had faced rejection from Skylar. However, given that none of these girls qualified for the dance, there was no guarantee that any of them would entertain the idea of accepting an invitation from Goyle or Crab after being spurned by Skylar. As a consequence, every girl outright ignored the duo. Draco's demeanor had evolved into a quieter and more composed state. Having promptly established a dance partner relationship with Pansy, he faced no concerns in that department. In a deep voice, Draco expressed, Skylar, I understand that you have no shortage of dance partners, but I hope you carefully select the champion dance partner for the event. The nuisance caused by the girls was, in reality, a trivial matter. What vexed him was the responsibility, as a warrior, to dance with his chosen partner. In doing so, he found himself compelled to choose one of his three girlfriends as the champion dance partner for the occasion. If he were just an ordinary student attending the dance, he could have brought all three of his girlfriends and danced with them in turn, not missing a single one. However, as a champion, he bore the responsibility to dance with a female partner openly, and the significance of this duty was distinct. He found himself in a quandary, Daphne. Morag? Or Astoria? Daphne had consistently stood by his side, diligently working for him, Morag, on the other hand, played an indispensable role in his life, preventing him from stumbling, and if he didn't invite Astoria, she wouldn't even qualify to attend the ball. Although he was aware that, ultimately, no matter whom he chose, the three considerate girls would likely not hold it against him, he didn't want to take their understanding for granted. In truth, the three girls had already discerned Skylar's inner turmoil, so they thoughtfully chose to remain silent. It was as if they had collectively decided to forget about the dance, never bringing up the topic of a dance partner with Skylar. The considerate nature of his girlfriends only intensified Skylar's inner turmoil. He sighed, compelled to confront the most significant decision of his life, who would be his true dance partner? Better yet, who would be his life partner? Harry found himself in a bind, experiencing a dilemma similar to Skylar's. The day after the Yule Ball announcement, a curly-haired Hufflepuff third-year girl with whom Harry had never interacted took the initiative to invite him to the ball. Being an orphan who grew up in the house of an aunt who despised him, Harry had never received any education about the opposite sex as a child. Consequently, he straightforwardly rejected the girl. The girl left, appearing hurt. Throughout the history of magic class, Harry had to endure the sarcasm and ridicule from Dean, Seamus, and Ron. This pattern repeated itself several times. With the Yule Ball drawing nearer, Harry felt an escalating pressure. Although he had someone in mind that he wished to invite, he struggled to gather the courage. He and Ron were akin to brothers. Not having invited a dance partner, Ron didn't feel as much pressure. He wasn't a champion and wasn't obligated to participate in the dance. Simultaneously, numerous changes unfolded within the castle. The teachers and students of Hogwarts continued to express their eagerness to impress guests from Bose Batons and Durmstrang. They seemed resolute in showcasing their best during the Christmas festivities at the castle. The school was adorned with radiant lights and vibrant decorations. Icicles that would never melt adorned the handrails of the marble stairs. The usual twelve Christmas trees in the auditorium were decorated with a variety of ornaments, ranging from sparkling holly berries to lively golden owls that emitted continuous hoots. The armors lining the hallways were enchanted to burst into Christmas carols whenever someone passed by. It was particularly amusing to hear an empty helmet attempting to sing, Oh, come, ye pious men. The armor only knew half of the lyrics, and the caretaker Filch had to pull Peeves out of the armor multiple times, as the mischievous poltergeist enjoyed hiding inside. When the armor couldn't sing, Peeves would improvise his own lyrics, often filled with rude and unseemly words. On that night, Skylar completed his magical research and discreetly headed to the kitchen for some midnight snacks. Truth be told, due to his dance partner's invitation, he hadn't enjoyed a proper meal in quite a while. The house elves, aware of Skylar's status as the heir of Hufflepuff, treated him with great enthusiasm, preparing numerous exquisite delicacies for his enjoyment. Before he could make a move, the kitchen door unexpectedly swung open, revealing an unexpected visitor, Hermione. What a coincidence, Miss Granger, Skylar said, a bit embarrassed. After their falling out, he and Hermione hadn't found themselves alone together again, 
even though their current encounter couldn't exactly be considered private. Did she believe that house elves didn't exist? Hermione's response caught Skylar off guard. She fixed him with a determined gaze and took a few deep breaths before stating, it's not a coincidence. I borrowed a magical item and tracked your whereabouts, so I came here to find you. Skylar was aware that the magic prop she referred to was Harry's Marauder's Map, which utilized a tracking charm known as the Homunculus Charm to display the movements of individuals on the map. In reality, the functionality of this item was somewhat exaggerated in the original work. Due to the vast size of Hogwarts Castle, the small map could only represent each character as a dot smaller than an ant. Monitoring everyone's actions unless focusing on a specific area or individual was practically impossible. Note, the term homunculus is derived from Pottermore's Marauder's Map. This implied that Hermione had been scrutinizing him on the map for an extended period to locate and intercept him here successfully. Skylar maintained a poker face, pondering silently about the significance of Hermione going to such lengths to find him. This semester, he found himself increasingly distanced from the Harry Trio. Except for the Shared Potions class, Defense Against the Dark Arts class, and Hagrid's Magical Creatures class, where their paths crossed, he devoted most of his time to various plans and research, creating a minimal intersection with Hermione. Out of politeness and a sense of courtesy, he inquired, did you seek me out for something specific? With a slightly raised chin, Hermione exuded a blend of stubbornness and pride in her eyes. Her hands hung on either side of her wizard's robe, fingers tightly clenched into fists. The sight left Skylar feeling a bit bewildered. It was almost as if he glimpsed the determined lioness from three years ago in the library, the one with an unyielding spirit declaring her intent to surpass him in academics. Skylar Malfoy, her voice carried a hint of hoarseness, yet her eyes sparkled with an unprecedented radiance. I came here to tell you one thing, I like you. I want to invite you to be my dance partner. Ha! Huh. Ah! Uh. What was happening here? Even Skylar's composure was significantly rattled. Was he being confessed to? As for honey traps, conspiracy plots, and the like. Skylar had never considered such possibilities. Harry wasn't inclined toward such schemes, and Hermione, with her own strength, was highly unlikely to resort to such tactics. Skylar quickly regained his composure. Observing the girl's now much more mature face, he realized that Hermione had indeed undergone significant changes. Unbeknownst to him, her signature front teeth had subtly reduced in prominence, and her hair appeared neatly arranged, lacking the previous disarray. Upon closer inspection, Hermione had blossomed into a much more captivating beauty. The once girl next door charm had transformed into the grace and allure typical of a young woman. Skylar, accustomed to the sight of beautiful women, couldn't help but marvel at the transformation. Though her beauty was undeniable, Skylar felt no inclination to reciprocate. Despite the allure, their fates had taken divergent paths. He couldn't help but think of Meredith and the three girlfriends who had silently sacrificed for him, reiterating the stern warning in his heart to avoid accumulating more emotional deaths. With a composed expression, he cleared his throat gently. Miss Granger, I appreciate your interest, but I must apologize. I am already in a relationship, and it's more than one. Looking into Hermione's eyes, which were starting to dim, he continued, You are indeed a wonderful person. Intelligent, adorable, and perhaps a tad bit arrogant at times, but your kind heart compensates for everything. Your loyalty to protecting friends and your courage to uphold truth and principles are commendable. However, matters of the heart cannot be forced, and no matter what, I cannot deceive you about this. However, we are not suitable for being together. Skylar continued. Hermione smiled, even though two lines of tears fell from her eyes. Skylar, she said with a smile, please allow me to call you this name for the last time. I am very grateful for your honesty with me. You don't have to worry about anything, really, because, before coming here, I had thought about this outcome. Her voice began to choke, but. Deep down, Avada Kedavra. Skylar easily repelled the deadly curse away with a stroke of his wand, enveloping his whole body with a variation of shield charm that Hermione had never seen in her entire life nor learned of, the divine Aegis. Before Skylar could even talk or reciprocate Hermione about what just happened, Hermione raised her hand. She sniffed and used the back of her hand to wipe her tears, looking at Skylar with red and swollen eyes and showing a forced smile. 
If I can see by myself that you survive the deadly curse, that's enough. I hope you can win the Triwizard Tournament, and... And... I hope you will agree to be with someone else. Maybe, one day, you will agree to be with me, maybe after the tournament, we will never have the chance to meet again, but as long as you can remember Dash, Avada Kedavra, Avada Kedavra, Avada Kedavra, Avada Kedavra, Avada Kedavra, Avada Kedavra. Hermione's voice as she cast the deadly curse lingering inside Skylar's heart, echoing with a painful, bittersweet tone, repeating over and over again. Skylar felt a pain in his heart for no reason, but his face remained expressionless. Sure enough, have I ever been moved by you? Skylar sighed and said solemnly, Hermione, I. I am sorry things turned out this way, I never meant to dash, Hermione finally couldn't bear it any longer. Her emotions seemed to have reached their limit, and she burst into heart-wrenching cries out of control. Tears surged out like water with a missing embankment. She quickly covered her face, turned around, and cried with the last breath, running out of the kitchen quickly. Skylar's heart still feels like being stung by a thousand pain as he watches the crying Hermione disappear. Hermione in this world he was in is suffering with too much of a problem that never occurred in the real timeline of Harry Potter's story. Though his heart skipped a beat when Hermione caught him off guard with her confession, right now his heart is beating to the other women's presence. It's a shame it's not Hermione. Serpentis Vigil's plan advanced with remarkable smoothness. Thanks to the dedicated efforts of Chang Cho and Susan, the Serpentis Vigil Society's membership swelled to twelve individuals, evenly split between Hufflepuff and Ravenclaw, including the inclusion of Luna. In Ravenclaw, aside from Luna, Skylar held another student in high regard, second-year Melinda Bobbin. The Bobbin family had operated 13 drugstore chains across the UK for generations, establishing a considerable presence throughout Great Britain. Their influence extended widely in the British business community. In Hufflepuff, Skylar had identified a promising student, second-year Joanna Derwent. The Derwent family boasted a storied history, with Dillies Derwent, a beloved Hogwarts headmaster, leaving an indelible mark and earning high esteem in the realm of healers. Skylar found great satisfaction in this diverse and accomplished group. Despite the majority being second- and third-year students, Skylar harbored the belief that with his guidance and training, they would evolve into his trusted aides within two years, playing pivotal roles in the impending Astronomy Tower confrontation later in the academic year. On the other side of Hogwarts, Harry mustered the courage to extend an invitation to Cho. Initially taken aback, the girl politely declined without providing any specific reasons. I am sorry, but I must refuse on that invitation of yours, Cho replied while smiling awkwardly at Harry. Harry felt as if he were under a curse, bewildered by his own actions. He couldn't fathom why he had uttered something so mysterious, are you rejecting me because you already have a date with someone else? In reality, Cho had no dance partner in mind, nor did she harbor any desire to attend the dance. Her ideal dance partner was clear in her mind, but she understood that the opportunity had slipped away. The whole situation left her feeling disheartened. However, when Harry confronted her, it felt as if he was playing mind games. Frowning delicately, she retorted with anger, Potter, this is my business. You have no right to interfere. With a fierce glare, she turned away, refusing to cast another glance at Harry. Poor Harry watched her depart, utterly clueless about the mistake he had made and why he had managed to upset the goddess of his heart. Returning to the Gryffindor common room in a daze, Harry discovered Ron sitting in a distant corner, wearing a gloomy expression. Unlike the original novel's portrayal of Ron inviting Fleur Delacour, Ron's forlorn demeanor stemmed from Hermione swiftly rejecting his invitation without a second thought. No one, not even his closest friend Harry, could discern the tumultuous emotions surging within Ron at that moment. He felt a seething anger, fueled by a palpable jealousy that lingered beneath the surface. Ron's demeanor often left people with misconceptions, he was deemed unintelligent, inept, straightforward, and envious. In reality, Ron was not lacking in intelligence but rather exhibited traits of laziness, playfulness, and an intense desire for attention. In times when Hermione's relentless nagging would wear on Harry, provoking his frustration, it was Ron who injected humor, dispelling tension with his witty remarks. Ron had an astute understanding of characters, instantly recognizing Lockhart as a charlatan after just one lesson. When Hermione claimed she wouldn't be drawn to a boy solely for his looks, Ron slyly whispered, Lockhart, exposing her inclination to judge based on appearances. 
he was the first to harbor suspicions about the Mirror of Ariste, Tom's diary, and Crookshanks. Ron's adeptness at observing nuances and deciphering people's hearts stemmed from growing up in a family with diverse personalities. Suppose only he could manage to rein in his emotions. In that case, he might have become a master of emotional intelligence, a classic case of social intelligence tilting heavily toward the interpersonal aspect. Note, social intelligence is divided into interpersonal and self, and Ron exhibits a strong inclination towards the former. His extraordinary powers of observation enabled Ron to see through the veiled reasons behind Hermione's rejection, even when others remained oblivious. It was like a bright mirror within him, reflecting the truth that Hermione harbored feelings for Skylar. The question lingered in his mind, why? Skylar, the charismatic young man basking in the glow of his family background and good looks, was encircled by a multitude of admirers, boasting three girlfriends yet seemingly unsatisfied. To Ron, he was nothing more than a scoundrel. Despite Meredith's prolonged absence, Skylar continued his carefree existence, further solidifying his reputation as a scoundrel. Skylar's lineage was tainted by a Death Eater father, Slytherin House's notoriety for cunning and coldness, and a brother who led a group to corner Hermione, an obvious adversary. Contrastingly, Ron saw himself as the one who shielded Hermione from Malfoy, the companion who assisted her in challenging Snape during class, and a fellow Gryffindor. He grappled with the unsettling thought, what did she perceive him as? A follower of the Chosen One? A naive fool ignorant of the world? The unloved younger son? Ron's fists clenched tighter and tighter, his entire body trembling from the intensity of his emotions. A subtle cruelty flashed deep in his eyes, invisible to those who did not delve into the turmoil within him. On the opposite side, as Skylar traversed the foyer, he encountered Fleur. She was surrounded by a gathering of young wizards hailing from three magical schools and four colleges, resembling peacocks in full display, each striving to present their most dazzling selves before the enchanting woman. A brief, imperceptible nod passed between Skylar and Fleur, and he continued on his way. Entering the auditorium, Skylar found his path obstructed by someone, Catalina Moro. She idly played with her red hair, her gaze slightly unfocused. Mr. Malfoy, could I have a word with you? she inquired with a hint of hesitation. Of course, Skylar responded, guiding her to a secluded corner. Observing Catalina's demeanor, Skylar had a premonition about the topic she intended to broach. Catalina was undeniably beautiful, distinct from Fleur's allure and chose innocence. She exuded a pure and serene aura. Her oval-shaped face possessed a hint of coldness in its resolute composure, and the slender sword-like eyebrows projected an air of aloofness that repelled anyone attempting to draw close. Yet, her naturally striking red hair resembled a blazing flame, igniting desires within the depths of hearts. Her large, lively eyes added a captivating quality to her overall presence. I heard you haven't chosen a dance partner yet. Would you consider accompanying me to the dance? Catalina asked with a keen interest, casting an inviting gaze toward Skylar. Despite his mental state, he found himself momentarily tempted. Gently biting the tip of his tongue, Skylar felt a tingling sensation that helped him regain some clarity. He replied softly, I am honored, Miss Moreau. But, I've already decided who to invite, he continued, maintaining clear and honest eye contact, as it was indeed the truth. Oh, no problem. Catalina smiled, Mr. Malfoy, I just thought you might want to reconsider. She took the initiative to draw closer, narrowing the distance between them. The proximity allowed Skylar to distinctly catch the unique fragrance emanating from Catalina, a scent distinct from common women's perfumes. This fragrance was pure and natural, inducing a sense of relaxation and happiness. It hinted at being a high-end product circulated among influential pure-blood families in the French wizarding world. Catalina's lips approached his ear, and she softly whispered, Consider it. The Moreau, the most formidable family in France, merged with the Malfoy family, the strongest in Great Britain. What kind of impact would it create in the European wizarding world, or even the global wizarding community? With a subtle chuckle, she gracefully turned around, leaving behind a trail of fragrance, and departed with elegant steps. Skylar gazed at her retreating figure with an impassive expression, the light in his eyes flickering, concealing his inner thoughts. Unnoticed, Eleanor appeared beside him at some point. Using her slightly magnetic voice, Eleanor teased in a low tone, You've turned down such a beautiful girl. 
You do have your standards, Mr. Malfoy. It's just. Are you sure you won't regret it? Once again wearing a confident smile, Skylar replied coolly, there's nothing to regret. The Moreau family may be the foremost in France, but so what? A family can be a pillar of support, but it can also be chains that constrain us. Wizards born with magic should shape the future they desire. Turning his head, Skylar met Eleanor's gaze with bright eyes. What's your take on this? Eleanor looked at Skylar's face intently, a faint smile playing on her lips. Why does your response not surprise me at all? With that, she turned around and departed. Upon entering the auditorium, Skylar immediately captured the attention of many, becoming the focal point of the room. Lately, Skylar had become increasingly elusive, seldom even dining in the Great Hall. The number of good guy cards he had been issued had reached an uncountable extent, with the news spreading throughout Hogwarts. Unperturbed by the gazes around him, Skylar strode confidently, passing by the Gryffindor table, then the Hufflepuff table, and finally, the Ravenclaw table. Without taking a seat, he made his way to his usual spot. Sensing a shift in the atmosphere, Daphne and Astoria both lowered their heads simultaneously. From an outsider's perspective, their cheeks were already as red as ripe apples. After a brief moment of silence, Skylar bent down, extending his right hand with the palm up. Miss Daphne Greengrass, will you be my dance partner? Daphne suddenly raised her head, her blue eyes widening, and her lips pressing tightly together. Stunned for a moment, she watched Skylar's face shift into confusion. It wasn't until Astoria nudged her gently that she snapped back to reality, comprehending the unfolding moment. Overwhelmed by emotions, tears of happiness welled up in Daphne's eyes. Without uttering a word, she seized Skylar's outstretched hand, rose from her seat, and openly threw herself into his arms, embracing him tightly. After a while, the two broke away from the embrace. Skylar and Daphne, in unison, glanced at Astoria and Morag seated at the Ravenclaw table. Daphne lowered her head slightly, her eyes expressing a sense of apology. She patted Skylar's arm and then addressed Astoria, Astoria, I can't. Astoria swiftly extended her small hand, covering his mouth, and gently shook her head. She smiled and said, you don't need to say anything, I understand everything. With that, she winked at Skylar. Skylar lifted his head, gazing in the direction of Morag. She applauded gently, signaling to Skylar with understanding and encouraging eyes. Through a single glance, the two communicated their intentions. Skylar felt a surge of gratitude, relieved that he had declined invitations from Hermione, Catalina, and other girls without causing any true harm to them. Why did Skylar choose Daphne as his dance partner? Aside from their lengthy relationship and shared experiences, Daphne's character made her the most suitable candidate. Astoria was deemed too kind-hearted, even soft-hearted, while Morag neither liked nor excelled at conspiracy and calculation, qualities deemed necessary for the role of a hostess. Skylar found no better candidate than Daphne. As the last week of the semester approached, the school buzzed with increased liveliness and noise. Rumors about the Yule Ball circulated among the students. Some claimed Dumbledore had purchased 800 barrels of mead from Madame Rosmerda at the Three Broomsticks, while others insisted Dumbledore had booked the Weird Sisters for a performance. Professor Flittick noticed his students' absent-mindedness in class and decided to suspend regular lessons. He allowed students to move freely, engaging in games. Most of his time was spent conversing with Skylar, discussing the impressive protective magic employed by Skylar during the first event of the Triwizard Tournament. Professor Flittick went so far as to write a letter of recommendation for Skylar, enabling him to participate in the European dueling competition, typically restricted to adult wizards. In Professor Flittick's eyes, Skylar's strength rivaled that of adult wizards. Professor Binns remained impervious to distractions, persisting in his lecture on the Goblin Rebellion and the Giant Rebellion. Astonishingly, he managed to render the bloody and thrilling rebellions thoroughly dull. Alchemy class had become a favorite among the students. Professor Borgen promptly delved into alchemical techniques relevant to the upcoming dance, including dance boots to enhance footwork, perfumes to quicken the dance partner's heartbeat, and even a mysterious waist painting girdle. It marked the first time Skylar observed the young witches, Daphne included, exhibit such enthusiasm and affection for a piece of knowledge. While some professors taught with zeal, Professor McGonagall and Professor Moody remained meticulous in their instruction. 
On the other hand, Professor Snape preferred adopting Harry as his godson over allowing his classmates to engage in games during class. He glared darkly at the students, announcing that he would test their antidotes during the last class of the semester. Skylar couldn't help but chuckle at Snape's delayed implementation of his plan to poison the wand on the day of the test, clearly indicating his careful selection of the target. Amidst the students' eager anticipation, the Christmas vacation finally descended upon Hogwarts. The festive atmosphere prevailed despite the teachers piling fourth-year students with a considerable amount of holiday homework. Many students opted to remain at the school for the holidays, ensuring a lively Christmas celebration. They formed small groups, playing and laughing together, with little regard for their pending assignments. A blanket of heavy snow covered both the castle and its grounds. Bosebaden's light blue carriage resembled a large pumpkin frosted in winter, while Hagrid's hut, adorned like a little gingerbread house, stood nearby. The side of Durmstrang's ship glistened with a layer of ice, rendering it smooth and translucent, with frost-dusted sail ropes completing the picturesque scene. Meanwhile, the diligent house elves in the kitchen below bustled about, preparing hot stews and sweet puddings of diverse flavors. On Christmas morning, Skylar was pleasantly surprised to find that his Christmas gifts had doubled compared to the previous year. A somewhat gloomy thought crossed his mind, soon, his dormitory might struggle to contain the ever-growing collection of Christmas presents. Narcissa's gift is a pair of enchanted communication mirrors, which can be used similarly to a muggle smartphone, but with a magical twist. However, it is not as convenient as a wizard's flu network since both parties must utilize this specific pair of mirrors. If Skylar wishes to communicate with another partner, he will need to acquire another pair of mirrors. Skylar recalls from the Fantastic Beasts movie that magical communication mirrors have the potential for expanding their functionality, indicating that there is still room for innovation. Garrett's present is a pair of dragon skin boots engraved with ancient runes symbolizing gravity. When worn, these boots make Skylar feel as light as a swallow, allowing him to move at full speed, akin to a transformed werewolf. Skylar is fascinated by this pair of boots, recognizing their potential significance. With increased agility, he becomes more confident in future battles, especially evading spells and curses, which enhances his survivability. Daphne and Astoria each gifted Skylar a magical book, while Murray presented an elegant magic bookmark imbued with a lighting spell, facilitating nighttime reading for Skylar. Chang Cho sent the Chang family's secret transformation technique, Celestial Metamorphosis, that Skylar had longed for. It also came with a letter of thanks from Chang He himself, expressing gratitude to Skylar for looking after Chang Cho throughout the semester. Celestial Metamorphosis is an exceptionally profound art of transfiguration, involving not only the physical transformation of the body but also the metamorphosis of the mind and soul. In Chang Yi's own words, it is a transfiguration technique that is at least three times more challenging than becoming an animagus. Through this transformation technique, one can transmute their essence, such as aura, into celestial energy, embodying the saying, this essence is not mundane, but celestial. It extends to celestial qualities, linking one's essence with the celestial realm, resulting in enhanced abilities, including heightened senses, resilience, and spiritual connection. Possessing and cultivating celestial energy provides numerous advantages, such as increased magical prowess, refined perception, heightened intuition, and even astral projection. Seeing this, Skylar was exhilarated. Isn't this equivalent to multiplying his combat power by two? Susan Bone's gift is quite impressive as well. It comes in the form of an investigative dossier detailing the dark histories of various pure-blood families throughout the years, including the Selwyn family, the Yaxley family, the Avery family, and, of course, extensive records on the Malfoy family. These documents are the result of diligent or investigations, although inexplicable reasons, usually at the hands of superiors, often the Minister of Magic, have prevented their public disclosure. Clearly, those in official positions are not as straightforward as they seem. Mrs. Bones, acting through Susan, must have intended a significant message with this gift, making it a thought-provoking gesture. Amidst the more straightforward presence, Luna presented a whimsical gift, an acne vine seedling adorned with a vibrant bow for added flair. A surprising yet meaningful gift came from Hermione. She gifted an exquisite quill, seemingly ordinary to the casual observer. However, only someone as meticulous as Skylar would notice the delicately engraved H and S on the quill's feathers. Skylar couldn't help but smile to himself, unwilling to dismiss it carelessly. 
After careful consideration, he stored it in a secure folder, deeming it a precious item. Two-way mirror has been obtained. Boots of gravity has been obtained, the secret art of Chang's family, celestial metamorphosis has been obtained. Oros Investigations files have been obtained. At around 7.30 in the evening, Skylar donned his evening dress and stepped out of the bedroom. While Dobby had purchased his dress from Diagon Alley, Skylar had, in fact, arranged for the owner of Twilfit and Tatting Store, to procure it in advance. The owner assisted him in importing materials like silk satin and black velvet from France to craft a custom outfit. The overall fabric resembled Draco's suit, featuring all black velvet. However, the collar boasted a satin gun lapel, providing a radiant black sheen, ensuring it would not be mistaken for clerical attire. Note, the wizard's attire is a dress robe, distinct from the muggle suit. The original description depicts Draco in a high-collar black velvet dress, while Harry wears a similar outfit resembling a school robe, albeit in dark green. It is evident that, apart from the different fabrics used in comparison to typical wizard robes, the general design and tailoring are similar. The only variation lies in the embellishments on the collar and cuffs. Skylar's presence, while not the stuff of breathless admiration or causing intense jealousy among men, undeniably commanded everyone's attention. It must be acknowledged that the allure of clothing relies on the wearer. Skylar, with his striking handsomeness and tall stature, coupled with the warrior aura surrounding him, exuded a masculine charm that elevated the simple ceremonial robe style. Soon, Daphne made her entrance into the common room. Daphne's blonde hair was elegantly gathered at the back of her head. She adorned an off-the-shoulder, high-cut evening gown crafted entirely from satin, accentuating her skin like freshly fallen snow. In the subdued lighting, she appeared radiant and exquisitely delicate. While this wasn't the first time Skylar had seen Daphne in formal attire, he couldn't help but feel a flutter in his heart. Their relationship had rapidly intensified throughout the semester, making him experience a rejuvenated sense of youthful love. This pure and innocent emotion made him appreciate the joy of newfound luck. Approaching her, Skylar gently took Daphne's soft, white hand, kissed it, and whispered, you are the most beautiful woman tonight. In the refined ambience of the Slytherin common room, Draco, adorned in a dignified black velvet high-necked gown, presented himself with utmost poise. By his side, Pansy, draped in a frilly light pink robe, clung to his arm with a subtle elegance. Not, often reserved and uninterested in the dance, chose not to make an appearance this evening. Crab and Goyle, both attired in verdant green, resembled stoic moss-covered statues, devoid of dance partners in their vicinity. In a sophisticated dark green dress, Blaze engaged in a dance with a fifth-year Slytherin girl. Despite her attractive appearance, she prattled animatedly in Blaze's ears, oblivious to the faint crease forming on his brow. Exiting through the stone wall, they ascended the stairs, arriving in the foyer just before eight o'clock. The area buzzed with students, navigating the space in anticipation of the auditorium doors opening. Some sought their dance partners from other houses, weaving through the crowd with sideways glances. A wave of excitement swept through the gathering as Fleur Delacour made her entrance. Cloaked in a silver-gray satin robe, the enchanting allure of her Vila bloodline transformed her into a mesmerizing presence. Accompanying her was Roger Davies, the Ravenclaw Quidditch team captain. At the castle's grand entrance, the oak door creaked open, capturing the attention of everyone present. A procession of Durmstrang students, led by Professor Karkaroff, entered the hall. Among them, Eleanor took the lead with Cedric as her dance partner, displaying a somewhat unrestrained eating manner. Notably, Crum was also in attendance, accompanied by a Bosbaton student as his dance partner, rather than Hermione. Observing the entrance, Skylar recalled glimpsing Harry and Ron earlier but noticed the absence of Hermione, suggesting she had no intentions of attending the ball. Seizing the chance as the door remained open, Skylar stole a glance at the scene outside the castle. The lawn in front of the castle had been transformed into a magical cavern, adorned with twinkling fairy lights. Countless live fairies adorned the scene, perching on magical rose bushes or fluttering their wings atop statues resembling Santa Claus and his reindeer. Amidst the enchanting spectacle, Professor McGonagall's voice resonated, Please come forward, brave champions. A hush fell over the chattering crowd as a passage formed to allow the champions and their partners to approach. Professor McGonagall, donning a red tartan robe adorned with an unappealing wreath of thistles, directed the champions to wait by the door while the rest of the students proceeded into the auditorium. 
At this moment, Skylar encountered Catalina, the Bozbaton's champion. Tonight, Catalina looked exceptionally stunning, donned in a pure white off-the-shoulder dress that showcased her beautiful collarbones. The dress, made of a white material that seemed almost transparent, accentuated her ethereal beauty, resembling an angel immersed in celestial space. The skirt's hem gracefully curved from high to low, featuring a slight puff that revealed the girl's slender legs, akin to white jade. Adorned with diamonds at the corners, the skirt sparkled like countless beautiful morning dews. Curiously, her choice of dance partner was Hector Folly, a tall and thin 7th grade Slytherin prefect. Like the Crouch family, the Folly family belonged to the prestigious 28 Holy Pure Blood families. They were known for their political fervor, with minimal involvement in business and wealth. Intriguingly, Hector shared the same name as his grandfather, who once became the Minister of Magic by securing a high vote. However, he resigned due to mishandling during the global wizarding war caused by Gellert Grindelwald. What truly intrigues Skylar is the question of whether Hector Folly genuinely mishandled the global wizarding war or if there was a deliberate intention behind it. Drawing upon his extensive knowledge of magical history, Skylar is well aware of the staggering number of Aurors who lost their lives in Europe and America during that tumultuous period. Astonishingly, the casualties among Aurors were disproportionately high, almost reaching a crippling number considering the wizarding population. What adds a layer of intrigue is the conspicuous absence of casualties from the 28 pureblood families among the Aurors who perished. A fact that raises intriguing questions. Since the previous semester, Skylar has harbored thoughts of seeking revenge against the Ghost Society. In his mind, several suspects for the enigmatic leader of the Ghost Society have emerged, with Hector Folly ranking as the primary suspect among the candidates. Narrowing his eyes slightly, Skylar shifts his gaze away from the duo. On another note, Harry's dance partner for the evening is Parvati, an Indian girl from the same house. While Parvati possesses favorable qualities, a sweet appearance and a decent family background, her dancing companion, Harry, appears rather disinterested. Judging from Harry's expression, it is evident that he extended the invitation out of necessity rather than genuine interest in his dance partner. Note, Dean Thomas acknowledged Parvati as the most beautiful girl in the grade, and in the first grade, Pansy addressed her by her first name, signaling prior exposure to pure bloods before Hogwarts. Small circle, Following Professor McGonagall's instructions, the students swiftly took their seats in the auditorium. Once settled, Professor McGonagall directed the champions and their dance partners to form pairs, leading them towards a large round table at the front where the judges were stationed. As they entered, applause resounded throughout the auditorium. The auditorium's walls sparkled with silver frost, and the ceiling portrayed a starry night sky adorned with numerous garlands of mistletoe sprigs and ivy. The customary four house tables were replaced by a hundred smaller tables illuminated by lanterns, each accommodating around ten attendees. Approaching the guest of honor at the front, Dumbledore wore a benevolent smile, while Karkaroff maintained an inscrutable expression. Clad in a resplendent purple robe, Ludo Bagman cheered enthusiastically, and Madame Maxime graced the occasion in a flowing lilac gown. Notably absent was Mr. Crouch. Seated in the fifth spot at the table was Percy Weasley. The champions and their partners made their way to the table, where Percy, with a self-satisfied expression, pulled out an empty chair and signaled for Harry to join him. Harry, comprehending the unspoken invitation, seated himself beside Percy. Percy, donned in a new navy blue dress robe, promptly shared his recent promotion as Mr. Crouch's personal assistant, narrating his professional achievements with an air of grandeur that suggested supreme rulership of the universe. As the champions and their partners settled at the table, each found a gleaming plate accompanied by a small menu. Merely stating their desired dish caused the food to materialize magically on the plate. The dinner was opulent, delighting most attendees, and the atmosphere brimmed with liveliness. Once the feast concluded, Dumbledore stood, prompting his classmates to rise as well. With a wave of his wand, the tables ascended to the walls, leaving an open space in the center. He conjured a raised stage on the right wall, adorned with a drum set, guitars, a lute, a cello, and various organs. At that moment, the weird sisters stormed onto the stage, eliciting thunderous applause from the audience. Dressed in deliberately torn and tattered black robes, each member, boasting thick hair, grabbed their instruments. As the lanterns on their tables were extinguished, the champions and their partners rose from their seats. The weird sisters began playing a slow, melancholic tune. 
Skylar took Daphne's hand, leading her onto the dance floor. Placing one hand on her waist, they swayed gracefully to the music. While Skylar's dancing skills might not be the epitome of excellence, having never invested much time in such extravagant activities in both his past and present lives, being a direct descendant of the Malfoy family mandated possessing basic dance proficiency. Yet, Skylar possessed a unique advantage. His body had undergone magical transformations repeatedly, rendering him superior in terms of agility and flexibility compared to dance maestros in the muggle world. Daphne, a lady of the family, had cultivated her social dancing skills to perfection. Together, their dance steps unfolded smoothly, presenting a spectacle of nobility and elegance reminiscent of a prince and princess gracefully dancing in a beautiful portrait. On the flip side, the dance between Harry and Parvati turned out to be quite chaotic. Harry resembled a circus dog, allowing Parvati to lead him in all directions, pulled abruptly from east to west. Swept off your feet, Potter. Even Draco couldn't resist making a few mocking remarks, audible enough for Skylar to catch. The dance performances of Eleanor and Cedric were satisfactory, without much to criticize. As for Catalina, a girl nurtured in romantic France, her proficiency in dance was evident. With her graceful figure, each movement exuded soul-stirring beauty. It could be argued that if it weren't for Skylar's pair, with their advantage in looks, managing to divert half of the attention, Catalina could have easily commanded the entire dance floor, rendering other champions practically transparent. Well, at least that's the current plight Harry and Eleanor are facing. At this moment, even Dumbledore and McGonagall, who were notably biased towards Harry, couldn't help but harbor a thought in their minds, fortunately, we still have Skylar. Soon after, many others joined the dance floor. Draco and Pansy spun leisurely nearby, and Pansy couldn't help but smile radiantly. Next to them, Dumbledore was gracefully waltzing with Madame Maxime, his pointed hat just grazing her chin. On the other hand, Crazy Eye Moody was navigating an awkward two-step with Professor Sinistra, who nervously avoided his wooden prosthetic leg. The organ played its final, quivering note, prompting the weird sisters to pause, and the auditorium erupted into warm applause once more. The weird sisters began to play a lively tune without missing a beat. Skylar led Daphne away from the dance floor for a brief respite. Though he felt fine from the physical exertion of dancing, he didn't want Daphne to become overly fatigued. After a short while, Morag and Astoria joined them. Opting out of the dance, they immediately engaged in lively conversation with Skylar and Daphne. The four of them chatted animatedly, and when the weird sisters struck up another beautiful song, Daphne nudged Skylar. He quickly caught on, extending his hand to invite Morag to join them for the dance. Morag's dance steps were a bit rigid, but with Skylar's attentive guidance, it proved to be a minor concern. After the dance, Skylar courteously escorted Morag off the dance floor, and then gracefully took Astoria's hand for the next dance. Thanks to Skylar's exceptional physical prowess, being the strongest among wizards, he effortlessly sustained continuous dancing. In his prime, having consumed potions that permanently enhanced physical strength and transformed by Hufflepuff's source of life, his body allowed him to dance tirelessly. Skylar's stamina stood out while other wizards were already breathless after just two dances. It seems that the ability to have three girlfriends or none at all boils down to the philosophy of, rewards goes to the one who risks it all. As the weird sisters played, the halfway point of the dance had already witnessed three song changes. Amidst the dance fervor, Roger Davies caught up in the moment, summoned the courage to try and kiss Fleur. However, Fleur, lifting her eyebrows, promptly rebuffed him, leaving him awkwardly standing on the dance floor. Fleur, scanning the room, spotted Skylar and his companions. She graced them with a captivating smile and approached, saying, Mr. Malfoy, may I have the pleasure of inviting you to dance? Of course, Skylar replied with a confident smile, It's my pleasure, Miss Delacour. Fleur lived up to her title as the flower of the court, showcasing dancing skills that could rival even Catalina. When paired with Skylar, their dance became a spectacle that overshadowed even the most stunning girls in the room. Despite her brilliance, Catalina couldn't reclaim the spotlight from the enchanting duo. As they moved gracefully from a distance, Skylar saw Fleur as a fairy, her beauty almost unreal. In their proximity, the allure of a complete Vila bloodline became evident. Fleur's near-perfect features, gem-like eyes, and a touch of spring in the corners arousing irresistible thoughts in Skylar. 
A sudden accent note from the weird sisters marked a change. Fleur gently embraced Skylar, pressing her chest against him, and their faces drew close. Everything happened swiftly. Before Skylar could register the surge of blood and rapid heartbeat, Fleur's red lips met his ear, whispering seductively, Be careful of Catalina, the Moros are currently planning something behind the scenes. This alluring gesture brought an abrupt calmness over Skylar, like a sudden splash of cold water. Though Skylar already knew something was amiss with Catalina's sudden proposal, if Fleur herself goes out on her way to warn him about it, then there must be something indeed at play. Before another word could be uttered, the crescendo reached its peak, and the weird sisters concluded their spectacular performance. Slowing down, Skylar and Fleur gracefully separated, resembling elegant butterflies. Skylar exchanged a knowing glance with Fleur, and as the music came to a close, he expressed his admiration. Miss Delacour, not only are you beautiful and enchanting, but your dance skills are truly superb. It's an honor to have danced with you tonight, Skylar complimented, taking Fleur's hand and tenderly kissing its back. Fleur responded with a bright smile, Mr. Malfoy, your dancing skills are commendable as well. I thoroughly enjoyed tonight's dance. As Fleur departed, an unexpected guest approached Skylar. Mr. Malfoy, you're an exceptional dancer. I truly envy your dance partner. Could Mr. Malfoy spare a dance with me if that's fine with you? Catalina said softly while locking her gaze with Skylar. Being in Great Britain and at Hogwarts, Skylar represented the warriors of Hogwarts and stood as a prominent figure among the young nobility. As the host, refusing outright would be considered impolite. Skylar gallantly kissed the back of Catalina's hand and extended his arm, guiding her onto the dance floor. Catalina, a breathtaking beauty and the legitimate daughter of a wealthy and esteemed family, appeared to be a delightful dance partner. Skylar remained vigilant despite her seemingly favorable attributes, not letting his guard down following Fleur's cryptic warning. Initially, the dance unfolded smoothly, but as the music reached its midpoint and quickened in tempo, Catalina revealed her dancing skills, leaving even the most accomplished dancers in embarrassment. Her every step was a blend of grace and power, requiring Skylar to rely on his extraordinary agility and reflexes just to keep pace with her. Intriguingly, despite the energetic dance, not a drop of sweat adorned Catalina's hands. Skylar found himself questioning the conventional wisdom that wizards lacked physical strength. Entrusting all other thoughts to the recesses of his mind, he concentrated solely on the intricate dance steps. This was a competition that transcended magical abilities. Skylar, representing the honor and prestige of the Malfoy family in Hogwarts, was also a recognized figure in business, academia, and various international circles. Even if not known for their dancing prowess, such figures were expected to conduct themselves with grace and dignity. As the tempo of the music escalated, Skylar and Catalina's dance gained momentum, their steps growing progressively lighter. The dance floor cleared, making way for the mesmerizing performance that was unfolding. Observing the spectacle, both professors and young wizards were left in awe. Eventually, as the onlookers retreated from the dance floor, the ball evolved into an exclusive showcase for Skylar and Catalina. Leveraging his photographic memory and exceptional reflexes, Skylar gradually discerned the nuances of the dance. Though challenging, he managed to keep pace with Catalina's graceful movements. Suddenly, Catalina donned an innocent smile reminiscent of a young girl. Mr. Malfoy, not only are you a formidable wizard, but you're also a dance virtuoso, she remarked. The smile was enchanting, catching Skylar off guard, and had it been any other suitor, he might have been captivated. Struggling to maintain composure, Skylar responded with a polite smile, such praise is truly an honor. My proficiency owes much to Miss Moreau's exceptional lead. I merely followed your graceful performance. With that, they concluded their dance. After the initial dance concluded, applause echoed through the room. Dumbledore's eyes glittered as he ceased his conversation with others, focusing intently on the interaction between Skylar and Catalina. While many perceived it as a splendid dance, Dumbledore seemed to discern something more profound in their performance. The majority of female onlookers directed their gaze toward Skylar, their eyes expressing a mixture of admiration and caution. Astoria and Morag, too, were captivated by Skylar's dancing prowess, concurrently harboring envy for Catalina. Daphne furrowed her brows slightly, a subtle worry lingering on her face. She couldn't pinpoint the reason, but an unsettling feeling nagged at her. 
Eleanor had already concluded her dance with Cedric, yet her focus remained fixed on Skylar and Catalina's dance. Her eyes emitted an icy chill, betraying no semblance of appreciation for the performance, instead, she seemed to be observing a scene as an outsider. Draco, holding Pansy's hand, ceased dancing as well. Standing together, they both turned their attention to the pair on the dance floor, Draco appearing contemplative. As for Harry and Ron, Harry grew weary of the ball and disappeared without a trace. Meanwhile, Ron sat in a secluded corner, his countenance gloomy, casting envious and resentful glances toward Skylar. With the onset of the second musical piece, Catalina ensnared Skylar with a firm hold around his waist, leaving him no room for escape. As she pressed her chest against him, a captivating fragrance emanated from her body. Skylar recognized the scent as the same perfume from their previous encounter, yet this time, a subtle nuance made it even more potent. When Skylar inhaled the fragrance, he found himself succumbing to various enchanting thoughts, rendering acclimacy ineffective. Impressively, this was a well-prepared move, executed with meticulous planning. Left with no other recourse, Skylar relied on breathing techniques learned in his previous muggle life. He endeavored to adjust his breathing, slowing it down to regain control over the desires and sensations flooding his mind. This can't persist, it's not Skylar's style to passively endure without retaliation. Skylar rallied and sneered, what an extravagant display for a black flutter, blooming only once in a thousand years. This time, it was Catalina's turn to appear taken aback. The full name of the fluttering flower is the Flutterby Bush. Most young wizards are acquainted with this magical plant as it's part of the fourth grade herbology curriculum. In Chapter 61 of Volume 4, the book mentions that this plant blooms once every hundred years, and its flowers are blue. However, the black fluttering flower is distinct. It is a variant of the fluttering flower, blooming only once in a thousand years. It is even rarer and more precious, found exclusively in certain hidden mountains on the border of France. A shrewd glint gleamed in Schuyler's eyes. He was aware that the twelve French holy blood families essentially controlled the production and distribution of this product. He even suspected it to be a unique specialty of the Moreau family. The black Flutterby bush had always been a cherished treasure among French pure blood nobles, with ordinary French wizards seldom even hearing of it. Yet, Schuyler could identify it with just a few whiffs, leaving Catalina visibly surprised. A vulnerable expression graced Catalina's beautiful face as she uttered, Mr. Malfoy is truly deserving of admiration. Catalina holds great respect for him. She raised her head slightly, casting a gaze upon Schuyler with what seemed like affectionate eyes. As Schuyler pondered what kind of trouble this woman was brewing, her countenance suddenly shifted. Her pupils initially flickered like lightning, followed by the emergence of a crystal mist in her eyes, akin to the dew and rain of early spring. Her gaze became so luminous that it was impossible to avert one's eyes. As the spring rain receded, it resembled the sun ascending over the earth, with a bright and alluring look subtly flickering in the depths of her eyes. Schuyler's mind gradually blanked out, and Catalina's fairy-like visage became deeply etched in his thoughts. Daphne's, Astoria's, Morag's, and Meredith's faces slowly faded away. Schuyler was suddenly overtaken by the notion that he could no longer resist her. He simply wished to kneel before her now and become her most loyal devotee. First, she drained his physical strength and energy, then she utilized the rare and precious black fluttering flower, and finally, she resorted to this cunning tactic. Although Schuyler had initially suspected the woman's ill intentions and remained cautious, he had underestimated the intricacy of her plan. Her scheme unfolded with sophistication, each link seamlessly connecting to the next. Simply put, in this game of deceit, Schuyler faltered. If nothing unforeseen occurred, he was on the verge of falling deeply in love with her, potentially becoming her submissive puppet under her control. Unlike Harry, Schuyler lacked the protection of the protagonist's halo. If he succumbed, not even the author could salvage his fate, he would be left to fend for himself. A surge of magical power erupted within him, uncontrollably flooding his mind, causing him to tremble and abruptly snap out of the enchantment. In an instant, he comprehended the perilous situation. Regardless of Catalina's plotting, she couldn't have anticipated that Schuyler possessed an active magical power that had been dormant for a thousand years, the achieving of the Trinity. For the first time, Schuyler revealed to outsiders his magic eyes, long concealed in the depths of secrecy. 
an overwhelming influx of magical power surged into his eyes like a torrent. His eyeballs heated up, pupils emanating a sacred milky white light. In a silent confrontation, he locked eyes with Catalina, refusing to yield. Pansy's subdued exclamation echoed from the sidelines. It turned out that Draco had unintentionally gripped her hand too tightly, causing discomfort. In response, Draco maintained his earlier expression, his mouth slightly upturned, and a profound gleam flickered in his eyes. Dumbledore wore a genuine expression on his face. Skylar's extraordinary talent had finally found a rational explanation in his eyes. On the other hand, Catalina initially displayed a moment of surprise, followed by a subtle expression of confident victory. Skylar and Catalina continued dancing on the floor, seemingly ordinary at first glance. However, their pace had slowed slightly, both intensifying their mental efforts to engage in an imperceptible dance, unbeknownst to the other attendees. Catalina's pupils emitted a continuous mist, forming and dissolving, dissolving and forming, resembling a captivating kaleidoscope. Meanwhile, the milky white radiance emanating from Skylar's eyes gradually intensified, becoming increasingly striking. Catalina's lineage strength stems from the Grindelwald family's ability of having a highly unnatural charisma and a way with their words to rally and inspire people under his banner, while the Moreau family's bloodline talent, Duelist Heart, bestows her eye power with the ability to pierce defenses. On the other hand, Skylar's magic eyes excel in mental prowess, lacking the means to utilize his pupil power for mental attacks. He must rely on his superior mental capabilities to forcibly bridge the gap in pupil skills between them and defend resolutely. The standoff persisted. Both contestants were momentarily shaken as the Weird Sister's song concluded with an organ accent. Seizing the opportunity, Catalina feigned a stumble, and Skylar promptly assisted her, effectively concealing the covert struggle that had just taken place. Catalina leaned close to Skylar's ear, her tone light-hearted, Mr. Malfoy, you truly are remarkable. Let's engage in another round next time we get the chance. Following this, she exhaled a fragrant breeze and executed a graceful turn before departing. It was only then that Skylar realized his back was already drenched, and his eyes experienced a faint tingling sensation. Post this incident, Skylar's interest in remaining at the ball waned, prompting his return to the Slytherin lounge in the company of his girlfriends. Meanwhile, Harry and Ron exited the Great Hall, where a rose bush triggered a conversation between Karkaroff and Snape, as well as a dialogue between Hagrid and Maxim, details omitted for brevity. As the clock struck midnight, the Weird Sisters concluded their performance. The crowd erupted into warm applause for the final time, marking the official end of the dance. On the second day of Christmas, a noticeable lethargy hung over the Slytherin common room. The hushed tones of conversation were punctuated by occasional yawns as everyone rose from their slumber rather late. With nine more days of vacation remaining before the school's resumption on January 4, a subdued atmosphere pervaded the space. In the days preceding Christmas, the focus was primarily on revelry and leisure. However, the realization that only a scant ten days remained prompted a shift in priorities. Little wizards were now scattered across the common room, engrossed in their written work. Skylar, despite his status as a champion, did complete his homework. Many professors extended preferential treatment, a sentiment underscored by Professor Benz, who uncharacteristically congratulated Skylar on his victory in the recent class project. This distinction surprised his peers, as Skylar became perhaps the first student in recent decades whose name lingered in Professor Benz's memory. Although homework was not the foremost concern, Skylar and Draco found themselves compelled to leave Hogwarts due to a somber family development, the passing of Grandma Druella Black. Following Lucius's arrangements, Skylar and Draco employed flu powder to reach Druella's small house that day. Skylar, despite his typically reserved demeanor, is not devoid of sentiment. Though his interactions with his grandmother were infrequent, the genuine love she harbored for him manifested through thoughtful gifts on every Christmas and birthday. During Skylar's brief sojourns at her home, the elderly lady diligently prepared delicious meals, ever concerned about his eyesight due to extensive reading, ensuring he had access to pricey eye-replenishing serums. The passing of Druella marked a somber occasion. House elves had summoned Lucius and his wife before her demise. While the circumstances prevented Skylar from bidding his beloved grandmother a final farewell, there was solace in the fact that she did not embark on her journey to the afterlife alone. Having lived through two generations, Skylar experienced a complex array of emotions at her passing, 
not devastatingly heartbroken, yet touched by a poignant melancholy. Remaining at her home for two days, he and Draco aided Lucius and his wife in hosting relatives and friends who came to offer their condolences. Despite the decline in the prominence of the black family, such references pertain to the patrilineal bloodline. As the foremost pure-blood family in the wizarding world, the generation of grandfather Cygnus Black boasted numerous cousins, with their bloodline persisting. For instance, figures like Mr. Crouch and his two sisters traced their lineage to Charius Black of the esteemed Black family. In simpler terms, Mr. Crouch and Skylar's maternal grandfather share a familial connection as cousins. Both being influential figures in the political sphere, their interactions are approached with a degree of caution. Similarly, Mr. Arthur Weasley, another cousin in the family, bears the same blood ties to Cygnus Black. However, due to the Weasley family being labeled as pure blood traitors, they won't be receiving an invitation to the funeral. A notable exception among the attendees was someone who, despite being excluded from the family and uninvited, made her presence felt, Skylar's second aunt, Andromeda Black. The paradox lies in the fact that she is Druella's biological daughter, yet her arrival was far from embraced. Narcissa, in particular, maintained a stony silence, offering not a single word of acknowledgement. Though she stared at Andromeda with a veil of indifference, her trembling hands betrayed an inner turmoil. Despite the strained relationship between the sisters, Narcissa struggled to summon the resolve to expel her second sister from the somber proceedings. Druella Black was blessed with three daughters, Bellatrix, Andromeda, and Narcissa, who once shared a close and sincere sisterly bond. This solidarity was notably evident in Aunt Bella's fierce allegiance to Voldemort in the original narrative. She went as far as concealing her magical contract with Snape from Voldemort, all for the sake of protecting Narcissa. Regrettably, this tight-knit sisterhood began to unravel when Andromeda chose to marry a muggle wizard. As a consequence, Andromeda was disowned, and the ties between the three sisters were irrevocably severed. In light of the reluctance displayed by his father, mother, and Draco to engage with this estranged aunt, Skylar found himself compelled to take the initiative. With his name carrying enough weight and stature, even though he belonged to a younger generation, none present dared to censure him casually. Skylar's appearance served a justifiable purpose, expressing condolences with genuine goodwill. To mete out cold treatment under such circumstances contradicted noble principles. Simultaneously, Schuyler's actions did not go unnoticed by keen political observers, who interpreted them as a statement on his stance regarding the pure-blood ideology. Schuyler was well aware that his actions had incurred the disapproval of the Ghost Society and the Knights of Valpurgis, and he wasn't concerned about potentially attracting more enemies among pure-blood extremists. On the contrary, he saw an opportunity to clarify his stance publicly and, by doing so, communicate to the moderate members of the pure-blood families. He aimed to reveal that within the wizarding world, there existed a third perspective beyond the extremes of pure-blood supremacy and pure-blood traitors. Andromeda, touched by Skylar's heartfelt words of comfort, found herself moved to tears. Yet, all she managed to utter in response was a repetitive, good boy, good boy. To be honest, when she summoned the courage to attend the gathering, Andromeda was mentally prepared for rejection, ridicule, disdain, or even insults. However, she hadn't anticipated being received by a younger family member who offered condolences and sympathy. This unexpected display of warmth left her too emotional to articulate a complete sentence. In addition to the various branches of the Black family, there were also representatives from the Rosier family, the family from which Druella originated. Evan Rosier, the last known member of the Rosier family, had met his demise at the hands of Moody, who was an auror at the time, for his involvement with the Death Eaters. Despite the Rosier family being originally from France, the French branch was considered the core of the Rosier lineage. In France, Rosier was one of the twelve Holy Blood families with a long and esteemed history, holding a position in the upper middle echelon, at least before some members became entangled in the global wizarding war. However, this implication alone was sufficient to rival the status of the Moreau family. The official burial of Druella took place in the afternoon on the second day of the funeral proceedings. Immediately following the funeral ceremony, a well-dressed middle-aged wizard, a specialist in will processing from the legal execution department of the Ministry of Magic, approached Schuyler. He commenced the reading of Druella's will in the presence of the Schuyler family. As per the provisions outlined in her will, Druella bequeathed her entire inheritance to Schuyler. 
This included ownership of the Gringotts vault, the small house, the house elf Sasha, various valuable antiques, and more. It was a gesture to convey her immense love for her grandson. Skylar willingly endorsed a series of magical contracts, solidifying his claim to the inheritance. To immortalize Druella's memory, Skylar registered the name Ella's Cottage with the Ministry of Magic, ensuring her legacy lived on. After completing all the necessary arrangements, Skylar intended to depart with his parents and Draco. However, an unexpected obstacle emerged in the form of an old witch with shrewd eyes, thick eyebrows, and short black hair. Skylar vaguely recalled encountering this elegantly attired lady on the first day he arrived at Ella's cottage. The peculiar thing was that her name eluded him, despite Skylar's meticulous efforts to entertain and remember each guest, he had no recollection of her. His memory, usually faultless, left no room for errors or oversights. To Skylar's surprise, Lucius merely nodded to the old witch, instructing Skylar to remain behind and return to Malfoy Manor on his own after the matter had been settled. Identifying herself as Miss Vinda, she revealed her status as a distant blood relative of Druella's family in France, belonging to a branch of the Rosier family. Having committed a crime in France, Miss Vinda sought refuge in England, where she found shelter and assistance from Druella. It suddenly dawned on Skylar, recalling a name long forgotten by those around him, the elderly woman before him was indeed an extraordinary individual. Vinda Rosier. She was the right-hand woman of the first Dark Lord Grindelwald, holding a prestigious position among the ranks of the saints, making her well-known. The extent of Grindelwald's trust in her was evident through her assignment to oversee Grindelwald's divining skull. Skylar, I hope you don't mind if I call you that. Feel free to call me Aunt, it has a warmer touch. Vinda, with her discerning eyes, had already observed the faint aura of black magic surrounding Skylar, which included the dark magic of the Rosier family that she was familiar with. Aunt Vinda, Skylar, aware of the person's identity before him and recognizing her as an astute and powerful individual, dared not let his guard down. Hello. How may Skylar be of assistance to you? Vinda smiled serenely and responded, I knew at the moment I laid eyes on you. You're a clever young one, and that greatly pleases me. Dealing with someone like you can save a lot of effort. Let me be direct, I've heard what others have said. You are Druella's most cherished grandson. I received many favors from her in the past, so I wish to do something for you as a way to repay her. These words didn't catch Skylar off guard. Given his reputation, it was implausible to portray him as a fool. Moreover, with the will just disclosed, it was evident to everyone that Skylar held a special place in Druella's heart. However, Vinda's subsequent inquiry took a different turn. Her gaze sharpened abruptly, and she asked, I have a question for you. Have you mastered the ancestral magic of our Rosier family? Skylar was secretly surprised. Despite having abandoned the study of dark magic for quite some time, the lingering traces from that period seemed to be more discernible than he anticipated. He had assumed that Dumbledore, at the very least, hadn't detected them. What caught him off guard was that the dark magic he had learned comprised predominantly of clandestine spells from pure-blood families. While these might remain imperceptible to outsiders, they fell under the purview of Vinda Rosier, an adept in the family's secret dark magic. To her discerning eyes, how could he possibly keep it hidden? Aunt Vinda, to be honest, Yes, before entering Hogwarts, I perused some magical research records of the Rosier family and attempted to learn certain spells from them. However, once I enrolled in school, my focus shifted to the magical teachings within Hogwarts and the ancestral magic of the Malfoy family. Consequently, I became less acquainted with the Rosier family's magical practices. What a sly child! Vinda's lips curled into a slight smile as she spoke, it's good to be cautious, but there's no need to be nervous. My dear nephew, I'm not here to stir up trouble over this matter. I observed the fluctuations in your magical power, and you've acquired a proficiency in dark magic. Why haven't I heard anyone mention that Hogwarts is teaching dark magic now? She paused, then continued, I won't beat around the bush. My intentions are entirely benevolent. I'm offering you a substantial gift. On the one hand, I aim to repay the debt of gratitude owed to Druela, and on the other, I'm captivated by your inherent talent. It's been a while since I've encountered a young wizard with such potent magical blood. In your case, you are truly deserving of this gift from me. With those words, Vinda produced a small, weathered wooden box from her pocket. 
the magical aura emanating from it hinted at traces of spatial magic. Skylar could discern that this was a box enchanted with a nearly imperceptible extension spell. She opened the box in front of Skylar, revealing ten bottles of vibrant potions. With just a cursory glance, Skylar recognized a variety of rare and controlled substances, two bottles each of Felix Felicis, Veritasarum, Polyjuice, the Draft of Living Death, and Amortentia Love Potion. Next, his attention was drawn to a peculiar ring shaped like a skull, along with over a dozen thick magical books. Don't let your surprise show too quickly, Skylar, Vinda spoke slowly. These represent the entire heritage of my rosier bloodline. While I understand that you may have acquired some of the Rosier family's secret magic through Druella, my aunt can guarantee that what I'm giving you here is a more comprehensive and complete collection. After all, her gaze was penetrating, I am a direct descendant of the core family of that generation. It's just. Sigh. Skylar inferred the reason behind her anonymity, likely due to her association with Grindelwald. He chose not to dwell on her somber past, swiftly changing the topic, Aunt Vinda, what's the story behind this skull ring? Upon hearing this, Vinda momentarily lapsed into a contemplative silence. After a brief pause, she resumed, this ring. Is gel, before she could utter Grindelwald's name, she halted, this ring is an inheritance bestowed upon me by a great wizard. When worn, it not only enhances the wearer's control over magical power but also refines the control over the four elements, fire, water, thunder, and lightning, and whirlwind. It harmonizes well with the Rosier family's core inheritance, which is elemental dark magic. Among them, combustion is one aspect, and others include black water, purple thunder, dark clouds, and more, all of which are potent elemental magics. This ring can expedite your mastery of them. All these offerings were undeniably valuable. However, the cautious Skylar wasn't accustomed to accepting substantial gifts casually. He prudently voiced, Aunt Vinda, before I accept these items, if you don't mind, I have a few questions that I hope you can answer. Vinda responded composedly, I know that you are smart, but I wasn't expecting you to be this cautious, young one. Go ahead, share your questions. These gifts are quite extravagant, Skylar remarked. Setting aside the connection between my grandmother and you, what is our relationship? Even if you perceive potential in me, shouldn't the core inheritances of the Rosier family be reserved for individuals bearing the Rosier name? Suppose, for some reason, you can't pass it on to the French branch. Still, how come I've heard about Uncle Evan privately leaving a bloodline as an illegitimate son? Wouldn't it be more fitting to bestow these inheritances upon him? I find it hard to believe that such a crucial family legacy would be casually handed over to someone with a different surname, especially when I myself have a quarter of rosier blood. Skylar explained. At that moment, a glint of intrigue sparkled in Vinda's eyes, and she spoke deliberately, who told you Evan has blood descendants? That's just hearsay. Auntie, Skylar grinned, you've acknowledged it yourself, we're both intelligent individuals, so why beat around the bush? It's a waste of our time. If you're unwilling to address that question, let's move on to the next one. Hearing the words from Skylar's mouth slowly made the facade Vinda was using gone. Even a slight smirk could be seen on her face as she acknowledged Skylar's way of dealing with things in front of him. Skylar's gaze turned icy, and he fixed Vinda with a stern look. The next question is crucial, it determines whether I can trust you or not. I expect an honest answer. Just tell me. After I receive these items from you, will you suddenly remember the tasks you need my help with? If so, what are those tasks? Vinda's eyes began to waver. She hesitated for a prolonged moment before sighing, Listen here Skylar, it seems like I can't keep anything from you, huh? Originally, my intention was not to disclose this, but if I don't tell you the truth, I'm afraid you won't accept this gift anyway. Aunt Vinda, just speak the truth. I understand that there might be some personal motives behind you giving me these gifts, but you don't need to ask for anything specific in return. Vinda sighed once more, the reason I hesitated earlier is because it involves some unsavory secrets. Evan indeed had a child, but it wasn't an illegitimate son, rather, he had a daughter through a disgraceful act. He had resorted to the imperious curse to forcefully possess a woman, bringing great shame to the family. It's truly deplorable that a noble pure-blood descendant had to resort to such methods to obtain a woman. Initially, the family had no intention of acknowledging this blood descendant. The incident remained hidden from public view, 
and the daughter could not pass on the family name to future generations. However, when both Evan and his father participated in the Death Eater camp and lost their lives during the First Wizarding War, the British branch of the Rosier family dwindled. Suddenly, the status of having a daughter became significant. Despite the disgraceful circumstances, she was now the last pure descendant of the Rosier bloodline. Vinda continued with each word said, leaving her with a bitter expression. Skylar furrowed his brows. What do you mean? Are you asking me to assist in caring for this descendant? Do I know her? Vinda smiled, not only do you know her, but she is your girlfriend. She paused for a moment, looking at Skylar in the eyes while smiling mischievously, Morag McDougall. What? Skylar exclaimed in shock. Last summer, Skylar had met Morag's parents, Mr. and Mrs. McDougall when he accompanied her home after a date at an art exhibition. The revelation left Skylar bewildered. Was Mr. McDougall deceived, or did he know about this? Anticipating Skylar's doubts, Vinda clarified, McDougall is aware of the situation, and the family has compensated him. It wasn't his wife's fault, and the child was innocent. He accepted both mother and son. You can rest assured of this. Then, I understand. Thank you, Aunt Vinda. Skylar realized he didn't need to exert any extra effort for these gifts. Regardless of the gifts, he would take good care of Morag. But then, a peculiar thought crossed his mind, adding Meredith, all four of his girlfriends belonged to the Holy Pure Blood 28 families. What struck him as even more bizarre was that they all had the core blood of their respective families. Consequently, Skylar found himself contemplating the idea of having at least three children to continue the bloodline of these families. A strange notion dawned upon him, he felt as if he had turned into a stallion. One, ten bottles of magical potions have been obtained. The ancient magic of the Rosier bloodline has been learned. Gellert Grindelwald's skull ring has been obtained. After stowing the newfound treasures into the suitcase space, Skylar summoned the house elf, Sasha, now under his command, to take charge of cleaning Druella's cottage. Druella's cottage harbored a hidden room, concealing several dark magic books. Druella had kept them from Skylar, deeming him too young for exposure to such magic. These books were now in Skylar's possession. Additionally, Druella had substantial savings in Gringotts' treasury. According to Sasha's account book, the sum amounted to approximately 7,000 galleons, all belonging to Skylar. Druella's cottage ownership has been obtained. House Elf Sasha has been obtained. A library of dark magic books has been obtained. 7,000 galleons obtained. It was already evening when we returned to Malfoy Manor. The house elf Lele had prepared a sumptuous dinner. Skylar and his family of four talked and laughed at the dining table, enjoying the delightful meal. Though on the surface, Narcissa expressed dissatisfaction with Skylar's decision to welcome Andromeda and criticized him a few times during dinner, Skylar could discern the underlying gratitude in Narcissa's eyes. Skylar's actions spared her from the difficult task of expelling her own sister. In the end, blood ties and family bonds proved undeniable. While easy to discuss, putting it into practice was an intricate challenge. Skylar wisely kept these thoughts to himself. An intriguing observation was Lucius's occasional furtive glances, revealing a mix of disbelief and guilt. This revelation sparked curiosity. Skylar was no fool. Draco's unusual behavior might be concealed from Narcissa, but it couldn't escape the notice of his perceptive father. Lucius seemed to be well aware of Draco's situation and harbored a hint of guilt himself. Skylar misunderstood the motives behind the family's actions, thinking that Lucius and Draco had orchestrated these subtle moves to further the cause of pure blood supremacy. Returning home was a rare occasion for Skylar, and he didn't want to rush back to school so soon. However, with seven days left until school resumed, staying at home every day wasn't a viable option. Daphne and the others were still at school, and most of his friends were occupied with the Yule Ball. Among them, only one person, like him, chose to return home during this Christmas vacation, Luna Lovegood. Earlier in the semester, Luna had been recruited by Chang Cho to join the Serpentis Vigil Club. Despite this, her reserved personality made her appear somewhat withdrawn to outsiders. Misconceptions about Luna abound. Many believe she's eccentric, unique, indifferent to others' opinions, and prone to unrealistic and fanciful thinking. 
In reality, Luna was a girl who had witnessed her mother's death at a young age and lacked emotional guidance from her unreliable father. The isolation in the wizarding world further hindered her communication with peers, exacerbating the situation. After her mother's passing, Luna found herself in a state of melancholy and confusion. Unfortunately, no one guided her through the process, offering no lessons on expressing emotions or providing a platform for her to share her feelings openly. Consequently, Luna erected impenetrable emotional defenses, concealing her truest emotions. Entering school with her distinctive temperament, Luna faced intense alienation and discomfort from her peers. The other young wizards, reacting with honesty, chose to isolate and distance themselves from her. Luna undoubtedly experienced a dark period during this time, grappling with low self-esteem and depression. Despite these challenges, she clung to the kindness in her heart. This innate kindness, coupled with unwavering persistence, enabled her to rise from the depths of sorrow and cultivate resilience. Luna stopped letting others' ridicule and bullying affect her. She made a conscious decision to embrace her true self, staying true to her own values. Luna's belief in her individuality and the courage to go her own way transformed her into a warrior unafraid to confront the world authentically. In her eyes, being different wasn't a flaw, instead, it signified the bravery to be true to oneself. In her second year at school, Luna experienced an unexpected stroke of luck on the train when she encountered Skylar. This encounter, a scenario she had never dared to imagine, unfolded in a way that would significantly impact her life. Skylar's warm and amiable demeanor effortlessly won her friendship, making him the first person, aside from her family, to truly enter Luna's life and inner world. Luna's deep appreciation for friendship is evident in a sketch prominently displayed in her room. The illustration portrays Skylar, Daphne, Meredith, Astoria, and Luna herself, capturing a moment of shared joy as they indulge in airship plums under the slanting sunlight. Each figure in the scene wears a bright and genuine smile. Upon learning of Meredith's mysterious disappearance, Luna experienced profound sorrow and melancholy in the solitude of a deserted corner. Despite the intensity of her emotions, Luna chose to keep her feelings private. When she discovered that Cho was recruiting members for a secretive organization associated with Skylar, Luna joined without hesitation. Recognizing the shared importance both she and Skylar placed on emotions, Luna believed in the authenticity of his feelings for Meredith and was convinced he would do everything in his power to save her. Luna was ready to provide any assistance he might need. Returning to Skylar, he hasn't forgotten the distinctive magical aura he sensed in Luna, an essence closely aligned with nature, radiating a purity and tranquility that felt magical. At that time, Skylar had already considered recruiting Luna into the Serpentis Vigil Club. Now that Luna is a member of the club, in a sense, she is one of his subordinate members. As the de facto leader, it becomes a necessary responsibility to care for her and foster mutual communication and understanding. Considering Luna's potential possession of valuable blood talents, Skylar admits that this ethereal and dreamy girl occupies a special place in his heart. It's not love, nor is it the sentimental connection between individuals of the opposite gender, however, it transcends simple friendship. Each time Skylar encounters Luna, a tender place in his heart is stirred. Luna may symbolize the freedom that Skylar genuinely aspires to achieve. Prompted by this sentiment, Skylar uses the family's fastest owl to send a letter to Luna, expressing his intention to visit her. Luna responds promptly. Given the proximity of Devon and Wiltshire, the reply arrives on the same day. After revealing his feelings to his family the following morning, Skylar tossed a handful of flip powder into the fireplace, announcing, Love Good House, with gusto before arriving at Luna's residence. Situated in the village of St. Catchpole in Devon, England, Luna's home coexists with both wizard and muggle inhabitants. The magical community established itself after the 17th century signing of the International Statute of Secrecy. Noteworthy wizarding families residing nearby include the Weasleys, Fawcett's, Diggory's, and Lovegoods. Among them, the Diggory family and the Weasley family maintain a strong relationship, with the male heads of both households employed at the Ministry of Magic. Although not occupying high-ranking positions, they lead comfortable lives. On the other hand, the Fawcett family experienced a decline, evident in their inability to secure tickets for the Quidditch World Cup hosted in their home country. Speaking of the Fawcett family, though less recognized, Skylar is familiar with their sole daughter, Sybil Fawcett. A notable figure at Hogwarts, she is also known for her mischievous endeavors. 
In the incident involving Harold Dingle peeping in the girl's bathroom at the end of the last semester, Sybil took matters into her own hands, pursuing Dingle and administering a beating that left his nose bruised and face swollen. Later, during the Goblet of Fire registration ceremony, she and Hufflepuff Summers attempted to circumvent the age line to register before the Weasley twins. The consequence was being expelled from the line and covered in white beards. For quite some time afterward, all four of their names were considered the laughingstock of Hogwarts. Her glorious deeds continued. Just a few days ago, on the Yule Ball night, she and her Hufflepuff boyfriend brazenly engaged in inappropriate activities in the rose bushes outside the Great Hall. Unfortunately for them, the plan did not pan out, and they ran into Professor Snape and Headmaster Karkaroff, who were discussing secrets. Both of them deducted ten points from their respective houses, and Skylar became the target of numerous people's ridicule. What is more noteworthy is that Skylar and Luna are both Ravenclaw students, with Skylar being three grades ahead of Luna. Despite the close proximity of their families, they never interacted with each other, as Skylar never paid any attention to the neighbor girl at school. Returning to Skylar, Luna's house hall layout resembles the tent visited during the Quidditch World Cup. Firstly, it must be mentioned that Luna's home resembles a rook in wizard chess, a long, thin, black, round cylinder house. In front of the house lies a glistening stream that stretches down into the valley. Judging from the exterior, one can get a sense of the interior style. The space within the house forms a narrow circle, segmented into several levels interconnected by a wrought iron spiral staircase. Upon entering through the door, the first floor is the kitchen, while the floor above houses the living room, where Skylar currently finds himself. This space also serves as Luna's father's workplace. Moving further upward, it likely leads to the father and daughter's bedroom or a similar space. Due to Luna's father working in this space, it appears somewhat disorderly. One might even say that the piles of books, magazines, and papers scattered everywhere give it a maze-like appearance. Hanging from the ceiling are exquisite animal models that Skylar doesn't recognize, all of them flapping their wings or moving their mouths. In a prominent spot, there is a female bust resembling Lady Rowena Ravenclaw, a familiar figure to Skylar. Skylar encountered Luna and her father, Xenophilius Lovegood. Xenophilius, a middle-aged man with a beard-like face, sported a head of white hair resembling cotton candy and wore a dazzling light yellow robe. Around his neck hung a gold chain adorned with a peculiar symbol, resembling a triangular eye. Luna, Mr. Lovegood, hello, Skylar greeted them politely as he approached. Then, he retrieved a crumplehorn snornack from his pocket, presenting it to Mr. Lovegood. This is a meeting gift, please, Mr. Lovegood, you must accept it. A joyful light gleamed in Xenophilius's eyes as he eagerly accepted the gift. Ah! This is the crumplehorn snornack. Look, Luna, Dad didn't lie to you, right? It really exists. With her somewhat dreamy eyes, Luna gazed at the horn and couldn't resist reaching out to touch it. Skylar had modified the horn of the snornack creature, significantly reducing the magic power within. If, in the future, destiny compelled the three Harrys to visit Lovegood's house, this horn would no longer pose a threat. It would fail to blast Luna's home into rubble. Xenophilius quickly arranged a relatively comfortable seat, urging Skylar to sit down. He then asked Luna to prepare a drink and engaged in a continuous chat with Skylar, or, more accurately, it was him doing the talking while Skylar listened. Clutching a magazine with, The Quibbler, written on the cover, Xenophilius kept the conversation flowing, Owl hooks and harassing flies are my least favorite magical creatures. They bring nothing but destruction and harm. Unfortunately. Maintaining a serious expression, Xenophilius continued, I suspect that the current Minister of Magic, Cornelius Fudge, is haunted by these two magical creatures. Ha! Huh. Skylar attempted to join the conversation but soon realized he and Xenophilius had little in common. It appeared his imagination had its limits. Fudge is secretly cultivating an army of fire spirits, the Black Leopard. I believe he's been influenced by the oyster hook and the harassing fly, Xenophilius asserted matter-of-factly. That's why I wrote about this in The Quibbler. I hope he doesn't repeat the same mistake over and over again. While Skylar perceived it as an amusing anecdote, his opinion of Fudge wasn't favorable anyway. Yet, from Xenophilius's perspective, it seemed no one had been willing to lend an ear to his tales for quite some time. Skylar became a rare listener for Xenophilius, especially since his wife Pandora. 
thoughts of Pandora brought a mist to the corners of Xenophilius's eyes. He apologized and withdrew to his dormitory. Dad must be thinking of Mom. Whenever he thinks of her, he looks like this. Luna displayed an uncommon expression of sadness and spoke softly, she was a quite extraordinary witch, you know, but she did like to experiment and one of her spells went rather badly wrong one day. Unfortunately, one day, one of her experiments went awry. Yes, it was rather horrible. And I lost her. I was nine years old that year. I'm sorry, Skylar said gently. Yeah, it was truly devastating at the time, Luna acknowledged sincerely. I still feel sorrowful about it from time to time. But I still have dad. And, it's not like I'll never see my mother again, will I? Yes, I'm sure you'll see her again, reassured Skylar. Indeed. Luna gazed at Skylar earnestly with her bright eyes, then broke into an innocent smile. By the way, dad really likes you. The two of them enjoyed several days in St. Catchpole Village, Skylar made sure to return home each night. Luna took Skylar to catch freshwater colored ball fish in the creek near Valley Bridge, and then she prepared fish soup, which turned out to be quite delicious. Skylar truly appreciated these leisurely days. Lovegood's home was filled with numerous books, most of which were the spell notes of Luna's mother, Pandora. As an exceptional spell master, Pandora had crafted numerous unique spells. Even Miranda Goshawk, the author of Standard Spells, openly expressed admiration for Pandora's work. Her notes on spell creation proved to be highly inspiring for Skylar. Observing Skylar treasure Pandora's notes, Luna decided to gift the entire set to Xenophilius with his consent. Obtained Pandora's spell notes. As time passed, January 4th arrived swiftly, marking the beginning of the new term at Hogwarts. <laughs>